Welcome to my channel. Have fun. Poison God's Heritage. Authors, by Ago. Novel Buddy. Chapter 1 Prologue. It just happened, how easy it is, how fickle it is, and how weak it is that man's life could end so abruptly and without notice. I have no clear recollection of what went on, I had just finished a day of hard work in the office, staying late was the usual as I had no one to go home to. My parents have long since passed away, and I had no siblings or close family to care or bother remembering who I was, or if I had lived or died. My life was insignificant, yet I lived it with all I had, took opportunities when they were presented to me, and was not afraid to take shortcuts. I was not a good man, and I will not deny it. But at least what I do know is that I am honest, and that will not change. I was walking down the street, down a shady ally, an ally that I have went past at uncountable times during my working life. I was a manager in an engineering company and was a few hard working years away from making it to director. Life, though dull, filled with the daily bender and hassle of work still had a future to present to me. Perhaps making it to the director's position was going to change who I was. And though a far away hope, it was hope nevertheless. The last thing I remembered was the shout of a gruff sounding man, then I received a powerful blow on the head. The pain didn't register until a few moments when my cheek was placed against the ground, my eyes could only see red, then after a small jolt of pain, I felt nothing. A dark world received me with open eyes. I turned and turned, there was no denying it, there and then, I knew I was dead. And for some reason, this welcoming darkness was not as horrid as I had believed it would be. The abyss was by no means cold nor hot. It was just dotted. Somewhere, I was stuck unable to move, yet with a lackluster will to do so. Why should I care for what is going to happen next, and this darkness was not as terrifying as I had imagined it. Perhaps I will be here for all eternity. Then a thought crossed my mind. God? Should I pray, ask for help? But why should I do so? This place feels rather good. As I was thinking to myself, not bothering with how much time I had spent floating in this inexistent place. My eyes flared with a burning light. I was able to see, and soon I was pulled out of the comfortable darkness into a world of pain. Had I been resuscitated? Perhaps I was taken to a hospital I thought. Yet the scorching sun and the taste of dirt in my mouth told me otherwise. I stood up, barely able to do so, my body dot not my own as I clearly was a man of 45 years old, this body was that of a child, probably 12 to 14. The clothes I wore, no, robe, was a pale blue. Dress? I have no idea what they call these, it looked like a bathrobe only it was made of silk. I felt something heavy on my head, touching it, it was a hair bun. I unintentionally undid it and my hair fell to my waist. Surprise overtook me at first, as I looked around. A group of kids was running away in the distance where I was on a part of a small hill overseeing a small village. Every move I made hurt me in ways I couldn't describe. It was as if my body had nails pierced all over it, and with each move, one of these nails would dig deep and bring me more suffering. For some reason, such pain would have brought a man to his knees in pain gurgling cries. Yet I had the will to take in the pain, and suffer through it with sheer will. How was I able to tolerate a pain that would have undoubtedly made my old self fall unconscious? I did not know the answer then. I dragged myself toward the village, I have no idea who I was, who this body was, but if I am not mistaken, could what I have been reading when I was young be true? Was I reincarnated? And if I was, is this a world of immortals? Stories turn to reality, my dreams of youth coming true, yet as I grew up, I realized that those were nothing but fables. Yet, here and now, such fables became true. And only to make matters more concrete, a man, wearing a dark purple gown, and a golden hair bun over his head appeared right in front of me, I had no idea how he had done it. Two other men did the same and appeared right by his side. This kid is still alive? The man spoke. Yet, this was not English, 
I know English and his words were not it, but for some reason, I understood them. Perhaps I retain the memories of the person who had resided within this body before me. I tried to make a recollection of past events, yet nothing came to mind, it was as if this body had come with nothing but its vital function, its soul was dead. The man kept his eyes peeled upon me. Making me feel like I was being probed and I could hide no secrets from him. Shen Bao, you still live. Worthless, you should have died then and there, better than to waste more of our village's resources. So, my name is Shen Bao, huh, but what is he talking about? Lord Patriarch, he seems to be in shock, all of his meridians have shattered. He is no better than a cripple. Should we kill him and be done with it? I panicked at the hearing of the term kill. No need, we do not acknowledge cripples, he is of no use to us. Remove all of his privileges, send him back to where he came from. The world of cultivators is closed for this one. He will die, sooner or later, either by bandits, or some ruffians, or at least, by old age. The patriarch turned around and began walking, every step he took took him ten times the distance one step a normal person can walk with. It was weird, it was strange but at the same time frightening. These were people with abilities, powers beyond what is scientifically believable. I come from a world of mathematics and physics and these people just threw everything I ever worked hard for, lived for, strove, and believed in, down the drain in mere seconds. Cultivation, huh, can you believe this? It's actually possible. Books and stories were not false after all. I said to myself as I laughed. Come with me, said one of the two men that accompanied the patriarch, and he moved first. He was not walking as fast as the patriarch, but his steps were still too fast for the current me. Pain pervaded my body with every step I took, and I had to take many to get to the said city. And it was difficult to keep up with the man. It didn't take much time to get there, or so I thought, but once I arrived, there was a carriage waiting for me while the man I followed after was speaking to the driver and pointed at me. He then tucked his hands under his long sleeves and walked away. Boy, spoke the driver, to which it took me a few seconds to understand, I haven't been called a boy in a long time. I answered, yes? Get your ass in, we're moving. Right. I answered and rode along, world unknown, destination, unknown, fate unknown. My start in a cultivation world is definitely not like any of the other characters I have read about. It is probably not the worst, but definitely not the best. So, perhaps, as it was told in those fictions, fate always had a say in these scenarios, and probably it might be hiding something interesting for me too. Chapter 2 Plans to Execute The driver dropped me off at a village that was built around a wide river. It was undoubtedly one of the largest ones I have seen in my life. Its waters, however, were not raging, but the current was strong anyway. People were moving about in the village, some farming, some were selling food and some were fishing or just strolling around casually. This village looked like a place where one could retire. There were a few kids playing with sticks shaped like swords, playing warrior. And on the far side of the village was another group of slightly older kids, probably the age of 12 to 14, doing martial arts training and practices. This place looked like a peaceful area that one could spend their time in. I looked around, trying to figure out what to do with my life. The current me has no family or relation to anyone here, so I'm going to have to get by by myself. What is the young immortal doing here? A man asked, turning around, it was an old man, of about seventy years. He looked weakened and feeble, but a gracious smile was plastered on his face. I've been sent here, I replied. Has the Juan Fu sect assigned you here for a mission? If so, I would like to help, I'm the village head. Anything you wish I could supply it to you, young immortal. Immortal. I replied. Are you not, you are wearing the Zhuan Fu sex inner disciples clothes. Oh, these I said as I looked down, with a wry smile on my face I answered, I've been kicked out of it. I don't have anything else to wear. 
The village had tilted his head, wondering what I was talking about. But after a few more moments of pondering, he said. Come, follow me. And so I did, after all, I was new here and had no idea what is going on. The village head took me to the back of the village, there was a large hill overseeing the entirety of the village and there was a small shed on top of it. Right behind the shed was a large tree that shaded the small house from the sun. The Zhuan Fusek was once our patrons, they have assisted us and aided us. And now, it is my duty to return some of that karma back. You'll live here, and I will have people bringing you food. The head said. Wait, aren't you being a bit too generous, I mean I didn't do anything to deserve this, I replied. The old man smiled and said, yes, I know, but karma must be repaid, for all in this world is bound in a circle, and all that is given is taken back. One day, perhaps you shall end this karma cycle, if not, another will. I had absolutely no idea what the man was talking about. But since this was a free house and free food in a foregone world, I would be too stupid to decline it. Then thank you, I'll take you up on your offer. I replied to the man then I added, but I don't even know your name. My name is Wang Nil, the old man smiled and said, you could rest and practice your martial arts here, I will head back to the village as I have many matters to tend to. The old man excused himself and left me by myself. I looked at the shed and wondered, this place was too dilapidated, the wood was rotten in many places, and the roof had mostly caved in, it was better than staying in the open, but not by much. However, with a few nails and wooden planks, I think I could fix it up. But where can I get those? I also need tools, a saw, and a hammer at least. I should probably check if there is a blacksmith in this village. I traced back my footsteps until I reached the village, and as I had feared there were no smiths in this place. But there was a shop in the village. Once I moved deeper a rancid smell assaulted my nose, a man just threw a bucket full of crap in the street from his window, if I was a step too close, I could have had shit all over my clothes. When I met eyes with the man, he yelped and slammed his window shut. Perhaps he was afraid of the clothes I wore. I walked into the shop and checked up on the stuff he had for sale. Most were grains, dried food, and some candy. Hello, I said. Young immortal, how can I be of service, a man answered as he came hasting towards me from outside the shop. Weirdly enough the man was sweating like he was scared shitless. He looked like a middle-aged man, time was still grinding on his face, but he didn't look too unhealthy unlike some of the people outside. Perhaps being a shop owner was enough to supply him with proper food and nutrition. For a moment I hesitated, I didn't have any money or anything to pay the tools, but perhaps doing some odd jobs for the people here can award me with a few coins, so I asked on the thought that I could just loan them. I'm looking for some tools, a hammer, an axe, and a saw if you have them. Of course I do, please wait a moment. The man walked deeper into the shop and entered through a closed door. The man hastily brought me the materials. Do you have some nails? I could use some also. Yes, the man said and brought a box full of different sized nails. I took a handful of them and placed them on the counter. These should do, as for payment. But before I could even speak, the man waved a hand. For the people of the Zhuan Fu sect I would not ask for a payment. These are not that expensive anyway. You can have them. He said. I raised my brows, this Zhuan Fu sect thingy was quite useful. Then I'll take you up on your offer, I replied and moved out. I headed back to the hill with a bag full of materials to work on my small shed. There was a forest nearby and a lot of trees I could use. Surprisingly, the pain in my joints and body became less and less apparent. Perhaps I grew accustomed to it or that my brain began ignoring it. That was handy, I had a lot of things to do. I started by hacking at a large sized tree, some of the kids from the village came to see what I was doing. They were interested but were too afraid to get any closer. After the first hack, the axe rattled threatening to crack and break, it was not of bad quality, but somehow the strength behind my swing. 
this body was stronger than your average man. So, I needed to adjust the strength of each axe blow. It took me a couple of swings to know the exact force needed to use the axe properly and I hacked the tree down in under a minute. Once the tree was down, I began sawing it, which was surprisingly easy as the saw was sharp and it sliced through the wood like a hot knife through butter. It wasn't that the tools were sharp, or the tree too brittle, but once again it was I who was too strong to use the tools and risked breaking them due to carelessness. After having sheared off a good sized matching plank, and what took me probably an hour or two of work I lumped them over my shoulder and headed to the shed. I needed to get it done before nightfall. Once I was back, I tore off a few of the rotten wood, then replaced them with new planks. The hammer and the nail did a great job in securing their position, and after another hour I had a decent place to stay the night in. While I was working, I didn't notice someone placing food at my doorsteps. I had my fill of rice and a piece of dried jerky then resumed my work. I needed to make a bed to sleep on, as the one inside the house was broken and had some things that I didn't want to touch with my bare hands. I cleared the rubble and cleaned the shed, then placed a newly made bed table inside then got one of the kids comma I say kids, but they are all the same age as me to get me some hay. They immediately followed suit and got me some dry hay and a couple of old blankets. Night soon came, I didn't have any interaction with anyone. I had kept myself busy this morning just to evade the hard truth. I'm in a place where no one knows who I am, where technology is no longer available. Where you can't turn on the AC if you feel hot, and your bed was made of straw instead of my comfortable king-size bed. I died, this was true and there is no changing it. But on the other side, I'm in a cultivation world. I came here unknowing of what to do, my future is unsure, but at the same time, in this kind of world, one can make their own future, forge it by their hands. And to do that, I have to first be able to cultivate. I am not fully ignorant of the workings, of these types of worlds. First off, I have been too trusting to the village head, but I was still on my guard, he didn't look like the type of person who would have a malicious intent such as any run-of-the-mill character in those stories. Secondly, I have heard that my body had shattered meridians. And also, something about cultivation deviation. This means that whoever used this body has failed in circulating the thing that is referred to as spiritual energy, or the world's energy, mana, chakra, or whatever it is and due to his failure, his meridians broke and are now useless. This is undoubtedly the reason for his death, and I had reincarnated in his body. This kid has worked his body well, it is strong, more so than a middle-aged man, probably twice or three times more. Which was a good advantage. But if I were to live in this world, like those characters of those stories I have read about, I need to tackle the biggest problem I have right now. The fact that I am unable to cultivate or circulate the so called spiritual energy in my body. And to do so, I need a miracle medicine or an elixir. And those cost a lot of money. So, the most important question is how can I get this said money? I pondered and pondered, over and over again, then it hit me like a brick on the head. Technology. It's easy, it's simple, and it's perfect. I stood up and went to the tools the shop owner had given me. They were made of rough iron and were rusty, pretty bad quality. If they were made out of steel it would have been better sharper and more durable. I know how to make steel, it was in one of the lessons I used to attend when I started studying to become an engineer. Even if this world had steel, I know the exact percentage, carbon to iron wise and how to make the most powerful steel. Secondly. The sewer system, I just saw a man throwing a bucket of shit down the street, this is no good. This will cause and spread diseases. Also, the water they gave me with the food was not clear, perhaps they drew it off the river, I had to start a fire and heat it first. Thirdly, the river, it's a huge power source if one could use it, building a mill there could aid in both grinding wheats, or even making a saw water mill. Even making a dam. Also, a dam, that means electricity, light, power. 
there is so much to do, and it's easy to do it. But the first thing I need to do is to get proper tools. Thankfully I have a body to use and wield those tools, I have the energy to make such buildings, and I have time and patience to do them, what else can I do? I soon fell asleep, tomorrow was going to be a big day, where I'll need to start renovating this area. Chapter 3, Bricks I woke up to the smell of food, someone once again placed food near my door. I had my fell and headed to the shop owner. Once I was there, the man had an angry look on his face. Kid, yesterday, you took those tools, I thought you belonged to the Zhuan Fu Temple, but apparently you have been kicked out. I won't ask you to give them back, but I won't forgive you if you try to scan me for more of my items. I guess he must have learned the news from the village head, but no matter, I was lucky enough to check my pockets yesterday, I had a purse I didn't even notice I had tucked inside my robes. It didn't jingle due to being covered in cotton, but it had a good deal of silver and gold coins. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take anything from you without payment, but you offered before I could pay you. How much are those tools worth anyway? I asked. Two bronze gins. Right, I replied and pulled out the cost and handed it to him. The man's angry expression immediately turned to friendly and he was more than happy to serve. It was true, money is God, and everyone loves worshipping it. I'll be needing more things, I said. Like what? The man asked. I'll need an anvil, and a more hammers, the bigger the better. Also shovels, pickaxes. I only have one of each, the man said, as for the anvil, I don't have one, you'll not find any anvil in this area, but I do have a big slab of iron you can use. Are you planning on opening a forge? For now, it's for personal use, I replied and then waited for the man to bring me the stuff. Also, do you have iron ingots? Iron ingots? What are those? He asked. I shook my head. Do you have anything that has iron in it and you don't need, even iron or as good? Well, for now, I do have some rusty broken axes, shovels, that no one will be using, as for iron ore, you'll have to wait for the city messenger to come by, you can give him a letter and an advanced payment and he will send someone to deliver it for you. Is he trustworthy? I asked. Of course, he is appointed by the city lord. I can write your letter for you. How much do you need? At least 200 pounds for a start, pound? I have never heard of that young master. What is a pound? I looked around and saw a quite hefty and large potato, I weighed it in my hand and handed it to him, about this weight. I said, oh, that's close to half a kilogram, so you need about a hundred kilograms? Uh, yes. If I remember it's one silver for 50 kilograms of iron, that'll be two silvers if you have them. Here, and this is your commission, I said and added a few bronze coins to him. The payment was two silvers and ten bronze gins, five for the tools, and five for the merchant. He was rather happy. I grabbed the tools and took them back to my shed, then came back for the square iron slab the man had. Thankfully it was not misproportioned as it had a few sides that looked as if they were cut by a sword. I grabbed the slab, it was heavy, but not too heavy for me. I managed to bring all the tools back to my place and began planning my work. First, to make strong tools, I'll need a furnace, and the best one for these types is a blast furnace. Sadly, the blast furnace will need a lot of time to construct and a lot of clay. I can probably make one. I already know the method and idea behind it. Second, I'll need firewood, a lot of it. The forest here is enough to satisfy my need, but I'll also need to make charcoal, and for that, I need a container to burn wood and make it into charcoal. The container needs to be made of iron that's why I got the anvil. I looked at the tools I had, there was enough iron here to make a small barrel and there was enough clay in the river to make a crucible. I brought a good deal of clay from the river then began shaping it into pots, it wasn't the best pot one could make, as I didn't have a spinning table. But they were good enough to hold things in them. I also made five of them. The clay in the river is not pure, 
so there is a risk of the pots bursting once they're put in high heat. I placed the clay I took from the river on a large plank that crafted slides underneath it to make it easier to move. I didn't have the time or will to make wheels. Once I brought enough clay near my shed, I started by shaping it into a pyramid shape. With an open hole on the top, then I left a small open spot where I can place wood. I threw in some wood to heat the clay furnace and after a good deal of time, it hardened and became operable with. Thankfully it didn't blow up in my face due to the heat. Now I have my furnace, it's not a blast furnace, but it's good enough for now. I began placing the pots inside the furnace and added more wood. Time to eat, looking down, I noticed that my clothes had turned dirty, I need to get more clothes. Once I had my fill, I saw a young man coming over toward me. He looked to be taller than me, with brownish skin. He was muscular and had a wide grin on his face. Hello, my name is Wu Fan, can you tell me what you're doing here? He asked. I'm Shen Bao, and I'm making stuff, I said. Surprisingly my name or the name of this body came out of me as if I had been using it all my life. I can clearly see that, but what kinds of stuff? This looks interesting. Wu Fan said. I'm making a crucible, to melt iron. What? You're going to melt iron into a jar of dirt? Are you out of your mind? The kid laughed. I didn't deign to tell him off, he was the first person to have the courage to come and talk with me. As I have noticed most of the other kids in the village were outright scared of me, no different than the older people. You'll see, I said. After a few moments, the first pot blew up, then the second. But the remaining three remained strong until the process was done. Good, I said. I then brought more clay and made a large mold that I could pour steel in. I shaped it as a wide rectangle. I placed the mold into the furnace and waited for it to harden. The kid had no idea what I was doing yet, but he was interested enough to bring me wood. He had the good will to chop some of the trees down and make more firewood while I spent time bringing clay back and forth to make more molds for different things, and even started making bricks. Night soon came and Wu Fan had to leave and go back home. I didn't feel tired or sleepy yet so I kept making bricks and throwing them in the fire. By morning I was soot covered, I had to get more clothes from the shop and once I did, I took a dip in the river. Most of the people in the village were treating me as a strange crazy man. I didn't mind it, I had a plan in mind. Once I was done, and this time I wore clothes only fit for working, made of ruffle and I wouldn't mind them getting dirty. I kept on making bricks and setting them apart, I needed to get more to make a good furnace. Wu Fan came once again, this time he had a good idea of what I was doing, but not the purpose of it. He helped shape bricks and threw them in the furnace to heat up. While I was busy cutting wood and making even more planks, our small businesses brought the attention of many other people who were interested in this brick novelty. They kept asking questions on how to use them and I didn't mind sharing, bricks were not a huge secret and anyone with a fart or a brain would know how to do them. It was better to be nice to these people and share in some of these secrets at least this might go back to me later in the future. Soon it was time to make the barrel, I took the crucible, which was a ceramic pot, and placed iron inside it. Broken axe heads, some twisted nails, anything that could be melted. My only fear was the pot breaking before the iron could melt, usually, a good crucible is made with a mix of clay and cobalt, since I don't have the latter, I'll have to count on the low quality of this iron to melt faster as it will have a lower melting point than the clay. Thankfully my gamble worked and the iron began pooling inside the pot after an hour. The current clay furnace did not contain heat well enough, thus why I was making the bricks. They'll be used to make a proper furnace soon. After the iron melted, I got a wet towel and hurriedly drew out the pot then poured it on the mold. It didn't take time for the iron to cool, especially after I drenched it with water to make it bend. Soon I had a rectangular iron plank. I then poured the rest of the iron on the remaining mold that were a circle shape. These will be the bottom and top of the barrel after I bent the iron plank and made my barrel. 
It was not big, but it was enough to make charcoal. After I sealed the badly made barrel, I placed wood inside it and locked it close. I didn't have anything to seal it with, but clay was good as it easily fit into the seams and closed the barrel. The heat from the fire under the barrel was enough to turn the wood inside into charcoal after a few hours. After I taught Wu Fan how to make charcoal, I began building the real furnace. Using the bricks, I heated earlier, I placed them atop each other to make a small square room with the top open, it was larger than the clay furnace, but it will contain heat better especially after I close it. I paid Wu Fan a bronze coin, that he was pretty happy of taking. He thanked me a lot and left to his house. He was a happy kid. Night soon came and I had a good deal of charcoal already and my furnace also ready for use. Chapter 4, Time Flies By morning, the village head came and woke me up. He was impressed with the stuff I had made. Soon but his arrival was to announce something. The fact that I gave Wu Fan a coin yesterday was enough to entice the people into coming over wishing to work. Perhaps I didn't count correctly but it appears that a lot of the people in this village were poor. The amount of money I had in my pouch was staggering to them. But if I were to pay everyone it will soon end. Especially before I could begin my real plans. I'll only hire 10 people, their wage will be 1 bronze gin a day, are you satisfied with that? I asked. How are you going to pick us? One of the men asked. I won't, you will. Discuss it between yourselves, by noon I only want to see 10 people, I don't have the time or effort to survey you all, and I don't even know your abilities, I only need the strongest of men too. I declared, the men outside agreed, and after having debated amongst them who should work and who should not, they finally chose the ones who were the most desperate and in need of money and had enough strength to work hard. Those are my favorite people as they will work and apply all their effort for survival, and those kinds of people are always honest I their jobs. I began assigning jobs, three to cut wood, three to get clay out, two more to saw through the wood and make planks and logs for building, and two more to build the stuff I was about to draw for them. The first thing to build was a mill, right on the river. A mill will generate power enough that I could make a saw mill that will cut wood and manning it will be easier for the workers and they will produce more wood. I got a sheepskin and drew on it the building diagram, the plan of work. A mill was not too hard to build, and the advantages it generated were huge. After giving them the diagram, they followed it impeccably, one would not believe that these people were new to this, and after all they had probably built their own houses and had a good idea of what they were doing. Soon came the shop owner. He drew me to the side and offered me a deal. I don't know how you're doing it, but you are producing a lot of material that can be sold. Do you mind if I bought them, off of you and sell them? This way we'll both make a profit. Catching. This is what I was waiting for. Yes, but we'll have to talk to the village head, I want something off of him. Soon the word reached the village head and he asked me inside his home. Once I was inside, the old man was sitting and in front of him was a table with tea poured in. The man signaled both me and the shop owner to sit and once we did, he took a sip from his tea and said, For a young kid, you sure do have a lot of ingenious ideas, I have never seen anyone coming up with so much in so few a days. It must be the teachings of the Zhuangfu sect, they have been known by their ingenious ways of cultivation. Said the shop owner trying to make small talks. I didn't answer but waited for the man to speak. So, it comes to my listening that you wish something of me. Yes, I want to privatize my work, if anyone in the village wishes to make the same things I do, you'll have to stop them. Why would I? Men are free to do what they want, some even started making your clay furnaces, though most of them broke once they set them on fire. Obviously, that will happen. The base of the furnace and the heat it should contain needs to be perfect, otherwise the whole structure will be weak. But I'm not gonna tell him that now am I. Because I'll be paying tax, to have my work protected. Every silver I make I'll hand over five bronze coins to you, I said. Understandable, 
but five is not enough to appease the masses, he said, it was more like he said that it was not enough for his pockets. Then ten, and I won't go a coin over. I said. Fifteen and we have a deal, I'll even give you a good piece of land where you can place your materials. It's close to the river and the forest. Deal, I said. As for me? Said the merchant. For you, once the messenger arrives, show him the materials I have. And I'll give him ways he can use them and how he can make better, stronger buildings and more powerful tools and weapons. You have all that already set up? Asked the merchant. Since day one, now, I'll be selling you the items at a fixed price and you'll sell them over to the people coming to this place. You'll act as a liaison and find more markets to buy from us. I can do that, I have a lot of connections that could resell these. Said the man, then we have a deal, I handed my hand for him to shake, but he didn't understand. You shake it, like this, I grabbed his hand and shook it. It was awkward but he understood eventually. Once I was done, I went back to my shed and ate my fill once again. Life in this world is turning for the better, now I'll have a good financial stability, and after some time I should be able to afford elixirs to cure my body. I went back to watch over the workers. After a few months, the village had completely changed. Most of the people were working under me. I had finished the soil water mill the grinding water mill, and was able to afford even more labors. I got more and more materials to craft others things. I made steel, replaced carriage wheels with reinforced steel wheels, made weapons and sold them to the messenger. Crafted goods, improved textile craft. Used the furnace to make pipes, used steel to make tools to dig the ground. Made pipelines and toilets. Innovated an irrigating system that could constantly feed the crop's water without having to manually do it. All thanks to the power of the mills. Electricity turned out to be a huge problem to deal with. There was not enough copper to make wires that could spend the entirety of the village. But I made sure to purchase wires whenever possible. The coating of the copper wires was going to be a hassle on its own, just coating them was going to be a problem. I could use tar for now but I'll need a more permanent solution later, since I don't have plastic. Months upon months, the seasons turned, and I generated enough money that I was the richest man in the village. More people had heard that there was always work in Lucid Spring Village thanks to the messenger and had come in droves. The village turned to a city, and the wooden shakes and houses turned to stone and brick houses. After a couple of years, Wu Fan got married. He chose me as his best man. Since he was my right-handed man, he made a good fortune for himself and got himself the prettiest girl in town, not that I ever cared, but he was an honest man. So far, my view on the cruel world of cultivation began to change, the people here were the same as back on earth. The strong eat weak mentality was not ingrained into them. They helped and aided each other. I have been offered the daughters of many of the people in this town, but I had chosen not to get married yet. I have more and many things to do still. Today will be my fifth year on this new world, I am in either my late teens or my early twenties, not sure of the exact age of this body. But this would make me forty-five years old counting the years I lived on earth. I find it strange that I am being offered girls not even half my age but it's never been my goal to sit down and make a family, I needed to pursue the path of cultivation. Though I have been informed that the later one starts down this path in life, the lesser their achievements that did not stop me from pursuing it. And today is the day that a man will be arriving with an elixir that I have paid a literal fortune to order. He said that it was made by some powerful immortal cultivator, an elixir that could repair meridians and rejuvenate them. I waited patiently at the village's entrance waiting for the person to arrive. Soon a man wearing a black hooded robe appeared right in front of me. I didn't see him or hear him, he just materialized in front of me as if he was invisible. You're Shen Bao? He asked. Yes, I nodded. The man looked me up and down and said, Your meridians have been broken for a long time. This elixir might help, but I doubt it would be of any great use. Are you sure you want it? 
I can't promise great results. At least he is honest, and I don't care, as long as there is hope. I will try it. Yes, hand it over. I said. Payment. The man said. I snapped my fingers and two men carrying a large chest came running toward me, they placed the chest in front of the robed man and backed away. I opened the box for the cultivator, and glittering gold assaulted his eyes. Good enough, he said and waved a hand, making the whole box with its content disappear somewhere. He then handed me a bottle, a small vial with a red glistening liquid inside it. Bath yourself in these herbs, burn incense and clear your mind before you drink this. He said and threw a small box full of strong scented herbs at me. The moment I picked them up, he was nowhere to be seen. I went back to my house, yes house now, a pretty big one, it took eight months for it to be built. And walked inside. I had a few maids, women who offered their services to take care of the house in exchange for a few coins a month and food. They prepared my bath with the herbs and I did as the man said. Once I felt myself relaxed and refreshed, I drank the potion. The material inside it melted in my body. It coiled around my stomach like a burning sun then spread all over my body. The heat it generated was enough to boil the water I was in, but surprisingly it didn't boil me with it. I felt my joints cracking, and deep, almost within the bones and flesh, I felt tingling, these were the same spots that pained me when I first came to this world, these were the meridians. They vibrated, more and more. I began breathing heavily. My body temperature rose exceptionally high, but there was hope, this elixir felt like it was the nectar of life, that energy began assaulting my body aiding in reconstructing it. However, it didn't last for long, as the power behind said energy dissipated, faded and was no more. I couldn't feel any change and the tingling faded. The current village doctor was a cultivator, he arrived here due to hearing that it was a cheap and nice place to stay. I went to him asking him to see if the elixir had worked. All I received was a shake of the head. You should give up, Shen Bao, it is too late, you have a good deal of money, you can live your life free, you can live as a king, and you have a good heart and a solid mind. You don't need to go down the solitary path of cultivation, the doctor advised, but I declined to answer. Yet another hope crushed. Years had passed and I tried more elixirs, some were so expensive one could literally buy cities over with. But it was not enough, it was never enough. Year after year, I was assaulted with a deep depression, I even took a spouse and had two kids. Both boys, they brightened my life a bit, and made me forget about my obsession for a while. However, old age was a constant reminder to me. That this life I am leading was finite and the dream of cultivation was soon going to be forgotten. I became the next city head, Lucid Spring had already turned to a large city by now. And with this power I was able to move more men to get even more money flowing into the city. And with it, my pockets grew heftier. Many of the people in the city were blessed with kids that were able to cultivate. They had lived a good life, ate good food and were able to raise healthy children that were attuned with nature and could harness the energies of the world. Unlike my children who were unable to, I even spent more money on them to gain the ability to harness the spiritual energy but it was futile. I even heard rumors that it was my fault, and due to my shattered meridians, that my children were cripples. My wife, Yu Ming passed away giving birth to our third child, she was a girl but she also didn't make it through childbirth. My two other kids, Lu Bao, and Zhao Bao grew up fast they didn't have the same mindset as I did. They did not pursue knowledge and didn't ask me or didn't wish to learn of what I knew, it seems that physics theory was going to die with me. Time passed on, and I was in my seventies. My children had children of their own, but I could feel it in their hearts that they did not enjoy my company perhaps because I was too engrossed in my obsession that I never gave them time. They rarely came to visit as they had parted to other cities. But as it happened today was the day I heard of an even better elixir, made by a nascent soul cultivator, thought I don't know what rank of cultivation that is, 
The doctor confirmed that the owner had an ungodly and steep cultivation level. After I gathered my belongings, as I knew I should be the one to go there and present him the money I have gathered, my two sons Lu Bao and Zhao Bao came along with me. I felt glad that they wished to accompany me this time, that they finally saw what I was attempting to do and are supporting me. Oh, how blind have I been, I should have seen it coming. Lu Bao chose to lead the carriage while Zhao Bao rode inside with me. The conversation was dry, and besides telling me on how his own kids and wife were doing, he replied with nothing else. After ten days travel, we had to take the carriage along a steep mountain, the road was tough but it could still fit a carriage as ours. And once we were halfway through the mountain, Lu Bao stopped the carriage. They wanted to rest they said. I left the cabin and went to check out the scenery, the sun was coming down, and the world looked at peace. Greenery spanning distances unknown a place where beasts roamed free and no sane man would move through. This forest has always been the bane of hunters and only those in desperate need would ever wander it. Unbeknownst to me, Lu Bao was behind me. He didn't speak, he only shoved me with all he could down the mountain slop. Surprised, shocked and unable to understand, the last I saw was the spiteful look on Lu Bao and Zhao Bei as I fell down the steep mountain, betrayed by my own children. Chapter 5, No Light at the End of the Tunnel It Hurts the fall, as I saw the last facial expression on the faces of my children. It hurts, it hurt more than the impact against the rocks, more than the cuts and bruises, more than the broken leg I received. And it definitely hurt me more than when I stopped rolling, and my body finally began assessing the damage and sending pain signals all over the broken areas. I couldn't feel my face, I didn't know if that was a blessing or a curse but the rest of my body was in an infernal agony. I could barely breathe, my lungs were laboring to get some air in. But with every breath, a sharp pain electrified my chest. My right leg was twisted out of place and definitely broken from the look of it. It will be a pain to set it back. I didn't notice at first, but the fall, was pretty high. It was so high that I couldn't even see the ledge I was thrown off form. This hill or mountain was definitely steep. And the fall I took should have killed anyone immediately. But it was all thanks to this body, though in my late 70s. I was still stronger than your average man, and definitely more resilient. However, my resilience will not save me from the fangs of a starved demon beast. And in this forest, these beasts were a plenty, or so has many of my lucid spring city had claimed. A lot of its people went here to hunt, but many left their lives here in search of riches. They were powerful and experienced hunters, and I was nothing more than an old man, easy prey for any that happens to pass nearby or fall upon my scent. I tried to drag my body, but I failed miserably, even my arms, which I felt had suffered the least damage, had finally started broadcasting the pain in them. They were both bruised, and I probably sprained my wrist. Still, I tied it through the agony and managed to get on one knee. I looked up at the mountain I dropped from. There was no way I could climb back. Perhaps I could trace along the mountain's base and end up back at the path it led through it. I could wait there for a few days, and a caravan could help me by then. This was the plan I set for myself, and I was about to execute it. Yet my body didn't respond. I noticed that I was shaking signs of an incoming shock. If I fall into shock, I will definitely never wake up from it. I bit the tip of my tongue, it hurts, really bad, yet this jerking pain, added upon the constant pain my body was feeling woke me up and stopped the shuddering. I have to get out of here, I thought. I dragged myself forward, with one barely functioning arm and leg. Feeling utter exhaustion after every move. And in no more than ten steps, I fell back to the ground. This is not going to work, I said to myself, I needed a way to mend my broken body. Catching a twig with my hand, I thought, I could probably use this with some rope to put my foot in place. Also, with a couple of stronger and sturdier sticks, I could make a cane. I laughed to myself, it has been years since I last crafted anything. 
being the city lord had pulled me away from these manual tasks, as I had assigned many people to do what I had in my mind after presenting them with the corresponding diagrams. But now, I'm back to my starting days, and that manual crafting is probably the only thing that has supported me, was with me, and never betrayed me. Do it yourself. I forced my hip and twisted my leg, snapping it back to place. The pain was enough to drop me unconscious but with another forceful bite of the tongue, I was back. If I do this more, I might end up biting my tongue off. I got more twigs and sticks, placed them around my foot then strapped them with a piece of cloth I tore from my robe. Then I dragged myself forward. Finding big sticks for walking in a forest wasn't hard. And I used them to pull myself up. I could now move. But my breathing was becoming a problem. With each breath I took, the more pain I suffered and this was not good. I fear that one of my ribs if not more are broken, or it had damaged or worse, punctured my lung. Though the last option was daunting, it was not possible, I was still alive and didn't suffer lung failure, yet. As I moved about, I felt a powerful gust of wind blowing above me. Looking up, I saw a man, he was floating. It took me a couple of seconds to realize that I was not dreaming, and this man was actually floating. He looked like a middle-aged person, wearing cultivator clothing, black and purple. The only cultivators I ever met were from the Zhuangfu sect, and others from minor sects, but even among these sects, I have never seen one able to float in the air. The man looked at me, with that same probing gaze that many other doctors have done to me. You'll work said the man and without even touching me, he grasped with his hand and I was lifted off the ground. Pain, back-breaking pain assaulted my body, it felt like an invisible titan grabbed my whole body and I had no say in the matter. I couldn't even speak, the pressure on my lungs was enough to shut me up. The man flew over the forest with a speed so amazing I thought I was on a high-speed jet. He kept moving above the forest, headed to a direction only he knew. And once again I had no say in the matter. I fainted somewhere along the road. And only woke up to the sound of agony. Not mine, but many, many, many others. I was inside a cave, more like a cavern. Its ceiling was high, and it was lit thanks to a few torches placed on the cavern's walls. A few things caught my attention. The first, a pungent purple-colored pool in the middle of the cave. The second a bronze door, filled with symbols, and words I didn't know what they meant. And in the middle of this bronze door was a handprint. Lastly were the cultivators around the room, there were five of them. Each with different clothing, different sex. They were our prisoners. Yes, I said our, because there was not just me. The people with me, men, women, children of all ages and races. Dark, white, brown, and many. They were all held down with some sort of power that I had just noticed, it caused us to remain unmoving, unable to resist. And why I say resist, is that one of these five people, a man also of middle age with dark long hair and a crimson colored robe, sat in front of the pool, he grabbed the people around the cave. And pierced through their skin with his finger rapidly so that blood didn't even have time to sprout out. The man would then throw whoever he had pierced through into the pool, where they shout, cry, and scream in utter complete madness. If I were to guess, this pool was so painful to the touch that they had the look of a person wishing to die the moment they touched it. Yet whenever one of these people was thrown into the pool, this purple liquid moved as if it had a will of its own, draining them, drowning them and ultimately killing them. This dot liquid, viscous, with a mind of its own, it moved and went through these people's mouths, nostrils, ears, and eyes. Then ultimately dragged them down without them ever returning back up. More people did, and I sat there, unable to do anything to resist my approaching doom. Fate? I have started believing in it, when I first came here, that I will be able to change my life and do something with this life. That my body, though unable to cultivate if I use my brain well enough that I could circumvent this situation. And then be able to become a cultivator. 
Yet what is fate when one like these cultivators is able to bind your life, bend it and do whatever he wants to you without you ever having the chance or opportunity to go beyond his clutch and escape? What is life when one can kill you at his whim? Fairness? Fate? I call bullshit. These were the last thoughts that crossed my mind as it was now my turn, I haven't even noticed how many people were thrown into the pit. Grab him, another man said. And the one wearing crimson grasped his hand and the same feeling enveloped my body, as I was being carried by a giant's hand and taken all the way to the man wearing crimson. I was unable to talk, something was preventing me from, all I could do was moan, but they didn't care about that. The man was about to pierce through my skin and throw me to my death. And I had no say in the matter. How loathsome! Yet before the man could even pierce my skin, the other guy, the one who brought me in said, there is no need, his meridians are already shattered. The man carrying me looked back at me with that same probing gaze, and shrugged, then threw me to my demise. It felt bad, worse than anything I have ever suffered before. And if the falling form, a cliffside was comparable to a pat on the back, this pain was a full-scale whipping with a notched iron whip. Only this whip was made of molten steel. I was going to die, and I could do nothing about it. Chapter 6 Purple Skull As I suffered an agony a hundred times worse than drowning, as the vile liquid penetrated through my nostrils and lungs, it made me feel as if I was drowning in liquid lava. With every bit and piece of my body in utter and complete agonizing pain. I wanted to scream, and when I did, I instantly regretted it as I have let the liquid that felt like a living thing access to my body. The liquid, a nefarious, destructive, and painful substance enveloped me and pressed against every fiber of my body, making me wish that death would come and claim my life as fast as it could but the reaper was too slow in his work that I wanted to curse at him. I wasn't dying any time soon. And it took a lot of time for the cultivators to notice that I am still alive and in utter pain. I lost sight in one of my eyes, the burning pain from my broken leg increased in folds. And my back felt like it broke and was reconstructed but in a deformed way. I was suffering, it was as if the liquid was morphing my body molding it like clay dough to the shape it wanted. He still lives. Good. One of the cultivators said, then the same power pulled me from the pool. Like a hand that grasped on the body of a small bird, making it feel useless and unable to do anything but beg for the mercy of its captive. He threw me against the pool's rim, I fell on my back, gasping for air that resisted contending I gazed at the burning liquid in my lungs. I was unable to see well, my mind was in chaos, and my lungs were full of the disgusting liquid, I wretched and coughed out whatever I could, but I felt like there was much more left inside my lungs as they burned with every breath I took. You, what's your name? Asked one of the cultivators, he was the man with the crimson robe. He was addressing me. I didn't want to annoy him, so I spoke through grit teeth, Shen Bao. Shen Bao. Today is your lucky day, you'll be of service to an immortal, rejoice and take pride in it. Said the man wearing crimson, his gaze however was filled with scorn, as if he saw me as nothing but an ant, a tool to his devices. An anonymity. It was humiliating, to be looked down upon, to be treated this way and to be expected to be thankful to your torturer, but for now, they hold the keys to my survival, and I could do nothing but follow their orders perhaps I could live. You've survived the bone and body grinding poison, that is a feat not even we immortals could do, that means you're fated to be of great use to us. Brat, move to that door, and place your hand in it. Said the man. Brat. No matter how you look at it, I look much older than him. But if he is an immortal, the same as the ones in those books, then he could be hundreds of years for all I know. So he is probably right in calling me breath. I looked forward from where I was lying down. There was a golden door there, filled with writings of all sorts. I didn't understand any of them, but in the middle of the writings was a palm print. Place your hand on the palm print. Once you do that, that door will open, and you'll be set free. I even have your antidote, 
You'll be good as new once you drink this. The cultivator said. Brand as new. I finally realized what he meant as I looked at my hands, I was a healthy old aged man, I still had muscles and a good build, but after being dipped into that pool, everything changed. My skin turned pale green, pustules and odd tumorous blobs grew abnormally all over my body, this looked like a severe case of neurofibromatosis, I've read an article about it once. I was a monster. Hurry. I tried to stand up, but my right leg gave up on me, the broken bone hadn't healed yet and with a bone and body grinding poison, it had undoubtedly been affected and now it's in an even worse condition. Move! shouted one of the cultivators, and I had no choice but to do so. I dragged myself forward, feeling every part of me in utter agony, every bone of my body screaming in pain as I moved forward. The pain was too much, yet I didn't faint or fall unconscious, I curse the strong constitution of this body as it would have spared me much of this pain if I was just a weak normal human. Once I reached the gate, the crimson wearing cultivator said, press your palm there, breath. We don't have much time. I did as I was told, all for that antidote, if I get it, I could get rid of these disgusting features. Once my hand locked onto the gate, it felt like it was glued. Something pricked me in the palm and a gust of blood surged out from the palm print and spread all over the door. I felt dizzy and anemic. But I still couldn't fall unconscious. I dropped to my knees huffing once the door creaked open. It's open. We finally did it. Ten years of hard work finally got us here. The crimson-robed cultivator spoke in glee. The door kept opening revealing the inside. The cultivators rushed toward the door. They wanted to claim what was there. But something was not right. Right in front of me was a purple colored skull, it was too big, almost as big as the door size, it looked like a ghost, ethereal and see through. Yet the cultivators didn't seem to notice it, or even care about it if they did. Soon, the purplish skull dissipated into a cloud of gas and fell to the ground, seeping like a coiling snake. It came to me. But the moment it touched me, it removed itself and went away, looking for something. The purple smoke also avoided the cultivators, but they still didn't seem to notice it. It went out probably that was the ghost of someone and it was leaving the dungeon we're in. The cultivators all went inside the new room but I grabbed at the last one's robe and said. The antidote. The cultivator smirked in my face and said. Do you think if we had the antidote we wouldn't have dipped ourselves in the pool and opened the door ourselves? Foolish mortal, now die. He said and lifted his leg up to stomp on my face. Yet the earth trembled and a shaking far worse than anything I have ever felt before started. The scarce light that came from the exit of the stungeon was cut off. And the volume of the purple fog began increasing in the room. The people who were chained began falling unconscious. It was sudden, and silent. Like nothing I have ever seen before, it was like a spell to make everyone fall asleep. Yet, their bodies shriveled up and dried up right in front of my eyes. Not even the cultivator who wanted to stomp my head into the ground was saved from this fate, even he was turned to a skeleton, then his skeleton turned to ash. All that was left of him was his clothes and a small brown pouch. The cave was silent. For the first time since I got here, it was as silent as the night. No more came the sound of wailing and pained moans, not even the sound of the cultivators who went into the room. I can't stay here, perhaps the purple ghost had ignored me at first was a coincidence, but I doubt it will do it again. There was no way out from where we got in from. There is only the cave. Chapter 7, The Light at the End of the Tunnel is Brighter I dragged myself forward and entered the door. I expected to see a large room or a corridor spanning hundreds of meters underground, but I was met with a small room, no bigger than one of my sleeping chambers in my palace at Lucid Spring City. How I miss my comfortable life! This is my first encounter with real cultivators, not those practitioners who barely know how to do alchemy or potion making that claim to be cultivators. The people here had utter disregard to mortal life, they were arrogant, boisterous, 
and domineering. They did what they wanted, with little regard to life or morality. These were evil. But my fate is sealed with these people I can't do anything in my current weakened state, no, I couldn't even do anything even if I was fifty years younger. But I have to move forward. And I did. But there was no one there, not even the cultivators that entered, there didn't seem to be a way out of this room and I didn't see anyone leave. Looking around I noticed that the ground was riddled with ash, and among the ashen remains were the robes of the cultivators. Everyone is dead. Even those people who could crush me like an ant, they too were crushed like one. What madness is this? Why among all was I spared? My mind couldn't adapt to the current scope of things. Cultivators that were mighty as gods were destroyed and made to look like they didn't account for a thing. They were a non-entity in the eyes of that purple ghost. I looked back but didn't see any signs of that floating skull. It was here no more, or probably it is hidden waiting to see what I would do. I calmed myself, if that skull wanted me dead, I had no ability whatsoever to defy it. So as long as I still live, perhaps I still have a chance to get out of here. I gathered the robes and pouches of the dead cultivators and tried to pry one open. None of them opened up for me. They didn't seem to budge or move. Disgruntled, I tore the red dress of the crimson-wearing cultivator and made a bigger pouch that I gathered all of the pouches in. I looked around some more but didn't find anything of interest. Nothing was here but old broken vases withered vines and mold. Yet my eyes gleaned onto something, a small green book with golden engraving was on the ground almost fully covered by the ash of one of the cultivator's remains. I went to the book and hesitated. Was this what they came here looking for? My curiosity outbid my sanity and I grabbed at the book. Almost instantly my mind went blank then a surge of golden writings imprinted themselves in my mind. Life and death, all handled by the hands of the mighty. Yet life begot death and death begot reincarnation. Life can be saved, and death can be spared. For in medicine, there exists poison, and in poison there exists medicine. I had no idea what these writings mean but one thing was certain. Under this passage, a sentence was written that made me shudder. Poison God's Heritage. Cultivation Manual. Almost immediately, my excitement dulled. There was no way I could use this. I was not a cultivator. Perhaps I could sell it to get a good elixir. I decided to flip one of the pages to see what was in the book and lo and behold. Fate has not given up on me yet. To cultivate the poison god's technique, one must first severe his meridians. The meridians are the base of all spiritual cultivation path. But the poison god's technique is a path like none other. It doesn't need spiritual meridian, but poison meridian. Seeing as you have the ability to read through this book, then you have survived the bone and body grinding poison. Your shattered meridians are unfit to use this manual, but once the bone and body grinding poison penetrates through them, it will mold them, refine them, and make them into poison meridians. You will be able to cultivate energy unlike any other a spiritual poison energy. Consuming poisons will be your way of cultivating. Building a strong cultivation base depends on the quality of the poisons you have consumed. Seeing that you are my one and only disciple, I have left you a gift. It is the pool of bone and body grinding poison. Consuming it will establish a good cultivation base, and then you can go and venture in the world to find more poisons to consume so you can increase your cultivation. After reaching certain stages, normal poisons will not harm you but rather benefit you. And even deadly ones that could turn a cultivator to ash will be like a fresh breeze to you. However, this comes at a grave cost. You have to be smart about what you consume, as your body cannot sustain the top grad poison and they could still kill you if you eat them. Lastly, you are going to die. This is a fact, know it, live with it, and fear it. The bone and body grinding poison will destroy you unless you control it and morph it intelligence your own poison and then use it to kill your enemies. But that is not all. To learn the poison god's technique, you will have to live with a frightening secret. This technique will help you become stronger, younger, faster, 
and more powerful than anyone. But you are against the clock. This manual is a curse as much as it is a blessing. You are urged to rise in your cultivation. You have one year to reach qi condensation. Here is the method you will use to circulate your poison qi. Under that text block was a picture of a man, sitting in the lotus position and four points were marked in his body. If I remembered correctly these were one of the four points that the cultivators destroyed to those homeless looking people then threw them in the pool. These are locations for meridians. And I needed to circulate this poison chi thing exactly as the manual shows. There were also tons of details on how to circulate energy and even a skill that can be learned once I reach the first level of chi condensation. I have looked all my life for a way to cultivate, yet I failed many times over. I cursed the fact that I was unable to cultivate, and that my meridians were shattered. Yet, even those shattered meridians came back with a gracious gift, they helped me survive death, and they also helped me start on the path of cultivation. I looked at the manual and sighed, this might not be the best start in a cultivation world. Where other people got a magnificent mentor, a great treasure, or a godly cultivation skill. All I have gotten was an old hunched back body filled with pustules and disgusting tumors. And a cultivation manual that will kill me if I didn't reach the next stage within one year. Not the best start, but definitely beats dying right here and there. I was given a chance, and I'll make sure to make the best use of it. Chapter 8, First Step Four days had passed. I have yet to fully understand how to circulate the poison spiritual energy in my body, but I had learned a few things. First was, I no longer felt hungry, strange as it might be. I am satiated almost all the time. Also, I didn't go to the toilets even once. Strange as it might be. It's weird, but I could live with that. Also, the poison pool. It. Tasted sweet. The poison that had killed so many people, tasted like the purest and most expensive champagne I have ever had in my life. And with every cup I downed, I felt the pain in my broken leg lessen, and the buzzing in the eye I could no longer use subside. Healing properties? Perhaps, but it is poison. Bone and body grinding poison. I reread through the manual, it didn't have anything beyond the method to reach qi condensation and I didn't have any mentor to show me the way, and no way to leave this place unless I become a qi condensation stage cultivator. I hope. With no other objective, goal, or purpose than surviving, I sat down and continued trying to circulate the energy. Trial and error, at first I had no idea on what to do, I tried to picture how the meridians should be, then. Then nothing. How the hell was I supposed to circulate energy I don't even sense? I was lost and had no idea how to go on about this. For all those main characters, circulating energy was as easy as breathing, why is it this hard for me? Perhaps I never interacted with this energy and don't know what it even feels like or if it is here or not. Days went by, as I tried different methods, meditation, dipping myself in the pool, that one was dumb. The poison, when drank tasted amazing, but when dipped in it, it felt painful beyond belief. I regarded leaving that option for later trials and tests. Time kept going, and thankfully hunger and sleep were no longer on my conscious, I was fully dedicated to finding out how this circulation works. As I was moving around the cave, for the millionth time now, I stopped and looked at the pool. Something about the poison in it was rather inexplicable. The liquid moved, it was not sentient, but it moved. It didn't have a shape, it just changed itself into random forms that made no sense, but overall, the entirety of the poison moved in a circular way around itself. This was not a living thing, but it still moved. It had a rhythm that it followed. Water in a pool would not move, and would soon become rancid still water. But here, it moved without pause and following a strange rhythm. I sat down in front of the pool and closed my eye. The other one apparently was forever close. I couldn't sense the energy in me, the one that needs to be circulated to become a qi condensation cultivator, but if my hunch is right, the secret lies within this pool. 
the way the poison moves, could I make the energy within me move like that? That is of course a question that can only be answered I I could even feel it. While I was thinking up some random stuff, I felt a tingling in one of my meridians. Soon, that tingling became more and more apparent. Then it transformed into a thin line that spread and linked itself to another meridian. Then to another and finally another, then returned to origin. It made a full circle. And the energy that I have never felt before became clear and bright as day. A powerful surge of energy began rotating following that path and it continued, moving, circulating, and rapidly accelerating. This is it. This is how to circulate energy. I thought and then immediately coughed up a pile of black sludge. I kept on coughing up that disgusting sludge. It was rancid, black as charcoal, and tasted worse than a camel's dung that's been mixed with fish guts on a hot Sunday morning. I sat down, thinking about this stuff, impurities? If I remember correctly, these are human impurities, the way to ascend to immortality, one must remove all that relates him to the mortal world starting with food and other worldly natures and needs. I doubt that I became a chi condensation immortal, this was too easy. Perhaps I just started on the path to circulate the energy or poison energy as the book said in my body. I definitely have more to do and need a lot more time to become a real cultivator. Days went by, and it was hard and difficult to enter that state where I could link the meridians and make them circulate the energy within them. But I understood later that I needed to be in a semi absent minded state. As the state, you're in when you're half asleep. Just about to doze off, but still aware of what was happening. I needed to remain in that state constantly. It was hard at the beginning but became much easier as time went by. Energy coursed through my meridians, and for every couple thousand of circulations, I would cough up a big pile of disgusting stuff. After a few days of doing the same thing, I felt my head turn blank, I was about to pass out. It was the same as if I was in an extreme hunger scenario. And in that instance, that pool, looked extremely appetizing and delicious to eat from. I moved almost mechanically toward it and took a handful of the purple liquid. I drank it, and it went down like honey water on a hot summer day. I began consuming more and more of the poison not even caring for the corpses that have been buried in it, and the mix of flesh with the disgustingly looking and horribly smelling poison still tasted heavenly whenever I drank from it. After a while, and having felt full, I continued my practice, continued rotating the energy and cultivating. The feeling of being stuck in a treadmill, unable to move forward in my cultivation soon dispersed, and I felt a slight increase in the energy rotation of my meridians. That slight increase soon began to accumulate, accelerate, then as if it was a snowball effect, the rotations turned faster and faster, until I felt that I was about to explode, and not in a bad way. A wave of energy shot out of my body and all over the cave walls, it rebounded everywhere, shaking rocks and pebbles away from me. I took a deep breath, and honest to the mighty, it felt like it was the first breath I had ever really taken. The pain in my 80-year-old joints had disappeared. The broken leg had not healed perfectly but I could only feel discomfort in it instead of bone-piercing agony. I began sweating, not your regular sweat, but an oily, black, disgusting one. I've been in this damned cave for far too long and there is no clean water source. Hell, I don't even know how I managed to survive this long without water. I suppose the poison and the cultivation have something to do with the body's needs. The book, the green book vibrated in my chest, I had placed it inside my robes so I wouldn't casually leave it somewhere and forget about it. I'm old. It happens sometimes. I opened the book and there were few more lines written there that I didn't see the last time. Equals equals equals, being able to read this line means that you have successfully reached the lowest tier of chi condensation. Since you're able to read this, your cultivation level has increased. As a disciple of my arts, you must not have ever been in contact with cultivation, as it needs a fresh sprout that has no meridians unlocked to learn it. So I shall impart upon you some wisdom that will aid you in your path. 
All cultivation levels are divided into nine levels. And these nine levels are also divided into three distinct layers. Bottom, middle, and peak. For the qi condensation, it is composed of the following layer and sublayers. Bottom low, bottom medium, and bottom peak. Middle low, middle medium, and middle peak, high low, high medium, and high peak. Having reached the bottom low qi condensation, your lifespan has increased by two more years. Your urge to reach the bottom medium qi condensation level within these two years. If you were a regular cultivator, you would be able to sense the world's qi, the spiritual energy, and start absorbing some of it to circulate your qi, though it is the most obvious of methods to increase your cultivation, it would take a great deal of time. Some skip this by consuming pills that can generate a good deal of spiritual energy and is much purer and can be rotated with these. Yet, this method is not without fault, it will make the foundation unstable if one was to rely on pills to increase their cultivation and will create a subpar cultivator in the future that will be stuck and unable to ascend to further heights. The pills made by alchemists may be good, may be great, but they can never match the perfectness of the world's energy. As for you, disciple of mine, you are treading a path only I have walked through before you. Our path is lonely and full of danger. To increase your cultivation, you'll need the energy of plants, poisons, and bugs. It is the same as consuming pills in a sense, only these pills are not made by man, they are made by the heavenly will and are as pure as nature's own energy. Here is the diagram of the only spell you'll be able to use once you stabilize your cultivation at bottom low qi condensation. Under the text was a picture of a man rotating his energy in the same manner that I have done while meditating, the only difference is that, instead of continuing the rotation to increase their cultivation, they channel it toward their mouth and breath out of fog. I sat down and began mimicking the picture of the man in the book. After a few rotations of energy, I willed the energy to leave through my mouth, and a substance green as a liquor bottle shot out from my mouth and transformed into a small puff of green smoke. The green smoke touched against a cave alga and it instantly withered. Poison breath! I exclaimed. I just learned my first new spell in a cultivation world. Chapter 9 Deadly Encounter I continued using the same spell, to understand my limits and how far I can go with it. The drawback, and the number of times I could use before I'm fully exhausted. So far I understood that I could only use it three times in a row and a fourth time after half an hour. But if I were to use it for the fifth time, I would drop unconscious. So, five is the limit. At least right now and at my current level. If I were to increase my cultivation, I would undoubtedly increase my tolerance and my ability to cast more of this spell, and perhaps even more potent grades of it. This all, on the premise I increase my cultivation and judging from the size of the pool, I guess it will be difficult. The pool that I had consumed poison from had its size already decreased by half. Thanks to me, drinking from it constantly for sustenance and supplementing my needs of poison chi. Days went by, and they were boring, utterly and completely boring, nothing to do, a dark cave that had no secrets, believe me, I checked by turning every rock and stone. There was nothing left, even from the corpses of those poor people. Besides a few coins, there was nothing left in the cave. The pool's level dropped further, with each day, I would consume a large portion of it until a month went by and the pool had nothing else to give me. I found out that I was able to ingest larger and larger amounts of the poison without it actually increasing my cultivation to a visible degree. But the totality of the pool ingested had actually increased my cultivation level by one layer. A few days ago I had achieved qi condensation bottom medium level. Yet, sadly, I found nothing of interest or new on the poison god's book. Perhaps I need to reach a higher cultivation level to unlock something new. Yet without the bone and body grinding poison, there was no way for me to supplement my poison qi, and thus no way for me to increase my cultivation. It's time to leave this cave. I packed everything I could and found it useful. There was nothing much actually, 
just the bags of the people who brought me and those poor fellows here, anything else had completely melted by the purple poison that I haven't seen lurking around here ever since the first day in this cave. I walked up to the cave's caved-in entrance, large boulders were holding off the exit. No way for me to leave but a small crack that was leaking some of the world sunlight. Getting out from that small crack was impossible. So I needed to find a way out. I checked the rocks and noticed that one small rock was actually supporting the majority of the rocks surround it, I was lucky. Because if I had to physically move these things, I would need to at least be 40 years younger. I was no longer as nimble or as strong as I was before, so if I were to move that small stone out of its place, the rest of the boulders will definitely come falling down on me. I wouldn't want that right now. I remembered seeing a spear somewhere around here, it probably belonged to a hunter that was brought with us to this place. It could do well if I were to use it to move the rock from a distance. I went back to the corpses of the poor men, women, and children, and among them was a spear and a few old or barely functioning hunting tools. I took the spear as I had no use for the rest of the stuff laying there, nor did I have the proper knowledge to use them. A bow in the hand of an amateur is as useful as a sledgehammer to a toddler. The spear would do perfectly. Once I had the weapon in hand I headed back to the entrance, then began poking, and poking, and poking at the small rock. Using too much strength would probably strain the spear and make it snap. So I had to be careful. And thankfully, after a long time of poking, the rock was dislodged, and the rest of the boulders followed as they rumbled down crushing each other and rolling on the ground. Thankfully I was far away that none of the rocks managed to hit me when the whole thing came down. The small crack in the formation opened up and became wide enough for me to squeeze myself in. And so I did, as I had to climb the now unsteady rocks, and get out of the cave. A cool breeze assaulted my face as I took note of my surrounding. A forest, the same forest that my kids had thrown me into was what met my eyes. And only then when I finally was forced to face a situation that I was hardly and intimately trying to avoid. I was betrayed by my own children. There was no justice in this world, cruelty, and unfilially, my sons have betrayed me. Sons that I have neglected, but still they are my sons, though I was not the best parent, I definitely was not the worst. I did not deserve what happened to me. I had given them all I could made their lives worry-free, yet greed still managed to eat at their hearts, they threw me off to the wolves so they would claim my fortune to themselves. Should I go back to Lucid Spring? A question that I immediately answered, I have nothing left there, and turned to have the sun against my back, and headed deeper into the forest. There was no way for me to return there, and even if I did, what good will that bring me? I finally made it to a cultivator, I have finally achieved my dream, why should I be tied to them? Why not find how this world of cultivation works? With a spear in hand, and a pack made of the clothes of one of the cultivators I moved ahead. There was nothing to look for behind me, and only one way forward. So I limped forward. Yes, limped, the damage to my leg was still severe, the bone definitely did not heal right. My left eye is botched, and I could no longer use it and the large and gross number of pustules on my entire body made me no different from a monster to any man's sight. I was disgusting to look at, disgusting to speak to, disgusting to even have in one's presence. But that would work perfectly for me. The more unsightly I am to people, the less likely they will bother me. As I walked through the forest I felt at a loss, the sun was going down, and the forest began to turn colder. Hunger and thirst were the least of my worries, as a beginning cultivator, I understood that my body no longer requires food and sustenance, but that is of course rather situational, I would die of hunger eventually, but I have a better tolerance to it than any normal human. The worst however was the fact that I am not in any form or shape, able to protect myself from monsters or demonic creatures if I were to face one of them. Parties of my lucid spring city have died here in the forest as they ventured to find materials here. They were strong and powerful hunters that came in groups, 
yet sometimes none of them were able to survive. I on the other hand am old, weak, limping, and with a spirit that I mostly could only use to support myself to walk. Encountering one of these monsters would mean my immediate death. Yet, it shouldn't be that easy to meet up with one of them, at least from what I remember, demonic monsters are a rare sight. Or so I thought as I heard a loud growl behind me. Turning, I saw a shadow of a creature, it looked feline, and only the brimstone colored gems of eyes it had were bright enough for me to see what it was. It easily moved around me without making a sound, its steps were light. Moonlight shone from between the cracks between tree leaves, revealing a spotted leopard shaped creature, only it was the size of a horse. He had two saber toothed fangs that were barred at me. They reflected some of the moonlight and showed me how dangerous they were. The leopard pounced. Chapter 10 Realization and Objective In my current condition, never mind running, not even a simple walk was possible, with the heavy broken leg, and the oldness of this body's bones, I was nothing more than an appetizer for this creature. I had no way to escape, no way to beat it or hid from it. Death has raised its scythe and is preparing to lob off my head with it. Death? How many times has it been now, from the time my kids threw me to my doom, to the cultivators who drowned me in a pool of poison, to the suffering I had at the hand of that poison? Death is easy, and it comes cheap, and now I was going to die, in a random spot, in a random place, facing a random creature. Death is easy, but at the same time, only those who surrender to it would die without fighting back. I may not be the most courageous of people, nor the bravest, or the strongest, but I had a will to survive, and a goal that I have just began achieving. I'm a cultivator, a weak pitiful, and dismissible cultivator in this world, yet I made it here, with my own effort and I will not forgive myself if I were to lose this life of mine due to some odd and random monster. The wrath and refusal to accept such a meaningless death made these old bones of mine move, the leopard lunged at me only to find emptiness in the jagged and sharp claws of his. The creature growled as it turned, to find me half sprawled on the ground. I had rolled away, only it was barely enough for me to escape from the creature's claws but not enough to save myself from hitting my wounded leg against the ground. Pain assaulted me from all over my body, but I grit my teeth against it. Cry later, fight now. I locked my eyes to the slit pupils of the now enraged predator, it seems that it was annoyed that such an old weak prey managed to evade its initial attack. There was no way for me to outdo the massive strength of such a large feline. But I didn't need to rely on muscles that have long since been weakened, nor fingers that were plagued with necrosis, or my body that barely had enough power to carry itself. I had a weapon and I had to use it. What better way than to use that than now? It's free practice. Correction, it's a practice that if I don't succeed in, I'll die. A grin crept up my old face, and my heart began beating, thumping loud enough that I could feel it revibrating through my entire body and bombarding my eardrums. Adrenaline rush. I'm excited. It has been a while since I had ever been in such a good mood. Come at me kitty. I spoke and the creature pounced at me as I just pushed myself from the ground, aided by the spear in hand to pivot my whole body away from the large cat. I rotated the energy within me, creating a full circle before releasing it in a loud inhale then exhale of dark green fumes that shot out then spread like a fog in a misty forest. The fog assaulted the tiger's nose then the rest of its body then spread along the area. The tiger didn't even notice what was going on. Then came doubt. Poison would need to slowly interact with the leopard's bloodstream before it could actually be lethal. And that could take from minutes to hours to days, depending on this creature's resistance. If my poison was not strong enough to kill this thing then I'm beyond doomed. Still, I couldn't wipe that childish grin off my face. Even if I had to die here, I'll die fighting, I have become a cultivator and all cultivators will one day meet with a crisis. This is my crisis and I have to survive it. The leopard moved forward, yet the moment it placed its foot on the ground it wobbled, then it began sneezing. The creature shook and shuddered as it wretched red disgusting liquid out of its mouth, 
Its hair began to fall and its eyes began tearing blood. The leopard shook, howled in pain, and suddenly fell to the side, motionless as more of the green smoke penetrated through it and ate away at its flesh. In seconds, the leopard husked over, his whole body drained from blood and muscle tissue as it transformed into nothing but brittle bones on skin. It took me a moment to fully take in what just happened. The poison breath I just used, is surprisingly powerful, so powerful that it took down such a large predator in seconds. This poison cultivation is not a hack, it's the real deal, to be able to handle such a large predator with such a lowly cultivation level. I can only think of one thing. Op, I began giggling, I was funny, how far I had to suffer, and it was funny how things had turned but the most hilarious was that I actually have value. And things could actually work out for me in the end. I smiled to myself as I picked up my spear and decided to continue heading deeper into the forest. I looked behind me where Lucid Springs was, then I scoffed, I'm not going back, so I look in that direction. Just as I was about to move, something shiny grabbed my interest. It was a red crystal that became visible after all of the leopard's skin had shrunken and tore. I went toward it and grabbed the crystal, but the moment I did, green energy began evaporating from the leopard's skin and surged toward the hand grabbing the crystal. The energy was domineering, tyrannical, and pervasive, it bore through my arm and continued doing as it pleases in my body. It felt painful, but a small part of me believed that this, whatever it was, was not harmful to my body. Suddenly I felt something snapping, then the world turned white. I woke up, later, hours at least as there was sunray going through the thick foliage. The time was day, and I had no idea of the exact moment, the sun was a little beyond its zenith, so it must be half an hour in the afternoon. Looking around there was nothing different from yesterday, the corpse of the leopard was still lying peacefully on the ground. Something happened yesterday, but I had no clue what. I got up. I got up. How did I get up? I thought. My leg was badly wounded, broken even, but now I'm fully standing up. I removed the robe that was covering my right leg and noticed that the bone that was protruding from it had already mended back to its proper place. Even more so, the pustules on my arm, the arm that I went to grab the crystal from within the tiger had lessened. They no longer were as large as baseball balls. But now, they were the size of peas. Still, they were disgusting to look at. How did that happen? Could it be the crystal? I thought. I pulled out the small crystal, but it was the same as yesterday, no change had happened to it. If I remember correctly, a green overbearing energy had penetrated my hand right after I went for the crystal. Could it be related to the poison breath? It shouldn't be, right? Without anyone of expertise to ask, I decided to leave this matter to undertake later. There was no need for me to worry about things I cannot explain, especially with my low cultivation level, and the lack of knowledge on how this world works. All my life I wanted to become a cultivator, but I focused on that goal so much that I never thought about what to do when I become a cultivator. I don't know any of the monsters or demonic monsters that live in this world, I don't know the geography of this country, nor do I have any knowledge about the powers that rule this place. I need to set a goal for myself and then follow through with it. And my first goal is simple. I need to join a sect. Chapter 11, Encounter As I walked forward, without any visible objective or clearer goal than becoming a member of a cultivation sect, I came to encounter several things on my journey. More monsters, not to say that it was as easy as before to deal with these new types. They were far smaller than the leopard and weaker. But their numbers were problematic. I ended up entering the territory of a lizard monarch or something of the sort as there were hundreds of said critters moving around me. Black lizards with sharp claws hissed and skittered around me. None of them dared make a move, but at the same time, they surrounded me from all over, on the ground and tree branches. They seemed to be expecting something, perhaps a command to attack, as they have yet to show any hostility toward me, except when I tried to move. The closest of the lizard would hiss and only calm down when I stopped. Soon, 
a lizard, far bigger than any of the rest, and probably as big as a German mastiff. Came toward me, its skin was obsidian, dark as the night, and exuded a powerful presence among its peers, they all gave way to it as it walked. This must be the king or queen of these lizards, I believed. Once the larger of the reptiles came within an arm's reach, it slowly sniffed the air around me. Then it shook its head, it began coughing or sneezing, and this enough caused me to worry. If the same happens to it as did to the leopard and the lizard starts bleeding, the rest of its company will come from my throat. And I'll have to deal with their massive numbers. Hopefully, my poison breath is strong enough to take them down rapidly or I'll probably be torn to pieces judging by how sharp the claws on them. Yet, the lizard hadn't sniffed enough poison chi from me to be fatal to it, it reared back, hissed a few notes and the rest of its group slowly backed off and skittered off, disappearing among the thick forest foliage. The lizard king or queen, I'm not a biology graduate mind you, did the same soon as everyone had left. I sighed a breath of relief, there was no need to take a life if one didn't need to, and I had no use wasting another valuable poison breath for nothing. I continued my journey until I heard the sound of running water. There was a river nearby. I headed there to wash up, it has been a long time since I last took a bath, and the stench and sticky sludge I have on me had accompanied me for a long time now. Once I was on the riverbed, I removed my clothes and slowly dipped my battered and disgusting body in it. The cool water soon removed the oily sludge I had coating my body, and bit by bit, the stickiness lessened and I felt refreshed. Still, the pustules and tumorous bulges I had all over my body were a sight to behold. Disgust was the first thing anyone would think of, even me. Still, that was not bad on its own, first, looking like this will keep me out of trouble. No one wants to associate themselves with a creature such as myself, and second, there was a promise in the book that after reaching certain milestones, the pustules will disappear and I would probably regain my former appearance. That is of course if I reach these milestones. Ah oh, crap! I muttered as I noticed something. Fish, floating on the river, dead. The filth all over me or probably my existence was poisonous enough that it killed off a lot of the fish in this river. And this probably contaminated it. I hope that no humans drink from this stuff right now, that would certainly end up killing them. I went back, butt naked to get my filthy clothes. Most of them were torn beyond repair, but these are all I had. And I didn't dare wear one of the cultivator's clothes, in fear that I might meet someone who will recognize the outfit. Simple, it was a risk not worth taking, I'm weak, not stupid. If I were to wear their clothes and one of their sect members meet me, how will I explain it? Or worse, what if I encounter a member of a hostile sect to these robes? A risk that was not worth taking for the comfort of fabric. I washed my clothes as best as I could, removing the sludge on them, and at least had them clean enough to be worn and not look like a low-class beggar. I looked like a beggar all right, but a clean beggar. Once they were dry, I gathered up my stuff and headed alongside the stream. There was no way for me to cross it, as there was no bridge and I didn't want to risk swimming across. And now that I think of it, I should have thought about that before dipping myself into the river, you never know if there is a cultivator crocodile version here in this river. Or worse. Later I managed to cross the river thanks to some protruding rocks I found making a small bridge. Still, without a clear destination to where to head to, I continued marching, for hours. Until the sun sat and rose back again, days went by as I moved. Unhampered by hunger as I didn't feel the need to eat, unhampered by fatigue as I felt refreshed even after all that walking, and never even dropped a sweat. Old and battered as I may be, this still is better than when I was human. A cultivator's life is rather amazing. One day, as I was walking I encountered something that changed my way of thinking. There was a small purple flower on the ground, it seemed to be the only living thing in the vicinity. Decayed corpses of snakes, bugs, and birds were sprawled all around the flower, yet this thing, brimming with life and I felt it beckoning me. 
I walked up to the flower, making sure that there was no monster or demonic creature in the vicinity. I still remember from those stories, that if this thing is a treasure it would mean that it must have a guardian beast protecting it. But after straining my eyes for so long, there was nothing of the sort. I slowly approached the flower and went down to grab it, just as my hands touched the stem, I felt as if someone was speaking through my mind. Burial Purple Petaled Flower A poisonous flower that steals the longevity of the creatures that get too close to it. Once consumed it will greatly enhance the innate ability of the poison breath. The heck? Who is there? I asked, but no one answered, I turned around, to locate the person that talked but there was no one. Could I have imagined it? But if so, would it be this detailed? I instinctively rubbed on my chest, there was the poison god's heritage, hidden behind the layers of my battered robes. Perhaps it's the book. That's the only logical explanation for this illogical scenario. It could be that the book has some knowledge about these flowers and plants. A thought to think about later, I took a mental note of what just happened and ripped the flower along with its roots. The best way to digest the burial purple petaled flower is to make it into pills, but you are not an alchemist and in dire need of strength. Consume it whole, though a lot of its medical value will be lost you will still gain it greatly. Gain what? I asked back, but nothing answered. This book seemed to be sentient? Perhaps. The way it spoke was too specific, perhaps it is not just stating a fact, it also commented on my current condition and how I'm unable to do this alchemy. Another thing to take note of, once I'm in a secluded place, I'll try and understand this book better. I drove the flower, roots and all into my mouth and began crunching it. Scorching hot and at the same time I see liquid dripped down to my stomach. It was rather uncomfortable but no way as near as to what the bone and body grinding poison did to me. This was rather refreshing in the sense, pain makes one feels alive. Or perhaps I have grown masochistic. Nevertheless, the benefits that this flower came with were rather surprising. One of the largest pustules on my right hand outright disappeared once I consumed the flower, and for the first time, I was able to see one small patch of my skin, that was not contaminated with pustules or tumors. Good good good. Just as I was about to continue walking, I felt the meridians in my body vibrate. I immediately sat down and began cultivating. Rotating the newly consumed energy proved to be far easier than when I did with the bone and body grinding poison. It was simple and it was far faster and more comfortable. The energy rotated at a rapid pace and continued doing so until I felt a sudden release of energy, I broke through. The peak of the lower chi condensation. I hastily checked the book for any new updates, but there was nothing there for me. No news about what to do next. So I sighed and continued cultivating. I needed to have my foundation stabilized, gaining a new cultivation level is good, but without proper stabilizing of the foundation, it will prove a hindrance to one's future achievement. I read too many stories to know that once one breaks through, they have to meditate and cement their cultivation first. I closed my eyes for a while slowly rotating the newfound energy to a new meridian that has just unlocked in my body. Now, the energy I could manipulate, even if it had increased by just one meridian was at least a third more than before. Soon, I felt the world went out of focus, and I was immersed in cultivation. Never sensing when the world turned, and the sun had dipped. Over and over again, days had went by and I was still in my lotus position, diligently cultivating. I never sensed when monsters approached me, and hastily ran off when birds thought I was an immobile stone and perched on my head, only to fall to their deaths soon after. My whole body is poison. This state would have probably continued for a while more as I tried diligently to break through to the next level using the remaining energy of the burial purple petaled flower, but I was rudely awakened when the earth began to wildly vibrate. I opened my eyes and realized that the vibrations were getting stronger, and they were headed my way. Suddenly two people showed up, they flew using two swords under their feet, and both of them looked badly wounded. Chapter 12, Battle of Wits 
One of them, a handsome man, probably not older than twenty, had one of his arms flailing uselessly to his side, and a gruff-looking expression on his face. Vexed. His robes were sky-blue colored and were ripped in several places. He seemed to be indigent to what just occurred to him. The other was a girl, also probably of the same age, a young woman that even when dirt and scum had covered most of her robes and face, she exuded a beauty that no woman I have ever seen had. I was only able to see her for a few seconds, but it almost lasted a lifetime, her eyes were bright, even in such a desperate situation she seemed to be defiant, her face had porcelain white skin, and the rest of her hourglass body only made one wish to greedily have this woman for themselves. I shook my head, perhaps this was a cultivator's charm, or perhaps this is the difference between a mortal and an immortal. Cultivators had more means to gain beauty than normal mortals and this one was, even if an unparalleled beauty, compared to many others she would look plain. Still, I had no business with these two. Miss Yan. Look. Spoke the man his eyes immediately changed to hostility. Let's use him as a distraction, he said then threw something small and round at my feet. A pill? It immediately blew up and smoke came out of it. It stank. What are you doing? The girl shouted and stopped. The boy also stopped and shouted back move Miss Yan. We'll die at this rate, it's our best chance, let the boar king waste time on this abomination. We're better off escaping. You're endangering the lives of others for your escape, that's not the way of our sect. Miss Yan, a genius such as yourself cannot die in this place. We have to leave now, we can amend our mistakes later, but surviving now is our top priority. I will not let an innocent man die for my sake. The woman shouted. What innocence! Don't you see what he is? Such abomination is the punishment of heaven. He must have been turned to such creature due to his evil deeds, this is heaven's way of using us to slay the wicked. Hey, you've been rambling your mouth for a while now, what's going on? And why do you throw a stink bomb at me? Stink bomb? This commoner knows not even of the monster luring pill. Miss Yan, let's go. There is no time to waste. Before the girl could even speak, the trees behind me parted revealing a gigantic boar. The size of him was large enough that an elephant would barely make it to its knees. It had tusks as big as a boat's mast and its fur looked like it was made of rapiers instead of hair. The boar sniffed at the air and took note of me. Ah, shit. I cursed. I can't allow a man to die due to our carelessness. The girl said and put her weight on her sword. The sword flew toward me but the boar was about to attack, there was no way for me to survive this hit. I immediately placed two fingers under my lips and spat out poison breath. Green smoke shot out from my mouth shaped like an arrow then entered right through the boar's open mouth. The boar's attack halted mid-strike and the creature squealed like a pig in a slaughterhouse. The creature began jerking as I moved back and away from the enraged creature. It began bleeding from all of its orifices then fell. Spasming, shaking, and shuddering. The boar died in less than a heartbeat, and with it came a sobering reality. I was powerful enough to survive a creature that caused such damage to these cultivators, but I knew that I was not strong enough to survive an attack from them. A single sword slash or even a projectile attack from any of them would mean my death. I needed not show my weakness here. Oh, it's dead already? Damn, and I even held back a little. I muttered under my breath. This was of course on purpose. Acting up all mysterious is the best way to make people wary of you. The kid seeing this immediately came to me. Stood in front of me and held both of his hands in greeting, even if one of them was broken, which was painful. He shook and shuddered as he bowed his head saying us senior. Junior apologizes for his misbehavior. Hey I goo, no worries, I said as I shook my hand at his face. But really what are two young kids like you doing here? I asked. I needed knowledge, and the best source of knowledge was a person in your debt. If Senior wishes to know, we are disciples of the Sword Spirit sect. The woman named Yan spoke. I'm Yan Song, daughter of Zhang Song, 
a great elder of the spirit sword sect. What about you? I asked the kid. I am Lu Zafing, I'm an inner disciple of the spirit sword sect, and have come with Miss Yu for a mission of our sect. I suppose the mission was interrupted by this little pig. I spoke back. I didn't need to be a mind reader to know what the two are thinking right now as they looked at each other. Little pig. That dangerous monster is just a little pig for this man? Who is he? He must be some powerful figure. But his cultivation looks so weak. Still, we can't afford to mess with him. Also, he is a poison cultivator. We need to be wary or something of the sorts. Oh, good to know. Could I be so rude to ask who Senior is? Zafeng asked. Me? I'm just a small time rogue cultivator, no need to worry about me. So, what do you want with this little piggy? I further cemented my superiority with my words. Yes, we were tasked to retrieve a third order demon core. Until this wild boar king showed up. The boar king, as you must know, is the fourth order, and we can't beat this with our weak core formation cultivation level. Huh, is that so, I replied and pulled out the core I obtained from the leopard. That's a third order core. Replied the kid. You want it? No. We can't take it, we have burdened senior enough. Replied the girl. Why yes, Miss Yen is correct, we would be rude. We'll try and find one ourselves. You're in no shape or form to beat a third order. Just take it, I said as I threw the core toward the kid. Now, if you could. Leave, that would be. Yes senior, junior will not forget your kindness. The kid then drew something out of a pouch he had on the side. It looked quite similar to the pouches those other cultivators had. It was a token. I frowned as I looked at the token, this was a countermeasure for something I hoped wouldn't be true. The kid immediately hesitated and said, I'm sorry, I pulled out the wrong token. He then handed me another one, quite similar to the first, bowed and said, Please, whenever you visit our sect, just show this to anyone and I'll be informed of your presence. A guest, yes, an honored guest at our sect. The kid said and stood up. Thank you senior for your benevolence. The girl said and the two of them took to the skies. Well, that went well. I said as I hid the token under my clothes. I needed a way to open those pouches I got from those cultivators at the poison gods gave. I sighed and headed to the boar's carcass. There was green energy slowly eating away at the remains of the boar, and if it is the same as what happened to the leopard, I'm sure I'll be able to consume it and heal a little bit. What happened there? Yen asked. I have no idea, I'm still trying to figure it out, replied Zafeng. That man clearly looked far weaker than us, and he said we were disturbing his cultivation? What a lame excuse. You're right, this place is barren of spiritual chi, what could he be doing there? She asked again. I don't know, he looked like he was in chi condensation level. But to survive in this forest and especially at the rims of the demon mountain, one would need to be at least at the upper levels of core formation or lesser nascent soul level. How is he managing if he had such a low cultivation level? I don't know, but didn't our master say that there are always higher mountain and steeper seas? He could be an old monster you know. True, the way he spoke, how eccentric he was, and how carefree he looked in such a dire and dangerous situation suggests that he is an old monster. But we have no proof of it. Why did you change the token? She asked. At first, I was cautious. I thought he could be just a sheep pouring a tiger's skin. But it appears that it was the opposite. You mean the way he gazed at you? Yes, at first, I wanted to give him a token with a tracker, so I could monitor his whereabouts, but the way he looked at me gave me the creeps, I felt like if I were to hand it to him, I would insult him and nothing good comes out of that when dealing with mysterious people, there was a good chance that he was faking it too but. Yeah? on the off chance he is not, and especially of how he handled that boar, thankfully we didn't cross him. Yes, this is a sobering experience, Miss Yan. I'll take note of it, Brother Zafing. The girl replied and the two disappeared in the distance.
Chapter 13, Benefits Okay, that worked out perfectly, I thought to myself as I flipped the token that the kid Zafin gave me like a coin. This should come in handy later, but for now, it's best I don't use it unless I need to. I moved to the boar king's carcass and placed my hand on it. Once again there was that green energy coursing around the carcass of the boar. It came rushing through my arm, climbing and penetrating deep within the skin. It bore through and made its way to my meridians, then the energy began spiraling and controlled spins, aiding my cultivation. Some of the soreness of my body disappeared. The pain on my leg had completely dispersed. And now I was able to walk with utter ease. My back no longer pained me, and for the first time in 80 years, I was able to walk in a straight manner. Old age gave me a slightly hunched back, but now it was gone. Still, the disgusting tumors and pustules on my body were still on, and to get rid of them I'll need to harvest more of this green energy. I continued walking randomly, as I thought about my next course of action. I can join a sect right now even if I miraculously find a way to do so. Simply because I am not strong enough nor weak enough. An old man such as myself would be a strange presence in a sect, especially with my low cultivation level. Yet, if I don't join one, I will be unable to understand how this world of cultivation fully works. I'll need a method to join a sect and not draw great attention to myself. Secondly, I needed to open those bags, desperately. There could be great treasures there that could help boost my cultivation level or martial currency that could be exchanged for items and pills. Poison pills that is. So, first things first, I needed to increase my cultivation level enough to be able to open the pouches. And to do that, I need to find more resources, plants, bugs, or poisons. Which I'm more than certain that I will find in abundance once I go deeper into this forest. Coupled with the aid of the book's internal knowledge of materials and flora, I could understand and know the value of such plants and even if I had no prior knowledge of them. I continued traveling, the need for sleep and food was a great bonus, as I didn't have to think about sustaining myself, the poison energy within me was enough to satiate me for an extremely long period. Days of travel went by, and in them, I gained a good harvest. I encountered a couple more leopards and another boar king. They were easy to deal with, as long as they underestimated me, thinking of me as weak prey, I could easily spew out a poison breath on them and they would die. I harvested the cores and the green energy which reduced a bit of the swelling on my body, but not completely. If I had a hundred pustules, I had currently lost a couple. I still had a long way to get rid of all of these disgusting things off my skin. One day, as I randomly walked without any goal or objective in mind but to gain better strength, I managed to exit the forest, or so I thought. Right in front of me was a mountain so high that its peak was covered in clouds. And around its base was a clearing, that appeared to be separating the forest from the mountain. My whole body was urging me to leave this area, but a light soothing feeling came from the book inside my chest comforting me and encouraging me to keep moving. The Poison God's manual was telling me that it needed me to go forward. I disregarded the urge to leave and against my better judgment moved toward the mountain. Danger and opportunity always walked hand in hand. If there is danger here, then there would definitely be a reward. I steeled my resolve and walked up the mountain. The steepness of this mountain made it troublesome to climb, especially with this old battered body of mine. I had to change direction several times before I found a path that I could walk up without fearing the fall to my death. The climb took me days, and thankfully there were no creatures or demonic beasts that threatened my life as I made my way up the mountain. My only issue was the coldness of the mountain that increased the further I went up, and the dangerous looming sense of death that increased with every step. It felt like a suffocating pressure that was pressing against me urging me to go down, but the more I kept going up, the more I felt that I needed to be up there. At one point the pressure became too much that I lost my grip and almost fell to my death, yet with a desperate flail of my hand, I managed to grab onto a small ledge and pulled my battered body up. I rested for a few hours, 
rotated some of the energy within me, and then continued climbing. Two days later of the constant climb, I managed to reach the source of the danger. A cave entrance that looked like it was punched in by a giant. Bone-piercing cold threatened to turn me into a nice sculpture. Something from within the cave was sending chilling energy that coursed my body and made my old bones rattle. If I were to move forward, I was certain I would turn into a nice corpse. I sat down and began rotating my cultivation base. The poison energy that spiraled within me and through my meridians began fighting against the cold. It was a strange sensation as if I had grown a tolerable fever that heated my body enough to withstand the cold. I stood up and took several more steps. The cold was still painful, but it was much more tolerable. But the further I went, the harder it became. Even breathing turned suffocating, as I coughed up blood. Ice had definitely materialized in my lungs and caused some internal damage. I walked back and sat down, rotating the energy a few times more until my condition stabilized. Spiraling the poison she helped me in gaining heat, but once I stood up and stopped cultivating, that heat soon dissipated against the cold. The only way for me to move forward was obvious. I needed to maintain a cultivation status while moving. A feat quite difficult, but it was the only option I had if I wanted to investigate the source of this cave's coldness and the beckoning of the book. I stood up, and entered a cultivation state, slowly my body heated up, and then I took the first step. I immediately lost focus and my cultivation stopped. I desperately tried again, and again, and again. Several hours went by with minimal progress. Rotating the poison chi within me while walking took a great deal of concentration, but with hard work and dumb stubbornness, I was able to move 10 steps while I still rotated my energy. If I continued like this, I was bound to achieve a breakthrough as my energy seemed on the verge of reaching the medium lower level of chi condensation. And only 5 steps more I did it, and the energy that my body released was enough to cause steam to burst out of my body. Reaching the medium lower level of chi condensation caused my body to shudder and a new page of the Poison God's Heritage book was unlocked. Chapter 14, Teachings You have continued your journey and reached middle lower chi condensation, to which I congratulate you, my disciple. But do not gain a shred of pride or arrogance, because for your current self you are nothing but a speck of dust in an endless sea of sand. You have just begun your journey and I shall be your mentor. In the middle lower chi condensation, your poison chi will be able to course more meridians, and thus, giving you more power and a better physique. The ability to use the poison breath will be increased and you'll find yourself feeling less exhausted with every use. Here is a diagram on how to circulate the poison energy into the newly unlocked meridians. A small diagram of a man circulating the energy, quite vivid and lifelike manifested on the book. The man was sat in the lotus position and began moving the energy through different pressure points on his body. Three more meridians were added to the former five I had already unlocked, making them eight. This would increase my power several times. Because the increase of meridians is not additive, but more like with each new meridian unlocked the base energy I could manipulate and control would multiply. I sat down in the lotus position and rotated my poison chi in the same manner that the pictures depicted. And soon, I became aware of a newfound level of power that coursed through my meridians. Another page opened up, unveiling a new spell. The picture in the book showed a man standing in a martial stance, one hand held vertically in front of him, and the other tucked under his armpit, like a punch in wait for a release. The man then took a forward step and the arm under his armpit extended forward into a forward grab, the fingers opened up then they clawed at the air. The course of the meridians required to do such a move was simple, but it also required the usage of all of the newly unlocked meridians. I was highly tempted to try out this new move, which is named, Poison Tiger Claw. But, there was a great deterrent. I was no longer in the jungle where I could resupply my inner reserves of poison chi by eating random bugs and poisonous plants. I was in a nice cold cave in a high and steep mountain, 
A single use of any martial spell will cost me poison chi that I do not want to be wasted right now, especially when this place is reeking of danger. I gripped my fist tight, shaking away the ecstatic feeling of a new spell, and focused on my current goal. One has to be smart about what they do, and this doesn't only account for a cultivation world. Taking idiotic risks is nothing short of suicidal. Even if this journey itself is an idiotic risk, it promises benefits, but using a spell just for the sake of seeing how it performs, while under my circumstances and without any tools or means to supplement the poison chi I will be using, then wouldn't that be even more idiotic? I began circulating the energy through my newly unlocked meridians and had managed to discover an amazing new fact. The rotation of the poison chi within the meridians became faster than before, and the energy it released doubled up and continued rising. The cold temperature felt less and less dangerous and began to graze upon the limits of discomfort. If I continued rotating the energy this way, I would only feel a slight annoyance from the cold instead of the bone rattling feeling I had before. With this newfound strength, I continued my exploration within the cave. If this was a regular cave the time, I would take to get to the depths of it would undoubtedly be less than an hour, but it took me hours to get to the deepest part of the cave. Mainly because of the cold, it rose on occasions, and even after rotating my cultivation forcefully to help myself from falling prey to the bone-biting cold, I barely managed to survive thanks to the time lapse of the cold increases. It only spiked after every 10 to 20 minutes and lasted for at most 10 seconds. But with every step, the coldness that would occasionally increase would become harder to bear. At the end of the cave was a wide room that you could fit a couple of basketball courts with ease in. Its walls were made of ice, crystal clear ice that was reflecting the scarce source of light that came from the cave's entrance. That tiny source of light reflected enough against this crystal clear surface gave me a clear view of what was happening, and the source of this cold temperature. It was a monster's breath, yes, a monster so huge that I found it amazing how it managed to fit itself into that cave entrance. It must have come in here when it was a baby and now it had grown into such a large creature. Yet how did it get its food? I failed to understand the base behind how this world works, but I didn't bother thinking about it for now. I doubted that it would be like a cultivator, not needing mortal food, but rather the rich worldly energy. Back to the monster, as I looked at it, it was nothing but a big ball of slowly inflating and deflating white fur. It had two massive arms and legs, resembled a humanoid figure frighteningly, and its face was that of an ape. Yes, this was, for the lack of the proper term that the cultivators would use on this monster, a yeti. I took a big gulp. There was no way in hell or heaven if I was going to survive if this bugger wakes up. I turned to walk away, there was nothing here to gain, and only death would await me if I were to accidentally wake this behemoth. Yet, from the reflection on one of the room's walls, I saw a glistening source of dim light. Something was reflecting a tiny bit of light somewhere around the room. I turned to check again and noticed that the Yeti had his arm wrapped around something. It was a rose, a white and sky blue colored rose. The stem of it was made of a crystal clear substance, that looked like ice. And its petals were distinct and apart from each other, making it one of the most beautiful roses I have ever seen. The book in my chest vibrated. Then that old ancient voice sounded in my mind explaining to me what I was seeing. Origenian flower. A flower that is condensed and created from the concentration of purest forms of yin energy. It is said that consuming this flower will give the user unparalleled talent in the way of yin. It is best used by female cultivators. Still, yin can also be harnessed by male cultivators if they wish to pursue the demonic or devil cultivation paths. Another sentence was also suddenly spoken through my mind. My heritage is considered a wrongful path. In the way of other cultivators, poison is insidious, and highly frowned upon, it is a demonic cultivation path that scratches the rims of the devil path. Still in the world of cultivation, basing your decisions on rightful and wrongful will put your martial heart to the test. One must not bend their knees to those above him in submission but rather rise above, struggle, 
and strive to feel pleased about yourself. Disciple of mine, you may be the vilest of the people or the most benevolent, it all depends on how you see the world, but no matter if you are saint or a devil incarnate, it shall crack against the will of the heaven if you are not pleased with yourself. Do what you want to do, challenge who you wish to challenge, and break who wishes to break you. Be overbearing, be proud, and most of all, never cower. For even if poison is the path of the cowardly as these insignificant and utterly delusional cultivators believe it to be, it means nothing if you make your own fate with your own hands. Disciple of mine, take every decision in your life only if you feel pleased about it. Never bow down to anyone, and always let your back be as straight as an arrow. Even against the judgment of the world, if you feel that you are doing the right thing, even if the right thing in the eyes of the world is wrong, then do it, and do it while being proud. Cultivation is not just about the body and soul, but also your spirit. Even if your body looks like that of a disgusting creature that has been scooped from the yellow river of the underworld, your spirit, if never contaminated could blossom into the most divine of beings. Disciple of mine, be courageous, not reckless, be proud, not prideful and be real honest with yourself no matter the situation. If you see a wrong then change it with your own hands. Never let yourself regret anything, and live your life, seeking to better it, and seeking to achieve your goals. Disciple of mine, these words I impart upon you are words that I wish I would have received when I first began my journey. If you honestly work by them, you shall witness great improvement in your cultivation, and at the same time, you shall see the world in a different light. After listening to that sermon, I was honestly feeling touched. The words of the speaker resounded through my soul, I felt that my cultivation rose a bit just by listening to them. And thus, I smiled. Whoever made this book is one of the wisest of the people I have ever known. I looked at the flower once again, there was a risk to taking it, and it involved doing something stupid. But if it is risky and there was a reward to be had, then baking off was not an option. This is what the book master had written, never feel regret for things you feel deserve your attention. And this rose right here, is a prime example. Chapter 15, Inner Battle I crouched down, though I had no idea why I did that, it's not like if I crouched the monster will sense me less. Still, it felt like the right thing to do in such a situation. I continued crouch walking forward until I was next to the monster. Right as when he decided to breathe out. The extremely cold temperature dropped like an anvil being thrown in a deep ocean. Thankfully the foci of the breath were not directly on me, I was a few steps away from it and this with the fanatic circulation of the poison chi within me helped me tide through the icy cold breath of the yeti. I took a big sigh of relief when the temperature rose back to tolerable levels then moved around the yeti's arm, there, the rose sparkled in a glistening light as if it was its light bulb. I wrapped my hand around its stem, and immediately I felt as if my hand had turned to a block of ice. I rapidly pulled the rose and felt a sudden chill running down my spine. The cave's temperature began increasing, it seems that the rose was the reason why this cave was this cold in the first place and it appeared that this sleeping giant yeti was cultivating by absorbing the coldness of the rose, of course, is a theory of mine, as I still have no real grasp of how the cultivation world works, but it seemed to be the most plausible cause. I walked back and away from the monster. There was no need for me to wait around here. And soon, the yeti began twitching, it was about to wake up. I increased my paces and managed to reach the cave's entrance. Only then did the Yeti's eyes fully opened up. My 80 years old brain cells began pumping some juice, deducing the situation. Shit was about to go down, I'm old, not fast, and hella slow. If the Yeti realizes that I took his rose he will come after me and I will not survive. The second thing, the cave exit is smaller than the Yeti, so it will be physically impossible for him to catch me. Yet. This is a cultivation world and the Yeti could have the strength of a Superman for all I know. Meaning that this obstacle might be useless in stopping him if he could tear it apart. Lastly, 
the ice yeti breath was almost enough to turn me into an ice sculpture, so there could be a pretty good chance he has an assault type ability that could turn me to ice if he used it on me. And in that long straight lined cave, a single breath will turn me into a popsicle before I could reach the exit. Several cumbersome variables are working against me, so I needed a way to save my skin. I immediately spat out my poison breath into the Yeti's room, and as he was waking up, he breathed in a huge gulp of it. This was good. I then immediately began running away, or what any other healthier person would call, walking rapidly. Come on, I'm old. A loud growl echoed from behind me, the Yeti had fully woken up, but it would take a few seconds to realize what should have happened so I'm good so far. Another roar came in and the ear ringing sound of stone being turned to dust echoed from behind me. The Yeti had realized that I took the rose and knows where I am. I spat another poison breath behind me and continued walking forward. The exit to the cave was still far away and the Yeti will have a couple of surprises waiting for him soon. As I remembered from before, it took me several hours to get into the Yeti's room, and I had to slow down and cultivate. Otherwise, it would have taken me less than an hour to make the trip. That is if I was slowly walking, and at my current speed, at least a quarter of an hour is all I needed to leave the area. And thanks to the reduced coldness from the rose in my hand it would be easier than before. Yet the looming danger of the Yeti behind me still weighed heavily on my shoulders. It seemed that the rocks were not strong enough to fully stop this creature from coming after me, and they proved to be a minor annoyance to this beast. Suddenly I turned and saw the ape-faced yet looking at me with murder in his eyes. It opened its mouth wide, revealing a sharp row of fangs. I ran forward as fast as my body could, but a gust coming from outside was preventing me to increase my distance, a second later I realized that this was no gust, but the ape was trying to breathe in the air either to suck me in or to prepare for an attack. The poison breath I left in the path had already been fully sucked in, but since I had nothing to lose, I spat another poison breath in front of me that was instantly sucked in by the Yeti. The pulling force stopped and I was jerked forward. I didn't dare turn around, I had no time to waste doing so. I struggled to move forward and then it came to a cold icy gust of wind that was going to spill my doom. The Yeti seemed unaffected by my poison and is retaliating. And I had no way to survive this beast's assault. My body slowly began to freeze over, yet somehow I didn't feel pain. Then soon the breath stopped, while a loud drenching sound echoed from behind me. More disgusted vomiting came following, then a moaning mixed in with the pain squeal of a pig being slaughtered. My body was encased in ice, green colored ice, that soon began to melt. Mixing ice and my poison breath seemed to be nullifying the ice's properties. And at the same time, the rose in my hand began to absorb the liquid ice green poison. The white petals of the rose began changing in color and turned to a poisonous pale green color. The ice soon melted off of me and was fully consumed by the rose. I regained the ability to move my body and turned to witness the corpse of the Yeti. His face had fully melted off leaving bare bone upon half-melted skin on its face. The fur on its body had fallen to the ground leaving a disgusting shape of skin with rare patches of fur on top. The body looked like those cats, the Sphinx cat, that had no fur, and even that bare skin had already melted in several places. Damn, that was close, I thought to myself. This time, I got lucky, and luck is not a good thing. Even if it had saved my life, it showed me that I was not capable of saving my own life by my means. Even if it was by my own hands that I have killed the Yeti if it was not for the rose, the ice would have covered me and turned me into an ice statue. I sat down in the lotus position and circulated the scarce poison chi I had in me. The continuous use of poison breath and the continued rotation of the poison chi to prevent the cold had dried my reserves. Yet, I had no way to increase my poison chi except for the rose. The book had mentioned that it is best consumed by a female, yet dark path cultivators, such as demonic cultivators or devil cultivators also use yin. It would supplement me greatly if I were to consume it. 
I pulled out one of the rose petals and placed it in my mouth. On the first chew, cold comforting energy rushed down my stomach and began rotating along with the poison chi I had in me. It felt soothing and bearable. Yet I noticed that the rose began to wither from the stem. The moment I removed that petal. If this continues the rose will wither and I will lose a great treasure. So, against my better judgment, I shoved the rest of the petals into my mouth, stem, and roots and began chewing. A juicy liquid filled my mouth, honestly, this felt like ice cream. That of course lasted for only a few seconds as my mouth began to dry and the liquid began to force its way into my stomach then into my meridians. The yin chi in the flower began fighting against the poison chi in my body, which was weaker than the origin yin flower. My meridians began to freeze over, and since I had too few of them unlocked by now, the origin yin flower was going to destroy them at this rate. I got back to the eddy, I may have been hasty in shoving the origin yin flower in my mouth, but I didn't do it without a prior assessment of the dangers. The yeti's body was covered with that green energy, the same that every monster I kill using poison breath has. And from the thickness of it, it was by far the thickest I have ever seen. Not even the boar kings I killed combined could match even a fraction of this energy. I placed my hand on the yeti's rotten face, and the grain energy coursed through it and began to fight off the yin origin flower's energy. The two energies began a battle and the battleground was my old battered body. Not the most pleasant experience I tell you. I jerked and spasmed writhing on the ground like a snake that has been impaled with a sharp spear. My lungs were emptied as if I was struck with a sledgehammer in the ground, I didn't even have the energy or breath to scream the pain I was feeling. Some of the pustules on me burst out from the exertion, causing even more pain, which I could express due to the lack of breath. The veins on my body popped out, changing from frozen to hot searing and green infested with poison. The two energies fought off for what seemed to be an eternity. And in rare chances did I have the energy to take a breath that was emptied immediately by a follow-up wave of pain. The soul of me felt like it was about to leave my body, but the stubbornness of it was fighting against the invading force, pinning me and anchoring me back to this world in tormenting agony. Finally, the pain faded off and I was able to breathe anew. Still. I was in no way or shape capable of moving a single finger, so I just laid on the ground, exhausted, until I closed my eyes. Chapter 16, Suspect Several hours later, when the dim moonlight was all that shone from the cave entrance woke me up, a cool breeze, far warmer than the cave's earlier temperature rose me from my unconsciousness. I got up, surprisingly agilely for my age. The old bones on me didn't rattle as much as they used to and the random and awkward soreness had disappeared. The pustules on me had softened up, they didn't disappear though but they became less apparent. I combed my hand over my head, and there were traces of hair there. That shouldn't be possible, the poison pool had melted all of my hair off, but now I have some of it back. The green energy of the yeti's corpse revitalized my old self and gave me a new lease on life. Within me was newfound energy coursing along with the poison chi. They became harmonious and aided each other as they circulated the newly unlocked meridians I achieved a medium middle layer of chi condensation while I was asleep. Sadly, due to my lack of focus, I must have lost a great deal of that power, so if I was cultivating that energy instead of being unconscious, I could have achieved the peak middle layer of chi condensation. Nevertheless, all progress is good, small or little. I moved away from the cave that I had nothing to do with anymore after picking up the Yeti's demonic core, which was purple instead of crimson red, then I had to climb down the mountain which was much faster and easier than climbing it. I do not need to find my way back to anything because I had no place to be right now so my only goal right now was to randomly walk the forest and see where it will take me. I roamed about and continued walking indefinitely and unknowing of my destination. The journey took me several days before I encountered the first people, and they were not a fun company. Five men showed up in front of me, weapons drawn and they had murder in their eyes. Old man, 
state your name and what are you doing here? This is the territory of our purple cloud sect. The first of the bunch addressed me. He was a tall man with a long beard that reached up to his chest. His clothes were purple, probably in relation to their sex name. The group behind him wore the same outfit only theirs had a far lighter color tone. My name is Shen Bao, I mean no trouble to your sect I'm lost here and was trying to find my way out. Lies. How could you survive this place if you were merely lost? Also, you're barely a chi condensation middle layer. I guess I was lucky? I replied. Luck? Nonsense. We have reports of people from the Sword Spirit Mountain coming here and causing trouble. Oh, that must be the two guys I met earlier. I have no relation to this Sword Spirit Mountain you're talking about. Then you have no problem with us searching you? The man said as he pointed his sword at me. I took a deep breath, if I were to be searched by these men, they will discover the token that Kid had given me, and honestly, that's the least of my worries. I also have several demonic cores that will raise questions if they find them. Not to mention the book. Fighting was out of the question, I'm not capable of beating these five. And running, that's not even an option. Suddenly I felt energy suppressing me and pinning me where I stood. One of the men came to men he had a disgusted look at me when he saw my body but he still did as needed and patted me like a cop would frisk a suspect. He has nothing on him elder brother. Really? Check again, no man can travel this forest without at least some food or tools to defend themselves. The man did as he was old, and even got more aggressive with the padding. Surprisingly, for him and me, he didn't find anything. This was both a blessing and something to worry about. Where were all the items I harvested? The demon cores and the pouches from the cultivators and the book? Questions to be answered later. For now, the cultivator removed the pressure and allowed me to speak. Many thanks, fellow cultivator. And to answer your questions. I've already lost my traveling bag a while ago when I was being hunted by a terrifying leopard. Terrifying leopard, you're talking about the silver claw demon beast? Well, probably, but I didn't wait around to check the color of his claws, the moment I saw it, I dipped into a small hole and hid there for days. He tore my bag and got all my food. Then I moved about for a long time trying to get by, I got to eat some mushrooms along the way to fight off the hunger. Then your current appearance? The man said. Definitely one of the things I ate, I wasn't like this when I first entered the forest, I replied. Which was true by the way, the men looked awkwardly at each other for a few moments before the bearded leader said, then you'll come with us, we'll need to ask you a few more questions back at our sect. I took another gulp, this was both good and bad, after all. In those novels I've read, when someone says this exact sentence it usually means torture. But I'm in dire need to enter a sect and know more about this world. Right, I'm more than willing to go with you, but I'll have to trouble you sirs, I'm old and have no means to move. A few of you have swords that you could fly on, and my weak cultivation level is not enough to allow me to accompany you. Wouldn't it be troublesome for you to keep pace just for my sake? No need to worry about that, Tuan Lin, pick him up. The man with the beard said, and the young man who had patted me before came next to me, and pulled out a massive sword from his pouch. Stand on it, he said. And just as I did, the sword rose, and with me above it, it was surprisingly easy to balance myself on it which was probably thanks to Duan Lin controlling the sword effectively to help me stand without falling. Let's go. The bearded man said and the group flew forward, me alongside them. The journey continued for several hours, lasting almost an entire day from the fall of the sun to its rise in the next morning and long afternoon. This made me wonder, the group claimed that the forest I was in was their property, so for such a large forest and for such a long journey we crossed, the Purple Cloud sect is definitely a big one. Also, I am part thankful for the arrival of this group of people. They were not bad people, at least from what I saw, they handed me food and continuously asked if I was exhausted or tired so they could take a rest. 
If this is how they treat prisoners then I had a good chance of seeing some fairness in their judgment. Soon, Tuan Lin, the man that was controlling the sword I was on spoke. We arrived. Looking ahead, I saw a great Torah gate in the distance with the words, Purple Cloud Sect. And behind it was what seemed to be a garden that extended far beyond what the eye could see, and even farther ahead were several mountains making the sect's inner set up. This cloud sect is looking promising. Chapter 17, Interrogation The group landed at the gate's entrance, and soon came a horse carriage, only the horse had six legs instead of four and the carriage seemed to be floating instead of having wheels. There was no one to drive the horse so it seemed to be able to know what it was doing. Get on, Shen. Tuan Lin said. He opened the carriage's door and sat down, there was place for only two people and I was the second, I sat in front of him in the well-decorated, and definitely much more comfortable carriage than the sword. What about the others? I asked. Don't worry, they will go first and report the matter to a sect elder. Then we'll arrive once the elder is ready to receive you. Right, that would do well, I replied and relaxed myself. The carriage began moving along the garden. Plants and flowers, so many of them were there, most I saw in lucid spring, but there were other flowers and exotic roses and plants that I never saw before in my life, this one or the last one. The smell was wonderful and it gave my old self a soothing sense of security and calmness. I could live here for the rest of my life, I said. Oh, why so? asked Tuan Lin. Well, this smell, this serenity, I admire it. I should have made a garden such as this myself. Well, I guess it's too late for that. You speak as if you used to be someone important especially since seeing your lack of fear in the presence of foreign and stronger forces. Son, I've lived long enough to know when someone wants me harm, and I see that you and your sect are decent and wise people. Also, I used to be a city head before I touched upon the surface of cultivation. But it appears that I have done so when I became too old. Huh, a mortal city head that became a cultivator. Still, I doubt that the way of cultivation is limited by age. Though starting young is the best due to the momentum, aspiration, and hope of youth, starting late is not so bad, wisdom is also a good factor in cultivation. Thank you for your encouraging words, you sound pretty wise yourself despite your age. How old do you think I am? Asked Wan Lin. I took a scrutinizing look at him and said, not today over twenty. Tuan Lin laughed and said, Thank you, but I'm 85 years old. Holy hell! I'm younger than you then. Well, technically you are, that's why it felt awkward when you called me son. I laughed at how carefree this man was. Though he looked hella young his appearance was deceiving. Well, it doesn't matter. The real ordeal will start soon. And as I have predicted, the carriage stopped. We had already climbed one of the mountains while we were speaking and I didn't notice it one bit. The carriage worked against the inclination of the mountain and for some reason, the pull of the horse never wavered or changed, it felt like we were moving in a straight line at a steady speed. This is an amazing application of force and gravity, I need to study this further. I shook my head, my engineer self was resurfacing, this was not the time or place. Let's get down. The elder is waiting for us, Tuan Lin said. I nodded and left the carriage after him. Once I was down, I noticed a huge amount of kids, children even, young of age, between 14 to 18 approximately, all doing various chores and tasks. A group on my right was training all together following the movement of a man who seemed to be doing martial arts. Another batch of kids was hurrying carrying logs that easily weighed several dozen times their weight as if they were made of plastic foam. And the latter group of kids was either sweeping the dirt with steel brooms that looked to be as heavy as Mount Tai due to the difficulty of every sweep, or cleaning the magnificent and gigantic palace in front of me from dirt and scum. There were dozens of kids running around all doing a different chore, and none of them were loitering or being too lazy. This place was the place of hard work. In front of us, at the entrance of this palace that was designed like a Chinese castle from the Forbidden City, 
There was a long red carpet and a chair where an old man with a white beard reached his stomach and a bald head. Even his eyebrows were quite bushy and long reaching to his cheeks. Twan Lin, is this the suspect? Junior greets Elder. Twan Lin said as he cupped his fists. That's the second time I saw this practice, the first time was when that kid from the Sword Mountain did that to me, thinking I was stronger than him. Greetings, I said as I cupped my fists at the man. That's a dry welcome, the old man replied. Yes master, but I'm not from your sect, and it would be rude to call myself your junior in this case. Good, at least you have a brain on that head of yours. So tell me what were you doing in our backyard forest? First of all, all of that forest is your backyard? Damn. That's a huge flex. I have no knowledge of what flex is, but from your reaction it must be something good, the old man said as he twirled his beard. Yay, really good. I'm impressed, this sect must be amazing. The old man laughed and said, your knowledge of the cultivation world is really low. To be real honest we are one of the weakest sects in the Zhu country. Zhu country? Aren't we in Longxian County? Oh, you have really low knowledge, but it is understandable if you were immortal. The Longxian County is a small part of the Zhu country, it is the smallest part even. And were the sect controlling it and the county next to it, Long Yu, right, thank you for your teaching, I said as I cupped my fists again at the man. Now, we are at a slight impasse here. The old man said and his humorous expression changed to that of a more serious toned one. A couple of spies have entered my backyard and took something from it. I wish to know if you have any knowledge of it? Now, this is difficult, if I were to answer wrongly, it will be my head that will roll. Now I could easily deny what he said, but there is always a chance of someone seeing me with those two from before, or even worse, if they were captured and admitted seeing me which I wouldn't be too difficult to describe, an old man with ugly tumors all over his body, easiest lineup recognition of all times. No sir, I have explained to the others before, excuse my lack of knowledge because I can't address them as brothers due to my incompetence in the martial arts and cultivation world as it would shame them. But I have not seen anyone in the forest, and have survived there due to sheer dumb luck. Well, I already know that but we need to make sure. Twan Lin, call the punishment hall elder. The old man said. Yes, elder. I had an anxious expression on my face when I heard the name, punishment hall. You seem rather anxious, said the elder. Well, of course, you just called me a liar and asked the punishment hall elder to come here, I'm gonna get beaten if not killed. Then admit that you at least know the ones who stole from us. sir." With all due respect, on the off chance I saw them, which I didn't. Would you spare me if I said I did? I asked. The elder looked a little bit perplexed and said, No, I'll definitely execute you. Then why would I even say I did see them? So you die with your body intact. Sir, look at this, I said as I removed my sleeves and made the elder take a good look at me. Do you think I'll care enough if my body is left intact after I die? You, you make a good point. Yeah, and also I'll probably just get beaten up for no damn reason and unfairly, that's bad karma, sir. You know karma? One doesn't need to have the Tao of karma to know the consequences of wronging the innocent. You speak of Tao as if you are a master. Enlighten me and I could probably spare you. I won't dare claim that I know Tao but the scarce wisdom I know come from the mortal world. No good deed goes unrewarded, and no wrongful one goes unpunished. The world may turn and spare you a day, but when the reckoning comes, it shall smite thee with vengeance. An innocent man's cry of help is far heavier on the heavens than the death of a saint. Good words. Came the booming sound of a man that just entered the hall. I have spent hundreds of years in this sect, and it is the first time I have ever seen such great wisdom in someone so new to the cultivation world. Elder Lu Zin, the hall elder nodded, Elder Hu Jian. The punishment elder nodded back. This man looked like Conan the Barbarian, at least his body, his head had a bushy beard and spiky hair, it looked like a white lion mane. 
his eyes were focused and serious and the number of scars on his ripped upper torso was amazing. He only wore the trousers of the sect and as for his chest, there was a cross suspender belt with an insignia of the sect symbol on the middle of it. Elder Lu Zin, this is our suspect. Ah, the man indeed. You seem to have knowledge and knowledge that I wish to extract. The old man said as he approached me, Boo you it? Nope, not gonna do it. What? Came the reply of the hall elder Hu Tian. Why not? From the look of it, this idiot will probably not last more than a year. He is inflicted with the bone and body grinding poison. The moment he spoke those words, my heart shuddered, I felt like I was about to die right there and then. How does he know of it? The bone and body grinding poison? How unlucky. But, shouldn't he be dead already? I could have realized that he was inflicted with poison, but no one had ever survived and reached such a state. I also don't know how come he is still alive, but believe me, torture will not work on someone who is in constant pain. The state of his body right now is so messed up that all of his nerves are fried from pain, the only thing that would feel painful to this man is a stab through the heart. So. Yes, just let him walk, if he has nothing to say there is no way for us to make him talk, and you don't want to use soul search do you? Nah, I'm not that merciless, also they only killed a few level 3 and level 4 beasts. It's not worth putting so much on my conscience for just that. The hall elder replied while shaking his head. Good then, old man, what's your name? Elder Tian addressed me. I'm Shen Bao. So, Shen Bao, since you're pretty much dead, how about you make yourself useful to the sect? How so? I'll give you an outer disciple's position, in the meantime, you could prove to be useful and get some merit points, this way. You'll probably be able to increase your cultivation and probably have better tolerance to the bone and body grinding poison. I I'd honestly like that. Very good, then welcome to the purple cloud sect. Here, said the old man and threw me a token. Take this and head down, find a deacon that will show you your lodging and give you your daily tasks. Though they'll probably be difficult for you to achieve due to your old age and current condition. You'll have to figure out how to do so yourself. I've relied on myself since I was born, I doubt I will need help. Suit yourself, the old man shrugged and walked away. Once he left, Hall Elder Hu Tian sighed and said, You got a new lease on life, but make sure you use it well. We don't exactly know if you could beat the bone and body grinding poison by reaching a higher cultivation level, but it could slow down the deterioration of your body. I'll leave word with the pavilion elder so he could hand you a copy of the purple cloud movement technique. Junior thanks elder I cupped my hand at the old man and grinned. Good. Smart. Now off you go, the elder shooed me away. And I left. Surprisingly this ended well in my favor, thank god I remembered some of that stuff written in those stories about Dao, it ended up being helpful. Now, off to get my first manual. I said to myself as I went out of the palace. Chapter 18, The Purple Cloud Sect I walked down the stairs and toward the lower building areas of the mountain. The hall elder Hu Tian said that I'll find a deacon here to help me settle and start cultivating and doing some tasks for the sect. That will come in handy. Once I was at the bottom of the stared mountain, which took a great deal of time, I found myself standing next to various and numerous tightly packed houses of students and disciples of the Purple Cloud sect. One of the people moving about had a different set of clothes on him. When everyone was wearing light purple colored robes, the man wore a dark set of robes, like a priest of the Middle Ages. He had a decorated fan in his hand that he constantly opened and closed as he watched over the people. Once his eyes landed on me. The brows above them furrowed then he snapped his fan shut in an audible click, he tucked both his arms behind him and walked toward me. His expression turning from serious annoyance to mild disgust the closer he got to me. He saw the tumors. He stopped a couple of steps in front of me and said, What is the meaning of these clothes? State your name. I'm Shen Bao, and I have just been admitted to the sect. As for my clothes, 
I don't have anything else to wear. Elder Hu Jian said that I'll need to find a deacon and present them with this. I said as I showed him a token. Humph, a new disciple. All right, I'm Deacon Si Chuzan but, you're too old. Still, it's the elder's orders, follow me. And don't get too close, you stink and I fear that you could contaminate me with whatever abomination had plagued you. Yes, I'll keep my distance, I replied and walked behind the deacon. We walked for half an hour until we arrived at a building that towered over all of the buildings in the lodging area. Wait for me here, he said and walked inside. The building had a tower that had four stories and a large lower floor. Disciples walked in and out of the building and they all seemed to have a book in their hands. I managed to get a glimpse of the book's title and it read Purple Cloud Movement Technique. This is probably where I need to get my book. Soon afterward, the deacon came out. He had a set of clothes in one hand and a small pouch in the other. This is your disciple attire, it will change according to your cultivation level and status in the sect. For now, it's the palest of the purple color meaning that you're an outer disciple. Which is not something to brag about. Thank you for your patronage, I replied. Don't thank me yet, this pouch has a few pills. They chi condensation pills, you'll get three each month. Use them sparingly. And there is a list of the chores you're required to do as an outer disciple. Do them all and you'll receive an extra pill by the end of the month, do less than required and a pill will be deducted for every chore missed. Thank you, also I was asked to get a purple cloud movement technique from the skill pavilion. A glint of greed flashed in the deacon's eyes, once I spoke the words. Do you have the required token? Why yes. Hand it over, and I'll see what I can do. Now here, there were two options, I could refuse, and probably end up in a bad situation with this deacon, or accept and see what is going to happen. After all, I don't need this skill, I already have the poison god's book. Oh, wait there is another issue I need to fix. I have no idea where the book went. I gave the deacon the token that Helder Hutian gave me and he immediately tucked it under his robes with enough speed that no one noticed what happened. It seems that he didn't want people to know that he took it from me. This is something I'll need to verify later. Here you go, now beat it, the deacon said. You haven't given me my lodging. Right, you're to head to the cultivation cave 3004. Thank you, I said and picked up my things and left. Cultivation cave huh, it appears that there are not only houses but caves too. I checked the pouch and it opened up, this was of course not a dimensional pouch. It was a regular one with three pills and a piece of paper telling me of the chores I have to do in the following month. There was also a map of the whole sect on the back of the paper. It gave information on all locations of the sect and where everything is. Even the skill pavilion which was exactly where I was before. I should have just walked inside and gotten the skill myself instead of giving the token to the deacon. Nevertheless, I'll have to manage with the stuff I have now, and I'll need to get to the cave I'm supposed to cultivate in. I arrived at the cave in almost an hour. And it didn't take me much effort to find it. There was a barren mountain almost at the exit of the sex boundaries and there were a few people in it. They all looked haggard and exhausted. Unlike the ones that were closest to the sex core. The people on the outer sect were utterly miserable. Most of them had their skin sticking to their bones, malnourished, and were weak. Their clothes were wrinkled, dirty, and cut in several places. I'm gonna fit right in. I walked up to my cave, number 3004. It was a small hole dug in the mountain that had a simple stone bed with a sheep's hide for minimal comfort. And an oil lamp. The cave had a boulder that closed and opened once one presented the sex token to the entrance. Simple, efficient, and enough. I walked in, lit the oil lamp, and used the sex token to close the cave. I sat down and decided against changing my clothes. I needed to take another bath if I were to wear these. I don't smell right. Also, I was wondering where the book had gone, but almost as the thought crossed my mind, a bright light shone from my chest and the book materialized in front of me. 
it opened up and from within the pages came the pouches of the cultivators that tried to kill me in the poison god's pool. Oh, so you're sentient and hid so no one discovers you. Quite nice. I complimented the book then felt that it was cringy and awkward that I was talking to a bunch of paper. Most heroes in those books had companions to journey alongside them, that way the reader wouldn't be too bored with the main character's monologues, but that's not the case for me. Perhaps my story will be a boring one, full of loneliness, but who would write about someone such as myself, I'm not hero material, at least not yet. I laughed to myself at the odd thoughts that crossed my mind, it was only by that that I could fight off the sense of loneliness and strangeness that I was so suddenly thrown into. I sat on the stone bed in the lotus position and began rotating the energy within me. With the amount of yin inside my meridians, and the abundance of the green energy from the yeti that still needed to be processed I had a few days worth of energy to circulate and cultivate. Time passed by, and I had to relit the candle three times. For every time, a full day had gone by. And once I felt that my extra reserves had all been safely rotated and infused into my meridians, I knew it was time for me to leave the cave. I had some chores to do. Looking at the piece of paper, I realized I needed to do a few things. Fill a few vats worth of water, and chop some logs and bring them down to the firewood storage. Also, pick a few herbs from a nearby mountain. The first two chores required a lot of physical strength, which I didn't have. As for the latter, I believe that I would enjoy that. The mountain was already inside the sect, which won't make it too difficult to get, and I have the book to show me the herbs. So, I decided to get the herbs first. Chapter 19, Ming Hao. As I moved about, I received awkward and disgusted glances from the disciples of the sect. Not that I cared, but I needed to be careful. I'm currently wearing the sect's purple clothes, though I didn't have the opportunity to wash up, it's better to have them on than the other ones. Still, their disgust mostly came from what's wrong with my body and most of the disciples decided that it was best to move out of my way. Getting to the herb mountain took a pretty long walk, especially with my condition, but nevertheless it was amazing. The whole mountain had a sweet smell to it, refreshing and soul-southing. There was a good amount of spiritual chi here, too bad I can't cultivate it as it is as useful to me as those chi condensation pills, useless. I walked up the mountain where dozens of other disciples were, they all must have been searching for herbs to submit. But seeing how barren the mountain base was, it was obvious that it was picked clean with all the people coming in here and doing their monthly chores. The herb scent was still strong however, only it came from the upper part of the mountain. Shit, there is nothing here, I'll have to give up more of my chi condensation pills. This is unfair. One of the kids shouted. I turned to look at him, he looked to be a boy around the age of 14, he had unkempt hair and a few bruises on him. Yet his eyes were shining with the energy of youth. He was alone, unlike the rest who were grouped up together. Then why don't you climb up? There are more herbs there, I replied. Old man, I don't know if you're taunting me or you're truly ignorant, but it's not easy to climb up. The more steps you take the heavier it gets, I'm surprised you're still able to stand even with your old bones. I don't feel any of the stuff you're talking about. The kid was stunned and immediately came rushing toward me, though I say rushing, it was more like struggling with every step. S-H-H-H. He said. If you have a treasure that helps you walk up the mountain don't make a scene about it. There are people here who'll do anything to get their hands on stuff you have if it proves useful to you, old man. The kid said. Oh, thank you, I didn't know that, I replied, and so it appears, the law of the jungle is back in play. Now, I don't know who you are, but you must be either strong or have a powerful object to protect you, just don't show it, mention it or even act as if you have it. Old man. At least pretend that walking up here is exhausting. Your mere appearance makes people feel disgusted and not look a second time at you, but the moment you go past the 300th step, everyone will notice you. I looked up the mountain, 
there was still a great steep climb to get to where the herbs were, and if this kid is saying the truth, then I can't draw attention to myself. Kid, tell me, when does this place have the least activity? I asked. Usually at night, when everyone is back in their rooms. Why? Right, do you want to make a deal? I asked him. What sort of deals? I want you to do my chores for me, I stated. Are you insane? I could barely finish my own, and also, I can't even get the herbs. Well, I'll reward you. How about this, I'll give you one pill for gathering the logs and another pill for getting the water on my behalf, and also give you a portion of the herbs I get from this mountain. It seemed like a good deal, too good to be true. I'm more than willing to get the logs and water filled on your behalf for the pills, but why are you offering to give me herbs? It says in the chore tasks that every herb on the mountain can be exchanged with at least one pill, I'm probably able to get a few herbs every time I go up. But I don't have the strength to get the logs and water. Consider it so in good karma. The kid pondered about it for a while. Alright, but you'll have to pay up front, and don't even mention the fact that you could and cannot trust me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have even bothered helping you with hiding your treasure. I smiled at the kid and threw him one of my pills. Take this, once you get all of my logs, come back and I'll pay you for the water, and give you an herb so you complete your monthly quota. Right, thanks, old man. Call me Shen Bao. I'm Meng Hao. I was slightly stunned for a moment, his name was rather familiar and nostalgic. Then I smiled, it's a pleasure to meet you, Meng Hao. The kid climbed down the mountain so fast that I thought he was going to stumble and fall on his face. Yet he didn't lose his momentum and reached the bottom in a few breaths. He then headed toward the woods, to get the logs mostly. I looked up to the sky, the sun was almost at dusk. I'll need to wait here for a while before I could climb up, I don't want anyone seeing how I got to the top so it's best if I take my time and be patient. Hours went by and the sun came down, people started climbing down the mountain one by one, while I was sitting in the lotus position waiting for the mountain to clear up. An hour after the sun has fully set and the darkness of the night covered the whole sect, I decided that it was time for me to resume my tasks. I stood up and headed up. The mountain was pretty huge, and with every step I took I risked falling to my death, but thankfully, with so many people going up the mountain every day, they made a path in the mountain that eased access to the upper parts of it. Soon, I was well in the clouds, and the smell was amazing, the herbs on this side of the mountain were numerous. My book vibrated in my chest, signaling me to take a few turns and twists within the mountain top. There was an herb hidden behind a small rock, I pulled the rock and discovered a purple flower. I didn't know what this was but I yanked it with its roots and placed it in the pouch I got from the sect. I continued moving about, picking herbs left and right, there were so many of them that I couldn't believe my eyes. How come the sect never got up and cleaned this whole place up? It's a wonder. I continued picking the herbs, and at a point, I didn't have enough space in the small pouch, so I began putting them in the book, something I discovered while I was experimenting in the cave. The book can actually work as a storage space. It held the pouches from the cultivators of the poison gods gave, and now the herbs I placed in it was all sucked in. This thing is quite handy. Thankfully I made sure to place all the herbs inside my robes before the book took them in, otherwise, if I had to physically pull out the book, someone might see it. After several hours, I climbed down, there was no need for me to keep picking up herbs. I could clean up the whole thing and that will definitely be suspicious. What's worse is, this mountain could definitely be monitored by some powerful cultivator. There is a huge risk to it also. If there was a powerful man keeping watch over this mountain, they would easily discover me and keep tabs on me, to see how I could get these herbs unhindered by the pressure that Ming Hao had told me about. I was down to the base of the mountain a few minutes before the first sunlight broke the darkness of the cold night. I headed back to my cave to cultivate a bit and also to learn a bit about the herbs I have gotten. Chapter 20 
Troubles in the Horizon. Big chapter ahead enjoy the read, once I was inside my cave, and had closed it and lit the oil lamp. I began by pulling out the herbs from my pouch and from inside the book. The book began by giving me a description of almost everything I had gotten from the mountain. Drowsy inkberry, a flower that can be used to mend minor wounds, and if tempered well can be used on a quill to write charms and talismans. Grad Level 9, Joyful Weed. A sweet-smelling herb that is mainly used to relax the muscles and calm the mind, it is good for clearing thoughts but can become addictive and is highly toxic if not treated before consumption. Grade 9, Nightmarish Sun Drop. Once exposed to daylight, it would cause illusions to anyone close enough to it. A primary ingredient to create the night demon expelling pill. Grade 9, Dot, the list continued on and on. Every spiritual herb had a different purpose and had quite an amazing attribute and ability. But I was interested in a couple of the herbs mainly. The joyful weed, and the tricolor doom flower. The joyful weed was as it said, a drug, and it served a good purpose to me. First of all, it was toxic and would help me cultivate. And the second thing was that it was relaxing and could help reduce some of the pain and soreness I felt usually with my current condition. The second herb was even more interesting, it was the only grade 8 herb in my inventory, the tricolor doom flower. Tricolor doom flower, a deadly flower that sprouts from the corpse of someone who had perished in a yin covered area. The flower can blossom seven times reaching its ultimate form the seven color doom flower. It is highly poisonous, and whenever a person perishes due to the effects of the color doom flower, it will wither and then sprout from his body creating a higher tiered flower. The cultivation level of every victim of the sever color doom flower needs to be higher than the previous person for it to bloom. I made sure to keep those two apart, the first one, I'll be needing soon, and thankfully there were a bunch of them that I gathered. The second one, I only managed to obtain one so I'll keep it for now. After a couple of days, I heard knocking on my door or the walls of the cultivation cave I was in. I opened it and Meng Hao was in front of me, he was sweaty, probably from the exertion of having to carry the logs and water, but he had a good bright smile. I got both of your chores for you, so, pay up. Right, that was our deal, here you go, I replied as I handed him two pills and one of the random spirit herbs I gathered. Nice. The Moon Cecilia. This one should get me two pills, no take backs. Replied Meng Hao. No need, I have better stuff. Good, still, old man, don't dump them all at the pavilion, it will be suspicious, give them one or two at best. Yes, I already had the same idea. Thanks, you can leave now, and I'll be counting on you for next month. I replied. As much as I'd like this, you should know that if you don't do this by yourself, you'll never learn. You need a strong body to cultivate beyond qi condensation. Oh, that's something I didn't know. Man, it's all in the movement technique, I heard you got one. The deacon said he'll procure it for me. That asshole. In your dreams, he'll probably hold your token hostage and delay until you do him favors. You should have handed the token you got yourself. Ming Hao said and left. I thought about what the kids said for a moment then it made sense. I guess it's time I visit the deacon. I gathered the herbs and placed them in my book then moved toward the pavilion. Just as I got to its doors, the deacon came rushing towards me. You, Shen Bao, what are you doing here? He asked. Suddenly I noticed all the people walking in and out of the pavilion stopping for a moment, they wanted to witness the scene. I'm here to submit some herbs for my monthly quota, I replied. Eight herbs? Spiritual herbs, you have some? Let me see. The deacon eagerly asked. I frowned for a moment but still pulled out the pouch he gave me. The moment he saw the two plants inside the pouch, his eyes widened then immediately he feigned uninterest. Those are just common weeds, they are worthless. Let me take care of them. Come back when you find real spiritual herbs. Oh? Useless herbs? Yes. Very common stuff with no spiritual energy, now move away, 
and just let me take care of this trash. His hand reached to my pouch. One of the kids muttered, so overbearing, the deacon is trying to cheat the old man of his treasures. I pulled the pouch away and answered, I beg to differ, I mean, drowsy inkberry is useful to make talismans, not to mention the nightmarish sundrop and its uses. Uh, no, you're mistaken, I told you these are just common herbs. I find it strange. Shouldn't you have at least better knowledge than a mere outer disciple who just started in this sect not even a month now? A loud booming voice sounded from behind me. Turning, I saw a man, wearing the same type of clothing that senior brother Duelin wore. A darker shade of purple, and inner disciple. This junior dares not offend senior brother Han. But this is a matter of the outer sect. The deacon replied as he cupped his fists. I don't give a rat's ass about the outer sect, all I'm interested in is, how did this outer disciple know of the proper name and use of the drowsy inkberry? It was in a subject for the receptarier's exam. And it's a hard and difficult plan to find not to mention have knowledge about. So it piqued my interest. If it's hard to find, wouldn't that suggest that it's not possible for him to have this plant, and it could only be a normal herb he found laying about? You're saying I wouldn't know of the drowsy inkberry? Are you questioning my intelligence? The same kid that murmured before chuckled, the deacon is in for a beating. No. Not at all. I'm just saying that there could be a possibility of mistake. Then how about we take this to the pavilion elder? I'm sure he'd like to know about this. Well, this seriously blew out of proportions. I mean, I knew in cultivation stories things tended to get ugly fast dot but it's like it's ingrained in these people to make a mountain out of an ant. I don't think we should bother the elder with such matters. The deacon replied. But I insist. Came the reply of the inner disciple Han. Then the elder disciple placed his hand on the deacon's shoulder and guided him toward the hall. He smiled at me and nodded for me to follow. And so, I did. Sighing along the way, kids nowadays make things really troublesome, I could have handled this myself. As we entered the pavilion, I had to take a moment to take everything in. The whole building was well decorated with old paintings and incense. The reception hall had an enormous shelf full of books behind it and the whole room was decorated in golden balls that hovered close to the ceiling lighting the whole thing as if it was daylight. Then came the stairs that led to the upper parts of the pavilion, to its upper levels, and probably to where better stuff was kept in storage. Elder Yan. Called the inner disciple. And from behind the reception desk that I thought no one was behind, came a small man. Yes, not a man afflicted with dwarfism, he was just a small man, not bigger than a ten-year-old. But he had a white beard and a cylindrical hat over his head. Both his arms were tucked behind his back, and his eyes were almost close. His wrinkled face looked like a plot of land that hasn't had a drop of water in years. Yes, what seems to be the problem? We come to appraise a few herbs a fellow outer disciple had found, but the deacon insists, based on his great knowledge of spirit herbs that the outer disciple only has trash in his hands. The elder frowned, the whole matter didn't seem worth his attention, but since this was an inner disciple in front of him, he had to give him I always hated this expression face. Let's see, replied Elder Yan. He took a single glance at the pouch and immediately said, this is clearly drowsy ink berry, why is the deacon saying it is not? The deacon's face turned white as a sheet as he started stuttering. Then the senior brother came in to reprimand him, I heard that something like this keeps happening here. So I came to inspect, I never believed that the deacon the sect has placed to manage the problems of the outer sect is such a debauched and heartless person, I have several other complaints against him, stealing the allocated pills taking other cultivators' tokens as a hostage, and allocating caves for whomever he likes against the sex rule. Is this true deacon? asked Elder Yan. The deacon in question began stuttering unable to reply. As much as I don't wish to interfere in this case. But honestly, this deacon has been acting like a dick since I got here. He also took my token, 
the token El Rahutiam gave me to get the purple cloud movement technique and never gave me the technique. Is this true? asked the elder, this time his voice was deeper. Wrathful even. And no. I already had his book prepared, he took it. The deacon lied. Then, we can easily check the records. The elder replied. Soon after he checked the record his brows rose up and he spoke saying, How come your name comes up here more than anyone else, you've been taking many things from the pavilion, on behalf of others. Is there any long who here? asked the elder. Yes, it's me. It says in the records you have taken a lower mantir weapon. Where is it? I, I had never taken such a thing. Actually, this is the first time I entered the hall. Hum, is Yuzan here? The elder asked. Why yes, I'm here. Replied a timid looking girl. You took a lower mantir sparring glove? No dot I have not. It seems that the deacon has been using the tokens of the outer disciples and exchanging them for items for his own. Look at his gloves. They are the same as the ones that were taken from the records same as the boots, and a calming ring. You took the outer disciples' contributions and made them your own. The elder said. That's a big oaf. The deacon then immediately slammed his head on the wooden floor. I was wrong please forgive me, elder. You were wrong, you'll be corrected. You'll be stripped of all of your rights, and all items will be confiscated. As for your punishment that's not my mission though, it is the punishment hall elder. No! cried out the deacon that was escorted immediately afterward by a couple of disciples. Well, there seems to be a lot of paperwork to be done here to fix up the mess of this useless trash. I'll take care of this. Anyone who has their items or tokens taken please submit a report to me. I'll take note of everything," replied the hall elder. Oh well, then the situation was dealt with rather finely. I have expected to have this whole thing backfire on me, and create a sworn enemy as those mics do. But seems that things will be fine. Just as I was about to leave, the inner disciple placed his hand on my shoulder and smiled at me, old man. I'm interested in how you got the knowledge about some of these spiritual herbs. How about you visit me in my place at the inner sect? Just tell the guards that I sent you. We'll have a discussion over tea. This is not a request. Replied the man. Uh, and here it comes, I should have not jinxed myself. Shit. Not a request? What does that mean? I asked. It means that you have to come. The inner disciple said. Is there any rule in the sect that says I have to follow what you say? I asked again rather sternly. The man hesitated for a second, this was probably the first time he was ever told off by an outer sect disciple and it clearly shows. Amateur. Now shoo away, I have no time to waste with you. I got my own stuff to deal with. You. The inner disciple scowled. You? You what? Didn't your mother teach you to finish your sentences? What the hell am I supposed to understand from one single word that comes out of your mouth, if you have shit to say, say it. If not get the fuck off of my face. I snapped back at him. The disciple shuddered, his eyeballs felt like they were going to pop out of their sockets, he raised a hand as if he was about to smack me but a simple cough from the elder behind him had the man gather his hand back and snort as he left. Yep. That's one sworn enemy created right there. I don't know if you're foolish or brave, but what you just did was not smart. You antagonized an inner disciple in front of many people. You made him lose face. Said the elder. Yeah, well I don't really care. If he needed me, he could have asked, I don't like threats. It's your funeral. Well, I lived long enough, death is not something, I fear. Thank you elder for your patronage, I'll be leaving to cultivate now. Wait, said the elder and then handed me a purple colored book and a few items gathered in a pouch. This is the cultivation manual you were supposed to get from the deacon, and these are some pills as compensation for the troubles that he created and in exchange for the drowsy inkberry. Thank you, that'll come in handy, I replied and took off with the loot. A few students felt that it was necessary to follow me and they did, from a distance.
Now I know how this is all going to unfold. Too many cultivation stories and you get the whole gist of things. First thing will be, these kids will follow me up to where I live, and find out my cultivation cave. Then, one brave dumbass will decide that it would be smart to assault me, break some bones, kill me, or even worse, shatter my cultivation. And if you're thinking that I have my priorities jumbled up, no I don't. I'm not Hermione, in a world of oh, cultivation, having your cultivation shattered is worse than death. As expected, the moment I got to my cave, a young man, probably the age of 16 along with three others showed up at my doorsteps right as I opened my cave. You, fellow cultivator Shen Bao, I advise you to give up your belongings and count out ten times in apology for senior brother Han. Ugh, another dumbass stepping stone wannabe. You, I pointed at the kid behind the one who just spoke. Slap that guy and I'll give you a chi condensation pill. The kid in question hesitated then said, Eh no, oh, I see temptation. I grinned as I said, then how about three, final offer. The disciple leading the group snorted and said of course he will not just but he was abruptly stopped by a slap in the face. He looked at the kid who smacked him and said, why? That's three pills more than I get for three months worth of hard work. Before the situation would escalate any more, I threw a pouch at the kid who slapped the other guy and entered my cave, leaving them bickering among each other. As I sat down in my cave, I began to do an inventory, some of the items I have on me were useless to use as cultivation material, for me, that is. For other cultivators, this could be handy. Most of these herbs are best used in creating pills that enhance cultivation, heal wounds, and cure illnesses. None of that is of any great use to me. But I could exchange them in a venue for something better. But that will have to wait. I don't have access to any auction houses right now. Another thing, I need to get my cultivation going, I have fully stabilized my cultivation but didn't improve upon it ever since I got into the sect. I need to have a higher level of cultivation if I wanted to unlock the bags of the people who got me in the poison cave, to begin with. Perhaps they have some good stuff on them. But without proper poisons to consume, I can't galvanize the poison chi within me to reach the next level. But the joyful weed can. It's toxic in nature and I need that. But I require a pipe. I walked out of the cave and found the guys still fighting among each other. Anyone has a smoking pipe? The kid who got the pills from me, with a black and blue face from all the beating still flashed me a happy smile as he said, Yes, I can get you one. Let me guess you need another pill? That would be a little too much for just a smoking pipe. I'll get you one for free. Good, I'll remember that favor. And, could you all go and fight somewhere else, you're kind of breaking my concentration. Right, let's go. The kid said and the three others followed him. For a group of people who were on each other's throats, they were pretty sensible. After an hour, the kid came back and knocked on the stone door. In his hand was a nicely decorated pipe. It was long with a small cup-like end, it had a small metallic net to hold tobacco or whatever substance wanted to burn. And it was engraved in silver. It was quite fancy and I liked it. I took the pipe from him and gave him one of the random herbs I got from the mountain as a reward, he cupped his fists at me and left happy. Time to test the herb. I locked myself in my cave and sat down. Then, I tore some of the petals and placed them on the pipe, then used the lamp to burn the petals and light the pipe. I took a drag and started coughing, this was pretty strong, and didn't taste right at all. Something was wrong. The whole thing didn't light up and needed a lot of fire for it to turn right. Ah. I need to dry it first. Damn. That's gonna be a hassle. I mean if anyone were to find this laying around, they would undoubtedly take them. I left the cave and began walking toward the pavilion. The elder there would probably have a good idea on where I could dry the joyful weed. Just as I arrived, the elder perked his eyes at me and said, You smell like weed. Were you smoking? Yes, a bad experience I can tell you that. But how did you know? 
a kid came to claim a smoking pipe from the pavilion also you have a really strong sweet smell about you. You probably didn't even dry them, the smell on you is too strong, and by the way, the joyful weed is toxic. I know, it's toxic, but it's helping my cultivation. Really? After a few days, you'll probably start vomiting blood. But wait, with the bone and body grinding poison, I think that the effect of it will cancel out the toxic traits of the joyful weed, you'll probably get better hits and stronger effects if you don't detoxify it. You seem knowledgeable. We old men always keep a bit stashed away. Would you like to try some? Real stuff. The elder said. If you're offering, I won't say no, I replied. The man smiled and nodded to one of the disciples. You, continue with the inventory, and hand outs of the tokens to the wrong disciples. That deacon made a hell of a mess here. Follow me, said the elder and walked up ahead. The man was really small, almost all the way to my knee small, but he was hella fast. I had to almost jog to keep up with his walking speed. We got up to the second floor of the pavilion and were met with another old man, when he saw the two of us, he frowned at me. Elder Yun, what's the meaning of this? I'm taking this disciple to the upper floor, don't worry we won't access the library we'll just sit at the veranda. Sigh, you found another smoking partner. Yes, Elder Yun smiled. You, what's your name? My name is Shen Bao, I cupped my face at who seemed to be the elder of the second level. If he challenges you to a smoking contest, refuse immediately, you'll make a laughing stock out of yourself. I smiled at the man and said, don't worry about it, I'll keep myself in check. Yeah, you should mind your own business Elder Zhang, I mean not everyone has a shitty tolerance such as yourself. Whatever. The four elder Zhang shushed us away and we left to the upper floors. There were several floors and each of them seemed to have a lot of books and manuals. Cultivation Manuals These are manuals for the disciples who prove themselves to the sect, if they get a proper contribution, they can come and choose whatever manual they like from here to help them cultivate. Why not make this public for all to use? I asked. Only the worthy will earn the right to learn. What if there are kids talented in certain aspects that their current disposition does not show, and there is a manual here that could guide them to be stronger? Shouldn't they be considered? The old man shook his head, that's not how sex work, you only prove yourself if you overcome your weak nature. Even if one has the disposition to become a martial god, is deemed trash if they die early. We're not here to rear and raise chicken. We need strong people who will overcome their weak disposition and obtain the right to gain more power. We will not guide the weak to become strong, the weak has to guide themselves to become strong, and once they are worthy, the sect will not spare a dime to help that weak person become a great one. Sounds pretty convincing, though I may have concerns, still you're the sect, and this is your rule, I replied. You seem pretty estranged to the rules of sex. Yeah? I am new to the cultivation world, so I have different ideologies. I hope I didn't offend you or the sect. Don't worry, I won't rebuke your ideologies, it's rare to find someone with a different thought process, most of the people I know have rigid thinking, it's good to be able to discuss topics with another person, especially if they have different views and opinions, we can both learn from the other. I smiled as I walked behind the elder, I think I like this guy. He is very open and has a good heart. I gotta make friends with him. Soon, we reached a veranda that was overseeing the entirety of the outer sect. It was the highest floor on the pavilion and was a great spot to just relax. There was a small go table with black and white stones and two cushions and a small pot of tea and two cups. A simple setting for a great view. Sit down and let's talk. The old man said and sat as he pulled a small pouch filled with dry joyful weed. This batch still needs to be detoxified. Are you sure you want to smoke it? I have a batch that's pretty well treated. No, I'd rather get the toxic one. Your funeral, the old man replied. I smiled as I grabbed a pinch and placed it in my pipe then started looking around like a fool for a match to light it. 
the old man in front of me smirked and snapped his fingers creating a small red flame that lit up from the top of his index finger, he used the small flame to light his own golden decorated pipe. I frowned, as I looked at him, thinking a bit, this could be the same as using chi to use the poison breath skill. But instead of rotating the energy in the meridians and releasing it from the mouth, he released it out of his finger. I looked at my pustule infested hand and closed my eyes, rotating the energy within my meridians and instead of sending it to my mouth, I sent it all to my hand. It slowly began to glow, I felt like my hand was about to burst as the tumors began wiggling. I then willed the energy to gather and focus at the tip of my finger where it shot out like a laser beam up into the sky. A green powerful laser beam. God Almighty! What the heck! shouted the old man. I I have no idea, I just mimicked you. By mimicking me you created a killing move? I'm not that great of a mentor with the bloody hell? How did you do it? I was still baffled at what the old man was saying and the light from my fingers dimmed enough that it shaped itself into a flame. I have no idea what happened, but I guess it's something to ponder about. Right, well, use that flame first and we'll discuss this over a game of Go, I'm really interested in this move of yours. Yeah sure, I did as I lit the pipe with a green fire coming out of my finger. Chapter 21, Troubles and More Troubles Damn, I lost again, I cursed as I processed the moves. This old man was a monster. I picked up the game of Go when I used to be head of the Lucid River, and I sucked at it at first. But after a few years of playing I managed to become the best in the whole city, people actually made travels just to come and play with me, yet this guy, he really bested me several times now. Yes dot you lost. The man said, but his expressions weren't of someone who had just won. He looked perplexed. How long have you been playing? He asked. A few years now. A few years. I've been honing my skills for hundreds of years, and I could say that among all my peers in this sect, rare are those who manage to play as long as you did against me. I'm impressed with your thinking process. It's just a game. Nothing to be so vexed about. The old man shook his head, you're using mortal moves against me. If you were to use your cultivation, this game would turn differently. I frowned, how is that even possible? to use cultivation in a game of Go. It's rather simple, you see, right now, you're using your brain, your mind, your mortal mind to play. Not the cultivator's mind, your thinking process compared to mine is probably several times slower. But if you were to use a cultivator's mindset to play, you'll start seeing moves that you have not before and discover tricks you have not thought of before. I think I understand but I have no idea on how to tap onto that thinking process. It's not something that can be taught, you'll have to figure it out on your own. It's a kind of talent, and when you're able to use it, you'll be able to see the world anew. Right, I'll keep it in mind. So how about another game? Right, let's go again. The old man began setting the small pieces and we started playing. As we went on, I thought about how he mentioned using the mindset of a cultivator. For me, right now, the proper move would be to barricade a group of his pieces and block his advance, that's the optimal move. If I were to do that, I'll still be on the defensive, unable to attack, and he will still have the upper hand. I need a move that could turn the tables. As Shin Bao was thinking, he never noticed a green nor suddenly beginning to overlap and coalesces against his whole body. Elder Yun was taken aback but he had a bright smile on his face. Another person came from behind Shen Bao, it was the elder of the second floor of the Purple Cloud Pavilion. Just as he was about to speak, Elder Yun gestured for him to stop. Whatever was happening with Shen Bao was something that he didn't need to be distracted from. Yun decided it was time for him to make a move in retaliation to Shen Bao's seemingly reckless piece that was placed in an awkward position without any prior thought or current goal or purpose. Yun continued playing, laying out a perfect defense, but Shen Bao was retaliating with a weak defense. Yun knew that Shen Bao was not someone weak at the game, 
as he had already played against him a few rounds before, so this week gameplay was a prep for something. Yet Yun could never see what. Shen Bao was still immersed in his own world, a strange feeling where whenever he moved a piece he would see almost all the corresponding moves that should follow, and whenever Yun would place his own pieces Shen Bao would figure out what the elder wanted to do. Shen Bao kept placing awkward pieces and stopping Yun's moves with defensive moves that seemed amateurish and unworthy of a good Go player. Yet one piece remained in the table that was still unused, it was the first piece that Shen Bao had placed. Yun was still pondering on how Shen Bao was going to use that piece and began dedicating defensive structures to hold off any pieces to be built around that one. Since the game started, Shen Bao has been focused on the table and never lifted his head up, so when he did, Yun was shaken to his core. Shen Bao's only eye had a green lustrous light, almost like a shiny emerald in the depth of the night. They say that dragons never die. It's a lie. And he slammed a piece where Yun never expected, stopping an impressive chain of pieces and at the same time switching the whole game. The whole board changed and Yun's amazing offensive has completely been broken. Reading the table Yun began to laugh, there was no way for him to come back from this. I resign. You win. That was a good game. I looked at the table and smiled, the thinking process of a cultivator, it's rather addictive. If I were able to use this more often and in a specific situation I could come up with a great many tricks to help me cultivate. I can already see the benefits this could bring me. Thinking at this frequency would mean that I could find the optimal way and method to circulate energy, find solutions out of problems and come on top in every single encounter or dilemma. But there is one little inconvenience. My head began to hurt like a motherfucker. It spun as the world started turning white. Drink this, said Yun as he handed me a cup of tea. A single sip is all I needed to clear my mind and chase the headache away. What's in this? It's a mind southing recipe. Made of a special spiritual herb, it helps calm the mind and restore energy once drunk. Yun replied. Many thanks, I replied. No problem, tell me how was it? The first time you used your mind's true eye. The what now? Mind's eye, mind's true eye, it has many names, but it mainly is a thinking process where you remove the limits imposed upon your mind to momentarily increase your intelligence. Well, it was painful, but I'm sure I'll be using it often. Good, I'll make you an order at the pavilion so you can get the mind southing tea. You should use the mind's eye as often as possible. It too can be cultivated and can increase in potency and power. Some legends say that you could even see the future if your mind's eye is strong enough, but those are just myths. Now, how about another game? Cough. I heard a cough and turned to realize that the second floor elder had been standing here for a while. Elder Zhang, why have you come here? Well, you guys have been here for a while. And I got bored. Right. Then come join us, you'd like a drag? Elder Yun said as he handed Elder Zhang his pipe. Yeah, but don't dose it too much, I'm not that good with the joyful weed. Was, said Elder Yun jokingly and handed the old man his own pipe. I also used mine, thankfully I learned how to control my poison chi and used a small flame to light my own smoking pipe. The three of us continued chatting as the sun came down. Days have gone by, and in them, I would always find time to meet up with Elder Yun and Elder Zhang, we play a few games of Go, talk about the cultivation world and the sect, and also practice cultivation. In these times I manage to reach the peak of the middle level of Qi condensation. My speed of cultivation was thankfully quite high, all thanks to the joyful weed's toxic nature which now I learned on how to dry. My only issue was where to put the herbs so no one would steal them and Elder Yun offered to have my herbs dried in his own abode. The Poison God's book opened up a new page for me. But this one was rather aimed for knowledge, spiritual herbs. And a huge list of them, all of them rank from the ninth level to the seventh. Of which I have seen a small sum at the spiritual herb mountain of the Purple Cloud sect, but the vast majority was so amazingly big that it would take a person ages just to memorize them. But surprisingly, 
using the mind's eye proved to be extremely helpful. It took me two weeks to fully digest the knowledge on the ninth level spiritual herbs, their usage, origin, and method to transform them into a pill. The teachings of the poison god is great as it shows the proper way to become an alchemist, or as the proper name in the poison god's book, a receptarier. Yet sadly I don't have the qualification, I need to at least be in the core formation level and have my core shape itself into a donshan, which is like a gigantic battery where I could keep an even bigger portion of poison chi hidden and ready for use. The best way to describe it would be that the donshan is an elusive organ of sorts, it doesn't exist in the realm of the physical. But more on a spiritual level, it's an organ that connects all of the meridians and harnesses the energy that circulates through them and saves it inside it. Breaking through to higher levels of cultivation will require this donshan to take several and different forms. Which I have no need to know of right now, as I still need to reach foundation building before I achieve core formation. Once I finished with my studies, I headed out, it should be time for me to hang out with Elder Yun and Elder Zhang. But just as I came out, a heavily beaten Ming Hao was unconscious at my doorsteps. I crouched down and held his head from the back, hey, kid what's wrong? Ming Hao's eyes were out of focus but they locked on to me for a moment, Senor Disciple Han. He, And immediately, the kid fell unconscious again. Shit. I cursed as I picked up the kid then took him to the pavilion. Chapter 22, Creeping Demise Once I got the kid to the pavilion a couple of older disciples came to carry him, they noticed the injuries and assured me with the following words we'll take care of him, Shen Bao, Elder Yun requests your presence. I'll go check with him, please take good care of Ming Hao. We will, replied the disciple and left with Ming Hao for treatment. As I walked up the stairs of the pavilion and interrupted by Elder Zhang, who I became a regular and daily guest of his. I saw Elder Yun waiting at the veranda where we played Go every day. Junior greets Elder Yun, I heard that you need me. Yes, now that you've reached the peak of the middle stage of Qi condensation, you've earned the right to pick a weapon from the armory of the pavilion. Thank you, but I'd rather wait for that. I have some concerns. I know, that's why I asked for you, go pick the weapon. You'll need it. Why? What's going on? I asked. The old man sighed and replied, You've made Han lose face, and with our daily encounters and talks I come to understand that the world of cultivation is still too fresh for you. So you don't know the consequences of your actions. I truly didn't, because if someone had a beef with me, why not settle it against me? Only cowards would hurt weaker people and those around me. The elder smiled and said, I know, but remember, where have you been spending most of your time lately? Well, with you of course. Exactly, and who am I? After a moment I finally understood what the elder meant, you're an elder, and even an inner disciple wouldn't dare cross you. So that's why he couldn't take revenge directly against me because I visit you every day and chose to attack someone who is unrelated to you. Good, now this should teach you, that in a world of cultivation, you are not only responsible for yourself. Your actions could lead to the demise of the people around you. That is why, most cultivators would choose to lead a solitary life, filled with solitude and loneliness so that no one could harm them. Friendships families, children are all weaknesses for a cultivator, and most rid themselves from them to seek the great Tao. Thank you for your lesson, senior. I'll keep it in mind. Right, if you can't help but make friends, then make strong ones, who will not drag you down. Elder Yun said. Or, be strong and domineering enough that when someone tries to harm your friends, they'll think twice about it. Ah, that's a great way to think about it but that path is ruthless. It could easily drive the people around you away if you wish to take it. In this case, I don't dare ask an elder for help, you offered enough already. I'll deal with it myself. I will not stop you, it is not in the nature of our sect to stop the disciples from forging their own paths, although, Disciple Han is far stronger than you, he is a core forming cultivator, an entire realm above yours. I know. 
but I've dealt with worse, I said as I grinned and went down to the reception hall. I have a token from Elder Yun, I need to pick up a weapon, I said to the receptionist. The disciple in question asked me to show the token and once I did he gestured for another disciple to take his place as he led me to a door at the back of the reception hall. Behind the door was a wide range armory of different weapons. There were war bows, swords, eastern swords, sabers, swillhanders, clubs, shields, and many other types of weapons. These are all grade 9 weapons, pick one. If you choose a bow you'll get a quiver of arrows, but any subsequent arrows you wish to procure you'll have to buy using your merit points or in exchange with pills. The disciple stated. Right, I'll have a look, I said as I looked at the weapons in the armory. There were so many that one would feel lost. But I had to keep my head about me here. First things first, great swords are out of the question, so are bows. Simply because they are too damn heavy. For the sword part, the great swords are pretty heavy and it's obvious why they have a lot of metal in them, duh. The bows, on the other hand, one should know that a simple war bow needs at least a hundred pound worth of pulling force just to drag it fully and that's a mortal bow, a cultivator bow would definitely need much more. Also, accuracy and experience are great factors. So I'd rather not use any. Daggers, daggers are good, because they can be dipped in poison and can deal fatal blows from cover, but let's be realistic, I'm no assassin, and a dagger needs a lot of experience, like a lot, and it's one of the most difficult weapons to master. Simply put, because it has so many disadvantages in a fight to properly use one effectively one must be god tier in dagger mastery. That leaves me with swords. Swords are simple, I know that many would find this statement atrociously wrong, but just stab them with the pointy end. Yet the sword I must choose must be perfect for me. It can't be too heavy, and too long, a long sword has greater reach, but is easily parried against a professional, a short sword, on the other hand, is easy to wield, and easy to poke people with. As I was thinking about all of this, my eyes landed on a strange looking sword, if I didn't look closely, I'd mistake it for an arrow. Its tip was shaped like an arrow's head, a triangle, while its edge was so small and so thin one would think it was a rapier. I got my eyes closer to the weapon's edge and noticed that it was not a needle like weapon, but rather a fine blade, and it could cut. Its arm guard was simple, like a katana's. A big circular guard that felt like it could barely protect one's arm. And the handle was hamstrung with leather. The pommel of the sword was a pointed blade. I grabbed the sword and it felt like I was carrying a feather. It was too light, one would think that it would snap in two if a strong breeze was to blow on it. Ah, the impaler, the disciple said. Oh, it has such a nice name. It must be a legendary weapon, I said. Yeah right, that's probably a prototype of sorts. Its only real use is to stab, but a proper sword can stab as easily as that one, and will sustain a clash against another sword of the same category. And from the look of it, that thing would snap in half if it were to challenge another sword. Who made this? We don't know, one of the disciples found it while journeying, he thought it was a treasure. But once an artificer appraised it, he deemed it to be below the ninth level of weapon classification. Though he said that the metalwork was splendid, it didn't have any real hope of faring well against other swords. So no one picked it. I'll take it. I replied. Man, whatever, I'm not gonna stop you, you're just wasting your token. So don't come crying to me when that weapon of yours snaps. Nah I won't. I grinned as I took the sword. This weapon, amongst all of those in that room, it was not the best, and probably the worst one in the bunch, that is of course if one didn't have the poison god's heritage. Earlier at the moment, I noticed the weapon, the book inside my chest sent me a message. Creeping Demise, a stoic and polymorphous weapon, capable of extending by the will of the user and can change form to a whip. A Zionshin weapon wielded by saints. It can be categorized as a top fifth dare weapon almost at fourth. It can only show its real power in the hands of an ascendant cultivator, but for now, 
no weapon under the fifth deer can break it or contend with it. Memories of the Poison God I happen to have used a similar weapon earlier in my cultivation days, and they were amazing, especially since you can dip the tip of the creeping demise in poison, and with only one slash, you can end someone's life. Especially since this weapon has a viper-esque nature that could bypass all defenses when used right. So, its real name is Creeping Demise. Well, I'm better off using it as a standard sword. Perhaps like a rapier for now. Until I fully unlock its potential. Man having an all-knowing book sure does help knowing treasures from trash. I took the weapon and the sheath and placed it behind my back, tucked within my robes so no one could see it. It was about two feet long and could hide in there comfortably. Also with all the tumorous bulges on me, no one would notice the hidden weapon. Time to pay inner disciple Han a visit. Chapter 23, Grand Elder It wasn't hard to find disciple Han's house actually, he was the only disciple of the only receptarier elder of the Purple Cloud sect. A Grand Elder named Lao Bo Fen. A new thing I learned. Apparently Elder and Grand Elders are two different things. An Elder is someone who is responsible for a certain activity in the sect. Like the Hall Master Yun of the Cloud Pavilion, or Elder Hoot Yun of the Punishment Hall. But for the Purple Cloud Grand Elders, there were only three. The Grand Elder of the Outer Disciples, the Grand Elder of the Inner Disciples, and the Grand Elder of the Core Disciples. And each of these elders has different responsibilities and is not less important than any other. Then the sect master, who leads the whole sect, and the sect's grand master who is the older sect leader but had to give up his role to the newer generation. The hierarchy system was not that complicated, but let's go back to our prior point. Han was being mentored by a grand master, even if he was not a core disciple. Even if core disciples were the hope and future of the sect. Apparently Han's martial prowess were not enough to get him a position in the core disciples' spot. But his understanding of alchemy gave him a great aptitude to become a receptarier. I understood all of this from a brief conversation with Elder Yun on a game of Go that we played a few days ago before this whole ordeal happened. We were just randomly talking until he brought up the incident of me telling off the inner disciple and he then explained to me why I should be on my guard and careful of his retaliation and gave me a briefing of the sex hierarchy. Now, as I stood in front of disciple Han's house, I was stuck in a dilemma. If I were to confront him, I would probably end up beaten to a pulp. But if I don't then I brought nothing but hardship on Ming Hao who was only there to help me. My actions brought misfortune to the ones around me, this is what Elder Yun said. So, I have to deal with this myself, but on the off chance I manage to subdue Disciple Han, then his master, the Grand Elder will definitely retaliate. I pondered on what to do for a few moments before I sighed and decided to leave. But just as I turned, an old man, far older than me as it appeared from the white smooth beard that reached all the way to the ground. He wore grey robes and had a sweet smell about him. Like a perfume made of all the world's sweet herbal scents. What are you doing in front of my disciple's home? Asked the man whose resting facial expression was as serious as someone who had his favorite shoe stepped on. At that moment, I felt that if this person wanted me dead, I had no way to deny him that right. Yes, I say right because, in a cultivation world. It is your right if you wish someone dead or alive, it is your right because you are stronger. A world as a rule as this one cannot be measured with the serendipitous mindset of a man from the modern world. I'm here for an explanation, Grand Elder Lao Bo Fan, so, you know of me, but I know no of you, still what seems to be the matter then? Asked the old man. I'm Shen Bao, an outer disciple. I came here for justice against a brother of mine that has been harmed by your disciple Han. The old man waved at me and my whole body shuddered, matters of the younger generation should be handled by the younger generation. If my disciple wronged you, become better than him and get your justice back. Leave me out of your problems. I frowned at the old man, for two things. The first was that when he waved, I noticed that the tip of his index finger, middle finger, and thumb had an icy sheen to it, 
they were almost transparent as if they were made of glass. The poison god's heritage gave me a brief explanation of the reason of this man's illness. The second thing was what he said, matters of the younger generation should be handled by the younger generation. Then if I were to kill disciple Han, you won't retaliate? If you kill him while being younger and less powerful than him, I'll take you as my own disciple, the old man said. Geniuses who die are no different than trash, remember that. Right then, also, if you need help with a five destruction of body poison, I can help you get rid of the ice destruction plaguing you. The moment I uttered the words, the old man appeared right in front of me, he was so fast that I felt like he teleported. His expression turning even more serious than his resting serious face. Breath. If you dare utter nonsense you don't know then your end would be immediate. Who told you about the five destructions poison? I swallowed a large gulp, maybe I should keep my fucking mouth shut. Acting all smart isn't smart, it's gonna get me fucking killed. I made a mental note, if I know shit I should shut up about it and only bring it up when it's beneficial to me. Now, I'm in the gutters but I have to switch this situation around. This is my personal secret and I won't discuss it with you, still I offered a solution with pure thoughts and don't know the reason why only the tip of your fingers is inflicted. If you know the treatment then start talking. You should just dip your hand in a 300 years old orchid nectar. It should alleviate the pain and reduce the crystallization. The old man removed his hand from my collar and pondered. I never thought about it, a 300 years old spiritual orchid does have yang properties, but they are subtle and they could nullify the iciness of the poison without conflicting with it. So, it should work. That's actually smart thinking, but how do you know of such an orchid or such a poison? I told you, it's a secret. You must have come in contact with a receptarier's manual. I'm ready to purchase it from you at whatever price you wish. Now here comes the hard part. I'll have to decline. The old man's face scrunched up in an ugly frown, but still, he sighed and said, no worries then. Still, you know what's going on with the poison in me right? Yes. You're not the primary target, you are probably trying to treat a patient who has an even worse condition. Yes. Do you think you can help this patient? He is still alive? I asked. Yes. Damn, if the collateral is that severe on you how come the primary afflicted be still alive? I would really like to see it for myself. Then you'll have to follow me. The old man said and I followed after. All right, note to self, if I ever come out of this in one piece, I'll have to be careful of what I say. This is the exact same shit that makes all of those heroic characters in those stories feel like they are making complete dumb decisions when they could have kept their mouths shut. Chapter 24, Sect Master Rai I followed Grand Elder Lao Bo Fan across the habitat of the inner disciples, but seeing that my walking speed was far too slow to his liking. The old man took to the skies, just like that he hovered in the sky and brought me with him. I flailed for a moment before I gathered my bearing. This was far gentler than when that cultivator took me to the poison gods cave. You seem used to flight. I had experience. I could understand flight using a flying sword would give one experience, but then you had a sword under you, a measure where you could find solid ground safety of sorts. But now, we're flying without the support of anything, only a madman would think they are safe. I wonder. Are you a madman? Elder Lao asked. Mad, perhaps, but I have my reasons not to fear, I replied. Care to explain your reasons? Asked Lao as we moved at increasing speeds. First of all, if you wanted me dead, you would have killed me ten thousand times over. Sounds about right, then what's the second reason? You need me to treat your patient. And also, you wish to know how I would treat your patient. Even a person as old as you are, you are still fascinated with new things. Curiosity is the mother of all things. And none could escape its clutches. So, I fear not for my life. I could also be leading you to a safe place where I could use soul search on you. Said the old man. True, but you wouldn't, I replied. 
Once again, you amaze me with your confidence I wonder where do you get this? Your demeanor. You're not evil. If you were, you would have forced me to give up my secrets the moment I spoke. So you do realize your mistake? Yes, and already regret it, but not enough to not treat a patient from dying one of the most agonizing deaths in the world. Ha! Huh. The old man laughed. Why are you laughing? I doubt that what I said was something to jest about. You, is who I'm laughing at, you say the most agonizing deaths when the bone and body grinding poison has infected you as a plague does to a backwater town. You've suffered fate hundreds of times worse than the five body destructions and say that it's one of the worst ways to die. Do you know that the bone and body grinding poison, though it is common is one of the top poisons of the poison list? No, I had no such knowledge. To be honest, most men would rather die than suffer your agony. I find it fascinating how you manage to survive, even if you're on the verge of death right now. Also another reason for my lack of fear to death, it has been my companion. But perhaps I could find a treatment. I salute your confidence and optimism, but if this was treatable, it wouldn't be on the heaven list. The world of cultivation is limitless, is it not? Yes. So, if there was a problem, there has to be a solution. Saying that a poison has no remedy is the same as being a frog in a well. We just haven't figured out the treatment, because we haven't exhausted all possible solutions. The old man went silent for a moment before he pulled something from his pocket and threw it at me. I grabbed at it, and it was a small ceramic vial. I shook it and it jingled with the sound of pails. Why are you giving me this? I asked. It is because I learned something from you. Just because there is a problem, doesn't mean that there is not a solution. The scope of our understanding must be expanded to figure out newer methods to solve something that everyone thinks unsolvable. I found myself in a bottleneck, and I believe with your words, I can finally touch the rims of comprehension. I'm not a petty man, I repay my favors. I cupped my hands at the Grand Elder and said, Many thanks, for your patronage. The old man smiled as he waved his hand, Don't mention it. We've arrived, let's go. We slowly dropped until we were in front of a palace so grand that I had trouble gauging its full size. I have been to India once and had seen the Taj Mahal, but in front of me, the whole Taj Mahal would barely fit in one of this palace's doors. And there were eight of them, each leading to a different sector. And they say that the Purple Cloud sect is a ninth level sect? I could hardly believe it seeing this palace. Actually. We're originally a fourth level sect, but due to what you're about to see, we have declined and lost a lot of power. This palace is all that remains of our former prestige. This sounds rather ominous. Still, I have to see with my own eyes what caused this sect to decline to this degree. As we walked through the palace, I saw many old men coming and going, probably elders and deacons responsible over the sect. They could even be inner and core disciples here. But none of them were too free to give us a second glance as we walked inside. We headed deeper into the palace and walked up the flight of stairs that led to a golden door. The door opened up revealing a room full of incense burners and vats of herbal liquids. Yet there was a coolness to the air that made my bones feel like they were going to freeze over. I began rotating my cultivation to fend off the coldness, and it worked like a charm. The added yin from the origin yin flower helped me subdue the cold. I'm amazed that you were able to subdue the side effects of the ice destruction. You seem to be carrying a lot of secrets. The old man said, but he had not a single hint of greed on him when he spoke. Lao Bo Fan, spoke a sweet womanly voice. It was another worldly beautiful woman who looked like she was made of pure crystal. Bare half of her face and one arm. The rest of her body was encased in an ice-like structure that was continuously releasing the cold air. Sect Master, Lao Bo Fan said as she bowed to the woman. I gave a similar bow then rose back up. It seems that the situation is much dire than I expected. Who might this be? Sect Master, this is an outer sect disciple, I found. He seems to be knowledgeable in regards to your condition. 
If I wasn't in my current condition I would have slapped you both to the nether world. You think a mere outer disciple who is not even a transformation expert can treat me? What foolery is this? Are you tired of living Lao? The last words she uttered with such wrath that she began a coughing fit. Two women, of probably the age of twenty came rushing to her side and began applying a brew made of some sort of herbal liquid. The two women's hands were also made of ice. And whenever they touched the sect master the contamination would spread. You should stop that, the seven silkworms extract is only numbing the pain it does nothing to the contamination. You think I don't know that? The woman said. Please sect master calm down, one of the girls said. But wait, how do you know this is seven silkworms extract? The sect master asked. Sect master, I told you he is knowledgeable. And I have brought him here to see if he could treat you. Treat me? Such foolish a notion. The woman spoke in disgust at me. A man of such appearance is no use to even himself how could he treat me? To be completely honest, I can't treat her. What? Then why have I brought you here? Lao's face turned to anger. Wait. I haven't finished. The current me can't treat her. But I could in time. I need at least three years. But from the look of your current condition. You probably don't have more than one month left to live, fool. I have enough medicine to keep me up and running for at least a year. Said the sect master. Okay, if you say so, but tell me, have you been feeling dizzy lately, and having sudden loss of temper, also sometimes you feel like you're seeing nothing but white and when you come back to it, more than a day had passed? The two girls around the sect master looked at each other and then back at me, how do you know that? Because those are the final symptoms of the ice destruction. The seven worm silk extract you have been using wasn't treating her, it was only numbing the wound and giving the sect master semblance of cure. The poison was still acting up and now it had reached her brain. Once her brain freezes, she will die. The sect master frowned, and I could swear that the ice around her body was about to break. You're right, you prove that you know what you speak of, but that doesn't change anything. Even if I were to die in a year or in a month, you can't help. I don't have the ability to survive three years until you can take care of this illness of mine. So whatever your agenda was in meeting me was, it is now null and void. Replied the sect master. Quite pessimistic. I said I can only cure you in three years, but I didn't say I can't help you survive until then. Which of course I can. Also, I can help the girls around you get rid of the side effects on them. Prove it. Shen Bao, we don't currently possess the spirit orchid, it will take some time to get it. Well, yeah, but there is another way, although it is faster. The outcome might not be to your liking. What do you mean? You have another way to get rid of the poison? Yes, but like I said, it's not preferable. What does it entail? Asked the sect master, this time with a tone that had far less hostility and more curiosity. Well, I can test it on your dot eu retainers? My core disciples. Said the sect master. Man she shouldn't have exposed her disciples to such thing they must be in terrible pain. Right then, can I approach? I asked. You may, but do anything strange and it's your head that will roll. See, this is why I'm hesitant. What I'm about to do is really not something you lot would think normal. And I fear that I'll have my head rolling before I prove my point. Lao Bo Fan looked at the sect master and the two of them sighed. Go ahead. Right, miss, can you come over and hand me your hand? The woman did as I asked and gave me her hand. I placed one of my hands above and the other under her hand. What the bloody hell are you doing? You're going to contaminate yourself and you don't even have the cultivation to suppress that poison. Lao spoke. Don't worry, I replied then I began assimilating the poison. It was the same as I did whenever I sucked in the green residue from monsters that I killed with my poison breath. Only the ice destruction poison was far more tyrannical and was willing to rip my veins as it coursed through them. Oh my god, you're not being infected. Lao said in surprise. The woman in front of me looked disgusted as I held her hand, 
she probably didn't think that I'm fit to do so, seeing how disfigured and nasty the tumors I had on both hands. Just bear with it, now is when it'll start to hurt, I spoke. Suddenly the woman began screaming as if I was skinning her hand. The second disciple immediately came to her sister's aid and placed a sword right under my neck, stop. She said. Wait. Look. Said the sect master. Even when the girl was screaming from pain, the second sister was patient enough to take a look at her sister's hand. The poison was actually being retracted, pulled out from her hand and into mine. Yet the ice from the poison destruction was unable to fend against the poison chi within me. Even if I was just a chi condensation cultivator, the bone and body poison, as spoke Grand Elder Lao, was powerful enough to fully suppress the ice from the body destruction, then consume it to empower itself. I kept sucking in the poison, and it kept feeding my own chi, until I had a breakthrough. Suddenly, I was able to rotate more poison chi within me and absorbed even more from the disciple. And in matters of seconds, the disciple fainted as the last bit of the poison was pulled out of the tip of her fingers. She fell unconscious, heaving on the ground, but there was now, redness on her cheeks that was not there before. I turn around and began vomiting, a black sludge, disgusting and cold. It was far thicker and concentrated than when I had my first breakthroughs. Such atrocious sight! said the first disciple. Have some respect to someone who risks their own life to save your sisters! said the sect master. What he threw up was the concentrated destroyed remains of the poison. So it appears that you actually do have value in keeping you. After wiping my mouth I said, sorry for ruining your floor. I didn't expect to have a breakthrough, this is regular stuff. Don't be, you saved one of my disciples from death, I should be thankful. I'll reward you accordingly, but for now, come the real question, can you treat me? I told you, I can, but you have so much poison in you that it will take at least three years. But I can alleviate the poison, take it in and discard it. This is a strange way to cultivate. It's my way. I have scanned you, and noticed that you don't have any meridians. How come you can control spiritual energy? Asked the master. So they can't see my poison meridians, that's good. I have my ways. Now, do you wish for me to treat you? Yes. Do you have any demands? Yeah, I want to punish someone for harming a brother of mine. For whoever did such, death is only the penalty said the sect master. Wait. Wait. Child, let me take care of that for you, if Han had wronged your brother, I'll handle it, don't waste a master's favor for some pitiful grudge. Oh, then I'll be in your debt. You have repaid this debt when you told me of the way to get rid of the poison afflicting me. Then so be it, I'm in your favor, disciple. What is your name? I'm Shen Bao. Good, from now on, you'll be a core disciple of my sect. And my personal health care. If anyone dares to harm you, stand in your way or cross you, you only need to show him this. She said as she threw me a token with a purple cloud imprinted on it. This is direct disciples token, it makes you on an even higher pedestal than my own direct disciples. Is it enough? Asked the sect master. Wait, I can't take this. It's too much when just treating an illness. You fail to see the consequences of treating me. Once I'm back to my former self, the whole country of Zhu shall shake at our mercy. Treat me, and I'll reward you with things you could have never dreamed of. Well then, I better get starting. A shout out to Black Feigned for the patronage, may your darkness prevails and your corruption consume the world. Chapter 25, Sect Master 2 First of all, I need to know your opinion on something, I asked the sect master. Speak, said the sect master, her tone was commandeering, and not even the ice encasing her was a match the coldness of her words. Author's note, is this how you want the dialogues to be? Right, but this is a private matter that I wish only you to hear. If that is alright with you. I asked again rather wryly. Matters that you speak in this chamber will remain in this chamber, 
so is the secret of you treating my injury, still if it is any comfort to your consciousness, Lao Bo Fan, Zion Rigsor please leave us. The sect master waved them off. The three of them bowed to the sect master and left the hall in haste. They didn't seem to be too keen on making the master repeat herself. Right, then what is it that you wish to speak that you want it to be private from my closest vessels? The woman coldly spoke. Her tone was like a god talking down to a servant of his. Right, what is your opinion on poison cultivators? I asked half expecting to be murdered with her gaze alone. The woman thought for a few moments before she answered, They are a scourge upon the land, disgusting and insidious. None wish to make their acquaintance as their company only brings misery, disdain, and the looming threat of betrayal. Poison cultivators are like a viper, and one cannot trust a viper. Oh dot that's rather awkward, I said through a wry smile. I could understand that from your question, you do not know poison cultivation. Or at least you have encountered methods to go through that path. I would advise you to change your direction of cultivation as you have just started and rebuild your base anew. She advised, rather gently this time. Yeah, that would be impossible. I shook my head. Poison cultivation is literally is in my bone and flesh. You will not find friend or companion along your road, not even poison cultivators trust each other. Her words were definite and certain. To be completely honest, I have never needed friends. I relied on myself to do everything in my prior life, that will not be a problem. Especially since my own children betrayed me. There is no need to trust anyone else. The road to cultivation is steep, long, and lonely, it could do to have a few allies. But that is your own matter. If you decide to remain on the poison cultivation road, I shall not stop you, and my advice to you has been given. The woman said. Thank you very much. Now, I'll begin treating this. Hopefully, you'll bear with the pain. I spoke. You may begin. She said. I could even feel her shrug through her voice as if the pain her disciples were in didn't even enter her scope. Right, but this will be rather uncomfortable. Please bear with me. I said once again. It would be really embarrassing if she started screaming like a little girl. I went behind the sect master, the chair she was on had already frozen to bits. Pardon me for what I'm about to do, I said and placed both hands on her shoulders. There was a rather large piece of ice covering her whole body, and the moment I placed my hands on her should the ice try to make its way through my arms. But I let it do as it pleased, I needed the ice destruction poison to seep into my body so I can recycle it into my own energy. The sect master grunted, and to be honest, she should have been screaming from pain. Her disciple felt as if I was tearing her hand from its socket and she was just afflicted with a side effect of the ice destruction poison, while the sect master should be in more pain only grunted. It's either that her pain tolerance is absurdly high, or that her cultivation is so steep that the pain from this agonizing extraction didn't feel worth more than her grunt. Hours went by, and the poison lessened around her shoulders, in less than half a day. My hands had fully sucked in the poison around her and were now firmly touching the clothes on her body. Sect Master. I'm exhausted. I need to take a break. You have well earned your break, said the Sect Master as she huffed from exertion. Not only was I exhausted, but she had been suppressing the urge to shout from pain and withstanding this cruel treatment all day long. In three years I should be able to regain my mobility, this is well worth it. You, no, I said. The sect master shuddered, what do you mean? If it's just about your mobility at this rate it we need a maximum of a week for you to be able to leave this chair and have all mobility. The three-year promise is for me to fully remove the toxin from your body, heal all of the inner wounds and bring you back to your top shape. Wait, so you're saying that you can also treat the damage to my meridians and donchen? Well, of course. Isn't that what we signed up for? I tilted my head. Ha! Huh. And here I thought I was going to need at least a few hundred years to get rid of all of the ice poison by myself. Brat, you brought me joy that I will reward handsomely once I am back on my feet. 
The woman for the first time smiled and it was. Beautiful. Don't worry about it, I didn't do this just for you sect master. I smiled back. What do you mean? Asked the sect master. You must have guessed it. I grinned. You're taking in the poison and using it as your cultivation chi. She deduced immediately. Spot on, I'm surprised that you figured it out. I nodded to her. That means that you consume poisons to cultivate, she explained further. I would also like for you to keep that a secret. I cannot feel the world's chi, but I can assimilate the chi from poisons and make it my own. I told her, after all, she already figured it out. That's the same as cultivators who use pills to raise their cultivation level. That's a fast way to cultivate yet it will not be good for your overall progress. You'll have a lot of impurities within your body. The sect master trailed off. Unless, when you vomited. You're able to expel the impurities by yourself. Such a fascinating cultivation method. I'm really tempted to understand it. She divulged her curiosity. As much as I would like to share it with you, the condition is rather impossible for you. You'll need to have your meridians broken and shattered, then build a mortal base upon them, then survive in a pool of bone and body grinding poison. I said while shrugging. Shen Bao, I have a newfound respect for you. I thought that I was in immense pain when you began the treatment, yet the pain from having your meridians broken is far greater than what I suffered not to mention the impossibility of surviving the bone and body grinding poison. You have suffered greatly. But still sought to cultivate against all of this pain. Still, I'll leave you with another piece of advice. The woman seriously looked at me. Please do, I replied. I am your sect master, and I owe you my life, this is a debt that I cannot repay no matter how I reward you. So, Betraying you would break my Tao heart and it is an impossibility for me. Thus, I say these words, I shall keep whatever you had said to me a secret that I will take to my grave, but you must promise to never divulge that you are a poison cultivator, nor the way how you cultivate. It would cause a lot of people a great deal of greed to want to know of your ways and want to take them from you. Even if it is impossible for them to use it to cultivate, they would still want to take it and build upon it their own methods of cultivation. Her words were like a cold bucket of water on a cool morning. I'll keep everything I have said to you a secret, but I have some concerns, I said. Speak them, and I'll see if I could help. Right, so you're knowledgeable and figured out that I cultivate poison and need to consume it in order to increase my cultivation, yet the world is big and there could also be people who would figure that out. Is there a way for me to hide that fact? I asked. There are many ways that work for things such as this, but they all require the acute sense of spiritual chi of the world, she shook her head. Meaning normal cultivation, I replied, bummed out. This is rather problematic. Yes, because not even poison cultivators use your method. They harness the world's energy then transform it into poison chi, while you do something different. You take in poison chi that has already been transformed and use it. Your way requires less time to transform the energy and is far more potent, yet you'll require a lot of resources to increase your cultivation base. I would say I figured that out, I replied. Yes, but fret not, I believe I have a method for you. Go to Elder Yun, show him the token I gave you, and ask him to give you the Star Weaver Manual. She said. What's that? It's a cultivation manual that uses the powers of the stars, it doesn't require chi sense, and it is common, but it will help you hide your poison chi and if any cultivators try to scan you using their divine sense, they'll only see the star weaving energy and believe you're a start cultivator. The sect master explained. Oh, that will be handy, thank you very much, sect master, I replied. Very well then. Your excuse to leave, she nodded towards me as best she could. Right then, I'll take my leave, but I'll come back tomorrow for the second session, I said. I'll be expecting you, she replied, and I believe I saw a small hopeful smile at the edges of her lips. I gave a courteous bow to the sect master and left the hall. Once I was out, 
Grand Elder Lao was standing at the entrance to the hall. How did it go? He asked, he almost looked like a puppy wagging his tail. Well, I removed a good deal of the ice from her body, in one week she should be able to move about, I replied. Good, good. Said the elder with a great smile on his face. You need me to treat that? I said as I pointed at his hand. That would be handy, pun intended, with the ice in my hands I could no longer practice alchemy, and my receptarier status has been removed. So I would be in your debt. The old man gave me a slight bow. It's gonna be painful, you sure you don't want to use the spirit orchid, I advised. That's something I cannot obtain currently and I'll need to travel to our country's grand auction that only happens once every three years. Right, auctions, I muttered, I remembered that there were a lot of auction houses for cultivators in those stories they visit them and end up with good treasures. Right then, we should probably go somewhere private. We don't want people to see this. I said as I looked at all the people going in and out of the massive purple cloud palace. Right, follow me to my house, we'll have privacy there. Said the elder and I followed after him. Chapter 26, Elder Lao's Villa We arrived at Grand Elder Lao's home, unexpectedly, it was not as big as I thought it would be. The whole terrain was no larger than a normal villa, which compared to some disciples was small. But it had a great smell coming out of it, herbs. The elder took me on a tour around his villa. The walls around the garden of the house were short enough to allow people to take a peek at the elder's beautifully designed garden of spiritual herbs. And the house inside it was small enough for him to live in and have a few extra rooms for study and what seemed to be alchemy. So many furnaces. I muttered. And none of them is worth a fart if one cannot use alchemy. While being inflicted with this cursed poison, I could no longer handle this. Every time I would touch a spiritual herb it would wither or turn to ice. The old man sighed in sadness. I think this is why you took in a disciple. I deduced. Right, I remembered you had a beef with my disciple. The old man pointed. Yeah, but that's not the problem right now. I think he won't dare harm anyone related to me anymore. I replied in a shrug. The vengeance of a vindictive person can go beyond reason. I would be a failure of a master if I were to go against my own disciple. But the only advice I could give you is to keep your distance. Right now, even with the sect master's symbolic protection, he could still apply sneaky methods to harm you, so be careful. Elder Lao advised. Thank you Elder, I'll keep it in mind, and out of respect for you, I won't kill him, I replied. Elder Lao had a worried look on his face. He probably knows that I would be no match for his disciple who is leagues above me in terms of cultivation. Yet my poison technique doesn't really care about the cultivation gap. Or at least, the gap of cultivation I know of. Perhaps people in higher realms would outright dismiss my poison breath and would whack me before I even realize I was killed. So, it is better to keep being discreet. Once we were inside the elder's abode, I asked him to hand me his hand. I used the same method of absorption and took in the poison from the elder's fingers. He too had enough will to suppress screeching from pain. But compared to the sect master's grunt, the old man was huffing and looked to be resisting pain rather forcefully. He was definitely below the sect master's level in cultivation due to the immense amounts of sweat that came out of his forehead from the extraction. After a few minutes, the elder was fully healed up. Teeth, thank you, the elder said, his tone betrayed his demeanor, it was shaky and weak. No worries, this is actually beneficial to me too, I replied to the old man. Speaking of which, why aren't you gaining more chi? The elder questioned as he rubbed his hands. Oh, even you know about this now, I replied. Basically, all four of us would understand now, me and the sect master and her two disciples. But fret not, none of us will speak a thing. I'm bound to the sect master, and she had informed me to keep everything secret so I will, even at the cost of my life. The old man waved his hand. You don't need to make it sound so serious, I replied. But it is, child. 
you'll know in the future how grave your methods are. Anyway, if there is anything you wish me to do, I'll help you with it. He said in a kind nod. Right, I was always interested in the topic of alchemy, do you have any way for me to start on that path? I questioned. Most people who begin the road of cultivation begin by cultivating their bodies, and only when they are encountered with a bottleneck that stunts their growth, would they seek alchemy to keep moving forward in the world of cultivation, yet you wish to start by the second choice? The old man gave advice in a question. Well, I only need general information, I replied as I didn't want to expose many of my secrets. I don't mind teaching you, but it will not be easy. It will cost you a lot of your time. And most of the alchemy is memorizing herbs their attribute and their reaction to one another, so you'll be wasting time that you should be using in cultivating and memorizing things. The old man tried to persuade me out of it. Did you forget that I don't need to actively cultivate to increase my cultivation base? I bragged. True. And with the poison in our sect master, it would be enough to fuel you to higher cultivation levels. Still, there is one thing that still bugs me. Why are you not gaining so much? The sect master has so much poison chi in her body you should be torpedoing through the early cultivation level. Elder Lao kept questioning. I took a moment to formulate my thoughts before I replied, I think it's a failsafe, my cultivation is not allowing me to take in more than I can handle. Though it's wasting a lot of poison chi, I'm slowly building up my base. If I were to fully digest the poison chi I'm extracting from the sect master, I'll probably blow up or turn into a popsicle. The old man tilted his head as he spoke though I don't know what a popsicle is, I think it's a bad thing and you're right. Then if your case is like that, there is nothing to worry about, we should start by giving you a list of some of the ninth level spiritual herbs, here. The elder said and handed me a black tome that read, Spiritual Garden First Tome. It's a book made by a great alchemist, Bulong, it has nine tomes in total and it encompasses the majority if not all of the spiritual herbs of the ninth grade. Once you have memorized the first tome, I'll give you the latter versions. I believe I won't been eating that. I handed the book back to him. Sure, I know you have an alchemist cultivator manual. I already asked to procure it from you, but I don't think that you should skimp on the basics. The old man replied in a slightly offended tone. He seems to be a person who doesn't like it when his gifts are returned nor a person who likes people who skip on the basics. How about you quiz me then? I asked with a wide smile. The elder frowned and asked, what are the properties of the blood ginseng? Unlike its name. The blood ginseng has no correlation to blood whatsoever, it's only its color that is crimson, and once soaked in warm water, the water will turn vicious and thick as blood. The blood ginseng is good for treating infections and could be used in increasing one's spiritual cultivation by slightly enlarging the meridians of the person. It comes with a downside that is if one were to continuously use it, They'll suffer from addiction and will have withdrawal symptoms once they stop using the ginseng for a few days, mainly headaches and nausea and such, I replied in one breath. The old man was stunned as he looked at me as if I was a monster, I'll be damned. That's even more than what Bulong had in his book, though I can confirm the rest of your statement is correct due to tests I did myself on the ginseng. Good, I'll ask you something else. The elder began mentioning more herbs. It was so much that he was engrossed in it more than I was, as he pulled up a note and began writing on it, he said that some of the notes I gave him were more exhaustive than what he had, and with this newfound knowledge he could increase the potency of his pills. We kept on exchanging ideas and knowledge about plants for a while until the elder had to stop, looking at the time it was well in the night. You'll need a place to rest. You don't need to walk all the way back to your cave, I have a guest room you can use it's upstairs, the elder kindly offered. Right, but I'll need to contact Elder Yun for the cultivation manual that the sect master asked me to obtain, I replied. Just tell me which cultivation manual you need and I'll have it delivered to you by morning. Elder Lao offered. Right, that would be perfect, I'm feeling a bit exhausted, 
and I'll need to be fresh enough to help the sect master in tomorrow's curing session, I thanked the old man. Right, off you go Shen Bao, I'll manage the rest. Replied the elder and pointed me to where I'll be spending the night. Usually, cultivators don't need sleep, nor do I, but what I meant with rest was to go into meditation for the rest of the night, tomorrow was gonna be a good day, and I'll be learning the star weaving technique. Chapter 27, Star Technique Morning came and my cultivation session has ended, I thought it would be best if I were to see Elder Lao about the star weaving technique manual. He had promised to go and handle that affair for me. Once I went down, I saw a small purple colored book on the book stand that was not there. I approached the table and took a look at what seemed to be a cultivation manual. It read star weaving technique. This must be it. I thought to myself. I open the book and read, Stars are beacons of the never-ending universe, they guide the way for lost travelers and help light the dim and dark space. They can be a great source of power were to harness the energy emanating from these ancient globes. To cultivate the energy of the stars one must follow the following diagram. I saw a sketch of a person sitting in the lotus position with a small rock in his hands under a starry night sky. He held the rock and the energy from the stars began surging into the rock and then seeped into him. They didn't need to go through his meridians but the skin of his body acted as a white sheet being inked on. It gathered the energy and empowered the character. This seemed to be simple enough, and I wanted to try it, but it was still morning and this technique seemed to be only applicable during the night. Still, this begs the question, stars are always existent. So why should we only cultivate in the night? I thought about this and then decided to start learning this technique. Even if it was daytime. But, I was still missing something, the small rock that the man was holding. Perhaps it's a stone from outer space, this is what my hunch is telling me. Is it focusing the energy of the stars though? Is it needed? I kept on reading through the manual and all I had to add to my prior hunch that the star was actually a moonstone, and they are abundant. It wouldn't be difficult to find it in the pavilion. As for all the cultivators of this type of style, they all start by cultivating the energy of the moon, then the sun then the stars of the starry night. They finally end up choosing one of the stars as their main and focal energy point, and whenever that star is aligned with the planet the cultivator will be able to gain immense power. The distance to the said star from the world plays a vital role. The farther it is, the more powerful the energy, but at the same time, the longer it would take for the star to power up the cultivator. There was a lot to explore in this technique and I was hoping to learn more, but by the time I finished reading the manual, it was already noon. I stood up and walked towards the main palace of the Purple Cloud sect. I needed to be in time to cure the sect master and I don't think she would like it if I kept her waiting. Once I arrived at the sect master's chambers, I saw several elders waiting at her doorsteps, while none were granted access. I waited patiently among the crowd until Disciple Zhu, the girl I had treated yesterday spotted me and beckoned me to come over. I nodded and came to her in a hurry under the calculative gaze of many elders. The sect master is waiting for you junior brother Shen Bao. Sister Zhu said in a gleeful tone. It seems that having treated her, she warmed up to me nicely. Let's go and then, we wouldn't want the sect master to have to wait. And frankly speaking, the rest of the elders are staring daggers at me, it feels like I did something wrong, I said in a hushed tone. Well, you still have a long way to go. Most elders can easily hear what you said even if you said it in a low tone, I'll teach you how to send your thoughts secretly once you reach foundation establishment. Disciple Zhu. One of the elders shouted, what's the meaning of this? Who is this brat and how come he gets to be heard and at the presence of the sect master before us? Elder Jin. He was specifically asked to come over by the sect master, if you have any complaint I'll forward them to her immediately. The elder scrunched up his nostrils and hiffed loudly. He was dissatisfied but not enough to want to cross the sect master's order of bringing me before anyone else. Senor Sister Zhu opened the door for me, and once I was inside she pulled on the hem of my robe and said, 
I don't want to be rude for asking this, but could you find some time to help my sister with her hands? I will once I'm done with the sect master, don't worry. We don't want her to be jealous or feel left out. Thank you so much, she was really embarrassed to ask of you directly, not after her reaction yesterday. Yeah, I almost lost my head there, but it's to be expected, she really cares for you and she seems to be of a pure heart. I'll see to her right after this. What are you lot talking about, Shen Bao? Get your behind over here and start the treatment, I'm getting restless. I am on my way sect master, I replied and hastily went behind the sect master and placed my hands on her shoulders, and began absorbing the poison. Hours later I decided it was time to take a break, I was about to break through and I needed to stabilize my cultivation. This method of cultivation is free of charge and amazing at the same time. Why did you stop? The sect master asked though the redness of her flushed face suggested that she also needed a break. Sect master, I'm about to break through, and I need to stop for a while, once I reach the peak of qi condensation. I'll continue. Go ahead then, start your breakthrough. I nodded and sat down. It was easy to rotate the poison qi I just took from the sect master and it spiraled fast enough for me to almost feel like I was about to lose control of it. Breath, Shen Bao. I don't want you to go on a cultivation deviation right now. Breath in. I did as told and suddenly the cultivation speed slowed down to a reasonable yet fast enough speed. An explosion of energy immediately followed after and I found myself at the peak of the qi condensation level. Nice. Start cementing your foundation. Keep rotating the newfound energy and move it toward your newly unlocked meridians. I did as the sect master said, though a bit differently. The breakthrough allowed me to sense even more parts of my body and I began channeling the chi towards them. It then began condensing into my bones and marrow. I started to sweat heavily, almost as if I was in a sauna. A green sheen of energy covered my body. Every fiber and every muscle tissue began vibrating being enhanced and reinforced with the energy I just obtained. Old muscle tissue began to rejuvenate and my old weak bones felt as if they were being polished and nourished, the old bone became new and the weak body began to regain the strength of youth. Suddenly I spewed out a foul black breath. The sect master looked at me in the eyes and said, you seem rather different. It feels as if you become younger. Perhaps I'm mistaken. Actually, she was not wrong, I felt that some of the wrinkles I had around my eyes had lessened, and a good deal of annoying pustules that were on my back had completely disappeared. Thank you for the compliment, I'm ready to start the second session. But sect master I have a small request. Ask, she said. Right, now, I've been absorbing the poison chi from your shoulders for the past two days but it would be far more efficient if I were to change the position of absorption. Then do as you think would be best, why ask for my opinion? Because it might become awkward and I wouldn't want to embarrass sect master. I'm not a little girl, brat, if it's for healing, touching my breasts or thighs isn't going to get me all flustered and red like a teenager girl. Do what you must, I have far greater worries than being touched by a man. Quite sensible. Then, I won't be polite, I said and placed my hands between her chest. This was the central area of her body, and the moment I placed my hands I noticed a small flush on her cheeks. She might sound and act tough, but in the end, she is still a woman. I immediately started absorbing the poison as to not let her or my thoughts wander. The poison immediately began seeping into my body and was continuously being destroyed by the bone and body grinding poison, then remodeled into poison chi that my body was able to process and use. I also felt that when I reached the peak of chi condensation, I was able to absorb even more poison, and was able to process a greater amount to my benefit. Hours went by and by the end of the day, the sect master had no eyes covering her at all. She looked perfect. Still, she was like a statue sitting on that chair of hers. Now, I've gotten rid of all of the poison around your body, but for you to regain movement, I'll need to remove the poison inside you. 
it's heavily entangled with your bones, muscles and joints. This will be far slower and more difficult as I'll need to be careful. Do what you please, at least now, I'm able to feel the warmth of the weather, instead of the coldness of that ice block I was in. Right, in five days, you'll be able to move freely, please be patient, I replied. You may leave. The sect master said. Right, but I still need to help your other disciple. Where is she? Zioner, come here, the sect master said and her disciple immediately walked in. After a few moments of screaming and pained grunts, Zyanur was finally healed up. I'm really exhausted and would like to rest for a while. Wait, have you started practicing the star technique? Asked the sect master. I've just learned the basics, I'll try and find time for that later, also I'm still locking a moonstone. I'll check out at the pavilion. Don't worry about the moonstone, Elder Lao will have some prepared for you but I'm afraid that the treatment of myself is taking its toll on you and consuming your time of cultivation. It's okay, don't forget that I'm actually passively cultivating when I'm here so it's not a big deal, I'll find time to cultivate the star technique once I have fully organized myself. Thank you for your aid, now you may leave. I nodded at the sect master and left the hall, the elders were still standing at the door, and they still were not allowed entry. It was rather awkward as I walked out and Disciple Zhu said to the elders that the sect master was too exhausted to meet anyone. Some of them started shouting at the injustice of having to wait all day while some unknown brat was able to see the sect master. But I didn't give them any heeds I still have a lot to do. Mainly cultivating that star technique. Chapter 28, Destruction The days kept on going, slowly but surely. I managed to fully remove the ice from around the sect master's body. Now, try and move, I asked the sect master as I moved a few steps back. And the sect master did, she first started by wiggling her fingers and then her hand. Then she slowly increased the range of motion until her whole arm was moving freely. You'll probably feel slight pains over the following days, but don't worry they are normal. I'll treat the rest of the poison in the following sessions and then you'll be able to regain your full cultivation. I said as I rubbed my cold hands. Thank you, Shen Bao, as I have promised before, if I were to regain my mobility, I'll award you with whatever you wish, so speak your mind's desires. The sect master replied in a smile so bright that it took me a few seconds before I could regain my bearings. Ahem dot 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 frankly speaking. I don't need anything more than what I'm already given. I'll excuse myself, I still need to cultivate the star technique. I said before I'd start flushing. Right then, you're an honest and greedless man, your kind are really rare in this world. Xwer, take your junior disciple to his new home. Said the sect master and threw a token to the senior sister. The woman caught it, looked at the token and said, but this place. Only Shen Bao will benefit from it. It would be a good opportunity for him. Shen Bao, I'll be going out into the public right now it has been a long time since the sect had seen me, and it's a good chance to prove to them that the Purple Cloud sect can still set foot back in its rightful place. And that's all thanks to you, the sect master proudly stated. I didn't do much, and remember, you're still not as powerful as before, you just have regained mobility. I said and warning. Yes, I know, but the rest of the sect doesn't know that, and they wouldn't dare question it. Now, Zhu Er, take Shen Bao to where he needs to be. The sect master waved me away. Right sect master, disciple Zhu replied and nodded for me to follow. Once we left the sect, the disciple took to the skies and carried me with her using that same translucent force that everyone around me had been using lately. This seems to be a part of power gained when one reaches the nascent soul level. It's a far away realm for me right now as I'm still stuck in the peak of qi condensation. Apparently, the poison I've consumed from the sect master was powerful, but not enough to cause a breakthrough. I have consumed so much of it that my body doesn't even want to digest it anymore and it's barely taking in a fraction of the poison qi from it. It's like I grew completely immune to it in a sense. 
sisters who took me to a small hill just beyond the sex perimeter. It was an inconspicuous hill that didn't seem to have anything special but the fact that it was too far away from the sect. It also had a small cave entrance that was difficult to notice if one was not purposefully going toward it. This was probably the cave entrance to the home gifted to me by the sect master. Wouldn't this make it too far for me to reach the sect master? It'll take my half a day just to walk to her and begin treatment. Don't worry about it, I'll come and get you when the sect master needs her treatment. Also, Grand Elder Lao and Elder Yun have been informed of your whereabouts. They'll come to keep you company when they have time. Right, Grand Elder Lao is helping me with alchemy and Elder Yun wants to play Go. Those are both good practices I can use to further enhance my cognitive ability and alchemy. Right then, I replied as Sister Zhu gently dropped me at the cave's entrance. This token will close and open the door away to you and only you. Go inside and check what's in there you'll be surprised. Sister Zhu said and bade me farewell. I walked through the cave and found that it had a spiral stone set of stairs that led down. There were small globes that lit the way as I walked in and once I was at the base of the cave. I was welcomed with a nice view of a library filled with books and an alchemy study at the side. There was also a section that was held by a doorway. In the moment I set foot near it I understood why this place was inhabited. There was poison in the air. So much of it that it covered the whole cave and contaminated the books, the alchemy material, and whatever that was behind the locked door. There was a corpse of a person laying on the ground. The poison god's book spoke to me. Braided Morning Petal. It's a plant that grows in humid places filled with yin energy. It has parasitic properties and can latch onto anything that has a spiritual link. The Braided Morning Petal has healing properties if processed by a high-grade alchemist, or can be used as a poisonous substance that can paralyze anyone at the nascent soul level and outright kill anyone below it. The primary danger of this Braided Morning Petal is that it is hard to detect by smell or taste. It can still be noticed by the fumes its victims will start emitting once they come in contact with it. You as a disciple of my teachings can consume this petal without gaining greatly as it is still far too advanced for your body. Still, beware of high rates of consumption as it will slow down your reaction time. Until you gain full resistance from the braided morning petal, do not wander the world. Right, so it seems that my early hunch was correct. The locked door is probably keeping the braided morning petal from accessing the outer world. It's a parasitic plant that will probably try and latch onto a cultivator, so that's why they sealed the place and only I, who is a poison cultivator is given access to all of this free material. I began rummaging through the library, finding a lot of books with a great deal of information regarding the world, the sex, cultivation manuals, weapon craft, and more. The premise of these books was rather circumstantial, it didn't hold great value besides educational, and there was not a single book that was specific towards a certain occupation. But it was knowledge nonetheless and I found myself engrossed in it. Time went by as I read through the book, and I didn't feel it going. I actually spent days and days inside the cave until I realized that something was amiss. Sister Zhu Er should have come to get me days ago. But she never came, could the sect master no longer need me? I thought, but I quickly shook the idea away. There was no way she could move freely with all of that poison she still inside her body. I'll need to check things out. I walked out of the cave and looked around only to notice that the purple cloud sect has been raised to the ground, while I never even took notice. Surprising isn't it? Now. How many of you could even guess or anticipate things to turn out this way? I'm sure no one, and that's why you're all reading by Akko. Gues no matter what happens, something always comes up, something strange, surprising and utterly unexpected always comes out when you least expect it. Chapter 29, Heavenly Vow Nothing remained of the once glorious cloud sect. All I could see were the smoking remains of burnt plazas and buildings. Caves that were no longer occupiable, and the sect master's palace that seemed to have been rooted out of its place. And was no longer there. What the hell had happened in here? I fumbled to find an appropriate answer, 
but nothing came to me. I slowly began by walking towards the sect, only to be assaulted by the rotting stench of burnt corpses. People had died here and their bodies have already been assaulted and infested with maggots and worms. People I saw before and was familiar with, people I had contact with, and some I saw regularly whenever I went to Elder Yun for a game of Go. The majority of the dead people were outer sect disciples because they all seemed too weak to defend themselves from whatever killed them. And what killed them wasn't gentle. Every one of the outer sect cultivators that had been laying on the ground had their bodies chopped up. As if they were sliced through with sharp swords. I don't have the vaguest clue on who could be responsible for this. This could be the assault of one powerful figure or another sect. Yet I only know of the existence of two other sects. The first being the Zhuan Fu sect, which ranked 8, and this one was where the former owner of this body of mine, the kid that had died due to cultivation deviation and gave me the chance to live incarnated in this body. The second sect I know of was the Spirit Sword sect, where I met two of its disciples a few months ago in the Demon Mountain Forest. But even if they were hostile to each other, a massacre of this caliber shouldn't be possible. The difference is not that high in the level of the two sects. Both of them are of the ninth level, and the sect master had already told me that even if the purple cloud is only a ninth level sect, its true core power is equivalent to that of a level four. I kept tracking my brain trying to find out why the whole sect had gotten eradicated overnight and for whatever reason, it happened, but always came up short without any information I could never deduce a proper answer. I kept on walking through the sect, trying to see if I could find any survivors. But that was not impossible, for whoever came here made sure that nothing would survive. They burned the fields and poured salt into them. There was no tree standing, no house kept whole, no life walked the sect. The birds were silent, mourning the passing of so many children, only the sound of birds of prey resounded over the sect. After hours of pointless search, I couldn't find anything. Not even the pavilion was where I left it. It seemed as if it was taken whole from its place. The cultivation caves were all empty, their doorways ripped out of their hinges, and the kids inside them brutally murdered. Who could do such a thing, I said lamenting. It was an unknown force, said someone behind me. And immediately, I felt as if my soul was about to leave my body. I turned to see Ming Hao, standing, the bruises over his body were no longer visible and he looked to be in better shape than before. You managed to survive. Yeah, thanks to that beating actually. How come? I asked. I was sent to the infirmary for treatment, and when I heard the ruckus, I hid there. When those cultivators came, they couldn't find me and left. The kid is lying. There is no way for those cultivators to be so thorough in killing everyone and forgetting him. Hiding, I could believe that, but a divine sense could easily locate him. He probably has a treasure on him that is protecting him and keeping him under the radar. No wonder I couldn't even sense him when he came from behind me. Right, good for you. Still, do you have any idea on how to attack the sect? I asked. The boy shook his head and said, the only things I heard were the cultivators that were killing our own were talking about was the fact that this sect was supposed to be much stronger than this, and that they brought a cannon to kill a fly and stuff like that. They were overestimating us so much, and from the look of it, they were right, we couldn't hold for more than an hour before everyone was brutally murdered. Shit, and just when I started learning, stuff like this happens, I mumbled to myself. Old man. I'll be off, said Ming Hao. Where to? I asked. I have no idea, but it beats staying here in this destroyed sect. I could probably head to the Spirit Sword sect, they'll take me in if I prove myself. Oh, that's the sect where those two cultivators from the forest came from. I wish you all the best then, I said to the child. What about you? I still have much to learn. I'm still too weak to wander the world with my chi condensation stage, I'll be able to move once I'm powerful enough, and I'll probably see you at the spirit sword sect. Right then, said the kid and turned to leave. I didn't give up the search, I kept on looking around, 
hoping to find someone to give me more information. As I continued looking around, I saw a familiar face. Elder Hu Tian was on the ground with his back supported by a fallen building beam. He had a large gash on his chest, the sword that sliced through him was vicious as it had borne through the bones of his chest with ease. Even you didn't make it, I sighed. As I was about to leave, I noticed that something was peeking out of Elder Hu's hand. I approached the elder crouched down and with difficulty, pried his hand open, there was a piece of fabric in his hand and in that piece was a sect symbol. It was a three-legged black raven. With a mountain behind it. I didn't know which sect this was, but I kept the fabric piece on me. I'm not a fan of killing, in fact since I had gotten to this world, the times I had to dirty my hands with the blood of my enemies were rare. Mostly because when I was a city lord, I had a lot of opposition and a lot of people after my neck. I stood up. But, this sect gave me a lot. And never have I thought that I will find people as friendly as you in such a world. Where the jungle rules are always in play, the Purple Cloud sect had been a great spot for me to begin my journey. And like the poison God had mentioned in his book, never let yourself feel regret. I'll pay you back your benevolence, with the blood of those who wronged you, and this is a vow I give. I said the dead old man and everyone in this sect. Suddenly, my back shuddered as I felt a strong shiver running down my spine. It seems that giving vows is not something one can back out of, but I'm not going to back off. Even for a small period, this cloud sect actually was helpful to me and was akin to family. Family unlike the one that kicked me down the mountain, but a family that helps you grow, reward your effort, and punish those who wronged you. I'm indebted to the purple cloud sect, even if it was for a short while, debts must be repaid. I walked away from the destroyed sect. I needed power, a lot of it, and staying here, isn't going to give me anything. Ming Hao was right, joining the spirit sword sect was good for him, but I can't, especially with those two knowing me, the moment I step foot in that sect, all I love or bring to myself is nothing but trouble. I'll need to forge my own path, alone. Even if I have to remain a rogue cultivator. But first, I need to somehow pack the library gifted by the sect master, and then completely leave this is. I don't want to be here when one of the nearby sects comes and investigates the disappearance of the purple cloud sect. Chapter 30, Gifts Packing the library proved to be far easier than I thought it would be. Thanks to the Poison God's book having a dimensional pocket, it was able to suck in all inside it just as I thought about how I was going to start gathering the books. The only thing left was what was left beyond the closed door frames. Once I opened the doorway, which came out easier than I thought it would be. The hinges had actually rusted over due to the passage of time, and when I used my sword, the creeping demise, it easily tore through them and toppled the doors inwardly causing a lot of dust to float up in the air. There were a lot of withered plants inside the formerly closed chamber. These must have all been spiritual plants that have been contaminated by the braided morning petal and were now dead and no longer useful. As for the braided morning petal, it was everywhere. It was a strange looking vine plant, it had climbed its way through all of the shelves and furniture in this small chamber and made itself comfortable inside pots, crevices, the ceiling, and the floor. It looked like a deadly garden that had overpowered the creation of man and had claimed its place. I began by plucking the plant that looked exactly as its name suggested, it was a vein that had its leaves shaped into braids. I plucked the first plant, and almost immediately after the whole thing began to move as if it was a beast that had been rudely woken from its slumber. The poison god's book immediately came into action. It shone brightly from inside my chest then it came out, rattling its pages as it opened up and began absorbing the plant inside it. Fully consuming the material and leaving nothing but the chamber devoid of all life and leaving a neatly dressed skeleton inside. I guess that's it, I said to no one in particular then headed out. There was nothing left for me to do here so I'll have to move to a new place and find something new to do. 
I have enough materials to climb to the next stage of cultivation so there was no need for me to wait here in fear of someone coming in to investigate the decimation of the Purple Cloud sect. As I have vowed to find the perpetrators of this ploy, I needed to first know who was responsible for this incident, and the reason behind such cruelty in uprooting an entire sect. So, I needed information. And the best way to get information was to either join another sect or go to the big cities. I had learned quite a lot in my brief existence in the Purple Cloud sect, and the most important piece of information that could be regarded as useful to this incident was the fact that the Imperial Court had sway over the 8th and 9th tier sect. Supposedly, the Imperial Court is comparable to a 7th grade sect where the emperor is immortal but is still supported by a powerful 7th grade sect. The current Zo emperor should have information. But I'm but a mere chi condensation cultivator. And would never get an audience with the emperor. Therefore, I'll need one of two things, either I should strengthen up and be powerful enough that even the imperial court would have to be wary of me or manage to somehow get the king's attention. Neither seems to be a plausible nor possible answer to my dilemma. As both choices are difficult. The first would mean that I'll need to be powerful enough to compare to a 7th grade sect, of whom the sect master is usually a soul formation cultivator. Which is a grade above nascent soul, the same grade where Elder Lao the alchemist of the purple cloud sect. That would take a lot of time not to mention an incredible number of resources. The second option would mean that I'll need a private audience with the emperor, and the only way an emperor would heed my words, is if I had something that he would value. And for emperors, there are rare things that would sway their needs. Not to mention, if I have something he needs, he could easily take it away by force. This was a world where if you have a treasure that you can't protect, you don't deserve it. The only thing I could have and he would dare not risk messing with me into taking is the emperor's life. Easy as that, I'll need to put myself in a position where only I have a say if the emperor could live or die. This is the quickest of the two methods but by far the riskiest. And all of this is just to get information about the sect. I changed my clothes to the set of clothes that the skeleton inside the inner chamber had. I didn't need to be questioned if someone recognized the robes I have. The robes were dark black and had a hood. Which was perfect as it would draw less attention if I was wearing more flamboyant colors. I started walking towards the north while munching over one of the petals of the braided morning petal. I used the poisonous herb as a snack as I walked towards the general direction of the Imperium. I began thinking about what I should be doing while rotating my meridians. There was no need for me to waste any time not cultivating, and I needed to become more powerful fast. More time had passed as I walked, and I grew fond of it. And it didn't take more than 8 days before I managed to break through and finally achieved foundation establishment. The moment I broke through I sat down, in the middle of nowhere and began rotating the poison chi within me to achieve stability. After a few hours of concentration and a powerful vomiting fit, I stood up in front of a pile of impurities that left my body. I was able to sense even more of my meridians. Exactly 54 of them. All over my body and one big lump a couple of fingers below my abdomen. Dungeon unlocked. Finally, I managed to truly step into the path of cultivation. The Poison God's book shot out of my chest and switched pages until it stopped on a new page that I haven't seen before. Equals 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 equals, Foundation Establishment. Disciple of mine, you have reached Foundation Establishment with a lot of time to spare before the bone grinding poison could fully corrode and destroy your body. This would give you great power in your upcoming trials. The more powerful the body is when it reaches the next milestone the greater the benefit, and I'm not talking about body cultivation, but poison resilience. As the longer the bone and body grinding poison saps from your body before the next millstone, the weaker you'll become in the following phase. Now I could disclose to you when you can fully rid yourself of the bone and body grinding poison and make it an asset instead of a blade that is looming like a guillotine above your neck. The Ascendant Phase which many of the lower worlds would consider it godhood, 
here in the upper realm it is nothing but the starting point of the real journey of cultivators. Still being an ascendant means that you'll need to cultivate for hundreds if not thousands of years, but worry not, following this book's guidance and with a little bit of luck, becoming an ascendant, unlike for the beliefs of the people in the lower world isn't a myth, but a true and honest fact. Now, same as the qi condensation stage, cultivating to the next stage of the foundation establishment in reaching core formation will need you to cross nine stages, three lower stages, three middle stages, and three upper stages of foundation establishment. And as the name suggests, your foundation must be immaculate, perfect, and strong if you wish to go far in the world of cultivation. You have now unlocked 54 of your meridians, which is the norm, but in the foundation establishment, you'll need to unlock the rest of them. Preferably at least a hundred meridian. But if you manage to achieve the legendary perfect meridian body and unlock all 108 of them, then your cultivation path will fully unfold in front of you, giving you access to power never seen before. I have sadly never been mentored and only managed to unlock 106 of them, but follow my teachings and you shall surpass me. First things first, I have kept a few treasures for you in this book that will aid you in your journey and they shall present themselves to you whenever you reach a millstone. The first is this flying sword. Equals equals equals, and immediately a sword shot out from the book. It looked like a giant slab of brittle steel, it didn't look fancy nor was it that beautiful, it was barely a piece of steel with a handle that could scratch the conceptualizations of a sword. This is by far not the most powerful of swords, nor is it meant for combat, however, Under 4th level traveling artifact, there are no flying swords that could match its speed. The most special thing about this sword is that it will not work for anyone but a follower of the poison god's teaching. Meaning only, you can operate it, as it doesn't work based on the world's chi, but poison chi. It shall be tough to use, as it consumes a lot of the user's energy to fly, but it is a tempering weapon that will aid you in cultivating. The book changed pages and a new page appeared. As of now, you should have mastered the poisonous tiger claw, and this is the diagram of the upper technique of the same cultivation path. Before I could even see the technique I smacked my forehead, I had completely forgotten about the technique I learned in that yetis gave. And never practiced it. But curiosity got the better of me and I looked at what the new technique had presented. It was a man that stood still the disappeared appearing somewhere else nearby, but now there were two of them. Poison Escape, a technique that allows the user to use poison as a reflective substance to create a mirror image of themselves and then fade into a nearby position. This is an advanced technique that requires an understanding of poison emission to cast. It is extremely similar to teleportation, but in reality, it is a high-level movement technique as teleportation would only be available to cultivators who reach the nascent soul level. Perfect, I said to myself, but I cannot use this now, I need to find a secure way and before even risking the attempt I need to first master the poison tiger claw, a skill that I neglected due to ease of life and the comfort of the purple cloud sect. I looked at the floating slab and said, so, I guess you can fly huh, let's try you out then, shall we? Chapter 31, Skittering Problems I placed my feet on the sword and it easily carried my weight without it dipping back into the ground. At first, I stayed standing on top of the sword like an idiot for a few moments. Mainly because I had no idea how this thing would even move. Yet, the moment I thought about the tree a few hundred meters in front of me, the sword shot forward, threatening to fly from under my feet and load itself into the tree. Yet there was something in play that kept my legs glued in place, and the sword made sure not to crash into the tree. The moment the sword stopped I felt like if I had been doing a light jug. It seems that the sword was pervasive as it took poison chi from my body without my consent. Still, those few hundred meters on would have been far more exhausting than using this sword. I nodded to myself, with this, my travels were going to be far easier. The sword was big enough that I could find space to sit in the lotus position while it flew, so I did that and rotate my energy while giving the sword one simple command. 
fly north. The imperial capital is in that general direction. The sword easily tore through the wind while creating a small barrier around it so I wouldn't feel affected by the powerful winds. It was pretty useful as I had my cravings and lit up my pipe, smoking some of the joyful weed that I enjoyed occasionally with Elder Yan. The disappearance of the whole sect is no simple matter, there was a conspiracy in play. The whole Purple Cloud sect was a low-grade sect, unworthy of any of the upper sect's attention, nor was it enough to become a threat to them. There was something that I wasn't seeing in this picture, a missing piece that could make the picture clear and why was the Purple Cloud sect destroyed. As I flew over trees and foliage, I continued thinking, trying to deduce any new clues on what happened but sadly there was nothing that came to mind. I put the thoughts to rest and focused on my next mission. The Emperor, or any one of the Imperial Court, would have a good idea of who destroyed the Purple Cloud sect. Days of flying went by, and I only sustained myself with leaves from the braided morning petal, and the occasional whiffs of the joyful weed, the two substances left my body in complete numbness after every use, but I was beginning to feel signs of resistance. Once I'm fully capable of resisting the side effects of the joyful weed and the braided morning petal, I'll be fully immune to their effects and would be able to apply their effects into my poison spells. Which would be amazing. A little bit in the distance and far off the direction I was taking, I saw a group of people gathered up in front of what seemed to be a cave entrance. I gave my sword the order to move towards the cave and it did. I made sure however to keep my distance from all the spectators as I didn't want any troubles. Some of these spectators were all mortals, and a rare few were cultivators as I now could easily recognize one from the other. These cultivators however were at best, foundation establishment, as I didn't see anyone beyond it and couldn't feel the threat of a core formation from amongst them. One of the mortals looked at me and his face turned white as a paper sheet. An immortal has descended upon us. He said and began kowtowing like crazy. Shut up, a cultivator said as he kicked the kowtowing man, and said, He's weaker than me, don't bow to those lesser than I, fool. The man said and looked up at me, he spat in my direction and said, Who gave you the right to rise above me, come down this instant. Seems like the edgy manners of all of those stepping stone extra characters in those stories were not made up after all, I ignored the brat, even if he was stronger than me, that was only by cultivation level, he was a foundation establishment of the middle tier, quite a few layers above me, but nothing that a single poison breath can't take care of. I looked at the cave's entrance and willed the sword to go towards it fully leaving the man in contempt of his peers as I didn't even deem him worth my time or my answer. You! said the man as he pointed his hand on my disappearing back. I was inside the cave and called the flying sword back into the poison god's book, sadly there was no light. So, I used my finger to light the way, mimicking Elder Yun's finger flame. The green flame was powerful enough to reveal the path in front of me and what lays beyond the dark entrance of the cave. I continued walking down the cave until I reached a fork. I didn't know which path to take, so I approached the candle to the ground and noticed a footstep of one of the cultivators on the dirt on the ground. So, the group of cultivators outside the cave weren't the only one, perhaps they were a group that was guarding the exit. This would mean that there is a stronger group inside no wonder that guy was acting all haughty I fear that they might have a core formation cultivator. As for the mortals there, could they be the ones to have discovered this cave? Or probably their mules to carry objects? No, that doesn't make much sense, the powerful cultivators could have holding bags. Sacrificial offering, or waymakers to ensure no cultivator would find themselves in between the jaws of a trap. No matter I have a more urgent matter at hands, the fork. Seems that all the footsteps are headed this way, but the other way. I mumbled as I looked at the other side, there was no clear indication on why they didn't split up, but the fact that none or probably no more than one person took this way meant that it was dangerous, and whenever there is danger, there is opportunity. I took the other path and continued forward, I slowly made my way into the leftmost path, without encountering anything that seemed life-threatening. 
yet at the end of the pathway, I finally understood why they didn't pick this road. The path I walked on ended on a perched platform that looked over a gigantic hall that extended all the way to the unknown depths. However, there was a small constraint, everything was moving, not the walls, but the critters all over it, the hundreds of thousands of them, maybe even millions of them, walked the walls, all in ununified, chaotic and totally shiver-worthy manner. Spiders Small red spiders walked all over the place. A flamethrower would be pretty handy right here now wouldn't it? Chapter 32, Treacherous There was no way for me to cross this without being eaten alive, so I was about to walk away when I heard a wet crunching sound under my foot. I lifted my foot from the wet and mozzarella-like remains of the spider that was stuck to the sole of my foot. Shit, I cursed. And instantly afterward all the room's skittering stopped, then they all began hissing. If spiders couldn't hiss, well these ones weren't normal spiders, these are cultivator spiders. Nasty stuff. A swath of spiders came at me and an even larger group came rushing along the walls of the platform I was on and closed the exit using their bodies. I sighed, if this was an RPG, I'd be getting a lot of EXP for this. Man, I miss my days on earth playing games every night before going to work. I took a deep breath and spat out my poison breath. In a locked and enemy concentrated area such as this place, my poison breath should be powerful enough to cause some serious damage. And so it did, the green wave of death shot forward and spread along the room like the tides of death. Whenever it went past an insect, the latter would fumble and fall dying, and once it touches the ground, it would already be dead. More spiders died as my poison breath permeated through the room. And in less than 10 seconds, the whole room was only riddled with the bodies of dead spiders. Good, I mumbled. Looking down, now that the spiders were all dead, I could see a small set of stairs that was leading from the platform I was on to the lower floor. I took the stairs and went down. Once I was on the ground, I made sure to survey my whereabouts before I took my next step. I needed to make sure that I didn't leave anything behind me alive. Assuring that there was nothing left alive, I continued walking forward, slowly, because there could be traps, traps that I didn't wish to encounter right now. Slowly making my way, there didn't seem to be anything out of the ordinary, the walls and floors were filled and riddled with spiders, if there were any traps, they seemed to have long been disabled. Perhaps by old age or just the number of spiders that usually moved through this area, they would have enabled the traps long ago. As I moved forward, I was able to see even larger spiders dead or dying on the long corridor headed forward. There seems to be an est forward, and the small spiders that died at the entrance were just the newborns, as for the ones in the corridors, some were as big as my thighs and others were even bigger, but they all had one thing in common. Either they were dead or dying. I continued moving among the dead bodies, only to see even more dead spiders. The poison breath's area of effect has vastly improved after I reached Foundation Establishment. And now with 54 meridians, I'm able to cast the poison breath spell on an area as big as a football field. Which is nice. After half an hour of walking, I met the first spider that was still alive. This one had eight legs and if one were to focus their sight, they would notice that this spider's legs were shaped like a curved pointed sword. Its mandibles were larger than a man's leg, and from the looks of it, this thing was at least 5 meters long. The spider wobbled as it moved towards me, but it made sure not to fall, it slowly hissed as it skittered forward. I guess you're the best opponent to try this on then, I said to the spider, fully knowing that it will not understand me. Once the spider got close enough, I moved to the side, and I was right in doing so, as it had spat a white substance from its mouth that fell on the ground and spread to a sticky looking spider web. Now, that's stranger, spiders shouldn't be able to create spider webs from their mouths, quite interesting, I said to the spider as I continued sidestepping his attacks. It wasn't that I was fast enough to agilely and rapidly dodge the spells but the spider was so slow due to the poison that a child could dodge his attacks. Once I was close enough, 
I sliced at the tiger with my hand, shaped into a tiger claw. My index and middle finger curved and linked together, so is my pinky and ring finger, while my thumb was separate and on its own. The slice didn't seem to have any effect on the spider as it bounced off against his thick armored exoskeletal body. Stupid me, I forgot to use poison chi in the attack. I shook my head, having been focused on the form I forgot the essence. But that small mistake was going to cost me dearly. The spider managed to swing one of his many legs at me, to which I ducked, dodging the blow in complete luck and avoided being decapitated. I rose swinging, my clawed hand this time fixed and poison chi rotating all over my meridians then being focused on the tip of my attacking fingers. The moment my hand touched the spider, it slid through. Not across it, but inside the spider. I pulled my hand immediately afterward when I noticed that the spiders had begun squirming and its body began bulging in different places. Shit it's gonna blow, I cursed and turned, hastily running away, then slid next to a nearby fallen pillar that I used as cover. The spider blew up immediately afterward, leaving guts and remains sticking to the walls and ceiling of the passage I was in. I looked up from behind the fallen pillar at the aftermath of the battle. There was a small core within the fluid remains of the spider. I walked up to the core and placed it above my chest. The poison god's book immediately sucked it inside it. The spider that just died had so much charisma that I didn't notice the big door that it came from. And what lay beyond it? It seems that the poison had barely entered through that door that led somewhere deeper in this cave. And if my poison breath didn't go through, then it would mean that there are enemies that are still intact. I got closer to the door and took a deep breath then spat out the poison to no avail, as it shot back into my face and behind me. The poison breath however couldn't move forward, it seemed that there was a force in play that immediately pushed it outside the door. I scoffed at the annoyance. This is going to be troublesome without the poison, but all of this would be for naught if I give up now. I sat down near the door's entrance. I thought about eating the braided morning petal to supplement my lost poison chi but decided against it, that plant makes me dull, and I don't need that in this situation. The joyful weed, however, makes me more focused though overusing it will get me stoned up which is equally bad. I filled my pipe with the joyful weed and lit it up. After smoking for a while, I stood up, my mind was far sharper than before and I had a good idea of how to deal with the remaining spiders. I stepped into the doorway. I walked through the doorway, and inside was a man-built tunnel that led further down into the deep. The tunnel was large enough to allow only one of the spiders passage, and if only one of them comes at me I could handle it myself. The problem lays in the fact that I can't use my poison breath here, mainly due to the strong wind coming from within the tunnel. This reminds me of the cool wind that the Ice Yeti had been releasing as his breath, but only here, it was far less powerful, far less cold yet, constant and continuous, this was natural made wind. And facing up wind, my breath skill would get swept away behind me. So, I had to get close and dirty if I'm forced to fight. I continued walking and had nothing to help me see through the dark but a small green flame, that I lit up on the tip of my index finger. After a long while, I heard the screams of people, coming from inside the cave. Seems like there are others than just me. I continued moving through the corridor until its end, where I saw an enormous palace that had been chiseled into the walls of a cavernous hole. The palace was amazingly huge, and the fact that it was carved up in the depth of the earth was even more amazing. Yet spiders had infested it. They laid their eggs everywhere around it and all over the now destroyed garden at its front. I looked up and realized that through the spider webs covering the summit of the cavern, there was a big hole. This area seems to be like a volcano with its tip covered in cobweb. I turned off the small light coming from my hand, the night sky even without a moon, shining through the cobweb was enough light for me to see clearly. Not far away from where I stood were hundreds of spiders like the one I just fought earlier, let's call them warrior spiders. And they all seemed to be surrounding one creature, which was by far the largest spider I had ever seen. 
It looked like it could fit 10 or 20 of the warrior spiders in its stomach and that still wouldn't be enough. This was a spider queen. The warrior spiders would go toward where a group of people was battling, fight against them and kill whomever they could, then one of the spiders would impale the dead cultivator and drag it through the dirt towards the queen. The cultivator would get immediate processed, the warriors would rip its arms and legs, taking it for themselves, and would hand over the head to the queen. The queen then would split open the head using her mandibles and would suck in the brain. This whole process didn't last longer than a dozen seconds and more corpses piled up in front of the queen. The torsos weren't however disposed of, but they were webbed together and stockpiled for later consumption. I was lucky enough that all the spiders had been slowly pulled toward the fight and left me all alone here, also I came to realize that the volcano-shaped mountain I was in was the reason why there was such a powerful wind. The air would come from the volcano's top and would then come down and exit through the tunnel, creating a wind current. Yet now that I'm here, the majority of my poison breath if I were to release it would rise and mix up with the air inside the volcano's belly. I slowly made my way towards the palace, hiding and taking cover using all the random rocks and boulders and growths that were growing in this place. Though this area was filled with spiders and covered in their webs, I noticed that the palace itself seemed that it had never been pried open, so while the spiders were occupied with the cultivators, I could probably get inside and see what I could find. I have no obligation to save anyone, as these people had taken the risk to challenge this place and still failed. So, it is of no concern to me if they live or die, nor would I feel regret over the death of people I don't know. Still. Sigh. I looked back and saw that the screaming had lessened, and the people were now being covered in webs instead of outright being slaughtered. The queen seemed to have probably eaten enough and now ordered her minions to keep her prey fresh by covering it in webs and keeping it alive for later consumption. The spiders continued covering the cultivators in spider webs and soon after they stuck them to nearby rocks. One of the spiders had dangerously gotten closer to me. If I were to make a sound, I'll be joining the rest of the cultivators as a mural decoration. I rotated my energy and released a low dose of my poison breath, this one wasn't based on the bone and body grinding poison, but rather the braided morning petal. The toxic and paralyzing effect of it. Small gout of purple smoke shot out of my mouth, which was far less dense than the bone and body grinding poison, and far less pervasive, but at the same time it worked fast, it shot up to the spider and the latter stopped moving and flopped down to the ground. I had to move away from this area because the secondary effect of the braided morning petal would kick in soon, and then it's going to become a problem to stay close. The spider that flopped to the ground started spasming while I moved away and took a roundabout way to get behind the rocks where the cultivators were stuck. Another spider realized that one of its own was having a nasty seizure, and when it went to check, the prime spider suddenly stopped moving, and then its body began tearing up revealing bloody braided petals that tore out of the spider's chitin. More spiders had gotten closer when the petal began releasing more toxins. And more spiders were infected. The commotion brought the attention of all of the spiders inside the cave, which was perfect. I took the opportunity to get behind the boulders and said in a low tone, Hey, you still alive? Why yes. Help please. The man frantically said. S-H-H-H-H-H. Be quiet. I'll get you out in a second. I touched the webs and immediately recreated it, the thing was sticky as heck and thankfully I only used one hand. Damn sticky, I cursed. I'll use my sword, be careful, and don't move, I said to the man. Swords are useless there are no swords that can cut through this. The man's words were abruptly stopped as he saw my creeping demise slicing through the webs with utter ease. You were saying? Nothing. Let's escape. Hey, hold it, I'm here to help you all. If we're a big group the spiders will chase after us. We have to save our skins. This man has a nasty and wretched personality, the moment I save him he immediately tries to escape not even giving a single thought about his friends. If you wish to escape, go ahead, 
I'll leave when everyone is safer. But you don't know any of them. The man said. His words caused me pause, this man. He knows too much. Dangerous, how does he know I'm not friends with any of these people? So, it means that he suspects that I found my way to the palace's entrance from another area. Meaning that even if I had saved him here, once we're out and he is safe he could do what he wants, perhaps even blame me for the death of his comrades. Though this reasoning isn't without flaw, in those stories, this would have been the perfect explanation. It doesn't mean that I shouldn't help those who need help. Leave if you want. I shooed the man away and went to the next person stuck. Just I was about to remove the webbing of one of the cultivators stuck in the rock I heard a loud stomp behind me when I turned, the man I had just saved, with murder in his eyes was swinging a sword at my neck, and it was far too late to dodge. Chapter 33 Hunter Becomes Prey Everything stopped, or everything began moving rather extremely slowly. This was my mind sigh going on full throttle. This is what Elder Yunt said about my thinking abilities being increased several folds in crisis. It used to happen only rarely in our games of Go, but now, it happened in reality, when the sword of this godless cultivator who I had just saved was about to chop my head off. My mind went into overdrive and in the span of a frozen moment in time, I saw everything. I saw his focused eyes, the hairs and pores on his face, and the ugly scrunch they made, the sweat and soot and dirt from being imprisoned by the spiders. The clothes he wore, their fabric, and even the sword, every nick, crack and dent I saw it all. And then, my mind switched from external to internal works. How was I supposed to survive? The sword is far too close for me to dodge, and I would end up with either a severed head or a torn main artery, none of which were survivable outcomes. Suddenly something came to me, a figment of hope, doable, yet carries risks that far outweigh the benefits. If it works, it will mean my survival, but failure. Failure is not an option, it will mean my death, and the end of everything. I have just started cultivating, I cannot die in some random cave, by some random person. I have to succeed. And I will succeed. My meridians began pumping poison chi and swirling it, and with the aid of the newly unlocked donchen, the poison chi I had stored inside was quickly used up, all to use one single spell, that I had far too great chance to fail and for it to backfire. Poison escape. Two words and our situation immediately switched. The man sliced through my head, yet his sword didn't meet me resistance, it was as if his sword had gone through smoke, and so it did. My real body, the physical one had appeared a few steps away from the smoke-made body that the cultivator decapitated. Then the smoke body exploded like a deflating smoke balloon, and the smoke, liquid in sight more than gaseous, floated and began seeping and coursing through the ground until it touched the cultivator's leg. Not a moment later, the smoke sensed life, and then it all began wallowing and swooping against the cultivator. It looked like the smoke was trying an awkward dance with its prey, as the cultivator cried out, screamed, and howled, in pained agony that no one was going to save him from. Yet, in his agonized death throes, he brought about the attention of every spider in the room, and that was not the worst of it. I was unable to move. My body was in a state that it refused to properly function. A side effect of using a spell I didn't fully understand the base of. As I should have had complete mastery of poison tiger claw before trying the poison escape. More spiders skittered towards me and the dead cultivator, yet the moment they noticed me, awkwardly sprawling on the round, two of the giant spiders grabbed at me and began spewing spider silk on me. It wasn't fun. If I'm caught, I'll die and there is no escape. They started by my legs, and torso, the moment they reach my head, I'm done for. And before I could be fully submerged with the spider webs, I spat out the remains of poison chi that I had inside me. Shooting out a blast of poison smog that immediately caused the spiders to shudder and shake, dying from the bone and body grinding poison that I released. The queen sent out a loud high-pitched screech that caused all the approaching spiders to stop and walk back towards her. 
she called their retreat, quite smart and that's not good. Facing a smart enemy like this spider greatly reduces my chances of survival. Thankfully I still had one arm available and wasn't covered in silk. I pulled my sword with great difficulty thankfully the effects of poison escape didn't last long and nicked the silk, easily ripping it off of me. The spider queen was big, so big that she could fit in four elephants in her stomach. And her mandibles were so large that I could easily fit between them. She bulldozed her way towards me while I was still struggling to regain full mobility. Yet she made sure to keep her distance, she opened her mouth and spat out a purple colored substance at me. Her aim wasn't perfect, so most of it missed me, but the sheer volume of the purple liquid she spat didn't even need aim. A bit of the substance splashed against a nearby stone and hit my clothes, melting a piece of the fabric immediately. While the stone that was the primary target had melted completely. The spider queen was competing with me in poison? Right then. I drew my sword and slid it across my arm, causing a spray of blood to shoot out and wet my sword. The spider was about to shoot another spray of acidic liquid while I threw my sword at the spide in a spinning motion. A cultivator has good physical strength, even if I'm old, I could accurately throw a sword wherever I wanted, and my aim was one of the spider's eight eyes. My sword immediately lodged itself into one of the spider's eyes and dug in deep. That wasn't the end. My blood, fully contaminated and submerged in my poison as she had entered the spider's body, from the eye and close to her brain. The poison acted up immediately. As the spider's legs began shuddering and shaking, unable to carry her own massive weight. The legs fell and rose to no visible rhythm as the spider screeched from the tormenting pain that came from the lodge sword in her eye. The rest of the spiders didn't dare come to where the queen was screeching, unlike what a herd would do when one of their members is being attacked, the spiders escaped hoping to save themselves from whatever misfortune happened to their queen. The queen kept screeching unable to move in a straight line, and when she locked her eyes on me, she came at me with maddened rage. Shit, I cursed. I was unable to move and running away was not an option as I can't outpace this behemoth. The spider lunged at me, only to fall a few feet short, wheezing as black blood spewed out from its mouth. I balanced myself up, holding my bleeding arm with my other hand, I'm sorry for this. But I had no choice, you came at me. I then raised my leg and stomped on the sword that had its handle protruding from the spider's head. The stomp was forceful and the spider jerked one last time as the tip of the poisoned blade struck deep within its brains. Killing it instantly. A green aura began materializing over the spider. Huh, I didn't use poison breath on the spider. Oh, so it's definitely the poison from my blood. It has the same effect as the poison breath. The green aura consumed the spider as it empowered itself and left nothing from the spider queen but its exoskeleton and a thick purple core that I ripped out and pocketed. The energy coursed through me as I absorbed it, healing my wound and enabling me to regain my full mobility. This was rather fortunate, I said as I looked at the palace that was now empty of all spiders. I guess it's time to explore you now. Slash slash, Chapter 34, History I walked towards the palace's massive gate while avoiding getting trapped by the spider webs that were covering everything. Not even the ground was safe from the white blanket. I had to cut my way through in some areas, where the webbing was just too much. And once I went past a certain point, I found myself at the door of the palace which was speckless. The palace carved into the volcano was untouched directly by the webbing. It was as if the spiders knew better than to defile the palace with their webs. I got up to the massive door of the palace. It was made of bronze as it seems and had a lot of carvings on it, it looked like a giant mural made into a gate. I tried to understand what was going on, or the story that the gate was trying to tell. Looking at it from one side to the other, I saw that there was a great battle led by demons, and on the other side of the demons was an army being led by a man and a woman standing next to each other. The war raged on with mankind taking great losses. Then an even greater demonic creature came up in front of the army. 
the man and woman who were leading the human army brought out a shining talisman up against the demon. It shone bright like the sun, causing a lot of the demons to shy away and escape, and even the great demon was wrathful, despising the talisman. He could withstand the talisman's effect, even for a little, so he threw his massive spear at the couple, where the woman pushed the man away from the spear, sacrificing her life to save him. The talisman then shone brighter and all the demons escaped to the depths of the earth, leaving the humans all alone. The depiction, or what I understood from it was this. But I have no idea why this is related to this place. Or if this actually happened or in just a fantasy. And another thing, the gate is too damn big. Unless I'm a 60 foot giant I'm definitely not gonna be able to open it. I tried to push the door though I knew it would be impossible to even make it budge, the construction unlocked and opened up widely for me, causing me to trip and almost fall on my face. Light flared up as torches after torch slid up leading deeper into the palace. The palace's floor was made of grey marble, and it looked like it was making the entirety of the palace. Even its pillars ceiling and decoration. It was all made of high quality marble. But there didn't seem to be any furniture. Nor did this palace look like something people had lived in it. There were however thousands of statues destroyed and broken all over the palace floor. They were broken by fist, sword, spear, or any other weapons. Not even the marble made ground was safe from a battle that had occurred here. As I moved about, I noticed that there was no second floor, and there were no other doors leading to other rooms. The whole palace was just a massive hall full of pillars and a ceiling. And deadly looking destroyed statues. As I was thinking about how lucky for me that these things were destroyed. On a nearby pile of scrapes, something moved, and I didn't like it. Whatever was moving underneath that pile, didn't look like it was going to be friendly. I carefully stepped away from the moving pile, and I'm thankful I did. An automaton jumped from inside the pile of rubble and dashed past me with supersonic speeds. Just the fact that it went past me with speed far greater than I could ever match with my mere sight not to mention movement, I knew I was dead the moment this thing would stand back up. And when it stood up, my heart rate rose, like a drum being struck with a bat, my heart beat to a powerful rhythm. Whatever this thing was, it was far, far, far stronger, faster, and more agile than me. The automaton moved to face me. It had no eyes no nose, and no ears, it looked like it was wearing a bucket instead of a head. One of its arms was torn out of its sockets, the tip of a sword embedded in where its heart should be, but as it seems, the sword didn't go in deep enough. I have no idea how I realized it, but I just did, then again, it could be the process of the mind's eye that Elder Yun always talked about, the ability to understand and deduce things far faster than what a mortal could do. Yet, knowing a solution to a problem and solving a problem are two different things. The automaton stood still, it didn't move or budge, it was just standing there, unmoving. I didn't know why it stopped moving and it wasn't killing me right now, but for whatever reason that happened, I'm thankful. I slowly went down and picked up a small pebble. I placed it against my thumb and flicked it against a nearby pillar. The moment the pebble had struck the pillar, the automaton was a fraction of a second later than it as it crashed into the marble pillar. Breaking it with its body, then destroying whatever remained of the pillar using its only functional arm. Thankfully the automaton was crazy, as it was chasing after sound, and the sound that it, itself made when breaking the pillar was giving it false information that there was still an enemy there. The automaton kept breaking the pillar, and with every noise his own hands made, he believed that there was an enemy. And I took that chance to move away. Compared to my low noised footsteps, the booming explosive strikes the automaton was making were far louder. I needed to leave this hall, so I continued looking around until I noticed a seam in one of the building's walls. Just as I was inspecting it, the whole wall moved and pushed itself back into the side, revealing a stair passage leading further down. I shook to my core because the moving of the store had caused the booming explosions the automaton was making to stop. It must have heard this. 
I slowly removed my boots, it was better to walk this way as to make the least sound possible. The air didn't smell bad, it was fresh, so there seems to be a current further down. An exit is a good sign. I continued walking, hoping not to find anything as dangerous as that automaton, and at the same time wary of any traps that I might set off. Because so far, two doors had opened up for me on their own, any sane man would immediately think that I'm being led down the rabbit hole, or to my untimely timely death. When I reached the end of the staircase, I found myself in a newer room, but something was strangely amiss. I felt my bones clattering as if something very wrong is happening right now. As if something that shouldn't happen had happened. As if I'm witnessing something that I'll never forget. Once I peered into the room at the end of the stairs, I saw black and grayish smoke, almost transparent. It looked like that portion of the world was on a black and white filter. And the smoke moved to cause that filter to move with it. I was unable to understand what is that thing but I realized that it wasn't good with a number of chains, locks, talismans, and more items that were consecrated and used to suppress it. The smoke was unable to move past the round chains that were trapping it and it seems that whoever built this mechanism know what they were doing and didn't spare a single resource. Suddenly, a voice so deep, so mind and soul shaking echoed from the depth of the smoke and directly into my mind. Come closer. I heard. Closer. 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 The voices echoed, even louder, and deeper. They came from the smoke. And I knew it was not good. I looked around the room, fully ignoring whatever screamed or shouted from within that smoke. Nothing good ever came out from tampering with seals that people of old had placed. And especially seals against something this nefarious. The whole of the room didn't go past this point. It seemed that it was the end of this palace. It didn't look like much after all. But also, this could be a conquered palace. Or it definitely was. Judging by the number of the automatons that were destroyed, this place must have been visited, ransacked, and left with nothing but this. Yet why didn't they remove the seals? I mean, though it might look stupid, some people would actually not leave something like this lying about. Some cultivators could use this, and others could destroy this. But neither of the options was chosen. Then that leaves me with three results. First, no one discovered this place yet, which could be odd. After all, people who fought those automatons and managed to destroy so many of them would definitely be able to sense this place. Unlike me who got lucky and saw the seam in the wall. This scenario is not that believable. So, this leaves two other options, whatever is inside this, it's too terrorizing for any cultivator to use, so they sealed the nightmares away. The automatons could have been placed here as guards to stop people from getting their hands on this thing or just not to temper with it. The last option is, it's too powerful for any cultivator to control and make proper use of nor were they able to destroy it, thus it was sealed. The second best option. However, in either case, I have no ability to control or handle something such as this. I should leave. But before I go, I pulled out a small petal from my book. It was the braided morning petal, I dipped a few drops of my own blood on the ground and buried it a few feet away from the door where the seal was. The braided morning petal is a nasty little plant, and when I plant a piece of it here, it shall grow to act as a poisonous seal. That will stop anyone from getting closer to the real seal. Though I'm not proficient enough, nor knowledgeable in the art of formations, seals, and protections. This is the least I could do with my mediocre knowledge. I should probably leave, just as I spoke the words. And turned up the stairs, I was face to face, with the automaton that was a few moments away upstairs. Slash slash, chapter 35, Puppet Maker the automaton would have me killed in less than the time I could even think about activating poison escape. The qualitative difference between this automaton and the cultivator that tried to cut off my head was like heaven and earth. However, I was still alive, and the automaton was just standing there with its hand raised in attacking action. I knew that whatever was happening in its mind was conflicting with his action. 
but I'm not going to stand here until it made its choice. After all the two choices it could make were, kill or no kill, and I don't want to find which right now. I'll make my own choice. I infused poison chi in my hand and struck with my right palm. The palm attack transformed into a clawed hand attack and it was the poison tiger fist, the claws struck against the broken sword tip embedded into the automaton's heart and forced the sword tip right through where it should have been in the first place, right through the automaton's heart, or in this case its core. An electric current spread through the body of the automaton as it dropped to its knees and fell to its face. The poison god's book shone bright and shot out of my chest. It opened up and began consuming the automaton, sucking in the robot inside it. Then the book flew away from me. Wait! I shouted but the book didn't care it kept floating and moving away back through the stairs. I chased after it. More like ran after it as the thing was too fast and I'm still old. Once I arrived on the top floor, I saw a strange sight. The automatons or their parts were being sucked into the book. The whole room, every bit, piece, and bolt were consumed into the book. How big is that stomach of yours? I questioned not expecting a reply. An image came to view, and it was shocking. The book could literally fit in something the size of a football field's worth of stuff. And so far, it didn't have more than a fraction of its size full. Suddenly the book closed up after it had fully consumed the parts and shot towards me. It opened up on a new page. Puppet Maker. An occupation that could entitle its owner limitless riches. It all depends on one's resources and resourcefulness. Here are my few notes on the topic. I was never a great puppet maker, but the few I made helped me greatly, from fetching my food to massacring my enemies. It can do all sorts of things. And with my little, information regarding the topic, you, my disciple could create something that could help you in your journey. After reading through the lengthy notes of the poison god, which by the way took me more than a day, I calmed down, thinking about all the possible things I could do in creating a puppet that I can fully control. This would be a great subject to test so many of my ideas. I smiled as I thought about creating building-sized mechas or robotic ninja squads, but all of that can wait. Right now, I'll need to leave this area. It took me a long time to finally find the exit. As I had to backtrack to where I last entered. Yet I heard a lot of noise coming from outside. There were people waiting outside, or perhaps another group waiting to get inside. If I encounter them, I'll be in trouble. I had a good idea right there and then. I pulled out a large batch of joyful weed, lit it up on my pipe, and then breathed it out using my own poison chi. I didn't want to kill anyone so I vastly reduced the potency of my poison chi and only applied its power to empower the joyful weed's effects. Bellowing gout of smoke shot from inside the cave and permeated through the camp. The people outside started clamoring, thinking that this was an attack. But after a while, a wide laughing hysteria spread. As most of the people outside were mortals, the effects of the poison chi and the cultivator plant on them were far too powerful. I didn't kill anyone thankfully, the dose I applied was just perfect. Enough to cause mortals to start laughing like the mad and to draw the attention of the cultivators. This way I was able to walk through the smoke and pull out the massive flying sword from the book. I stepped on it and willed it to move forward. The sword shot through the smoke leaving the cultivators bewildered about what happened and who was behind the smoke that came out of the cave. I kept traveling through the forestation and open areas of the land of Zhu. The whole damned country looked like if it was endless. Days of travel are only accompanied by smoking some joyful weed or eating the braided petal and the same scenery repeating itself, forests after forests and rivers after rivers as I continued my trek to the empire capital. The more I thought about my idea to kidnap the emperor the more dumb and stupid it became. The man should undoubtedly have information regarding the destruction of my sect. But it's idiotic to try my hand on the emperor without fully knowing how powerful his retainers are. He could easily have a nascent soul cultivator, who could obliterate me. The travel to the imperium was a drag, a boring drag, 
and this gave me thought about how those cultivators of those stories supported such a lonely and awkward silence where they couldn't talk to anyone or anything. Hell if I had a writer for my story, I'd ask them for a small companion, otherwise I'd be getting crazy in no time, and that's not good for the readers. After a lengthy boring while, I saw a group of people attacking a caravan. Mountain bandits, hiding in the mountains all day long and only attack people through the road. They assault travelers, kill the men, kidnap the women and take the loot for themselves. I've had dealings with such people before, they always attacked my caravans whenever I sent them from Lucid Spring to the nearby cities to get resources and materials. And due to the richness of Lucid Spring, it was a new city that beckoned flies from all over the area. The bandits being the flies in this statement. I had to hire some guards and a powerful group of men to wait and lay an ambush for the bandits, then I even disguised several carts full of soldiers instead of goods. It was to the point that only one in every five carriages had real merchandise. And I was still making a profit. Four carriages full of burly men were far less expensive than a carriage full of gold, and precious metal. I hated bandits with all my soul, and I was not going to stand still and watch a massacre happen right in front of me. I flew down with my sword and hovered above the group of bandits that were awestruck as they saw a man floating in the air. So, what do we have here? I asked. And all I received were wails and screams as men began shouting their lungs out like little girls finding out that there actually was a boogeyman under their bed. Chapter 36 Damsel in Distress Two of the bandits drew their bows and shot at me, no warnings issued, they had a rather calm expression. Honed by years of constant faces with death. Fight or flight. And in a case where a cultivator is upon them, they knew that death was inevitable so they would rather risk their lives for a lucky shot in the dark and kill the cultivator rather than try and escape from a man that can bend the laws of the world. The two arrows were to me as slow as a snail. Apparently, my body had already improved beyond human. No that's not the correct term in this case. Beyond mortal limits. What these two men considered a shot that could be a sneak attack and would definitely fell any soldiers that weren't paying attention nor wearing armor such as me, that attack was nothing more than a toddler trying to kill me with a single punch. Pathetic. I easily dodged the first arrow and plucked the second one from the air with my index and middle finger as it was a few inches away from my eye. Impressive. Not the shot, the gall you had to actually try and kill me. The two archer bandits looked at each other and split up, each running in a different direction. Smart an impressive tactic that will cause me to waver, having to think which to chase after. The bandit to my right vaulted over a boulder and jumped into a tree branch, then continued running as if he was sprinting across the solid ground while in fact, he was jumping from tree to tree. The other archer on the other hand had chosen a far risker way as he took to a nearby geographic descent, like the side of a cliff, and ran down with all he got. In that split moment, the rest of the bandits had already run away, splitting like a school of fish when a shark comes into play. This tactic was rather smart though heartless. It would mean that one or at least a few, the slowest, or just the unlucky ones that I would go after would die. And this is probably the reason why they have survived so long even when they were infesting the perimeters of the Imperium. If they were ever chased after by the guards, then most of them would survive on the account of a few unlucky ones that will get caught. I ignore the escaping bunch, though momentarily. There was a small problem that needed my attention. The carriage had its door ripped out, and two women were there, a beautiful and well-dressed woman, and a maid that looked like she was on her deathbed. Still, I noticed that something was odd and I was going to address it soon. As I approached the caravan, the two men in it had come to greet me. One of the men was wearing servant clothes, and the other was a bloodied soldier or guard, he seemed to be the only one left alive. The bandits ambush was so thorough that they had killed off the entire retinue. Lord Benefactor, we thank you greatly for your patronage and hope that you can forgive us for the time it took you to offer our mortal selves your benevolence. Such it with the over-glorification, I just offered a hand. So. 
What happened? I asked the old servant. We were accompanying Our Lady to the Imperial City when we were ambushed by mountain bandits. They had predicted our route and caused us great trouble. Without your aid, we wouldn't have survived. We are greatly thankful. Thank you, said the soldier as he cupped his hands toward me. As I glanced at the battered carriage once again, I realized that the so-called lady was in fact not the lady. It seemed odd. So, why aren't you panicking? I asked. W. Why should we panic? Asked the servant. Oh, he probably interpreted that wrong. No, I don't mean you harm, but why aren't you panicking since your lady is badly wounded? The two men looked at each other and looked back at me when the servant said. How did you figure it out? He asked. The nails on the girl in the dress, they are polished, but they are rough around the edges, even her neckline has a light tan, she is used to going out and use her hands. While the maid's hands are as smooth as silk, a maid who uses her hands all the time would have rougher hands. The two men bowed to me as the servant said, Please great immortal, we didn't wish to deceive you, it is just a precaution we did to hide the identity of Our Lady. Then you're as foolish as you think you're smart, I replied. The two looked at each other unable to understand the underlying meaning in my words. I sighed as I explained, in these scenarios when you've been hunted by the bandits, who do you think is the first to die? None of them seem to be bright enough so I answered for them, it's the soldiers and the people of least interest, I pointed at the bloody lady dressed as a maid, she was believed to be a person of least interest, a useless maid. In an ambush like this, she has only two options, die, killed for her insignificance, or taken, raped then killed for her insignificance. As for the one dressed as your lady, she would have been kidnapped, then in fear for her life she would have spilled the beans that she is not the lady, then she would end up, raped or killed or both. Dumb decisions such as these that don't take into account all the variables would have ended up with you two in a noose. The two men instantly kowtowed, thank you for your insight. I didn't do this to receive your kowtows, stand up damn it, and next time use your heads. Still, you're not off the thicket, she is bleeding rigorously and she will die in the next hour or so unless you plug that bleeding. Do you great immortal have a pill or something, we're willing to trade you for a pill that can cure her, a palace, or even a great plot of land, anything please she must not die. The woman dressed as a maid spoke. It's not about money, the pills I have are not for mortals. The words I spoke were like an ice bucket being poured on them on a cold morning. Seeing their panicking faces I sighed, but I do have a method. I went to the carriage, got inside, and said, leave. The girl was hesitant at first before the soldier gestured with his face for her to leave. Once the girl was out I overheard the soldier say if he wanted us harm, we would be dead already, trust him. But, the lady. Just stay, he may not look like a monster, but to me, he is far more heroic than those filth bandits. I shook my head, a cultivator's hearing is far more powerful than a human's, and their whispering was like a loud glaring shouting in my ears. I ignored them and checked the wound. The girl was slashed through the face and the sword had cut through her collarbone, breaking it. Miraculously, it didn't cut into any major artery, but the damage was still severe and she would die of fever even if she had first aid. How long until we're at the capital? I asked. It should take us half a day on the carriage. So, not far. But the carriage would be bumpy. It's not good to shake a patient. I bandaged her face and did the best I could for her shoulder. I lit up my pipe and puffed gout of the joyful weed into the girl's face. I made sure to keep a separate stash, one that didn't have the toxin in it. A batch that I was going to share with Elder Yan. The joyful weed is far too potent for mortals, but I made sure to manipulate my chi and reduce its potency to the bare minimum. It was enough for the girl to have her complexity change and her face softens up as if she had relaxed. I don't have the required tools to help her here, she needs mortal medicine and I need an apothecary's shop to treat her. We don't have anything here. I know that's why I'll be taking her. The men looked at me and said, 
If we go back to the city without her, you will be punished, or executed, I completed their sentence for them, but it's far better than the alternative she dies here, you will definitely be killed. I bandaged the girl as best as I could and carried her into my arms. The little thing was too light. Surprisingly, she looked like she was in her mid-twenties, and didn't seem like a person who had gone out much. She had much of her life ahead of her, and she was going to lose it due to the greed of a few bandits. Such wretched creatures. I looked back at the general area where the bandits had run to and scrunched up, I'll need to clear this once and for all once I'm done. I placed my foot on my sword while I carried the girl in the princess's carry. Then willed the weapon to move forward as fast as it could. The girl didn't have much time. The sword, surprisingly fast, had increased its speed even greater than it was. It seems that it is reacting to my intentions, though it's consuming my poison chi like mad, it's giving me far greater speed. If this keeps up, you'll have a chance, just hang in there. I addressed the unconscious girl as we flew forward. Chapter 37, Among Wolves I rode through the wind as fast as I could, flying is far faster than traveling using the bumpy slow ride of the carriage. The journey took less than an hour when I saw a prominent palace standing atop a city so wide that I couldn't think it would exist even in modern day life. The city was clearly far bigger than New York, and didn't seem to be in contrast against itself as the buildings were well organized and built like circular rows surrounding a hill where the imperial palace stood overseeing the entirety of the city. The city's walls were massively big, and it had three sections, the first section closest to the first gray wall was made of houses that didn't look to have great prospects, most of the houses were old, yet not battered, and they all had a monotonous shape to them, squares next to squares while the upper circle had larger houses with different designs, yet they didn't seem to be overshadowing each other. And finally, in the top circle where there was the imperial palace, there were only a handful of smaller mansions with large swaths of land around them and above them as the imperial palace that could actually be compared to a miniature version of the purple cloud sex palace which had been uprooted and disappeared overnight. The whole city looked like it was divided into three sections, poor, or commoners. Upperclassmen, perhaps merchants and wealthy people. Then you have the section surrounding the main palace, which looked to have people of noble origin or royalty. As I approached the walls of the city, I noticed a few soldiers pointing at me. I was as obvious as a sore thumb, especially when I was actually flying. The soldiers however didn't do anything boring such as shoot me without prior notice. I went past the walls of the city and above them without receiving any hostile threats or warning. But I wasn't paying any attention to that for the moment, the girl in my hand was dying. And I needed to get to an apothecary to get her the help she needs. Looking down, I saw a shop that was selling what seems to be vials. I willed the sword to get down, and once it was in front of the shop, I hopped off. The people around the shop left in a hurry. Perhaps they didn't think it would be wise to stand next to a cultivator, or perhaps because I didn't look that handsome. Still, the shop owner was definitely not going to like the fact that I chased away some of his customers. Still, not my problem. I walked up to the shop and saw a man as old as I was standing behind a counter. Are you an apothecary? I asked. What does it look like? The man rudely answered back. He didn't seem to be afraid of cultivators. Perhaps he had lived long enough to have some wisdom behind him. Not all people who ask the favor of an apothecary would come with hostile intentions, and he seemed to know of this fact. I'll need a few of your materials. I requested. The man came closer to me to check up on the girl, but his eyes widened. I'll have to decline from treating this person, she will die no matter what you do and I would appreciate it if you leave this place, I don't wish to have one of the royalty die at my shop. It's bad for business. The old man sternly said. You seem like someone who doesn't like royalty much, but I'm not asking for your personal involvement, I'll just need ginseng extract and some herbal medicine. I'll take care of the treatment. If you say so then, I'll get them ready for you, just so you know, if anyone comes asking.
I'll put all the blame on you. Do as you wish, now get me the damn things. The old man sighed and went inside his shop. And after a few moments, he came back with a few vials in his hands. You don't expect me to treat her on the street, do you? I asked him rhetorically. Then I pushed him aside as I walked inside his shop, there was a small bed for patients that I gently placed the girl on and began the treatment against the grunting from the man who didn't want anything to do with what was going on right now. I immediately poured the ginseng extract on the girl's wounds where she began squirming. What are you doing, she should drink it. The old man said. Quiet, drinking it would be far too slow, and I'm not using the ginseng to energize her but to clean the wound, I replied and pulled out another bottle from the folds of my robes. Or that's what the man thought. I actually placed my hand inside my robes right above my chest where the book was hiding, and it spat out a gourd of wine. I poured the wine on the wounds to increase the cleansing and asked for a wet clean cloth. I wiped the rest of the blood and began applying some of the herbal medicine that the man had brought me. I also fixed the broken collarbone and placed a healing salve made of the needed herbs. Once everything was in place, I bandaged the girl as best as I could and added more herbal salve between the folds of the bandages. The scar on her cheek is going to last. She will definitely not like that. The old apothecary said. I think that surviving outweighs a scar on the cheek. Not for royalty, also, you have a few visitors. The apothecary pointed behind me. Turning I saw a few guards in golden armor and a man wearing cultivator clothes among them. The man was in his mid-thirties, he had long hair and a small mustache that doesn't quite match his face. We'd like to ask you some questions fellow cultivator. The man said as he cupped his fists towards me. Why? I asked. We're the ones asking questions here. One of the guards said. To which I only frowned and the cultivator next to him immediately backslapped the man to the face causing him to fly through the street and smash right into a nearby house. That guard is definitely dead, and I would probably die if I were to show a single sign of weakness. At least, even if you don't know how to keep your guards in line, you know how to punish them, I told the man. The man smiled at me and said, I sincerely apologize for the roundness that men had spoken toward a fellow cultivator. Let me buy you a meal to apologize for what had just happened. He is smart, he actually turned the situation over, and gave me face I really hate that expression now I can't turn him down. I would have asked you to lead the way, but I have a patient that I need to take care of right now. Oh, fellow cultivator is a medical cultivator. I'll have to properly introduce myself then, I'm Fence. An upper realm core formation cultivator. I'm Shen Bao, I nodded at the man, a rogue cultivator. Fellow cultivator, the man said as he peeked at the wounded girl and said, seeing the ghastly mortal wound on the girl treated with simple medicine, and from the information, I had that you came to the city riding a flying sword, I say your background isn't simple. But, Due to the identity of that person behind you, the sect rules are forcing my hands. I need to have a telling of what just happened, just enough to appease the sect so that they would leave you alone. Finch said. Which sect? Crimson Suzaku. The Imperial Sect. Right, then. So, I can tell you what happened. I'll make it brief and informative. That would be for the best. After recounting the details of what happened the man nodded and pulled out a green jade, he placed it on his forehead and threw it in the sky, the jade immediately broke through the sound barrier and disappeared in the distance. A messaging tool, they seem handy. I should get one and see how it works. That has been pretty informative. I'll make sure to send out a party to fully eradicate those villains. I would rather you don't, I said to him. The man frowned but he still had the decency to ask me why? Because I want to kill them all myself. It is something related to my belief and my Tao. Oh, I see, I would not wish to impose upon your Tao heart. Please do as you wish, and here. The man handed me a jade. This jade is inscribed with my mark, once you have killed the bandits, I would really appreciate it if you could send me the jade. 
I wished to pass it to His Majesty as it would make for great evidence in his court. I took the jade and placed it inside my robes. I then cupped my hands and said I'll need to finish treating the lady, and once I'm done, I'll make sure to take you up on your offer, I'm starving. Right, I'll have to go back and physically report to the sect, I'll keep a few guards here. Once the lady's house knows of her whereabouts they'll send a few of their own to accompany her back to her mansion. Fens replied. I nodded at the man and he did the same then he left leaving a few guards that were still unable to utter a single word since their comrade had died right next to them. That was really dangerous, I thankfully stood my ground and didn't expose the fact that I'm far weaker than him. At least with faking that I'm at the same familiarity level and the same cultivation range I managed to save myself from trouble. I didn't want to get dragged out, but still, this little girl had caused me to get a lot of unwanted attention. I'm a camouflaged sheep in a den of wolves, I'll have to either lay low dot or become a big shot. Damn, I have a long way ahead of me, I better start getting some power-ups. Chapter 38, Demon at the Door after an hour or so, a group of men came to the apothecary with a carryable sedan. The men entered the room as if they owned it, and one of them addressed the apothecary with a disregarding tone. Where is Lady F? The apothecary didn't care to answer and only pointed to the heavily wounded woman that was laying on the bed. The man looked at her and gestured to the two behind him with his head for them to pick her up. One of the men went to pick her up by the leg and the other from the shoulders. It was as if they were picking up a corpse. That pissed me off. Easy. I called. One of the men, looked at me, and as if he was about to curse at me, he froze up. W who might you be, sir cultivator? The man said. Just a rogue cultivator, but I'm the one who saved your lady from death, so if you don't want to send her to an early grave after all the troubles I went to, I would rather you pick your lady with more grace and if you don't even know how to move out of the way. The man didn't even hesitate to dodge away from my path as I approached the bed. I carried the woman with as much care as I could, not to open her wounds. Her face was already in a rough complexity, so it would be best to be as gentle as possible. Once I had her in my arms I walked out of the shop and gestured to the men at the sedan to step aside. I placed the girl on the sedan and made sure she was comfortable before I turned to the men and said. I'll have to take care of some business first. But I'll come and visit soon after. Where are you taking her? I still don't know where she comes from. We'll take good care of the lady, Sir Cultivator doesn't need to worry about it. The man at the sedan said. I don't wish to repeat myself, I already said that I will be coming to visit. I frowned at the man. Sir, just ask for the house of Lou. Everyone knows of it, once you arrive we'll take you in as our esteemed guest. The man said and bowed his head. Good, I'll be sure to check up on her in the next few days. I turned flapping my robe behind me and placed both of my hands inside my sleeves and behind my back. I willed the book to release the flying sword that shot out of my chest and placed itself in front of me. I stepped on it and it flew away from the city. My direction was the bandits' whereabouts. Though I don't know their exact hiding spot, I can figure out their general location. It took me a couple of hours to arrive where I'm at first carriage the first time. Though I didn't see them this time around, it seems that they already went through a different route than I did. After all, I was taking flight and only needed to go in a straight line to the capital while they had to travel through routes that turned and spiraled through this fortress. I kept scanning the area with my eyes as best I could. But I didn't find anything out of the ordinary, it was all trees, branches, and plants. I had no way to find anyone with the forest this thick. So, I had to get down. Once I was down, I began searching for signs I could track. I wasn't much of a forest tracker, yet my mind's eye. A cultivator straight was able to understand everything in my vicinity. I saw a few broken branches in one direction, a step in the mud, and a bush that was slightly damaged. Tracks, tracks are easy to follow with the mind's eye. 
As I kept following the abnormalities in the forest, I managed to find even more of them coming all together. It seems that the path I was following was the main path where the bandits gathered and grouped up after they scattered. Seeing that the night was coming down, I felt more confident. My sight never changed, be it light or day, and it gave me an edge as I could see clearly at night time. The tracks kept increasing and they seemed to disappear right in front of a boulder formation in the middle of the forest. Seems like this is the entrance to their hideout. I didn't rush in to enter, so far I had gotten too close to their hideout and didn't see anyone else. These are bandits, and it's obvious that they should have at least a few people guarding their lair. I kept a lookout and scanned the area as best as I could, and though I didn't see anything, I heard something. A muffled yawn, not too far away from me. I rotated the energy within me and spat out a puff of poisonous smoke right under me. The smoke got carried with the wind, and thanks to the dim light of the night the smoke wasn't visible. It spread out around the entire area and soon I began hearing light coughing and then the death throes of a man suffering from suffocation. They were going to die painfully, yet silently. I followed after the sound of the muffled suffocation until I found a person grabbing at his throat, when he saw me he stretched his arm for me to help him, but all he received was a stab with my sword to the neck. Creeping demise tore through his throat, silencing him, and yet leaving him to drown in his own blood, paralyzed by poison, in the depth of the night, where no one was going to save him. I made sure to take good care of anyone else that was being a lookout for the bandits before I changed my focus on the people inside the cave. The entrance to the cave was still locked and I had no idea how to pry it open. So, I basically just waited at the door. I sat on top of a rock that was in front of what I believed to be the cave's entrance and began meditating, waiting for what is bound to happen soon. I could easily flush them out, but I rather not. I have no idea who could be inside that cave, there could be children women, or innocent people, kidnapped by these fiends. I would rather wait for them to open the door. And once they open the door for the demon, I wouldn't need to knock by then. Chapter 39, Dark Thoughts It took less than an hour for one man to show up from behind the boulders. The system operating the boulder was pretty similar to my old cultivation cave back at the Purple Cloud sect. The boulder moved to reveal a dark dug tunnel and when the man walked out, he didn't seem to be too cautious, he looked around and blew a whistle using his mouth. This was probably a signal for the other bandits that were stationed outside, and if he didn't receive the signal back, he would definitely be suspicious and could call for an alert. However, I wasn't going to let him. I had already moved past the man, without him even sensing me. Thanks to the darkness of the night, and my improved physical condition, I was able to sneak past him and sent one single strike to the back of his neck with creeping demise. The sword bore through his spine and neck, protruding out of his throat. A single twist and the man fell down, paralyzed and choking, unable to move nor call for help. I then spat a bit of my poison chiva on my sword, coating it with poison. Once I made sure the sword was fully immersed in poison, I walked down the tunnel. There was light at the end of the tunnel, a torch where many of the bandits were staying inside. And once I was at the bottom area of the dug-in tunnel, I saw a group of bandits laying on the ground. Half of them were drunk and naked. To the side, I heard the sniffles of women. And sounds of muffled pained moans. Some bandits were taking their frustration on poor defenseless women. The sight of women being raped and tortured made my heart feel as if it was being twisted from its place. A revolting action against a defenseless person. Some of the girls were younger than flowers and they too didn't escape the greedy lustful cravings of these men, no, men is far too much of a compliment for these things, and not even beasts would impose themselves upon their mates with ruthless force. These things were far below beasts, they were the scum of the scum the lowest of the low, and even lower. A revolting disgusting existence that is nothing but a waste of breath upon this beautiful land. And they deserve punishment far outweighing what sins they have committed. I slowly walked towards the nearest man, he was half awake, 
and I needed to remove him from the equation if I wanted to fully dispose of this group of scumbags. The man was sitting against a rock, and in his hand was a gourd of wine. He never noticed me walking to his side as I stabbed him through the neck and ripped my sword as fast as I could, causing a spray of blood to spread around him in an arc. The first kill was instant, and thanks to the poison I coated my sword with, the man had died without being able to move a muscle. This was the first, and looking around, there were others that were still awake, but they were far too occupied with raping girls to take note of the massacre happening to them. The group of bandits sleeping on the ground never saw their deaths. Though I wanted them to suffer, it would be problematic to have to fight all of them without using my poison breath, sadly. I'm not proficient enough to control my poison and have it avoid harming the girls. So I kept on stabbing the men on the ground, on strike to the neck, and another immediately afterward to the heart. They never moved or uttered a single sound as I went past them, one by one. Once I stabbed the last man on the floor, I looked forward, there was a girl in cuffs that was looking at me directly. She had bruises far too many to count, her lips were cracked and one of her eyes was black and blue. Most of her hair was wrinkled and she had burn marks on her, yet, her eyes, her blue clear eyes were locked tight on mine. She didn't utter a single word, not a word. And I was sure she wasn't in shock, she knew what I was doing, and knew that if she would call for help, it would make the other bandits pay attention to what they were doing. She nodded at me and gestured with her head towards the men that were assaulting the other girls in a separate room. I nodded at the girl and slowly walked behind one man who had a girl pinned under him. The girl saw me and I gestured to her with one finger against my lips to be quiet. The man's head flew and fell down before he could even realize what happened to him. There were two guys a few feet next to him, and the moment they heard the sound of the man's head falling, they turned unarmed and naked, only death awaited them. But, I had been patient for far too long. I stabbed one of them to the shoulder before he could even move and the second one received the tip on my sword right through his groin area. The moment he tried to shout I sent a jab to his throat shutting him up. The first man who I had stabbed in the shoulder tried to stand up, but a single kick to the knee popped it, breaking it backward and he fell with his leg in an awkward position. They began screaming, and in their scream, more bandits showed up, these, I didn't see, but they weren't numerous, just three of them, and one of the three was one of the archers that escaped from me this morning. The moment the archer saw me, he threw a smoke bomb, he didn't even dare fight and ran towards the cave's entrance. The other two, however, came at me with swords, yet they never stood a chance. Mortals against cultivators you have better rods betting at an ant killing an elephant than this. The two died before they knew what happened to them and only the two wounded rapists had remained. I walked towards the girls, I didn't offer any solace, because there were no words that could be said to comfort them, yet there was one thing that they could do and it would definitely release some of their pent up frustration. I walked toward every girl and removed their bindings, their cuffs, or the ropes around them. I rounded the girls up then dragged the two men to the center of the cave where the dead bodies of their comrades laid. I handed the girl with the blue eyes a sword and said three words in her ears, make it painful. I then headed out of the cave. Soon after, gruesome sounds of pain screams echoed as the girls took their own revenge with their hands, it will not be enough, it will not satisfy their revenge, but at least it would lessen the damage. Some of them will probably end their lives after this. But some, who can withstand this event will definitely turn out to become stronger women. This world is cruel, far crueler than I believed it to be, but so was the world I was in before. At least these girls have gotten some semblance of peace, a small token of revenge, but in the world, I lived before, these fiends who wear the skin of man. They had escaped the chase of law far too many times and had gone under the radar, unnoticed by the flawed eye of the justice system. Once I was outside, I pulled out the jade that Fins had given me. I placed it against my head and I was able to immediately understand how it works. I could print memory of mine on it, and I printed the memory of the slaughter and clearing of the cave. Once I was done, 
I threw the jade in the air, and it immediately took off on its own, breaking the sound barrier and disappearing in the distance. I swung my sword to the side, removing all the blood from it, and placed it behind my back. I was done here. And I needed to get back to the city. This much killing, though I thought would make me feel disgusted, did not. It was simple, it was easy, and frighteningly, I felt pleasure doing it. I didn't believe these men, to be men, they were less than that, even less than malicious insects, so stomping them was not heavy on my conscience, no, it was the complete opposite. I felt that what I did was just, and they deserved it. Law? Justice, you can preach to me all you want about that, but once you see some of these fiends do what they do, law is irrelevant. For what law can return to these girls their chastity? for what law can return to these girls their lives. Even the death of these men had done nothing. Justice, it's flawed. Only power, absolutely complete, and dominating power has right. And if you're weak, you'd be as helpless as these girls. Then what justice would you write? I kept thinking about this as I rode on my sword, I didn't want to hurry to the city as I slowly went through the night's cover and breeze. I thought hard and clear about what just happened. This world has no justice, and one day, I could be in the hands of someone who is far stronger than me. The last thing I want is to feel as helpless as I felt that day in that cave. I'll never be in that position, never, ever again. And to do that, I need strength, a strength far surpassing everyone, I'll need to be strong enough to grab the reins of my own fate, and steer it wherever I want. I need power, unlimited power, even if I have to go to the dark side. I thought as I tightly pressed at my chest, where the poison God's book resided. Chapter 40, The House of Lou I came upon the city lights in the distance, the lit torches and lamps gave the whole city a serene calm, and peaceful image. A great contrast to what went on in the nearby forest. Once I arrived at the city gate, a man flew to meet me. He seemed to be on a greater cultivation realm as he stopped me midway. Fellow cultivator, this city prohibits entering it using flight, I'll have to ask you to come down with me. The man said. I nodded and went down to the city gate where the man stood in front of me. It seems that you're the person Brother Finns had talked about. The man said. I don't know what Brother Finns had said about me, but I hope he only spoke true, I replied. Oh. Worry not, we have received your jade. The clearing of those despicable mountain bandits will prove quite helpful to the masses. The people of the city are in your debt, however, as cultivators, you should remove yourself from mortal matters. The man replied. For me, if I see injustice, be it mortal or immortal made, and I have the capabilities to change it, I will change it, I replied. I will not argue your logic. Just do know, we cultivators live in a realm far greater than the mortals. And if you remain bound to mortals, you'll be unable to survive your mortality severing stage. The man said and turned around. You should head to the house of Lou, they're expecting you. The man said and threw me a jade. I took it and placed it against my head, it had the general map of every house in the city and the location of the Lou house was highlighted. I thanked the man and walked in the direction of the city, it didn't take me a lot of time to arrive at the first gate separating the two sectors. The guards immediately opened the door for me, not even asking me about identification. Someone had already given them a description about me, at least this way I wouldn't have to worry about having to prove who I'm to the house of Lou. After an hour worth of walking, I arrived at the house of Lou. There was a swath of people standing at the gate with torches lit. Guards, servants, and handlers, all in wait. And once I arrived, the servants bowed to me and the guards came around me, escorting me inside. I entered the house of Lou, which was a mansion within a large garden of beautiful flowers and roses. There were even ponds with koi fish swimming within it. The servants led me towards the mansion and inside it where I saw a woman and a man standing in wait for me. The two of them looked to be in their mid-forties, and from the colorful and well-made and probably expensive clothes on them, 
they seem to be the owners of this house. Sir Cultivator. Welcome to our humble abode. The man said while giving me a deep bow, and so did the woman. I looked around and replied, If you say this is humble. I have no idea what extravagant is to you, I replied. As the whole building was made from expensive wood and decorations of silver and gold all around it. How is the girl? She is relaxed, the treatment you had given her had saved her life. I sent a few more apothecaries while you were away, but they couldn't do more than what you did, and some even urged us to know of how you managed to treat what seemed to be a fatal blow with simple medicine. I waved my hand in disregard at the man, secrets of the trade. I'll still need to check up on her and see if I need to change her bandages. You've done so much for us sir, we wouldn't want to impose on your time. The man said. It's not like I have much to do right now, I'll have a look at the girl then leave. Yes, follow me please, the man said and he moved ahead and into the upper floor. We entered a large room where the girl was asleep on a bed made of something far better than the best beds I slept on and I was a city lord. I took a quick look at the bandages, the wounds didn't seem to be bleeding, and her bandage is relatively clean, but it will need to be changed. I pulled out a few of the herbs, kneaded them, and made a medical salve. I gently removed the bandage on her face, revealing a ghastly scar on the girl's right cheek. I wiped the dried blood away, cleaned it with ginseng and alcohol then applied the salve again on it, finally, I covered it with bandages. I did the same for the wound on her abdomen. And when I was done I turned to the parents who seemed to be distraught at something. What's wrong? I asked. My daughter, she is to be wed to the prince next fall. With that scar on her face. The woman trailed off. Your daughter's life was in danger and all you care about is a simple scar? I replied. Sir, with all due respect. I don't believe it's easy to explain. The man replied. I looked at the two in the eyes and removed my hood, after all, I had my face fully covered by the hood so was the rest of my body, and the only things that were visible from me were my hands that were in gloves. Once I removed the hood and they took a good look at my face, the pustules on my arms and hands, the woman gasped. The man immediately slapped her and kowtowed to me. I'm greatly ashamed of my wife's behavior oh great cultivator, she didn't know and reacted in such a way, please forgive her ignorance. She didn't mean to insult you. The man said with enough gusto that it almost moved me. I don't care about it, I've been inflicted with this for a long time. I don't care what people think of me, I replied while I put on my gloves and covered my arms with my sleeves. Once I had my hood back on I said. Physical appearance isn't more than eye candy, it will one day go away. The scar on your daughter's face isn't something that will devalue her or lessen her value. If the prince is naive and shallow enough to disregard your daughter due to a simple scar, then you're better off not marrying her to him. I said as I stood up. Please sir cultivator, we will not speak of this, but what you just said can amount to treason against the crown. Also. It is a diplomatic move to marry into the royal family. And with the opportunity gone, other rival houses will take this chance to marry into it and will destroy us. The man replied. You're using your own daughter as a chess piece. If you get destroyed, remember, it's not your daughter's fault, it's yours for being such a bad chess player. The best diplomates will never use blood relation to secure their position, think about it, find another way. I walked out of the room. I left a bit of the salve next to the girl, change her bandage every two days, she should wake up tomorrow. And her wounds would heal in a few weeks. She'll need to rest for a month, and after that, she'll be good as new. Bar the scars. You can probably get a receptarier to make you a mortal wound healing pill, but it will be expensive. Probably it will be worth all you own. That means that you'll be betting what you currently have, for what you could probably have, those are odds that I'll never take. I replied to the men and left. I didn't need to stay in that house, otherwise, I'll be dragged into a political struggle. I know of this because it would have been the same tactic I would use if I was in his stead. When a powerful entity comes to your home, 
your best option as a politician is to enroll them to your side and not have them go to another. And I wasn't ready to play the sides game, at least not yet. The emperor, though I need to have a meeting with him, it's still far too early. I'll need to get a secure location for myself first, I have a few things I need to do. Once I was outside the house and at the gates of the house of Lu, Fins had appeared in front of me. He seemed to have been waiting. Brother Shen Bao. The man smiled at me. Brother Fins, I cupped my hand at him. I've seen your exploit on the jade, and I dare say that was an amazing display of cruel cold-blooded skill. I wouldn't have been able to stop myself from going all out and killing them all, but I learned greatly from you. Had I tried to do it my way, the bandits would have used the girls as hostages, though their deaths are not of great value, it would have slightly bogged me. Yet you. You coldly dispatched of every bandit and gave the girls a chance at redemption, such great benevolence, and such great patience is really awe-inspiring. The man said in a couple of breaths. Shit, all these compliments, I'm screwed. He needs a favor. Brothers Finn, don't sell yourself cheap, I'm sure you would have chosen a method even I would be inspired and awed from. I nodded at the man. No, I'm sure I wouldn't, my dinner offer still stands, do you wish to come with me? Sven said. Yes, I'm willing, I have nothing else to do. Still, I'd like to ask you for something. I said. Now, I know he wants to ask me for a favor, but if I ask him for a favor first, and a small one at that, it will make him unable to ask me for a greater favor. It would be rude, and for cultivators, favors must be repaid in kind. Why yes, anything for brother Shen Bao. I'll need a place to cultivate in, somewhere where I'm not interrupted. Can you do me that favor? I'll owe you one. Oh. That's simple, I have a few places where you can cultivate without anyone bothering you. Let's talk more about it over dinner. Right, lead the way, I said. Now, with a place to cultivate, I'll be able to work on some projects. Alchemy, and puppet grafting, also, it's long due for those pouches. The cultivators at the Poison God's Cave have left me with a few pouches and I need to see what's inside them. Now that I'm at the Foundation Establishment, I should be able to open them. Chapter 41, Drinking Night After a few turns and twists, we arrived at a large establishment where people went in and out at a constant pace. Once the attendants at the entrance saw Fins, they welcomed him with open arms. Please follow us, the attendant said as he walked inside. The first floor had many tables full and bustling with people enjoying their food. They feasted on boar meat, fish, and other strange-looking dishes while enjoying wine and drinks of all sorts. The place seemed to be reserved for the wealthy, especially since the decoration was marvelous. Not to mention the servants who were all pretty young girls that didn't seem to find any shame in flirting with the customers for an extra dip. The man led us to the second floor, and once we arrived, a beautiful girl led us to a private room where we went inside and sat on comfortable chairs. Get us the usual, Finch said, and the girl nodded. Then she closed the room and immediately I felt my ears popping, it was as if the room was locked airtight. Silent room? I mumbled. Right, anything you say here will stay here. These rooms are designed to counter eavesdropping. Finch said. Right, then what do you want to talk about? I asked. Right then, well, I just wish to know more about you. See, the fact that you came into the Imperial City flying where it is well known to be a flight prohibited area means that you're not from around here. Also, you didn't seem too worried about me, nor my senior disciple Zulu. Meaning that you clearly have a good background. I wish to make friends with such people, you never know when they come in handy. Fins explained his reasons. Though they seemed clear and innocent, I wasn't too dumb to believe them. My origin will remain mine to speak off, it's a good strategy to keep it secret as it will deter many off of my back if I were to get into trouble. Secondly, I'm here for training. Oh, I understand, I wouldn't want to pry further, the man said, 
and he clearly didn't mean what he just said. He still had questions and I know how he wants to extract them from me. There was a knock on the door and the girl from earlier had come with a group of servants to serve our food. It was stocked with fresh meat, whale, and fish, and all sorts of delicacies that need ten men to finish. Yet the most auspicious was the alcohol. The alcohol they brought was in covered pots that looked ancient. Old rice wine. It should be delicious. I went for the wine first, and the moment I took a gulp, I grinned. This is good stuff. I said as I swallowed what should be compared to lava and not alcohol. The damned beverage was really hot but strong and delicious. And this confirmed my suspicion, this man wants to get me drunk enough so I can let my guard down. Though it's not impossible to get cultivators drunk on mortal wine, cultivator wine on the other hand is powerful enough to knock out the heaviest of immortal drinkers. Yet, that would never be the case for me, simply because dot wine is poison. I drink from the pot relentlessly, even competing with the shocked man. Have another drink fence. I said as I giggled. I never thought you'd have such tolerance, hell, you're a good drinking partner. The man smiled, this time it was genuine, and he actually drank a full cup in one go, challenging me to a competition. We talked about random things, most of all, our cultivation, which I simply decided to lie to him about. I cultivate the stars, I said. Oh, a star cultivator, rather amazing, I see why you went to those bandits at night, most star cultivators are superior at night time. Yes, but we can even be strong during the day, people fail to understand that the sun is also a star. And using it to power one's cultivation is the best way to overcome difficulties. I replied as I took another gulp. The man pondered for a while before he raised his cup in cheers, that was rather simple yet enlightening, thank you for sharing such knowledge. It shouldn't be that much, it's common knowledge don't mention it. I replied. What about you? I asked. Ruthless water sword. The man said, he tapped the alcohol pot with a finger and the wine inside it jumped up in the air, creating a water sword, the sword hovered in the room, flew around for a bit then dipped back into the pot. I clapped at the party trick. Amazing display of skill, I'm envious, I replied. The man kept laughing and never forgot his primary goal of goading me to reveal more about myself. Yet the more I spoke, the more confused he was. I only spoke the truth, yet always in complete truth. This way, he'll never think that I'm lying to him, nor would he believe I'm telling the whole truth. Lies are easy to figure out, yet incomplete truth leaves a man with a sense of incomplete understanding. He would rather not push the matter further also, because he will believe himself to be rude if he were to insist. And since I already told half-truths, he has information, incomplete, yet still, information is better than nothing and that will take him off of my back. Right, so you said you're a rogue cultivator, are you willing to join our sect? The man asked. I'm sorry, but I decided to go through my cultivation alone. I have no need to bind myself to a single place. I still wish to see a lot of this world. I replied. I respect your decision, still here, the man handed me a token. Damn, I'm collecting these like Pokemon now. This is a guest's token, show it to the guards at the Imperial sect and you'll be granted entry, come visit whenever you wish, also for the cultivation cave you asked for, here. The man handed me a jade and a key, this is the location to a secure house I have in the city, you can get in and use it as you see fit. There is a cave underneath it with a small spiritual vein, it's not as powerful as the ones you find in sex, but it's good enough for one person to cultivate in it. Oh, that a lot, I can't accept such an offer. I replied. Don't worry about it, we're friends. The man said. I gave the man a rueful smile, I'll make sure to pay you back, I don't like to owe favors. I replied. Do as you wish, for now. Let's have more wine. The man shouted as he slapped his cup on the table. More wine kept coming in, and we didn't leave until Fins was able to see three of me at once. As for me, 
After the first cup I had, the moment I started to feel buzzed and lightheaded, I began rotating my poison chi, consuming the alcohol, destroying it, and converting it into poison chi. And to be honest, the alcohol in this establishment was potent enough that I actually raised my cultivation a little. I think I'm done for today, Finch said while gulping. Yeah, I guess, more than this and we'll be knocked out cold on the floor, I humored the drunk man. We both walked out of the bar, or at least I walked out, Fence was barely able to stand up and I had to carry him out. The staff never asked for payment, so it seems that because he was a regular, they wouldn't bother with following us. Thank God, as I didn't have any money on me right now. Zhu Liu, the man that I met yesterday night came over, he looked pissed. Fence. What's the meaning of this, have you been drinking again? Zhu Liu shouted. And in a second, the drunk man next to me stoutened up, standing like a palm tree. Yet that didn't take more than a couple of seconds before he fell to the side, losing balance. Yeah, I think I do drink a bit senior brother, he said while laughing. Zhu Liu took the man and gave me a despicable look before he left with his junior brother. Well, that went well, I said as I looked around. I had already located the general area where the house fence had gifted me. And I walked toward it. The city was quite big, and since I couldn't use my sword to fly around it, I had to rent a taxi. Which was a carriage that was dragged by a buffed man for a few silvers. And since I didn't have any silvers, I threw the man a silver ring I found on one of the bandits' bodies. Once I arrived at the house, which was located in the middle sector of the Imperial City. It was inconspicuous and didn't seem to have any close neighbors. It would be perfect for cultivation. I entered using the key that Fence gave me. The house was a simple two-story house, it had a couple of rooms and nothing of value. It had a trapdoor under a rug that led down to a small cultivation cave. By saying a cave, I mean a dug-in square room underground that could be closed and opened. Once I was inside the room, I made sure to check every corner and bit of the room. Once I was sure that there were no tools to spy on me I began by pulling the book. Yet the book didn't want to emerge. I understood that I didn't check enough, the book would only reveal itself when no one else was present, and from the reaction of the poison god's book, someone was either spying on me or there was something I missed. Yet I had made sure to check everywhere. Ah, yes I checked everywhere, but at the same time. I forgot the most important place to check. On myself. I tapped at my clothes and robes, nothing came to sight, but two things, the token Fins had given me, and the jade. The token didn't have anything obvious about it, but the jade, on the other hand, shimmered with spiritual energy, though I couldn't sense the spiritual energy, the poison chi in me can easily react to it. And when I tried coating the jade with poison chi, it seeped into the jade and broke it. Shattering the thing into tiny pieces. The poison god's book immediately shot out of my chest. I guess the jade was the spying tool. I'll have to talk to Finns about this later. Now, let's start, I mumbled to myself as I pulled the pouches. I hope I could open them now. I had about seven cultivator pouches. All belonging to the cultivators that had captured and tried to kill me in the poison gods gave. The first pouch I pulled belonged to the man with the crimson robes. And just as I was about to pry it open to see what was inside it, the poison gods book shot right in front of me opening a page. Open it, and you'll die. Right. I didn't see that coming. Chapter 42, Puppet Making I looked at the second pouch, after all. Opening the first one was gonna kill me, so I'm better off not to try and pry into a traps. For the second pouch, there were no warnings, I actually waited and even asked the book if there was any danger entailed in opening this pouch, but seeing that there was no such thing, I went ahead. The pouch only needed for me to infuse it with a little bit of chi, it didn't matter if it was poison chi or spiritual chi, chi is chi, and the pouch is neutral to the type. So it opened, and the moment I touched upon the rims of the pouch, it gave me a picture of everything within it. 
there were thousands of pill bottles and herbs locked in spiritual boxes or preserved them. There was also a small hill of small stones, that gave off powerful spiritual energy. Weapons of all sorts and robes, dress for the cultivator. These robes all had the same color and shape, and the same logo, it was a sex uniform. There were also some tokens and the most interesting were cultivation books. I also found a piece of a map, I pulled it and understood that this was the map to the poison gods gave. It seems that all of these cultivators had a piece of the map, they gathered up and made the map as a whole and then went to the cave once they discovered the location of the treasure. I ignored the rest of the content of the pouches it didn't have anything else worth mentioning. I continued looking at the other pouches and found a lot of good stuff, mainly weapons and herbs of the 8th to the 7th ranks. There was only the first pouch that I couldn't open, and it seems that it belonged to the strongest cultivator of the bunch, so I was better off keeping it for when I could open it while keeping my life. I began by gathering all the items that I thought are worth my time in the Poison Gods book, as for some of the weaker weapons and some healing pills. Those I placed in a pouch and placed it on my side. I needed to have a fake pouch for whenever I found myself in trouble it would come in handy to not have all my eggs in one basket. Now that's done, I went back to the main thing I was after, puppet making. I started by pulling the puppet that was going to kill me back at the spider cave and placed it down. I had a few tools that I found from one of the cultivators who seemed to have a side interest in puppet making and pulled them out. I needed to understand how this thing works, and thanks to my knowledge in the engineering domain. This puppet was going to be a great project. Once the puppet was out, I began by dismantling it. I needed to understand how it worked and how I can mimic it. The whole thing was truly difficult to untangle, every screw and bolt had a mechanism to protect it and keep it in place that I had to pop off first before reaching the screws. I managed to unbolt them and removed the head of the torso, and once the head was out, I started by removing the right hand which was the only limb left on its upper body, and then the legs. Once every piece was out, I noticed that they didn't seem to have any wires connecting them, so how did the limbs receive the command to move? I figured I needed to dig in deeper. The head didn't look like it had anything special, supposedly it wasn't where the brain was located. I looked at the chest area, where the tip of the sword was embedded, there looked to be something that was dug in by the sword. I had to open the chest to see clearly. There was a small hidden plate that covered the screws of the torso, once I removed the screws I was able to open the chest from the side of it, it opened like a box revealing its inside. There was a golden circle drawn in the chest area, and right at the middle was a broken spiritual stone, though broken and clearly old. It seemed to still have some spiritual energy within it. It would still work as a power supply. Once I made sure that the jeweled piece was removed from its place, I began by studying the circle. There seemed to have several strange letters and symbols to it. They were organized in different and various shapes around the circle and the pinkish stone was powering them. Yet, with the sword dug in deep, the circle was broken and it seemed that it no longer worked. The sword had cut through a great part of it, leaving it barely readable. If I were to reverse engineer this, I'll need a reference point. I started by pulling the other puppets and dismantling them, which took the better period of the night, I could even know it was day by the rising temperature in the room. Still, I worked diligently, heck this was bringing me back to my roots, and it was fun. I enjoyed using my hands especially in anything that dabs in precision and details. Once I dismantled the majority of the puppets I began by writing the symbols on a piece of paper, going from puppet to puppet, and figured out a few things. Not every circle was an exact match to the other, there were a few differences, especially in the drawings. And the one that had the most complete and detailed and perfect circle was the first puppet I dismantled it seemed to have the best quality. As for the stones, most of the other puppets had their stones destroyed and were inoperable and unusable. Once I compared the circles I managed a rough drawing of a complete one in a piece of paper. I studied it and understood some other things. 
It seems for whatever reasons these writings were like programming codes and once they are put together they will make a brain of sorts that can execute simple commands. Though I didn't fully understand the exact meaning of every symbol, I could get the gist of them. And with a few repetitions, I could manage to write them. I began by reproducing the circle on other pieces of paper, and after a long time, I managed to perfectly draw the circle and could duplicate it from memory alone. Now I needed to see how this drawing could revive a dead puppet. First things first, I'll need a puppet that is in operable condition, and the only one that almost matches this condition is the first puppet, though it has a deep gash in its chest and was missing a limb, I was able to replace them from other puppets. Now that the chest was perfect and the left limb was taken from another puppet, I put the whole thing together making the puppet. I opened its chest area and carefully wiped away the golden drawing that didn't need more than a wet cloth. As it seems the ink that was used to write this inscription wasn't permanent. That was a flaw, imagine if the puppet was in contact with water, that'll make it faulty immediately. And though I don't know which ink I should use to write the circle, I know of a good quality ink that can be used to write talismans. The Drowsy Inkberry which was a spiritual herb I got when I was in the Purple Cloud sect. I took the drowsy inkberry and followed the instruction of the Poison God's book on how to process it and make it into ink. It didn't need more than a bit of dew water, and a pot which was in abundance in the cultivator's pouches. After batting the herb and mixing it with water then extracting the liquid that turned black after a short while, I pulled out a brush and began drawing on the puppet's chest. I completed the circle but left only one small line of it which will serve to close the circuit. That line I wrote in regular ink that can be removed with a splash of water, for reasons that I will explain later. Once the puppet was done and the circle was completed and closed, I placed one of the spirit stones I had in my book in the center. Though the spirit stone wasn't as powerful as the pink one which was there before, it should be enough to operate the puppet at low power. Almost immediately the puppet turned to life and it took a slow swing at my face. I dodged it and splashed its open chest with a cup of water I had readied before. The puppet immediately stopped working as the line that was written in regular ink had faded. Well, I guess there is a kill on sight command in that circle, the problem is I don't know which one. Time for some trial and error tests, I said and began by removing one of the symbols. The only way for me to figure out the attack command was by the process of elimination, and only when I eliminate the appropriate symbol would the puppet actually not attack me. And then I began by replacing symbols, removing them, changing them, rewriting them, and even writing strange gibberish instead of symbols that were already written. This process was going to take a while, and I had a lot of time. Chapter 43 Procuring Resources Several days went by as I continued to study the symbols. I even went around the city for a couple of days to clear my head off, had a few drinks, and practiced star cultivation, then resumed my work. I had great hopes for puppet making and I had great ideas to integrate into it so I wanted to be thorough while making the symbols. One day though, I happened to walk across the street and saw a man selling some goods and among them was a specialist tool for puppet making, I asked him how he got it and his answer was simple enough that it left me baffled at how I completely missed it. The auction house, he said. Apparently, he thought he had purchased something expensive, and seeing the two lawn close-up, I noticed a few signs of wear and damage. This thing wasn't worth much in the hands of an amateur, but if I could get my hands on that tool. I'll be able to upgrade my own tools to better handle the puppets. You willing to sell? I asked. 200 spirit stones. The man said. I'll give you 10, I answered. Are you mad? You know how much I paid for this? The man answered in question. I don't really care, but you seem to not know how to use this, nor what is it for. This is a tool for puppet making and it's already damaged beyond repair. If anyone would like to have this tool they'll often get a new one. After all puppet makers are rich. And they won't settle for second-handed goods. I shrugged. Ha. Huh. Nice way to try and trick me out of a deal, 
But if that was true then why are you trying to buy it? A hundred and fifty spirit stones. The man answered smugly. Ten stones, and I'll tell you why, because I need to use that tool as a mold to make a new one, so basically I'll discard it the moment I make a mold out of it, I stated, giving him the impression that I was buying garbage. The man looked at me like I was crazy, he still tried to haggle some more, but after a long while, all he got from me was twenty spirit stones which I reluctantly gave. I could have stayed there haggling with him all day long but I was tempted to try the tool as soon as possible. I pocketed the tool and went to the nearest pavilion, the man had said that he bought the tool at an auction, but since auctions usually have a specific time, once a month, year or decade depending on the value and importance of the auction, I couldn't wait for one to appear. So, the pavilions of the capital were my best bet. Once I was at the capital's pavilion, I took a pause, frowning deeply. Compared to the purple cloud sect, the imperial pavilion was rubbish. It didn't look like it had anything important even with all the over-the-top decoration and paintings, it didn't have the honesty and detailed fine work of the wood, ceilings, and floor of the purple cloud pavilion. I guess the purple cloud's fourth grade sect secret identity was what made it into such a prosperous sect. And when they were attacked, even the pavilion had disappeared due to its quality. Seems like the imperial sect can't even hold a candle to the purple cloud sect. I went into the pavilion and was greeted by a young girl, Welcome to the imperial pavilion, what can I do for you? She asked. I need some 7th grade materials, and books on puppet making, I said in a disregarding manner. Most people here tend to act all haughty, and I needed to act the part especially since I had no idea how much these items cost. Better to act like a snobbish noble, at least people will think twice before trying to inflate prices, lest they offend me. Sir, puppet making materials and crafting materials of the 7th grade requires authentication by the imperial court, you'll need a VIP clearance to have them. The girl said, but there was still a hint of fear in her eyes, I guess my attitude worked. I frowned at the girl but immediately showed the girl the token I got from Fence. The girl immediately bowed and said, For an esteemed guest of the Imperial sect, you're more than welcome to get anything you wish from the 7th grade materials and the manuals you're looking for at a 20% discount Sir Master Craftsman. Master Craftsman? The heck? I supposed she deduced it from the fact that I was trying to buy crafting materials, but I was not going to correct her. The more of a high impression I give, the better I'll be treated. Good then, lead the way, I said as I followed after the girl. Thankfully Fins had proved useful, this might even make me forget about his sly attempt at trying to spy on me using that jade. Probably. I followed the girl to the third floor of the pavilion where she showed me the door and said, You can have your pick of the materials you want from here, once you chose everything you need. Once esteemed guest is done, please come back to the receptionist and he will charge you for your items. She said while giving a bow. You mean I get to freely pick? Aren't you afraid that someone would steal from you? I said. Sir, no one had ever dared steal from the pockets of the emperor, only a fool would dare do such things, as, for powerful people, they'll not even take a second look at this pavilion. She said in a matter of factly. True, there could also be a tracking mechanism on the items, so stealing would be a really dumb idea for anyone not capable. I went inside the room and saw several shelves stocked in materials. Black stone, ingreed iron, sleuth wood, frictionless obsidian and many more rare minerals and items. These are all heavily sought after for puppet makers. But compared to the material the puppet I had gotten were made of, everything here was worthless. I kept looking around until I was stopped by the book, it shone a bright light on a specific stone in the pavilion. As I looked at it, it didn't look special, it was a purple stone, a spirit chi ceiling magnet. It wasn't uncommon, but it was a useful material, it could cut the flow of spiritual chi when it came in contact with it. It's a pretty good item to make puppets as it could allow a puppet to preserve energy but it shouldn't be that important due to how easy it is to find. 
Also, there were other rocks like it all over the shop, but the book only looked this one piece. I still decided to take that one piece and continue my search. After a while, I managed to procure many items I needed, tools and writing brushes, more drowsy ink berry fruits to make the ink, and a few parchments to make talismans. Finally, I got two more books, Basic Knowledge of Talisman Writing, and Puppet Making. The Poison God's knowledge of puppet making was not bad, even if he himself said that he didn't know much about it, his knowledge and the symbols he knew had far surpassed the puppet I had, so they were basically useless to me in making my own puppet, especially since his own symbols required Saint Chi to use, which was a grade higher than spiritual Chi. Saint Chi can only be obtained once one had ascended, discarding the mortal body and attained unity with the world. A true saint, then their whole body and the quality of chi they can harness would evolve. For me, saint chi is so far away that I can't even fathom the full scope. A simple comparison would be that a single piece of rice worth of saint chi is comparable to a whole mountain of spiritual chi. It's just not possible for me right now. So using the same symbols as the poison god is dumb as I don't have the energy to control it, yet using his knowledge, his symbol organization, and factoring it against the symbols of regular chi would relatively make for powerful restrictions. Yes, the correct term I discovered was restriction. And restrictions have enormous ranges. They can be something benign as lighten up the room, to something as complex as defending an entire planet. A restriction based on the knowledge of the user can become a killing formation or a defending formation that can make illusions or it can even gather spiritual chi. That's a whole damn sea of knowledge I need to look into. For now, puppet making doesn't make even a slight fraction of the entirety of restriction but I'm going to try and master it, then look into the other aspects of restriction. I want to make something unique, never before seen in this world, and I'm going to do it. I smiled as I had great goals, and it was the first time in more than 70 years, that I had a clear goal. The first goal I had when I got to this world was to make the city of Lucid Spring prosper using my own methods, and now, I have even greater goals. And once I set my eyes on something, I'll do it, no matter what. Slash, hey guys, I gotta admit, I'm pretty amazed by how generous people can be especially since we're raised to see the evil side of people, we rarely take a pause to see the good they do. Chapter 44, Master Craftsman I went to the clerk and paid my dues, it wasn't much, after all, the money is coming from the pockets of those despicable cultivators that had tried to kill me. Once I was back home, I pulled out all the stuff I had gotten and began by studying the arts of puppet making. The book started by introducing the symbols and their meaning, and thankfully I had a prior attempt at deciphering the symbols of the puppet, so I had a good basic understanding of what I was doing. I started studying the symbols and understood the meaning behind every one of them, and how they all work together to write a code of sorts, it was like writing a computer program, nothing too difficult after a good study session. And once I understood a symbol properly I tried to apply it. First things first, movement symbols, I used one limb of a puppet and wrote a small circle on it, then began by painting the movement symbols on it, nothing happened, after all, there was the movement command written on it, but the execution command was missing. I then went back to the book and looked for the execution section and how to make a puppet do your work, basically, it can be used using different methods, speech which will have me make sound reception into the puppet slim so it could translate my speech and pick up the execution command to apply it. So I needed to write another set of symbols alongside the command symbols. Then I had another idea, what if the puppet was in a situation where it couldn't hear me speak? I needed a secondary input in place, sight? I needed to look for sight reception commands and write them. I continued modifying and writing on the puppet's arm, and after days and sleepless nights, I managed to finish my work, the hand I had was packed full of writings and symbols, so many of them, so complex and tightly packed that they looked like small tattoos. 
the puppet's arm was a prototype and it took the better half of a week just to make every command written on it function with each other and not overlap. I'm surprised that whoever wrote that simple looking circle in the middle of the puppet managed to do it. But once I went back to the original restriction on the primary puppet which now I called X, I was surprised at my own advancement in the domain of restrictions. The primary restriction, now that I fully understand the symbols on it had only three commands, sight and sound reception, attack on sight, and hibernate. Nothing too fancy, except the attack command, which had several sets of commands that allowed the puppet to move, though, in a monotonous robotic way, it was powered with a powerful spirit stone that allowed the puppet to move at extraordinary speeds. But my commands. My commands touched upon the rooms of human behavior. I had written symbols and circles all over the puppet's arm, enough of them that there were circles in between the puppet's finger joints. My symbols had focused on precision than brute function. Not only that, but the arm itself was a sentient part that once powered with a spirit stone can function on its own, it can even use the fingers to move, something that I was about to test out right now. I placed a small spirit stone on a small hole that I dug into the arm's joint where it would connect to the puppet's shoulder. The puppet's arm came to life as the spirit stone shone bright and lit up the symbols, soon the arm shuddered, flexed its fingers, and then clenched them in a fist. Come to me, I gave a command, and the hand immediately began moving using its fingers. Sadly, it didn't take the hand more than few feet before the light on the symbols turned off. I panicked at first, did I write something wrong? This was a coder's worst nightmare the computer code looks fine but it doesn't work, or worse, the code looks terrible yet it somehow works. I needed to find the error. Just as I was about to pull out my tools, I noticed specks of dust settling behind the arm. As I picked up the arm, I noticed something daunting. The spirit stone had been completely sucked dry and nothing of it remained as it turned to dust. I guess so many restriction symbols need a lot of energy to function. I need more powerful spirit stones. I sighed, but that didn't discourage me. This means that my symbols work. And I can write more of them. I began by picking a second arm for Puppet X and started writing on it, this time it took me 5 days before I was done and after testing it by feeding it a spirit stone and making sure the arm functions perfectly, I went for the legs, then the chest, then the head. Three months, I spent three months working on the puppet, making it stronger, faster, more very styled, I even placed poison-coated needles inside the puppet's fingertips, the fingertips would fall down and the puppet can shoot tens of poison needles out of its fingers. I also placed two canisters full of my own poison breath inside the puppet's chest, where it can actually shoot poison breath similar to my own. Then I took one of the swords from the pouches of one of the cultivators and inscribed sword techniques into the puppet, though it was nothing fancy, the sword techniques should be enough to hold a core forming cultivator at bay. All of this work had me exhausted, and without actually noticing, I had already touched the rims of a breakthrough in my cultivation. Thanks to my cultivation method, where I didn't need to continuously meditate and harness the world's chi, I only needed to consume poisonous substances, and with a bag full of toxic herbs, I managed to rise to the peak of a breakthrough of the first layer of the foundation establishment. I only need a little push to get me to the second stage of foundation establishment. Sadly, however, I never managed to operate the puppet. The problem was the number of symbols I had written, they were so many of them that they actually require so much spiritual energy. Even after placing five spirit stones, one in each shoulder and one over every thigh, and once in the center of the puppet, I couldn't have puppet X function for more than 10 seconds. I kept scratching my head for answers, I needed a powerful spirit stone at least something like that pink spirit stone that was in the puppet before. But I don't have a complete one, all I have is a broken pink spirit stone. I needed to get to the pavilion, hopefully, they'll have a spirit stone just like that one. I gathered the puppet and placed it inside my book then left the house. Just as I walked out, I saw a man sitting in front of the house, 
he looked exhausted and out of it. Once he saw me, he perked up, Senor Shenbao. Finally, you're out, Brother Zenf wanted me to inform you to meet him as soon as possible, and that was a month ago, the man said. Right, then why didn't you knock? I asked. I wouldn't disturb your cultivation session. All right, most people would enter secluded cultivation and don't want to be disturbed, though I don't need to seclude myself, I don't also need to tell that man of this. Right, I'll have to apologize to Brother Fence, I'll go meet him as soon as I'm done with something, I said. All right, I'll inform him of such. The man said and hurried away. I sighed, I hope that Fence doesn't need any favors. I still have so much on my plate right now to even bother with him. I headed to the pavilion, and once I was there, the girl that I last met welcomed me with an over-the-top greeting. Greeting Master Craftsman. I glowered at the woman, and what the heck is up with Master Craftsman, when did I get that? Perhaps she thought I was since I was buying crafting materials, but everyone could be a Master Craftsman following that logic? Or, perhaps it was Zenf. Damn, I didn't need this, and I still have a business to take care of, I need something from the pavilion, hopefully, you can provide. Anything for the master, what is it that you wish to procure? She asked. A spirit stone, a rather powerful one, or multiple. I suppose you're looking for medium grade spirit stones? They're rather rare, but I think I can get you some, actually, this is even perfect. Please follow me. What's this about now? I wondered but followed the girl. The woman took me to the third floor where a few men were bickering about something. No. It won't function, I told you, the symbols aren't aligned, this is a defected product. A bald man called in an over-the-top fashion of throwing his hands. I swear I saw him use it, he even flew using it. Another man, younger who looked like a homeless person spoke. He had a pleading demeanor, like a commoner in front of nobility. Two other men were looking at what seemed to be a gourd. The first was a small old hunched back, he didn't look much different than me, with the exception of the lack of pustules over his body and his thin slits fries that seemed almost closed. The other one was a younger dark-skinned man, probably in his mid-thirties, he looked like a buffed athlete that could get first place in a bodybuilding competition. You're blabbering too much, this doesn't function. The bald man said. The girl next to me coughed, and everyone turned to take a look at me. This is Master Craftsman Shen Bao, Cultivator Fins has recommended him, she said. Yep, this confirms it, damn you Fins and your drunken blabbers. Chapter 45, Making Friends Master Craftsman Shen Bao? I never heard of that name, still. What do you think about this, the bald man said as he threw the gourd my way. Immediately, my eyes began processing the gourd, it felt as if it was the most natural thing to do, especially after those months of work in my study. Pretty intricate, but faulty, I said. You too. The homeless man said, I swear I saw a man flying using it, he gave it to me in exchange for a bite. I'm not lying. I didn't say that I can't fly, but the one who made it actually gave it to you because he knew it's faulty. Look here, I said as I tapped at the bottom of the gourd. The thing immediately grew to a pony's size. Earning the gawking shocked eyes of everyone present, and it even hovered in the room. The one who inscribed this failed to make proper connections of the writings, thus if someone with. I trailed as I looked at everyone, I don't wish to offend anyone here but I have to speak truth. I said. The three looked at me while frowning unable to understand what I was talking about. Right, so as I was saying, if someone inexperienced were to look at the guard they'd think it's inoperable and faulty, but this is of no fault of yours, I said to the three as I saw their expressions change, I don't even know them and I don't want to offend them, the last thing I want is to make enemies, I'm not here to slap faces. That stuff only works for those story heroes because they have plot armor protecting them, if I were to try my luck I'm going to end up six feet under. I'm not strong enough to start a face slapping contest, at least right now. The three looked at me, 
annoyed, but thanks to having informed them that it was not their fault that they were inexperienced I was able to continue my train of thought. Actually, I have to correct myself, the more masterful a person is, the harder it is for them to notice this flaw. I had to switch my tone, they seemed unimpressed when I first called them inexperienced, the one who inscribed this had tried to make several inscriptions work together, but due to his lack of knowledge and his constant attempt at correcting it, he managed to cover his inscription error by sheer luck. So, the gourd will actually consume more chi from the user than needed due to these excessive and extra inscriptions. So, this thing is faulty, and the attempt at correcting that fault further ruined this gourd. The bald man immediately interjected, Ha! As brother Shin Bao had said, I told you it was faulty. The old man started trying to curry favor with me and hide his ignorance, an attempt everyone noticed but no one spoke about it, it was a silent agreement between them all, stroking their own ego in a sense as to not appear dumb. Right, like Master Shin Bao had said, the more promising an inscriber is, the harder it is to notice this flaw, it is amateurish but hidden with many other restrictions that made no sense the whole inscription would make one see so many mistakes in it that it actually covers the erroneous primary writing that commands qi consumption, the old hunchback inscriber added, though his statement was correct, if I didn't hand it to him, he'd never get it. We still have much to learn, brother Shen Bao, a true master craftsman, even talented such as us should have seen that mistake, your knowledge humbles us, the younger of the three said. Don't worry about it. I'm sure you could have figured it out given more time, I think I lucked out because I came late and was out of context thus, I was able to see from a perspective you haven't seen. I continued stroking their ego, after all, a little bit of praise costs nothing, and it could take you a long way if used correctly. So, is this thing worth anything? The beggar asked. As it is now, no, but once the restrictions are rewritten, removed and corrected, I think it would be a good flying treasure, I said. Yeah, and that will probably cost a lot, the type of money you can't afford. The bald man said, I can buy it from you for twenty spirit stones. The bald monk said. I'd rather sell it to this man, the beggar said as he pointed at me. You're putting me in a tough spot, I won't buy for something brother. I trailed as the girl never introduced the men. I'm Zai and Yu Fan the bald man said, and this is master craftsman Han Zhao, and Gang, the man mentioned the other two craftsmen by name. Right, as I said, I won't buy for something brother's eye and has her eyes on, I replied. Ha! Huh. No, actually, your interjection and saved us a lot of time, I actually wanted to buy it and gift it to brother Shen Bao for enlightening us. It is only natural. The man said, still trying to curry favor with me. Thank you, I won't be polite then, I said. The beggar took the twenty spirit stones and left the store and I had a gourd for my own personal experiences. Would brother have some time to share a meal with us, we would like to discuss some of our concerns with you. Zion Yufan said. Damn, everyone wants knowledge, I have to play my hand right. Sure. I would like to exchange pointers with masters of the trade. Still, I came here for something. I said. What is it you wish to get? Zion asked. Now, I had two options, first was to speak and show how ignorant I am I want a pink spirit stone. That would sound dumb as heck especially after all that work trying to make everyone think I'm actually smarter than them. So, I took the second option. I pulled out the destroyed remains of the pink spirit stone and showed it to them. Oh! A high-grade spirit stone. Those are really rare. How did you find it? Now, that was frigging close. If I were to show them the stone and say this was a medium spirit stone it would have immediately blown my cover, that attendant however was clueless and thought I needed a medium spirit stone, and due to her words I almost ruined myself. Yeah, I'm in need of a few of them. I'm ready to pay any price. I have a couple, I'd like to exchange them over a few pointers, the old man said. I have one, the dark-skinned man said, 
and I'm willing to gift it to Brother Shen Bao just in thanks for your enlightening session. I have three, and I can gift them to you in return. Zion Yufan said and trailed off but I finished his sentence for him. I'll fix the gourd, reinscribe it and show you the method, I smiled at the man who had a wide grin on his face. The gourd would need a lot of time to repair it, and he obviously lacked the experience, showing him how it was done would be a great boon to his knowledge. Surprisingly, these master craftsmen were not as talented as they give off the feeling. I only studied inscribing restrictions for a few months and I'm legal head of them, and they seem to have spent ages in this domain. Could it be the mind's eye? After all when I was working I had the mind's eye on full throttle. Anyway, my offer was tempting enough and I needed those high-grade spirit stones. Right then, let's head to Fushi Restaurant, it has food that can take you to heaven and back, Zion mentioned and the two others looked as if they had hungered for centuries, the dark-skinned man even wiped some drool out of his face. How did Brother Zion manage to land a reservation? The old man Hanjal asked. I managed to inscribe the young prince's sword a few days ago and he gave me a token to visit the imperial restaurant and I could take as many as I wish, so this one is on me. The bald man laughed as he walked first. Well. I wasn't going to say no to free food, also I managed to obtain what I came for. So why not follow after these three, who knows I might encounter something interesting. Chapter 46, Restaurant Friction Once we entered the Fushi restaurant, which by the way was an impressive 10-story tower building in the middle of the city, it looked prominent and amazingly decorated. The people within it were all high figures, the big wigs of the empire. Generals, high-ranking officers, great scholars, and even imperial entourage, from young princes to princesses and their attendants to some royal guards. This whole place stank of rich pockets and cocky attitude. I was not going to fit here if I were to open my mouth without thinking. Our group, even considered of the best craftsmen in the region as I came to understand from the introduction that Zai and Yufan had been given once he entered were not Roth accessing the higher floors. It seemed that only generals and high-ranking alchemists, craftsmen, and any cultivator below the nascent soul level were allowed access to this floor. I didn't care if I was seated next to an emperor or a beggar, all I needed was to have a proper meal since I haven't eaten in long months. And to exchange a few notes with the people. Though I felt impressed with their knowledge and the way they worked their inscriptions, I was not fully convinced how they managed to attain such high social standing. I know more than them and I only read a couple of manuals. So, I needed to have them spill the beans. Yet my small talk tactics to switch the topic back to their source of knowledge had been stunted due to the presence of a rather arrogant kid. A boy, not even in his twenties came to us, and alongside him were a row of beautiful girls some with chests comparable to melons and thighs that would make the most pious of monks have lecherous thoughts. They wore scanty clothes and strong fragrances. This was lust and sex rather than a group of girls following a young man. The three craftsmen stood and bowed deeply to the boy, surprising me as I was too slow to act. Why not bow? The kid said to me, as I was busy munching on a piece of chicken thigh. The three men panicked as they noticed I was still eating. Shit, here it comes, this guy is probably someone important and now he's going to cause a scene in this restaurant. I'm too old, if I were to stand up and bow, I fear I might fall on my face, perhaps ruin your appetite, I gave the most ridiculous of excuses as to why I wasn't so fast in bowing. But that didn't seem to impress the kid. He was about to speak when he noticed that I was actually eating with my gloves still on. Something the other inscribers have definitely noticed but didn't dare speak their minds about it, still, as he didn't know who I was, he spoke his mind. Why are you wearing your gloves, you have no manners to eat in this establishment, it's reserved for royalty and people of great demeanor and interest, and looking at you, I fail to see you have any decorum. The kid spoke in one breath. I don't dare show what lies under my covered self, it would make everyone here gag and I don't wish to show the sight of my ugly self while people are eating, 
I said. Nonsense, appearances don't matter, all that matters is power, are you so afraid to show yourself that you hide behind such excuses, show your hands? The kid ordered. I really hate this brat, but, it's all on him. I have already said that it will cause unease in the hearts of those present here, but if you wish, I stood up, removed my gloves revealing the disgusting pustules on them while removed the hood, showing the gaping hole in my eye, and the numerous tumors growing all over my face, hands and neckline. Immediately, one of the girls that were behind this kid fainted and a few people who had been enjoying the food and were paying attention to our conversation started vomiting. The kid was struck aback, by the gods, what atrocities have you committed to having the heavens punish you so? Guards! The kid shouted as guards came rushing in. Apprehend this fiend! A vein was about to pop in my forehead, this brat, just came in demanded respect without presenting himself, and audaciously tried to have me show something I already told him was not a good sight in this place. Then asked the guards on me, I'm really tempted to go all mick on his ass and to hell with the consequences. But I have to stop and think for a while. I held up my hands and waited for the guards to surround me. You fiend. You don't even have words to defend yourself? The kid asked. If words had any value to you, I said while scowling, you wouldn't have forced me to reveal my ill skin, so why speak words to someone who won't listen? If you wish to take me, then do it. I'll explain myself to someone who will actually listen. I reprimanded. You. Do you know who I am? To dare speak to me like this. The boy said as he pointed at me. This you's name is Shen Bao, I said. But the kid failed to understand what I meant. The three craftsmen next to me proved to be as useful as a band-aid trying to keep a cracked wall holding up together. They never uttered a word, and it seemed that unless they were addressed, they won't speak their minds. I don't care who you are, you dared insult a high-ranking noble, you deserve to hang. The kid said. My lips began shaking. I was really tempted to use a poison breath right here and then, but with the number of guards this kid has, it would be no brainer that he could have a few powerful cultivators nearby trying to protect him. I calmed myself and said, I have said what I had, now do what you want. It was your own hastiness that caused this scene, not mine. I said. You. The kid said once again and I was really getting pissed. A man came into the establishment, he was wearing a red cultivator robe with a dark satin belt around his middle. The man had his hands in his sleeves and walked with sure steps. His beard was long and reached all the way to his chest while his hair was wrapped in a man bun and wrapped in a golden brace. Still a great portion of it cascaded down his back and shoulders giving him a noble presence. And took a look at everything happening before he said, You son, what's going on? The man said. This foul fiend has caused me to lose face. The kid said. The man looked at me and frowned, you don't seem like a person regretting what he had done. The old man said. I don't regret speaking my mind, I have not offended anyone, but the child took offense after forcing my hand, I replied. The man didn't understand. But before I could explain the kid was about to blabber some nonsense when his uncle stopped him with a finger shushing the kid. Speak, what truly happened, the man addressed me. I sighed before I recounted everything that happened in detail. The man turned to the three craftsmen next to me and asked, Zion Yu Fan, is what this man spoke the truth? The bald man looked at me, and the kid and with a hesitant nod he said, yes, all that brother Shin Bao had spoken was true, I wish not to take part in this. I have spoken only due to Lord Zai Sun had ordered. The old man said and extracted himself from the conversation as to not further offend the little kid. The uncle, Zai Sun looked at the kid with a disgusted look, not only did you not act as a true noble, you actually barged into a table, forced a man to reveal his flaws, and then condemned him to death just because he was sick? Have you no shame? The uncle slapped the kid on the face and shouted. Get your harlots and your sorry ass out of my sight. The words were spoken with wrath behind them, and the kid scurried away with the girls behind his tail. 
He then turned to the rest of the guests, I hope that none take offense of what just happened, nor should you take fellow cultivator Shen Bao's side to disgust, he had been poisoned, as it is apparent from his misfortune, it is of no fault of his, a brave man such as this person is able to stand while enduring the bone and body grinding poison is something that one needs to be praised for, and not scuffed at. Damn, everyone, knows the bone and body grinding poison. I truly admire a person with such strong resolve, though you have few years to survive and I am more than certain many in your situation would rather slit their own throat than suffer the constant grinding pain of the bone and body grinding poison, you seem rather comfortable and even able to move about. I say you have found peace with yourself thus finding it easier to move about with such pain. Sai Sun spoke in all piousness. Yep, too good to be true. This guy is not someone I should trust, but right now I can't afford to reject his goodwill. Thank you Lord Zai Sun, I was born with a good fortitude and mindset, I'm able to block the pain, but like you said I don't have much longer to live, thus, fearing death or arrogant unjust nobility isn't in me. And so should everyone, once one sees injustice one must speak against it. I'll speak to my brother to rein my nephew in place. As for you and everyone here, due to my nephew's behavior, I'll happily take the bill for all of your tables. The man said, further gaining reputation points with everyone here in the room. This guy is dangerously cunning, I gotta keep watch when around him. The man approached us and said, a gathering of three genius master craftsmen and the bold brother Shen Bao, what's the occasion of it? Zai Sun said. Oh. We came here to celebrate with Brother Shen Bao, he had enlightened us to some knowledge we failed to see and we wished to reward him, but it seems that we caused too much trouble for him. The man, Zai Sun's eyes twitched, it was obvious, this guy was still trying to curry favor with me while he kept his gullet shut when I was under the scope. Pretty opportunistic, but still, even if everyone knows it, no one would speak it. Everyone likes to stroke their own ego in public. Right, I guess that brother Shen Bao is also a master craftsman of great renown. To be able to impress these three professionals must mean that your knowledge is superior, Zai Sun tried to create a little bit of strife just to see how we would react. Normally any man would humbly decline such a statement and still make it seem like what Zai Sun said was true. No, actually, I still need much to learn. The three gentlemen here could have easily discovered a flaw I noticed, I was merely lucky. They have shared much of their knowledge that I'm still impressed and wish to learn from. Not only humble, but you even included everyone with you, I say you're a good person to befriend. Zai Sun said. Seeing how just you are, I say it would be my greatest honor to befriend someone such as you, I said throwing the praise ball back at his court. We kept talking and exchanging small talk until Zai Sun decided that it was enough time spent in pleasantries. He then said, I managed to get my hands on a strange artifact, and seeing that the four of you are gathered here, I'd like to invite you to see it. It's heavily inscribed and none of my personal inscription masters managed to discover the secret behind it. Perhaps a master craftsman can find out how this thing was built and show us a way to unlock this box. Zai Sun said. We'd be happy to have a look, Baldi Zai and said. Right, if you're done with your food, please follow me. Chapter 47, Back Dealings The three of us stood up and Zai Sun didn't let us pay for our own lunch, we followed after him until we reached the city's pavilion. With Zai Sun's identity as a high-ranking noble married to an imperial consort, he has the right to access most of the pavilion's floor and when we arrived on the seventh floor of the pavilion, he took us inside to a small room where there was a small metallic bronze square placed neatly on the table. This is a bronze cube we found in a dungeon, we tried to refine it to no avail, and didn't manage to understand the inscriptions on it. It took me a great deal of time before I finally gave up and brought this to your eyes. Tell me if you see anything out of the ordinary. The three master craftsmen all went to the cube and began inspecting it, carrying it, and picking it up. But I didn't move, I already had a vague idea of what this was, 
all thanks to the information the Poison God's book gave me. Seeing my inaction, Sai Sun looked at me and said, You seem rather calm, do you know what is this? Not really, but I don't wish to waste time. Presumably, you already shows this to many others before us? I asked. Yes, replied Sai Sun. So they definitely have notes, can I see them? I asked. Right, the man said and handed me a ledger full of notes written by other people who had looked at this cube. This whole book fiasco was nothing but a ruse I used, this would show that I was actually a bright move. It will show that I didn't want to waste time finding things other people had already discovered and noted in the book. Once I went through the ledger, I went towards the cube, the other craftsmen had already gave up, the symbols on it were too complex but it didn't have any seams or cracks that could be used to open it and uncover what's inside it. I see. I said as I looked at the cube. The other craftsmen and Zai Sun all paid attention to where my finger was going. I touched the middle part of the cube, poured a bit of poison chi on it, then removed my hand, I then flipped the cube and did the same, putting just small bits of chi in separate and random spots, but these spots were all inscribed with a small chi gathering symbol. Once all sides had been injected with chi, the cube vibrated then jerked. Heavens! This is the first time this thing reacted. Sai Sun was actually impressed. This caused the rest of the craftsmen to feel dejected but they were still excited to see what this box had. I relaxed and sat back down, not continuing any further. What's wrong brother Shin Bao? Sai Sun asked. I can't open it, at least not right now, the box has a private chamber inside it that's locking the whole mechanism. It also reacts poorly to sunlight. It has too many receptors. It also needs a powerful cultivator to power up, at least someone above an Asin Soul cultivator, I said my words, though the rest of the craftsmen couldn't make heads or tail of what I said, Sai, Sun smiled. He understood the meaning behind my words, if one were to carefully deduce what I just said, they'll understand that I already know how to open it and would rather do it in a private chamber and at night time without any receptors as in any of the three people around us. Sai Sun was a cunning man and immediately understood what I mean, right, then I'll see what I can do, I'll inform you if the box was ever opened and I'll be sure to reward you all if we manage to find something special. The rest of the group understood the meaning Bane Sai Sun, it was time for us to leave. And when I did leave with the group, Sai Sun was fast and inconspicuous and hiding a jade in one of my sleeves, he didn't mean to spy on me but rather gave it to me to contact him. I left the room with the three craftsmen as we discussed the cube and went down to the second floor of the pavilion. The three asked me how I managed to unlock it, and I only mentioned that I came from a different place and I managed to understand some of the symbols because we used them but actually those symbols are used by cultivators beyond the Ascendant Realm. What is an Ascendant Treasure doing in a place such as this? A question I couldn't answer. But no matter the secret that cube is hiding, it's far too dangerous for any one of our cultivation realms. Once we were in the second floor, where the craftsmen usually hanged out, I pulled out the gourd that Zai and Yufan had gave me and began removing the old inscriptions. Once all the symbols were removed, I began by editing and rewriting the correct sequence all under the gaze of the three craftsmen. They took notes and were all nodding at every symbol I changed. Amazing, to see someone with such immaculate accuracy in writing the restriction on the gourd leave much to be desired in our own experience. The oldest of the craftsmen Han said. Right, the precision is immaculate. I'm really jealous of how brother Shin Bao has a steady hand, you really are a dragon among the craftsmen. I only had more time in doing this, I smiled at the three while I continued writing the symbols as fast as possible, I didn't want to get delayed much. Once I was done, and thankfully I didn't need to add anything complex to the gourd such as weight distribution control command or even a balance and chi regulation inscription. I only needed to add to the size growth inscription and flight inscription which all had the basic inscription already written, I only needed to rewrite some and link everything so that it will all work. 
Unlike a puppet that uses spirit stones to power itself, this gourd would use the chi from the user that is riding on it to move, so I didn't need to have a lot of details written. After three hours of diligent work, I managed to finish the gourd and handed it back to Zian, who in return gave me the three spirit stones I needed. The other two had also given me their own high grade spirit stones, and now I had five, exactly the number I needed for each and every slot in my puppet. Smiling happily, I left the room, thanking the group. I'll need to go back home, now that I have these stones, I can finish my project, I said to the three. Thankfully, they were tact in not asking what I was working on, everyone had their secrets and no one was going to pry on mine. Once I was home, I hurried downstairs, and pulled out my puppet, it had several dozen inscriptions written on it. Instead of the boring monotonous pink color of the puppet, the inscription on it were so numerous it looked like tattooed skin. I had to dye the puppet, the dye will act as a coating to cover the inscription and will not hinder the interlaying works. But before dyeing it, I needed to make sure this thing works. I placed a single high grade spirit stone in the puppet's chest and the whole damn thing stood up. It didn't even need for me to add the rest of the spirit stones. Thanks to the fact that I made the whole construction in turf functional, meaning that even if the spirit stone on the puppet's shoulder was the only one functioning at a time, it could send energy to the rest of the puppet. This was great, the whole construct could work with just one high grade stone but I don't want to overtax the spirit stone, so I placed the rest of the spirit stones on the other spots. Now, two high grade spirit stones, one in each shoulder, another two, one in each thigh, and the main one in the chest. The puppet was fully functional, but as it seems, the puppet started shaking, the energy from the high grade spirit stones was too much, it would probably cause the puppet to blow up. I immediately tapped on the puppet's head, rearranging a few symbols to have the puppet dial down on power consumption, the puppet only needed 10% of the total energy coursing through it to function at full capacity. So, there was no need to exhaust the spirit stones for no reason. Good, I said then ordered, X, punch that wall, I pointed. Not even a fraction of a second later. The puppet had already torn through the wall with a punch powerful enough that it shook the whole building. And that was 10%, and I could swear it was at least 4 times as fast as when I first saw this puppet in that cave. Ha 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 ha. I laughed like a madman, seeing how amazingly powerful this puppet is, made my efforts, and the months I spent not go to waste. Just as I was about to give it more commands. I remembered that it was midnight and I still had the jade in my pocket. I placed it against my forehead and imprinted in it my location, then went upstairs and threw the jade out of the window. It didn't take more than a few minutes before a man appeared in the front of my door. Greetings brother Shen Bao, are you ready to go? Zai Sun said. Yeah, let's go, I said in a smile. Chapter 48, Dungeoneering do you have a flying treasure you can use? Zai Sun asked once I arrived next to him. Yes, but I'd rather not pull any unwanted attention, the laws against flight and such. I trailed off hinting at how this city forbade flight within it. Not currently know that treasure as you have mentioned needed the power of a nascent soul cultivator, though I am such a cultivator, I dare not risk unlocking the content of the box in a city filled with experts lest one of them senses it and scry upon us using their divine sense. Zai Sun explained. I agree, then, where do you wish we open the box? I asked. I have a location in mind, please follow me, Zai Sun stated and we both left headed to the city's gate. Once away from the gate and off braying eyes. Zai Sun pulled out a flying sword from his pouch and hopped on it. I did the same, thankfully I had the decency of mind to actually think beforehand and place the flying sword in a pouch that belonged to one of those cultivators from the poison gods gave. Once I pulled the sword I stepped on it, while noticing the ogling gaze of Zai Sun. Now, here, that was dangerous, mainly because, if what he said was true, and I doubt it would be a lie. He is a nascent soul cultivator, which means he is at least two great realms stronger than me, 
and even a small layer is a difference between heaven and earth among cultivators, not to mention a realm that has nine layers. So, any sane man should now be shaking in fright, thinking that this nascent cultivator had been interested in their treasure. For anyone besides me, they would have offered the sword in peace just to preserve their lives. But I, I was rather immune to such threats, even if they were probably unfounded. And I had two strong reasons that would keep me safe, the first, without me, Zai Sun would never be able to unlock the box. And the second is simple enough, I just finished making a puppet that kicks ass. Though I don't know if it could fare well against a nascent cultivator. One punch at 10% is strong enough to break a reinforced wall. No matter how strong that man's body, a punch from my puppet will hurt. Let's go, Zai Sun said after what he deemed enough time spent ogling my treasure while I didn't adhere to his gaze. The two of us flew south, and we continued the pace. But after a few hours of constant flight, I had to start popping pills before I became too suspicious. Simply put, I'm a foundation establishment cultivator, while he was a nascent soul cultivator, he would have greater spiritual chi reserves and would be able to support his flight, while my chi reserves should diminish. If I were to showcase that I was still fully capable of matching and keeping up with his speed, then roots of greed would sprout in his spirit. And the last thing I want is to give a stronger person more reasons to want my things. Junior Shen Bao, Zai Sun said, should we slow down? I don't wish to see you exhausted before our trip reaches its end. No worries, I have enough pills to keep this pace for a few days. It was a blatant lie, even if my flying sword was eating up my poison chi like mad, I still had enough energy to keep this pace for weeks. Apparently, the time I spent cooped up in scribing wasn't for naught, as a side effect, a positive one, I'm able to make full use of my chi using my mind's eye an insight that I passively gained after days upon days of constant concentration on inscription. Now what came in handy, micromanaging the energy that I'm expending, and using the minimum of it to its maximum potential in powering the sword. As for the pills, I was eating, they were just some weak poison pills that I found in one of the cultivator pockets, it doesn't do me any harm to have a snack while flying. Yet even while popping those pills like Tic Tacs, I have yet to break through the next layer. I'm surprised to have spent so much time in the first layer of foundation establishment, but I can't be too rash about it, at least for my earlier progress I had the sect master of the purple cloud sect as a poison source to power me up, as for now, I'll have to settle for lesser poisons. Hours after hours of flight, the first light of dawn breaks before Zai Sun mentioned that we arrived. Though I don't know why we had to get so far from the capital, I won't be judging him, at least right now I don't know the range of a nascent soul cultivator's divine sense. But at this distance, I doubt anyone from the capital would have range enough to spy on us. There was a small cottage built in the middle of nowhere, right under a large oak tree in what seemed to be a thinly packed forest. We entered the cottage and Zai Sun invited me to a dusty seat. I wiped it as much as I could before sitting, and once I was on the chair I took a moment to survey my surrounding. The cottage was old, perhaps it belonged to Zai Sun or some person that didn't come here in a long time. Also seeing that it still had its wares and wasn't infringed upon by some random animal or someone seeking shelter, it comes to mind that this place had been abandoned for a long time. Zai Sun waved his hand and the dust on the table, chair and all the wares in this small hut was swooped at the door. Neat trick, I could learn this, at least this would help clean up the house that Sven had gifted me. Back to our topic, I'm getting distracted. Zai Sun placed the cube in front of me and said, Can you unlock it? Yes, but I'll require your aid, the bit about an essent soul cultivator I said was true. Without thicker spiritual chi, I can't put enough energy to power this thing up. I answered. Right then, what am I supposed to do? Zai Sun politely asked. You see this symbol here? I pointed at the centermost symbol in the box, you need to pour in your spiritual chi in it and at the same time supply all other five faces of the cube the same amount of energy. Once the cube is sated, 
it will release its locking mechanism and display what's inside it. I replied. The man nodded and began pouring his energy into the cube. After a few seconds of no visible change, Zai San frowned, thinking that I lied to him and was probably trying to drain his energy to kill him, or so his expressions portrayed. But soon enough the cube began shuddering, proving that what I said was true and the frown on Zai San soon turned to an expression of excitement and anticipation. The more the cube shuddered the more Zai San poured his energy and after a while and what seemed to be an exhausting amount of spiritual chi wasted into the unsatiated cube, the small six-faced little black hole opened up. The cube's faces fell to the side revealing nothing inside them, to the disappointment of Zai's son. There is nothing inside. He said, angered yet huffing with exertion. His exhaustion proved him a person of a prudish mind, yet I couldn't fault him. He sees himself as a weak person right now with all the expenditure, and at risk. No, there is everything, I corrected. The treasure isn't supposed to be inside the box, but the box itself. I took the six faces of the cube and placed them next to each other, making a rectangular piece. Look, I said as I poured a smidgen of my chi on the cube's faces. The chi spread along seamless and invisible lines along the cube's interior faces drawing a map that shone in a dim green aura, my poison aura. This. Fascinating. Zai Sun said. I kept gazing at the map, unable to determine where this location could be, Zai Sun interjected. I know this mountain, it's Luowo Mountain, it's a few days travel west of here, this also, I believe I know this region. The man contemplated as he shared his thoughts. Come with me, I'd like to discover this place alongside a smart person such as you. That's the most blatant lie I have ever heard in my life, simply put, this man deduced that if the map required such effort and smartness to understand, then the location that this map pointed to would require the same mental exertion. Thus, if he were to abandon me and go alone, he was bound to get stuck in some sort of trap that his brain can't figure out. I'd be delighted to come along, I replied, after all, I have no way to refuse him, even if I'm fully capable of annihilating him using X, I'd rather keep X a secret, after all, it would be best to have this man exhaust himself in whatever location this map leads to than if I had to rely on myself to do all the manual work if I were to kill him here and now. Zai San then pulled a pill and popped it in his mouth, it didn't take more than a second before he was full of energy. Thankfully I didn't try anything stupid, now that I know even after he had exhausted himself fully, he still had a pill that can invigorate him, if I were to stupidly attack him while he was weak, nothing less than a killing blow would be enough to save me from his retaliation. Zai Sun pulled his sword and flew in the direction of the Wawo Mountain. And after days of constant exhausting travel, we arrived at the said location. It was an open plain with nothing impressive about it, and following the traces on the map, there was supposed to be an entry to a cave somewhere around this region. A wave of pervasive energy shot through me, it lingered for a fraction of a second before shooting off in the distance, and in that fraction of a second, I felt myself naked against the gaze of such a powerful entity. So that's Devine Sense. I construed. Frowning the man looked at me and said, I can't seem to find anything here. My divine sense isn't detecting any cave entrances. The man said. We'll have to manually look for it, and seeing this large swath of planes, it's going to take a while. Though I'm unable to use divine sense, I wouldn't be surprised that you couldn't find it, otherwise others would have, I said. Then what do you suggest? He asked. Well. Could you use your divine sense once again, and instead of focusing on detecting areas to access, try and find areas that you divine sense can't protrude through, I replied. Smart, by locating areas where I'm unable to see with my divine sense we can heavily reduce the areas we need to search, luckily there was only one area, there, Zai Sun pointed. It was a large boulder among many others, that had a lot of grass growing around it. It did look like a part of this scene but so would anything be if one wanted to hide it in plain sight. The rocks shouldn't bounce off my divine sense, I should be able to see through them, 
but if you hadn't voiced your opinion I would have disregarded them as regular rocks. Now that I think about it, I should have at least been able to see at least a few meters within the rocks. Damn, if divine sense can see through rocks that would be the most unfair advantage in a hide and seek game, where you hide from death and the man seeks to kill you, I should really mind not pissing off someone with a divine sense, because not even hiding underground can save me. Or at least finding a way to hide from the divine sense. I added a mental note on studying divine sense and finding ways to avoid detection, such methods would help greatly in keeping me alive. For now, I'll have to rely on X and hope that his badass power punch is enough to make Sai Sun regret turning his back on me if it ever happens. Well now, what am I waiting for, let's go explore a cave that was probably created by an ascendant. How hard can it be? Chapter 49 into the cave. Once we came down, we were stopped in our tracks while we gazed at the rocks. There was no seeming entrance to the set caves, if it weren't for Zai Sun's confirmation that these rocks were natural, no one could ever be able to convince me otherwise. I thought high hard and low on where the entrance to these rocks could be but came to no favorable answer. Should I break them? And risk the probability of destroying the entrance? There are too many variables and things at risk, perhaps this could even be a test that we need to figure out before entering. I say we spend a little bit of time contemplating, thinking about all possibilities before acting rashly then suffering consequences we don't want. After all, this is a cave made by an ascendant. I spoke. I'm surprised you know about the ascendant stage of cultivation. It's rare to find people with such vast knowledge even when they're still young cultivators. Sai Sun said while delivering a stab in between his words, stating that I'm far weaker for my knowledge. He might as well say that I was actually tightening the noose around my neck, but better keep my paranoia in check. Now I need to focus. I got closer to the boulder formation and deduced that if there was going to be an entrance, there should be a gate and most rocks here were too small to act as a gate, besides the largest one among them. I slowly climbed up and tried to understand how this boulder would act as a gate while it looked like a completely ordinary oversized tall boulder. Then it hit me like a train. And I grinned. I climbed down and took a few steps back, I think I figured it out, I replied. Sai Sun waited for me to answer. Here, the grass, why is it this small? It should have been thick and overgrown, yet it never went past this area. Then that bird's nest, it doesn't look natural, most birds would usually lay their nests on trees, and their nests won't be as perfectly round as that one. I replied. I don't really understand. This is another form of inscription, a formation, nay, a restriction. It's a puzzle that only those who can see can unlock. I replied but I failed to see a key to said restriction. Sai Sun said. Because there is no key, I replied and sat down in a meditative state. The man frowned, unable to understand. This is actually a clock, it will open on its own at a certain time, though I don't know when, the large boulder is acting as the clock's longer hand, then you have the other boulders acting as the hours of the day. I presume that when the large boulder's shadow is over the bird's nest, then something will happen. And that didn't seem like it would take a lot of time, as it only took a few hours before the sun moved, causing the larger boulder's shadow to cover the nest, and then I felt a small vibration, almost subtle, but to Zai Sun, it was loud enough that it woke him from his meditation with a wide grin on his face. Yet, his expression disappeared almost immediately when nothing seemed to have changed. I also found myself in a perplexing situation, unable to discern the right way to enter this gate. Sai Sun's pervasive divine sense swept right through the boulders with no signs of any change. But I didn't fall to despair. The bronze plates, can I see them? I asked. And the noble presented them almost too eagerly. Just as I grabbed the plates, trying to see if I could figure something, one of them shone brightly in my hand. On the boulder, there was a seam that I didn't notice before, and it probably was hidden, but the seam was a perfect square. 
I placed the square shining plate on it and immediately the massive boulder shook and literally opened up like an iron maiden. Inside the boulder was a tunnel that led down. Well, that worked, I mumbled. I gave the rest of the plates back to Zai Sun, who eagerly pocketed them and jumped into the tunnel, not giving heed to what possible dangers an ascendant cultivator's cave could entail. I sighed as I followed after him, jumping inside the small hole within the boulder I fell down to the dark unknown. Not wanting to die flattened on the ground due to my inability to fly, I unceremoniously pulled out my flying sword and plated my feet above it mid-fall. The sword swooped down and carried my weight with no visible strain. In this darkness, it was a little bit hard to see where Zai Sun was, but not impossible. I pulled my finger and used my green flame, the same flame I used to light my pipe with when I was smoking joyful weed with Elder Yun. The small flame danced as it lit the dark cave in green light. The cave wasn't big, but it was deep, it was like a large well that led down. I descended, while Zai Sun raced forward. He seemed interested in whatever an ascendant's cave would entail in treasures and resources but I was more curious on why an ascendant would build a cave in such a remote plain area. Once we arrived at the bottom, I saw Zai Sun standing in front of a square platform, frowning. What's wrong? I asked. This, this is a long-range teleportation platform, it needs to be powered with spiritual stones to activate. Though I have, I'm really reluctant to part with them. Zai Sun said. And he was right. Spiritual stones, though useless for me unless I use them to power X, for a regular cultivator they can use them to cultivate. Unlike pills that restore energy, spirit stones can bolster one's energy and help them cultivate to higher realms, there are rare pills that can do the same effect, but nothing is as pure as spirit stones, after all, spirit stones are the condensed form of heavenly energy given shape into small marble-like objects that can power a person with no side effects as would pills and their impurities that they leave in the body. I wish if I could help, but the few spirit stones I have I already use them for my project, I only have some weak ones, I stated as I pulled out thousands of regular spirit stones that I got from the cultivators that tried to kill me in the poison cave. Good, that's more than enough, quantity is quality in itself. Zai Sun said as he pulled another 2,000 to my thousand spirit stones. Though it pained me to part with so many stones, I wanted to be a part of this expedition, at least now, Zai Sun would feel apprehensive from outright ending my life, at least, he would feel slight guilt now that I'm actually helping him without regard to my wealth. Or so I believe. I still have X ready to go out at a moment's notice if Zai Sun proved a threat but I should stay passive for now. Zai Sun waved his hand, carrying all the spirit stones and placing them on the platform, which instantly devoured them, turning them to dust and lit up. Several runes shone brightly under the platform, I was fascinated with the complexity of said runes before Zai Sun gestured for me to follow while saying, though I respect your need for knowledge. These runes are ancient and would require a lot of time studying not to mention properly using them. It would be best not to waste time trying to figure these things lest the gate closes. Zai Sun said. But I didn't need to study them right now, I memorized the whole platform, all thanks to my mind's eye, a seriously overpowered ability, though I'm sure every cultivator has it, when it comes to photographic memory, it proved beyond helpful when I needed to study this later on. I stood next to Zai Sun and immediately the teleportation gate lit up and I felt as if my body was being disintegrated molecule by molecule, and immediately my sight went dark before it was assaulted by a bright pervasive light. Opening my eyes, I found myself in a large swath of green fertile land. I would have sworn that we were ejected outside of the cave if not for the dense heavenly energy that was swirling about in this area. My god, the spiritual energy in here is several folds stronger than back at the capital. Zai Sun stated the obvious. But for me, it didn't matter if it was thick or thin, I can't cultivate spiritual energy, but that's not enough to put a damper on my mood. After all, high spiritual energy means that spiritual herbs are more prone to bloom and blossom in such areas. 
and the Poison Gods book had already sent me a private message, more like telepathic audio that several herbs could prove useful to me in this area. We should explore the area, let's split up, and here, Sai Sun said, giving me a jade. If you find yourself in danger, just break this and I'll appear as soon as possible. I wouldn't want you to die on me, not before I repay your help, Sai Sun said in a faithful smile though I felt it was a blatant lie. He wanted to keep track of me, perhaps I might get lucky and find something that would interest him. Thank you for your benevolence, I said as I pocketed the jade. After all, I also have my way of dealing with his tracking mechanism, unless he uses divine sense to look for me. I could easily alter this jade and send him to the wrong location. Though if I find myself in trouble, I won't hesitate in breaking it, better have him deal with any shenanigans I might encounter than me dying meaninglessly in a bloody ascendance cave. Damn, sometimes I do some stupid stuff. Still, every dangerous encounter is worth the risks, the treasures that these expeditions award are worth the risks, at least the spiritual herbs. Now. Let's see, which way should I head to? Chapter 50, Trials and Tribulations I moved through the large swaths of grass and open fields, trees rose ever so sparingly in this enclosed area, though I have little understanding of if this whole place was a part of this world, or from the stuff I read when I was back on earth, a separate enclosed dimension. Though unlikely, this place could probably be on some other side of this continent instead of a secret location but it's never wrong to be careful. This place might be the resting place of an ascendant cultivator, and from what I understand, this could have several trials and tribulations to the people seeking the ascendant's treasures. But I'm not too keen on getting myself killed in seeking treasures of an entity that far surpasses my level of understanding. Risks entail rewards, but the looming threat of death is great and it would be foolish if I were to throw myself to my death if I were to overestimate my abilities. The poison god mentioned to seek danger and find reward for one's risks, but he also mentioned to be careful for there is a thin line between courage and recklessness. Only if the risks are worth the effort, and I'm fully capable of surpassing them even at great effort, will I move to obtain what the ascendant has to offer. Otherwise, if only death awaits as I take stupid risks, then I'd rather leave this area than try my already non-existent luck against insurmountable odds. Struck by realization, I finally began to understand better how this whole thing works, birds die for food and men die for wealth. But I'm able to think pragmatically right now, clear of mind and sharp of focus, I'm able to perfectly judge my current conundrum. It seems that there is something here that's calming my thoughts and making me able to perfectly see reason. As I continued moving through the grasslands, the book vibrated in my chest as my single eye was attracted to a naturally formed spiritual plant that I would have missed for common grass. The spiritual plant looked exactly like the grass next to it, a long single strand green grass petal. If it were any other person, they would have not given this grass a second look, but this was the fickle blade grass a 7th grade spiritual herb that can be used to reinforce medicinal pills. Receptarius would use this to increase the power of their pills, it's a commonly known herb in the domain of alchemy, however, though it is well known, it is extremely rare. And for a good reason. This plant looks feels and acts like normal grass, though it has a spiritual vein inside it enabling it to cultivate heavenly energy. But the real reason why this thing is so rare because once it births into the world, it will only last for a few days before it will wither and die. Though many didn't understand why this plant would die, from what I got off the Poison God's book, he theorized that this plant's very existence is to defy heaven. Weed, or grass, stomped on, chopped, cut, or burned, will always grow back as long as its roots remain. And this very simple looking grass is an embodiment of heaven defying nature. Thus, after a few days of its birth, heavens will not tolerate its existence and will cut off all heavenly energy from around it, insulating it from the world and thus dooming its existence. I picked up the herb and placed it inside my bag. Rare are those who manage to obtain a stock of this thing, but the moment I raised my head, I was surprised to see so many of it just a few feet away. 
fickle blade grass grew in abundance in this place. How, or why? It escaped my understanding, but if what the poison god said was true, and judging by the dense heavenly energy in this place I could also put a few theories of mine to work. First off, this place was a sealed location, meaning that not even heaven can interfere, thus the fickle blade grass had grown to abundance. Secondly, this place is undoubtedly beyond the perception of heaven thus it's able to thrive in heavenly energy, although this might sound contradictive, I could guess that there is something in this place that is supplying this small world with heavenly energy, though not heaven itself, perhaps a treasure, or a spirit stone. I don't have any evidence to validate my theories, but it's possible that something is powering this whole place up, against heavenly law. Thus this place is both concealed from heaven, and at the same time has enough heavenly energy within it to allow a myriad of spiritual herbs to grow. Lastly, if one was able to create this place, seal it and lock it from the eyes of heaven, how powerful could they be? The last question was something I did and did not want to be answered. Knowing an enemy's capabilities was half the effort into finding out how to defeat them but an ant can't kill an elephant even if it knows how strong he is, for the disparity in strength may call efforts nothing but a moot attempt at defying unshaking possibilities of doom. I walked ahead, while plucking all the grass I could find, for all of it is wasted if it were to remain here unattended, I could also use some of this grass into increasing the potency of a lot of my pills, especially poison pills. Though I don't have the ability to start mastering receptorism, as the poison god calls it, or alchemy as the people of this lower realm call it. I can easily dilute a poison pill in a cup of water and add a few drops of extract from the fickle blade grass to increase the poison's potency. I continued moving through the open field, finding even more spiritual plants and herbs. So many of them I felt that it would be a crime if I were to strip this land barren of so many treasures. Though I continued plucking without regard, as every single piece of grass and spiritual herb would only go to waste if no one took them. But I still kept my bearings about me, there was something that I should not forget due to greed. I made sure that for every ten stalks of grass I gathered into my poison god's book, I placed one stalk into my holding bag. For reasons that I wish would never happen, but one cannot be too careful. I kept gathering the herbs and continued moving until I noticed one small little detail that became as apparent as a sore thumb after a while. I've spent several hours on this field, but the sun never moved an inch. Thus giving me two options, the first, I was probably trapped in a restriction that I didn't notice an illusion where my soul is stuck in this heaven of spiritual herbs while my body is about to be ravaged by some odd monstrosity. Quite a far-fetched theory but this is a cultivation world and such scenarios wouldn't be too unthinkable. The second was a confirmation that this place is nothing but a created domain, a world with stagnant natural phenomenon, where the sun, the ground, and even this soulless breeze that keeps moving were all artificial and manufactured. But if all of this was fake, how could the spiritual herbs thrive? Heavenly energy was such a wondrous thing that it would defy the natural order and make a world against laws. I sighed as I had no way to confirm either suggestion and continued on my merry way gathering herbs comforted by the fact that the poison god's book never spoke of hidden dangers. After more tiresome hours of gathering herbs, enough hours actually until my back started to hurt from picking them up. I found myself in front of a lake. A blue stagnates lake, where not even its waters rippled. But the water in it looked as stagnant as a mirror's surface, for the life of me I was unable to understand why it didn't rot over and turn into a disgusting rancid quagmire. After all, the natural alignment should have affected the stagnant pond, or at least have some algae grow on the pond. This pond felt unnaturally natural, and it somehow irked me. Yet, due to its clear and crystal surface, I was able to see something inside the pond, there was a flower the size of a man's fish at the bottom of the lake. Another spiritual herb, and just as I approached the lake, the poison god's book vibrated in my chest, sending a message directly to my mind. Don't take another step lest you want your life squandered and your soul shredded, 
for you're in the presence of a soul-devouring bloom. Okay, that's not ominous at all. I said to myself. But to my dismay, even if I didn't take another step heeding the book's command, somehow, the lake shuddered and ripples moved along its surface. Heck, I was complaining that this thing wasn't acting as a natural lake, and now that it does, I feel hella more worried. Especially since said flower shot up from within the lake, though I say flower, it was sitting on top of the head of a jade serpent the size of a high-speed train. And the serpent didn't look too pleased with my ugly self. I'm too old for this shit. I cursed as I saw the massive behemoth open its mouth wide, ready to swallow me whole. Chapter 51, X The train-sized snake wasn't too keen on greetings and immediately dove at me, head first, fangs ready to gouge me whole in a best-case scenario. At least it would be being chomped on and chewed to bits before turning to a gigantic cultivating serpent poop. I urged my frail old body to dodge to the side, say I urged here because against mortals like back at the bandard's cave, I was strong and all-powerful, the disparity between a cultivator and a normal human being was vast, exactly as vast as the situation between me and the snake, where I was the mortal in question and the snake was the cultivator. My feeble attempt at a decent dodge still awarded me with a rather lucky escape from the jaws of death, even if momentarily. As the snake had bitten through the dirt, digging several metric tons of it out of the ground in a single bite then spat it out to the side in a rumble of dust and stone that rose up to the high heavens then focused its eyes back at me ready for another attempt at my life. Shit. Now, I could be strong compared to a mortal. But if the jade-colored snake was to have me in between its jaws instead of the massive dirt pile that had just spat, I'd be hard-pressed to worry about coming out of the incident with a few broken bones. I'm in way over my head, and I know it. I have two options, the first, run, which is super dumb considering the serpent is faster, stronger, and has impressive agility, a huge contrast to its massive train-sized self. The second option is to fight. And even if it does sound even dumber than the first option, it's my best one. Though I know for certain that even if this snake were to sleep right in front of me for a hundred years as I hacked away at its hide I'll be satisfied if I were to break a single one of its scales during that period. Shit is impossible to beat and I know of it, yet, there was only one way to come on top. Using X now here come my concerns, I don't know if Sai Sun is observing me. But if I don't act, I'll definitely end up dead. And since he didn't show himself the moment the snake had appeared, then he either doesn't care if I live or die, or he has no idea I'm in great peril. I'll bet on the second option because the first is too grim to think about. I jumped back while the serpent shot at where I stood, only missing by a hair's breadth as I got assaulted by all the dust and debris that were the result of its second chomp on the ground. For the life of me, if I was just a bystander, I'd think that the ground was made of tofu instead of solid dirt dust, and rocks. I tapped twice on my chest as X shot forward from the Poison God's book, this was X's debut fight and I pitted him against a demonic beast, for his first battle. A great risk, a stupid one even, because I haven't fully calculated its full capabilities, side form a powerful punch against a wall. I have no idea where X's limits lay. And if that punch against the wall was impressive, Snecky here made chomping on the ground look like he was taking a bite out of a cack. Still, X never failed to impress me, the automaton immediately took action, knowing exactly what to do without even having to tell it that I need to be protected. Not out of luck, no, I had already inscribed perception, awareness, and a deduction inscription within it. Though not the most complex, but enough for him to understand that snake equals danger, X kill danger. A simple equation that made great results. X didn't dodge the incoming charge, as the snake was about to bite right through it. And where I saw the puppet standing in wait for the incoming charge, my heart wrenched at the prospects of losing X, but the puppet surprised me as it grabbed the snake by the fang. Thanks to the massive spiritual chi expenditure from the high-grade spirit stones powering it, X's strength rose to match that of the snake and above, 
as it stopped the snake in its tracks like a reinforced concrete block would do to a car. Utterly and completely immovable, X stood on his grounds, while the snake panicked at being pinned by the fangs. The snake coiled around itself, though it couldn't move its mouth, its tail was still able to move, and it was about to use it to swat X like an annoying fly. I moved several paces away. The battle between these two is not something I could join or even survive if I was in the vicinity, so I had to leave the stage for X. The serpent's tail came down like a god's whip about to punish a heretic servant, but the puppet released one hand from the snake's fangs, and even with one hand, X still kept the snake pinned. X then tucked his hand under his armpit then punched forward, meeting the snake's tail with a sound-breaking punch. A loud thundering explosion echoed as tail and fist met, and neither buckled. I was impressed with the outcome, X didn't spare any chi using his punch, though he didn't use the full power from the spiritual stone as it would destroy his hand from the sheer chi within the high grade spirit stone, X used the most chi he could use without damaging his hand from chi overload. And that was about 35%, not of the total chi inside the spirit stone but 35% of the chi that the spirit stone would passively release. And that clash had caused the snake to feel threatened as the slits of its eyes shook in apprehension, sensing that the puppet grabbing it by the fang was strong enough to contend with its hardened tail, the snake tried its best to escape, only to be pinned down once again by X as he grabbed the second fang with his now slightly damaged fist. The snake raised its tail again, attempting to swat X once again, but the puppet was smarter. It had already deduced that if they were to repeat the same scenario, he will not come on top, the damage to his hand was a clear indication that his durability was slightly below the snake. Not a fault of his, but the material that made X. So as before the serpent's tail would come down on the puppet, but X pulled the snake towards him. Then, as if X was human. I'd swear it heaved as it jerked the whole damned creature above its head then slammed it on the ground behind him, cratering the ground, while I almost lost my footing due to the reverberations from the impact. X had smashed the snake on its back, then stomped on its upper jaw that was now stuck in the ground, he then clutched the other jaw with two powerful grips, a single forceful twist and pull, and the snake's lower jaw was ripped out of his socket leaving the snake hissing and flailing in complete pain agony, while showing X in a burst of crimson blood. Not even bothered by the boiling blood that melted the grass under his feet, X unceremoniously threw the lower jaw away and grabbed at the snake's forked tongue, ripping it from its socket, causing untold pain to the snake. Though the snake's hide was as strong if not stronger than X's body, its internal organs weren't as durable and X abused that fact to vicious savagery. One would even feel sorry for the snake if one were to see how it flailed around, in agonized but unvoiced pain. X reveled in the pain thralls of the snake until he finally believed the snake to be deserving of mercy. He dove his fist right at the snake's upper jaw, and right into its brain, where the snake flailed one last time before it slumped to the ground, forever unmoving. The moment the snake was dead, X stood up and stood still, deeming that no danger presented itself, the puppet stood at attention waiting for further instruction. Holy crap, I cursed. Honestly, this was a surprising outcome, I never thought that X would have such power. And it was damn impressive and comforting. Still, there was much to do, so much to fix. First of all, X had a lot of power, too much power in fact. Not that it was a bad thing but his body had received a lot of damage, mostly from X's own expenditure of chi than the damage from the battle, as the snake had failed to even land a single blow on X. The damage was mostly dealt with his hands and shoulders. A few nicks and strained fingers. He was made of metal, but metal can bend and due to the power behind him, his body became oddly shaped even if slightly. He was now favoring his right leg over his left and his torso was slightly tilted from the forced pulls, if he was made of flesh, his current predicament would be the same as a person who had pulled his muscles, only he pulled his muscles enough that they ripped. An automaton he was, X still suffered an injury and it would hinder his action if left unfixed. 
I waved my hand as I pulled X back into the Poison God's book. So far, there was no news from Xi Sun, nor did he show his face, the battle wasn't soundless, so if he had sensed the Qi expenditure, he would definitely know that I've been fighting and would come to investigate. So, I'm better off hiding my trump card. As for the snake. I sat down, contemplating what to do with it. It was huge, powerful even, and looking at its fangs I could say that they could prove worth a few coins. I thought against using my poison to consume the snake as I didn't need any poison chi right now and it would be useless to waste such a corpse. I needed to study this snake. Even if it had died to X, it had a hide strong enough to sustain a full blow from X, that was enough for me to take interest in its skin. Better skin the snake and use the skin, sell it or craft something with it than waste it using the green poisonous aura that would serve nothing as I'm neither exhausted nor in dire need of poison chi. So, I waved my hand once again and had the poison god's book suck in the snake inside it. Preserving it for later along with the flower atop it and the tongue and the lower jaw that were thrown on the ground. I sat down, trying to calm my excited self, right now, I felt fifty years younger, I began meditating, reflecting on what just happened, and how surprisingly powerful X is. Chapter 52, Solitary Mountain Pagoda First things first, I'm weak. This is obvious, to anyone with eyes. I'm no match to the monsters and creatures of this world, and I'm even surprised at my ability to retain my sanity even after I was almost eaten by that huge snake. I'll have to thank the cultivation mindset for this because if I was a regular person, I'd probably shit my pants the moment that snake showed up. The second thing, I'm way in over my head. This mere snake was the first hurdle thrown at me in this ascendance cave, there could be more, and definitely fiercer, stronger creature up in the distance, something that mere luck or a damaged dex cannot overcome. And finally, I can't leave this place without Xi Sun simply because I didn't have the slightest idea on how to. I came to this place thanks to the teleportation platform. But the platform didn't teleport me to another one but rather threw us in a random spot inside this small world. So to leave I must find another teleportation platform and pay the hefty sum of spirit stones to get out. Also, not to mention the small slabs that are in the hands of Xi Sun. One of them allowed us access to this place, so it wouldn't be wrong to assume that one would allow us to leave, or even be the key to some of the possible areas in this small world. Right, let's take a step back. I'm too weak to fight, but I won't give up and just die. I need strength to survive but it's impossible in the current situation, I can't just up and become an ascendant if I wish hard enough. The world doesn't work like that. Hard work and dedication and suffering at the hands of the poison plaguing my body. So, that leaves me with what? Prudence, carefulness, and complete understanding of where I am, what I have to do, and where to go. I can't power my way through these hurdles with mere strength, I'm so far lacking in that aspect right now it would be a joke if I were to think I'll survive on my mere foundation establishment cultivation. I'll need to use my wits. Immediately. My mind's gears began spinning. I reevaluated my situation and rethought through it. No exit, no power, but still intelligence and prudence will take one a long way. At least if I were to die, I'll know it won't be because I was headstrong and believed I'm able to fight my way through, but because I wasn't smart enough to navigate the hidden dangers of this place. X is damaged, but I have no way to fix him in this situation. My body is still perfectly fine, I received no injuries and I still have enough chi to move about. I'm not in any immediate danger but that's no reason to relax. And I need to figure out my next step, should I wait for Xi Sun, or should I navigate this area all by myself? Though the first choice seems like the best option, I don't trust that noble. Simply because he had too much power for me to pose any real threat, the same as the traps here. I could file him as another hurdle and find a way around him, he is the hurdle that I'm best off avoiding. So, that brings me to my current predicament, what now? All over me are planes that reach all the way to the horizon, 
the sun never moved, and the sky is slightly cloudy, there is a gentle breeze but it feels fake. More like the wind from a fan than a cold summer wind. Staying where I am will not change anything, and will only increase the chances of Zai's son finding me. Not that I'm avoiding him, but if the jade he gave me stays in one place for a long time he would think that I might have died, or that I'm stuck, giving him reason to come find me. I kept looking around, there was nothing that would indicate my position, no mountains no trees, and no points of reference besides this pool next to my feet. Which way to go, north, south, west, east? I kept tracking my brain thinking where I should go before realizing how idiotic I was. The winds, are static, continuous, but the wind is coming from the west, it never subsided, it kept moving. And in this fake world, this wind needed a source, and this source would probably be the center of this place. That's a start, though not the best lead to follow, if I created this place I'd probably put all the mechanism in the centermost area. I then pulled my sword, sat meditating on it in a lotus pose, and willed it to move forward. Not fast, but not slow either, just in between. I meditated, thinking about my situation and if I were to find myself in a fight against something soon and how to deal with it. Though it wasn't the best way to deal with my current situation, it beats not thinking of anything and worrying about what might be hiding in the grass. Hours upon hours of flight. I finally saw the first sign of change in this world. In the distance, there was at first a protrusion in the horizon. And the longer I flew forward, the more the protrusion looked like a mountain. Good, a mountain, it's a change in scenery. But also, it means that there could be something there, besides the mundane grass. I kept flying forward while gazing at the mountain taking the side of it whole. The mountain stood at several kilometers tall far higher and bigger than anything I had ever seen and it only grew larger the more I gotten closer to it. And right in the middle of it, the source of the wind came to view. A towering pagoda with nine stories, and each of these stories was as big and as majestic as the palace in the purple cloud sect. And on top of it, there was a mistake. I say mistake because something didn't seem right. There was a sphere that shouldn't belong there, it was wind, gathering rotating and spiraling above the pagoda then blowing in one single area. East. Where I came from. The pagoda looked immaculate and clean as if it didn't weather God knows how many eons in this place. No snow, dirt, or dust gathered on the pagoda and it looked clean. It took me more hours to get to the pagoda's open gate. And looking at the doors I saw two of the slabs making the box that Zai Sun had, already placed on the door. Keys. This means that Zai Sun had already arrived here and entered. I took a deep breath and took a step inside the pagoda. Only to be immediately assaulted by a mind rending vocal message. Welcome to the Laughing Slaughterer's Abode. Rejoice for your trials and tribulations are yet to start. Survive and you shall earn untold might, fail and you shall be doomed to everlasting mediocrity. That is if you remain alive. The message was simple but it meant that so much danger lurked inside this pagoda that it would be best if I leave. Yet, man proposes, and heaven disposes. The gates of the pagoda lurch closed locking me inside what seemed to be a gigantic pentagonal wooden platform where it seemed to have no other exit or entry. The walls around me closed and locked me while the ceiling came down locking me in a sealed enclosed space that I had no way to leave. And right in front of me, there was a man standing front of me. He oddly looked exactly like me. With the same robes, pustules and hunched back, only his eyes, well one of them as I was missing an eye and so was the clone. His eye was red, no irises, not white, just a red glowing eye and his grin was something that sent shivers down my spine if I could grin as he did I'd be damn scary. First trial. One against self. For only one's limiter is oneself, find victory against yourself to see true enlightenment. Slash, don't forget keep the help coming for the poison gods heritage all donations are welcome to keep this work free. Chapter 53, Battle I didn't move, nor did the clone. I didn't need to act. First of all, I need to understand what the hell is going on. 
I'm in some laughing slaughterer's pagoda, perhaps his trial area where he tests the cultivation noobs for lack of a better term. And the first test is a fight against oneself, so I'll need to prove that I can be better than who I currently am to proceed forward. Right, now, the clone is not attacking, probably waiting for me to attack first, and if I were to do it will start the battle. I'm not ready yet, I'll need to stay my hand until I'm sure of everything around me. By starting with the setting I found myself in. An octagonal room, with a locked ceiling, and closed walls, no windows or doors opened. Even the one behind me was tightly locked, and there were no stairs to the next room, so I would have to assume that once I defeat this guy I'll be able to go to the next stage. Right, assumptions aside, I'll need to know of one thing. I pulled out my sword from behind me, and so did the clone, he pulled out a similar creeping demise. Now that's bad. Because it means that whatever is powering this thing is capable of replicating my stuff, so using X is a big no I don't want to face a copy of my own puppet. Nor would I risk having my own X fight against the enemy's X, in case mine gets ruined in a meaningless battle of attrition. So. I figured that unless I pull out something from my pockets, the enemy will not have any prior knowledge of the item I own. It would be best if I kept my cards hidden. That's an accidental lesson I learned. So, how do I beat myself? Simple, by cutting my neck, I'm physically weak. Physically weak compared to regular cultivators mind you as I can easily dispose of a few hundred mortals without breaking a sweat. But against myself? I'm not too keen on battling this copy, simply put, because I already know how to defeat the clone. This is a test to see if one is able to come to insight in the middle of battle. As one would definitely fight until the bitter end against themselves, and only in this battle where one is equally pitted against his clone would one would understand that unless they came to a new insight, a new killing move, or a new skill, that they would be able to defeat the clone because only by bettering oneself would one be able to defeat their older self. The idea settled in my mind and I was sure of it, this was the answer to this test. But if I were to fight and not come to a new insight of my battle brows, then I will be killed here by a clone. But what choice do I have? If I were to stay my hand, wait then nothing will change, there is no room to back down, and only one way forward. Then. Prove myself better than myself is the only option left for me. I took a step forward and so did the clone, then another step, then the clone charged me, with far more speed than I ever believed myself capable of. Still, the attack was predictable, a long sword sweep that I could easily dodge if I were to jump back. Yet, doing so will definitely cause me to be were on the backhand, defensive stance. I don't want to do that. If I were to play this battle defensively then I'll be forced on the defensive from the start, and that's a recipe for disaster. The sweep came close to lobbing my head off, but with a flick of my wrist, creeping demise sprang to action. Striking against the length of the clone's sword and parrying it with ease. A good parry, I'm impressed I managed it on the first try, but there was no need for me to be all giddy I'm in the middle of battle. I followed up reposting with another flick of the sword, this time slicing at the clone's wrist. The repost was perfect, as I sliced the clone's wrist, then I saw something strange. The clone's wrist bled, but the blood on it was a clear healthy crimson. I took a step back. A terrible move in any battle when one has the advantage, but I deemed this was the best move. Simply because, I found a better way to defeating this enemy especially since what I saw happening right in front of me proved that my action to back off was the best course of action I took. The wrist on the clone healed at astonishing speeds. So, unless I landed a death blow, I would have been stuck in a battle of attrition against an enemy that probably can heal itself indefinitely. I took a deep breath and spat out my poison breath, to which, the enemy did the same, spewing a powerful gust of poison towards me where I greedily smiled as I opened my mouth wide, gulping back my own poison and the enemy. The action caused the clone to frown and instantly act, as it opened its mouth to suck in the remaining poison. 
only for me to bawl out laughing, dumb idiot. A statement that proved more than true before the clone began shuddering, shaking then outright melted in front of me in a puddle of corroded melted flesh. Magnificent display of skill. The laughing slaughterer's voice sounded loud and clear. This simple statement was enough to indicate that this was an automated response to the victor of this stage, and wasn't an actual person watching and speaking directly to me. Otherwise, they'll be asking what the hell just happened, or at least know that it had nothing to do with skill and just luck. The clone was made of human flesh and powered by some sort of mechanism, also it was made in a way that it would perfectly replicate the being that it was cloning. The only difference that it didn't fully copy the enemy's internal body. Otherwise, I would be facing a creature that was really inflicted with the bone and body grinding poison, instead of just the appearance of the affliction such as the pustules and the tumors. A large hole opened up on the ceiling where a spiral case of stairs came spinning down, allowing me access to the upper floor. Then a small pill bottle flew at me. It was fast enough that I didn't realize it was in front of me until it was. Receive your reward, dress your wounds and go to the second floor, for your test has yet to end. The voice said once again, further confirming this was just a recording after all I wasn't wounded to dress any wounds. I took the pill bottle and opened it. A strong spiritual scent assaulted my nose, it was sweet and potent. A mid-grade restorative pill, but to me, it was more like poison. Spiritual pills were useless to me, and a restorative pill will actually try and heal my affliction which is the poison plaguing me, but in doing so, it will literally destroy me from within, or so I theorized, but I'm better off just keeping this instead of throwing it like the useless trash it is. Once I was on the second floor, I saw that the floor was slightly smaller than the one I was on, but it didn't take from the majesty of the pagoda. Only, instead of the non-existent decoration on the lower floor, this one had a small table with a teapot and a cup ready. Might is right. But what can one do against inconceivable odds? Drink up cultivator and show me. The laughing slaughterer's voice sounded louder this time. I sat down and gulped the cup's content on one single motion. The poison god's book didn't warn me that it was dangerous, and if it had poison, then I'll benefit from it even. But the drink actually caused my vision to grow woozy and I found myself lost in a dreamlike state before my eyes focused, where I sat wearing leather armor. Looking at my bare arms, I saw that I had a darkened skin, for someone who had toiled under the glare of the blazing sun far more than anyone should. This was not my body. It was the body of some soldier as I noticed many others with the same features though their faces were blurred. I could see that they talked, laughed, and joked with each other, this was a scene from a battle perhaps. We were in a desert-like environment, where cliffs rose high above us as we were shaded by their sheer size from the blaze of the scorching sun. Tents were pitched as far as my eye could see, but seeing from the ragged clothes and armors of many of these soldiers, even the dead and dying coming in and out of some of the nearby tents. I realized that this could only be the camp of a defeated army. I walked away from where I stood and took another glance at my surrounding. We sat cradled between two high cliffs, and outside these cliffs was sand, reaching all the way to the horizon. The cliffs around us stretched in a long line back, where many, many wounded soldiers marched, slowly funneling away from the camp. While the healthiest of the bunch remained standing where we are right now, before I wondered why isn't the whole camp moving deeper between the cliffs, a man came rushing in, as he roared out a warning. The enemy is upon us. Prepare for battle. The rider shouted, again and again as he raced through the camp, waking everyone to a grim reality. Though I couldn't see anyone's face, I could feel the rising tension, despair, and outright defeatist morality of the camp. I was but a mere soldier in this battle and I didn't have my sword, nor my ability to use poison chi, as I didn't feel my meridians no matter how hard I tried to rotate my energy. Huh, back to being immortal so soon, I grimaced at the realization. Soldiers. Rank up. Form a line to hold the enemy. We'll pave way for the wounded to escape. A man with a bristling voice called, 
his voice booming through the camp and commandeering everyone into action. A group of soldiers gathered up and lined up in front, where the two cliffs stood as natural barricades, the soldiers lined up to defend the only access point to where we stood. A good strategy to limit the number of enemies we'll be facing. Soldier. A loud shout woke me from my stupor as the same man who had called everyone to line up was shouting at me. Looking back, I saw a man in slightly more ornate clothes, a round helm covering his face, and in one of his hands a spear that held a blue bloodied banner. Are you too scared to move your ass? Show signs of cowards and I'll kill you myself before you taste the enemy's steel. I nodded at the man and scurried forward, lining up alongside the other soldiers. So, we're supposed to hold the enemy for the rest of the camp to escape. Pretty desperate, pretty stupid, and outright suicidal. Most of the people around me looked rattled to their cores as the enemy was upon us. Hundreds upon hundreds of horses were charging their way toward us, and with such a flimsy looking line of soldiers to hold the line, I was certain that we'll be overrun with the first cavalry charge. Now, I'm pretty sure this very test was not tailored towards someone such as me. This was a test for the battle-hungry, sword-happy swinging martial artist who will use their skills in slaughtering as many of the enemy soldiers as they can. This is a test of martial skills, of which I didn't have much knowledge. And since I didn't have any martial skills to speak of, then I'm definitely screwed. God, I wish if I could run along with the still scurrying soldiers unfit to hold the line. Fighting here is outright suicide, and backing away is desertion, rewarded with instant death delivered by the captain himself. I'm too old for this shit. Chapter 54, Against the Odds Spears at the Ready The captain shouted at the ten tightly packed lines holding the entrance to the enclosed space. Archers. Loose. He called as the back line shot arrows that arced their way into the incoming cavalry. A few of the arrows fell harmlessly on the sand, but a good portion struck rider and mount, causing the horses that were rushing at breakneck speeds to falter or outright fall. A horse's tumble was nothing if not catastrophic, as the whole beast would tumble forward crushing the rider above it under its weight. Not to mention, causing a good deal of the riders behind it to stumble to the same fate crushed under the hooves of their own allies. But the majority of the charging horses knew how to deal with such incidents, as they nudged their horses to jump over the dead and dying bodies of their allies to continue the charge. Spears up. Hold the ranks. The commander called in the front row raised their spears. Futile as it might be against the charge of heavy cavalry, the spears pierced through horse and rider, while many of the horses charged right through the ranks swatting allies with vehement savagery. The riders were well equipped for the charge, with long spears, clay ives, or metallic poems. Some even had chain-linked morning stars that they used to swing at the heads of my allies. Breaking bone and crushing skulls. The cavalry bore through the ranks like a hot knife through butter and there was nothing the captain could do to hold the charge, especially since a perfectly aimed spear had cut through the captain's incessant commands as it bore through his throat. Another soldier hurried to grab not the captain, but the banner, if the banner falls, everyone is doomed. The same soldier shouted orders and the battle continued. One would think that in a battle everyone would be fighting face to face, but it was far from it. Only the soldiers engaged were able to fight, as the rest of the ones behind them waited. There was no room for everyone here to fight, and there was only one thing they could do wait for their comrades to die before they took their place, or pull them back to relative safety if they are too injured to battle. And second, after an arduous second as I waited, the battle was getting closer to me. I had a scimitar in hand, a little heavy but not discomfortingly so. It rested well in my hand, it was made of low-quality steel, nothing comparable to cultivator weapons but it was more than enough to slice through the enemy's leather clothes with relative ease if one were to apply a bit of strength. Another spear shot through the soldier's ranks and pierced through the chest of the soldier that held the banner, only to have the banner fall towards the ground, and if it were to fall, all will end. Yet this damnable banner, as if it had a nasty will of its own was falling towards me, 
where I unconsciously grabbed it before it touched the floor. As I had the banner in my hand, a few soldiers looked at me, though their faces were a blur, I could feel their apprehension, fear, and uncertainty, but most of all, hope, hope that I could lead them out of this miserable situation into an impossible victory, or at least survival. Pull the wounded. I shouted and my voice rang, hold the line, and any able archer keeps shooting your arrows. I called and many followed, comforted by commands, soldiers fell in line. A weak, barely able to hold itself, but a line it was. And the arrows fell. The arrows managed to subdue the incoming cavalry, where my infantry made quick work of the overly extended cavalry in our ranks. A cavalry ride was great for charging through infantry, but against thick lines of spears and arrows, the cavalry found little success in making more way. Now stuck in the midst of soldiers, they were killed almost instantly. A rider had the height advantage in a group of soldiers, but even if he could fend one or two, when you have half a dozen soldiers surrounding your horse, then you're bound to be impaled. And with the arrows still being loosed on the incoming riders that desperately tried to replenish their overextended cavalry, it was all but impossible to get any closer. The tight enclosures had guaranteed that every horse that had been felled by arrows was an obstacle to subsequent horses, further stopping any cavalry from replenishing their front lines. And with that, the rest of the cavalry were forced to retreat, dooming the few that had charged headfirst into the army. A small victory, and a well-earned rest for my soldiers the moment they made quick work of the few riders that were within their ranks. But, that's nothing to throw a celebration for. As in the distance, there was another group of marching soldiers, heavy infantry, walking right through the desert sands, hot as it was, and insufferable as it was, these soldiers still tided through the blistering heat in their armors. The moment they'll make it here, it will be all but defeat that will await us. Retreat! I shouted, getting a stunned reaction from everyone. But this was the best action I could think of, waiting here would mean nothing. We'll be slaughtered to the last the moment the enemy was upon us. Retreat. I called once again and the soldiers finally turned tail and began running. You, I called and began pointing at a few soldiers, who were well halfway in stride, they stopped looking at me, and I could even feel the helplessness in their eyes. Light the camp and tents on fire, it should buy us time to escape, do it quickly and run as fast as you can. I called and moved forward, there was no way for me to take one of the enemy's horses, as I didn't know how to ride one, and even if I did, I'm better off not riding a war horse that had lost its master, lest I want a broken back and a rude spear through the chest once someone finds my body and laughs at how dumb I was trying to hijack a war horse. Don't sprint. I called and everyone stopped, keep moving, half speed. I called and the rest of the army moved at a brisk but not so fast speed. Almost like a jug, this was both to keep them warm, even if the weather in this desert had done they the burned of that work, but they needed to keep their bodies ready for battle lest the sweat would cool them and cause them more exhaustion and unreadiness to battle. The pitch tents were thankfully packed tight, and when my soldiers lit them on fire, they caught it like a swat of dry hay under a summer sun's blaze. Smoke rose, and fire looked through the camp, securing our back from an assault for a few moments. The blaze helped scare off the horses as not even a war horse was brave enough to charge through it, and it was hot enough for even the heavily armored soldiers to try and move through, their only option was to wait, and we were going to wait for them. We moved on foot, for long arduous hours, with no enemy behind us, as the path elongated and extended forward. Thankfully this valley was wide enough to allow our army to move, but crooked and with enough obstacles to stop any of the enemy's horses to charge into a full sprint. We kept moving as my group moved at half a running pace. A man passed me his water skin, and I was thankful as I was parched beyond humanly possible, I took a sip, dousing my almost brittle throat, and passed the water skin to another person. We had no chance at survival against the enemy but running away, we can make it if we're lucky enough. The only problem was, if there was an end to this valley or if it extended to eternity. 
The scout that had first alarmed us to the enemy came running again, keep moving. We're close to the valley's end, there are friendlies in wait. Hope, good, this would raise the morals, but I didn't like how it made almost all of the soldiers run even faster, keep your goddamned pace. I shouted, the last thing I wanted for them was to exhaust themselves before they reached the end only for the enemy to find weak exhausted prey to pick. The friendlies that the scout had said would have been pretty helpful here holding our back, but I immediately shook the idea out of my head. The cave was tight pack enough with my soldiers, it would be suicide to add more to this death trap. As if the enemy had known of the friendlies in wait, I heard the thundering sound of hooves behind us. Though still far away, it would take them less than a dozen minutes to reach us. How can I stop the enemy from mowing us to the last? And especially since the troops were so close to the exit. Rope. I need rope. Rope. I called and two soldiers came to me with it, even without being able to see their expression, I could bet that they have bewildered expressions on what I'll be doing with rope. I took the rope and attached it over a protruding rock then ran all the way to the other side of the valley and attached it on another protrusion, making sure it was taut and strapped tight. I continued forward, this cost me a few precious seconds, but the idea was easy to understand. The rest of the retinue immediately did the same, strapping rope whenever possible on rocks and protrusions as we continued the pace. A few brave soldiers even picked up their spears and ran behind us, to secure the way for the rest at the expense of their own lives. I couldn't stand back and help them, even if a part of me wanted to, but the bigger cowardly but pragmatic part advised otherwise, these soldiers needed someone to lead them out, and if I were to fall. I don't want to think about it. The sound of horses falling echoed soon behind us, this wasn't good. It meant that the enemy had been far closer than I anticipated, and they were hot on our heels. Yet thank the mighty for smiling down upon us as the exit of the valley was, I sight. This was both a relief and at the same time a proof of the soldiers' indomitable will as even more decided to stand and leave the wounded to run away so they could hold the enemy. The friendlies were out of the valley, but we'll be mowed to the last if we exit right now. The soldiers knew it and they decided to sacrifice their lives for the rest to escape. I never knew them, never spent more than these few hours with them, but felt a sense of belonging to see people laying their lives for the rest. This selfless act was enough to send shivers down my spine, I can't explain it, but it was enough to make me stand my ground. I handed the banner to one of the soldiers, keep them running. I called and drew my sword. How stupid! How futile, laying one's life on the line for the rest to escape, but at the same time, it felt like the right thing to do. This is what the book had said, and this is what I'll abide by. It felt right. And if it feels right, then it's definitely right. No matter the odds. I'll fight. Even if old and frail. No, I'm not old, not here not now, I'm a young man, a soldier. And even if I had no sense of attachment to these soldiers, there was a sense of belonging and camaraderie that I cannot explain, and it would be wrong to abandon people who selflessly sacrifice their lives for the rest without me doing the same. Against my pragmatic self, against every common sense of self-preservation, it felt right to stand here, with these few dozen heroes, it felt right to die here. Because otherwise, none would escape. And at that moment, I forgot that I was in a test, and immediately, the cloud over the faces of the soldiers next to me disappeared. Most of them had expressions of grim determination. None were cowards, none thought themselves heroes for doing what they're doing, they all knew, that their friends and comrades relied on them to survive, and they'll be damn sure to make that happen. Though I wasn't here for a long time, it only felt right to say this. It's been an honor serving with you. There and then, the enemy cavalry was upon us. Chapter 55 The Bane of Man The riders charged at us with ferocious impunity, if not for one final linked rope to cause a few to stumble I would have died right there and then, trampled by a war horse. The horse that fell in front of me, delivered its rider to my feet, concussed obviously but still looked whole, 
I dove my sword right at the small opening between his helmet and chest armor, I didn't need to do more, the strike slid a major artery and he would die within minutes, nor could I afford to make a cleaner hit as more rider came at me. Our forces, not more than a couple of dozens that decided to stand and allow the rest to escape, were nothing more than grass in the way of a stampeding rhino, only the rhino needs to slow down due to the narrowness of the valley the ropes stumbling the horses and the fallen animals blocking its way. If we were on open fields, we would have been mowed down to the last in less than a couple of seconds. But thanks to the buckle of the enemy, we managed to stop the rest by using their own numbers against them. At best, twenty of our soldiers remained to fend off hundreds. A wild mace threatened to cave my skull in, but thanks to my mind's eye, I was able to predict the mace's trajectory. Though I was unable to use any cultivation, my mind still worked like that of a cultivator, giving me ample time to duck under the mace then deliver a rising slash at the rider, slicing through the opening under his armpit. The sword connected and the rider's arm was barely attached to its socket thanks to a bloody tendon. Another spear threatened to impale me where I stood, to which I dodged by the barest of margins. The spear's tip sliced through my leather pauldron causing mild discomfort while the shaft throbbed against my shoulder netting it a hollow empty strike against the air. I pulled lightly at the already extended spear causing the rider who refused to abandon his weapon to fall from his horse. I sliced at the rider's back neck, as fast as I could as I noticed another spear coming my way. My sword slid fast enough, ripping the man's neck, gushing blood and moved in a rising slash to parry the spear, where one of my comrades struck at the spear wielder with his own spear toppling him from over his horse. I knew that I had no martial skills to speak of, and most of the stuff I had just done was thanks to the power behind the soldier I was currently possessing, and the increased thinking process of the mind's eye. But mental exhaustion will soon down upon me. That is of course if this soldier's body I'm using doesn't outright collapse from physical exertion. The battle continued for what felt like hours as we fought on the back end. More of our comrades fell to errant sword strikes or crushed under the maces of the enemy, further dooming this already hopeless situation, but I had to fight, and I kept on fighting, even when one spear cut through my thigh, not because I couldn't dodge in time, but because the body I'm using refused to dodge. It was already exhausted beyond humanly possible. Another soldier sliced at my left arm, rendering it barely usable. But I still fought, and fought, using every scrap of energy I could muster, every bit and every speck of power that was left in this body. My comrades had long since died and only I was left fighting and that has been a long time ago, or perhaps I felt like it was. Bloodied, battered, and exhausted. I still heaved for more breath as I sliced at the enemy. Until a time I noticed everyone standing still, none moved towards me. For they knew that with injuries such as the ones I have right now, it would only be a matter of time before I fell down. The enemy soldiers knew that if they were to attack, they'll only die. And not attacking is what they did. Standing still watching the strange man, fighting to the literal last breath and then one of them slapped a fist to his chest, as did others, and soon I understood why. They were saluting, an enemy, one worthy of respect for standing against odds, fighting to the brinks of death, yet still grasping straws of futile hope, they didn't see an enemy, they saw a soldier fighting for a cause and that would bring even the mightiest of foes to respect such act. There and then, my eyes darkened, and I fell on my knees breathing the agonizing last breaths of this body. Suddenly, I woke up, where I found myself seated within the laughing slaughterer's pagoda, in front of me was the small table with the teacup emptied out. The laughing slaughterer's sound resounded through the hall. Pitiful display. Such is yours, for you only slew forty-three of your enemies. Many had achieved higher than you have, you are better off giving up, for the test will only become harder. The voice was monotonous as always, but then another vocal message sounded. However, unlike any before, your battle had secured the survival of more than 319 soldiers. You are the first to have managed to help soldiers escaping the pursuit of the crown regime. 
most would fight against the enemy, scoring as many kills as they can, while the enemy would run rampant among their lines only for them to die once outnumbered. You secured a path to retreat for the others before you returned to battle. And my verdict is. The voice trailed. This time the message felt a bit more. Lifelike, but still it had a neutral dead tone to it. But the following words were like heaven and earth. Stupid. The word sounded like a thunder's echo within me. For no cultivator would weigh their own self-preservation against the survival of people they do not know. Foolish. For you gave your life for ones you didn't have any relation to. The most stupid of all, your pride blinded you to the simple truth, survive. Survive at all costs. I couldn't debunk the statement, because I knew in a sense he was right, I didn't know any of them, and I should have escaped when it was possible. I do know that I stopped and fought alongside the soldiers so others would survive. But why did I do that? Did I know them? They weren't friends family or anything else, they were just soldiers. Still, it felt wrong to leave them to their demise, my conviction, I muttered, though I didn't think the voice would answer back, I fought because I believed it was right. A loud silence echoed around, it was so baffling that I could only hear the sound of my own heartbeats and the breaths I drew, it was a still deathly silence that I never felt before. Then the laughing slaughterer's voice echoed once again. So young dot and you have the rudimentary understanding of the truth dot your Tao, perhaps not, perhaps egoistic beliefs, still. Idiotic, but I won't sway you against your conviction for it is not my place. Proceed. The words echoed and another spiraling staircase came down, this time the reward was different. It was a manual, a sword art. The sanguine blade, first tome. I took the book in hand and began flipping its pages, it was a series of sword darts dedicated to slashes and stabs, with overexerted and overextended strikes. The risks entailing these sword darts were dangerous, for every attack was overbearing, but at the same time, held great risks. For every attack, would cause the enemy to falter, hesitate briefly, as did the manual explain. This art required a resolution far beyond what any man could ever hope to obtain. It was the epitome of a higher sky reward. A sword dart that relied on diving without regard to the enemy's blows or one's self-preservation. It was meant as a risky sword fight that made every attack be seen as a trait of life. Just the major idea behind this book would make one shake in fright, who would ever learn something as dangerous as this? But then, I remembered what happened in the dream I just had. This book, is a reward for the same actions I did, lack of self-preservation. This sword art is a reward for the actions I have shown. Though without any other sword art at my disposal, I believe this sword art would be good in my hands. I tucked the book inside my robes where the book on my chest sucked in the manual and I moved forward. Once I was on the third floor, I saw Zai son who looked exhausted beyond exhaustion and had several wounds all over his body. He was the first thing I noticed before I took a second look at where I was. This floor was also slightly smaller than the one before it, but not much, the only difference was, this floor was separated into two sections. 1. Where I and Sai Sun stood. It was the same as before, a wooden floor with no decoration in sight and no doors or windows while the other side of the room had vast treasure troves, weapon spiritual stones, manuals and even crafting materials. Yet there was a mirror-like barrier that stood tall, separating the two sections. And on the corner, there was the spiraling stair leading upwards. Greed is the bane of all man, but in front of so much wealth, would you ignore it? Or risk all to obtain it? The question the laughing slaughterer was the last of his words as I stood looking at the treasures in front of me. Indeed, they were mighty appealing, as I noticed many spiritual herbs that I didn't even recognize or the space stones on the floor that looked like the least important bits and pieces of this treasure. These space stones are things I need to continue cultivating my star technique to hide my poison cultivation. But I can't get past the barrier, this I know of but Zai Sun apparently doesn't, seeing from the look on his eyes. 
He looked at me like I was a heaven sent gift. Shen Bao. You made it here. He said. Yeah, I'm also surprised to see you here. I'm used. How did you manage your way here? It took me a lot of effort to fight my way through the hordes of spiritual beasts lying about, I doubt you have the ability to fight them. But now. Apprehension was apparent on Sai Sun's face, especially now that he is weakened, and thinks I was able to fight my way through numerous enemies. I pulled out the healing pill I got on the first floor and threw him the vial. He inspected it using his divine sense which Khan accidentally passed through me once again as he tried to see if I had anything on me. But right now, as long as I appear calm and collected, and not answer how I managed to defeat hordes of spiritual beasts even though I have no idea what he is talking about, perhaps we took different routes to get here, and his was ridiculously dangerous I should be able to instill a sense of mystery and with it, danger. Good. The less he knows, the more apprehensive he will be, and with the disregard to the value of the pill I just gave him, which by the way would definitely fetch a fortune outside, he will think I have no interest in it, making me stand on a higher mental pedestal than I deserve. Games within games, mind games to put one above the other, without any verbal words spoken. As long as I carefully set myself above him, I will give him one more reason not to test me or outright turn hostile. I could have easily ignored his exhausted and wounded self, but a wounded lion is more prone to be aggressive than a healthy one. Especially since he will subconsciously feel that even if he was as hale and healthy as he is right now, he proved to be of no consequence or danger to me. Thank you, fellow cultivator Shen Bao. Sai Sun said and chucked down the pill. He sat down in a lotus position and began digesting the pill fellow cultivator he said, and that's a sure sign that I gained his respect or his apprehensive fear. Which was better? No need, I said as I got closer to the barrier, giving him an easy target as I turned my back to him. I looked at the barrier and smiled, then turned around and said, let's go, there is no need to waste time here. Why? I tried hard to break through this barrier, and I think it could crumble with a bit more effort. Sai Sun said. I shook my head saying, this barrier is designed specifically to do that, it will wane and look about to break just enough for you to exhaust all your power, then when you replenish, you'll try again and will seem about to break just as you're exhausted once again, it will do so until you're fully depleted, desperate and without any speck of power or items to replenish yourself. This is a test of your greed, and if you continue down that line, you'll fail. Sai Sun took a moment to digest my words this said, how do you know all of that? Simply put, this barrier is made using Quasi Saint Chi. No matter how strong you are, you'll never match this barrier in strength unless you're an ascendant. Even I can't decipher all of its mysteries, but I know that this thing will survive the bombardment of millions of nascent cultivators without a crack. I said in a decisive and certain tone. Sai Sun sighed and stood up damnable trick, it almost cost me my cultivation as I tried to break through it using a forbidden technique. Damn, damn. Sai Sun cursed and I felt that he was pissed enough that he was going to once again take it off on the barrier. Also, I added, your efforts would have been for naught, I said. Sai Sun looked at me questioningly. Yeah, because those treasures are fake, I said. Nonsense. I could feel their spiritual release even through the barrier. Sai Sun shook his head. That's the thing, this barrier is actually replicating the spiritual residue of all of the items behind it, these are nothing but fakes, but that doesn't mean that they're not here. Looking completely lost I interjected, these treasures probably exist on another floor and they are only projected here to exhaust the cultivators in futile attempts to lessen their chances at retrieving the real treasures. Simple method, but undoubtedly effective. I said as I gave a knowing gaze at the now slightly ashamed Sai Sun. Right, Sai Sun said after clearing his throat, let's keep moving then. And we took off to the upper floor. Chapter 56 The Primordial Dragon Serpent. We arrived at a new floor, yet again a bit smaller than the one under it. But on this floor, 
There didn't seem to be anything of note besides the massive pillar in the middle of it. It was a square pillar made of an obsidian like substance. Before I could consult the Poison God's book, Sai Sun hurried towards the stone, trying to pocket it into his pouch but was soundly denied. Damn, I can't take it, nor can I refine it for my own use. Sai Sun said. Pardon my lack of knowledge, what is this? I asked. Huh? I thought you would know, this is a law stone. Though this is the largest one I had ever seen. It helps cultivators understand the laws of the world. But on a rudimentary level. This is more like a preparation for when they begin studying law in order to confirm their Tao and create their domain. So many new concepts that I have yet to fully understand but I believe I have the gist of it. Though fellow cultivator Shen Bao's cultivation is severely lacking, you can still gain glimpses of this law stone if you can understand something from it. And I believe this is the test of this flower. But it is highly unfavorable for you due to your cultivation level. Sai Sun said, though he spoke in an underisive manner, I could feel hints of pity in his tone. Not the good kind of pity even though pity was never good. I nodded at Zai Sun and approached the stone, trying to understand what secrets it held. There was nothing worth paying attention to, it was nothing more than a well-chiseled stone that stood in the middle of the room, but seeing Zai Sun sit in a lotus position in front of it and enter meditation gave me enough hints on what I should do next. I sat opposed to Zai Sun on the other side of the stone and closed my eyes. The stone was not meant to be seen through one's eyes, but one's mind, and using my mind's eye, I was able to peer through the stone into Avastic Spans. No, into the Avastic Spans as the Poison God's book just sent the information to my head. This world you live in is but a minuscule speck of dust in the ever-expanding vast expanse, it is unlimited and forever enlarging, birthing new life every fraction of a second, and creating secrets, treasures and worlds and Uau bringing death destruction, and annihilation to more. You are but a mere speck of dust within a speck of dust in such a large world, but even a pebble can create triples that resound through a lake as you can make your name resound through the vast expanse. While the domain mankind had explored cannot be more than a fraction of a fraction of the vast expanse, you can be sure that more exists for you to explore, and the dangers and rewards it entails are for only the brave to discover. Do not feel as someone insignificant, for as long as you follow this master's teachings, your voice will be heard loud and clear throughout the vast expanse. I took the words of the Poison God's book with a grain of salt, as I a former man from Earth know, the universe is huge, and huge isn't enough to encompass the true meaning of how big the universe is. Simply put, I know that as many grains of sand there are on Earth, there are more stars in the universe. And that is true. I peered into the vast expanse that was in the stone, and all I could see were stars so numerous that it was mind bogging to keep track of them all. And then there was a star, a green one, in incessant turmoil, as green flames spun and rotated, revolved, and morphed within each other, and then my eyes focused on the planet even further, ignoring the background and solely peering into the planet. It felt warm, not hot not boiling, but just warm, the flames weren't flames, but rather liquid that acted like flames. And within this liquid lived monsters of proportions unimaginable. Serpents that were as long and as large as rivers, and scorpions that furrowed into the flame liquid and emerged, battling against each other in frenzied furry, never stopping never receding, and always and forever battling against each other. I saw more creatures. But there was only one thing in relation to all of these things. The massive leaping frogs, or the snakes, nor the colorful bugs, they were all, poisonous. This was a planet that was festering with poisonous creatures and the planet itself was doused in poison. I have no idea what this means, how can a planet have an ecosystem such as this? But I was in a cultivation world and making logical explanations where I was literally spewing poison out of my own mouth just a few moments ago seemed rather illogical and a moot point to argue. Suddenly, something strange seemed to happen, as the waves of green flames parted, revealing two sets of eyes that definitely belonged to a reptilian creature. The eyes, 
from where I could see them sent shivers down my spine, as they were as large as the moon, and glistened in gold while the abysmal slit in them looked like space was split. This creature's eyes were so massive that I had a hard time understanding how it could even fit inside this planet. Then I figured out why almost soon afterward when the damn planet shuddered and literally uncoiled around itself. A draconic serpent as large as a planet was looking directly at me, where the former liquid that made the planet slowly rotated around its body, probably just due to how massive this creature was, it literally had its own gravitational field. Where the massive creatures I saw before, now were nothing more than specks of dust along the enormous size of the draconic serpent's frame. The serpent opened its mouth revealing rows of fangs large enough to contend with mountains, and then it hissed, with enough force that space around it shuddered and vibrated, causing it to ripple and break in so many ways that I felt the destruction of the whole universe was bound to happen at any time now. Then with its eyes locked in me, the serpent began moving towards me. Only then was I forced back into where I was sitting, fear gripped at my heart, and cold sweat drenched my back. Sai Sun was still meditating, not having sensed what just happened and only the Poison God's book was my solace as it explained what happened and what I just realized would be my most troublesome foe, and the looming scythe of death upon my head. Serpent God, one of the seven primordial creatures. Nothing much is known about them, but I have faced it several times before and never managed against its impressive might, not even at my prime, I was not even able to scratch it. Thankfully, it was not fast, but at the same time, it was my most fearsome foe. For this primordial creature, it vied, loathed, and envied anyone using his path of cultivation. It will not still, nor stop until all that seek the Tao of poison are consumed by it. As this primordial creature's goal was to go beyond his current unknown cultivation and reach above, it failed to find treasures enabling it to break through and would seek to break through by finding and consuming cultivators who use the poison path. However, what bogged my mind was the fact that although there were many, many, many sects cultivating poison, the serpent god would only move against specific targets, and I was among them, and so would this danger befall upon you as you cultivate the same path as I did. Disciple of mine, Take not this creature as a sign of despair and mortality but embrace it as a deadly reminder that you have to increase your cultivation before the serpent god reaches where you are. Do not curse me for forcing you down this path only to be hunted to the end of life by this creature, for I too had suffered at his hands, and had known of its impeding approach only when I achieved ascension. Then and there. I was lucky to have an artifact that propelled me on a random planet through the vast expanse, giving me ample opportunity to escape the hunt. I grew stronger while the serpent approached, and whenever it got closer, I would escape once again. I have never found a way to escape its hunt, and as you read this, do know, that if the serpent is at or you, then it had already claimed me within its jaws. Escape, run, and grow stronger, for only when you're mightier than the serpent god, can you free yourself from your own mortality. I took deep and heavy breaths before images began flooding my mind, as I saw the serpent god chasing after the figure of a young man that didn't look older than his thirties. The man flew through the stars with enough speed that the stars turned to long rays of light. But the serpent god leisurely followed after it, breaking through planets as if they were made of paper, and gobbling them up along his way. The cultivator stopped, heaved raising both hands, then swiped down with his fingers in a clawing manner. This clawed grip looked exactly like the poison tiger's claw. And while I could replicate the basic move to some semblance of perfectness, what I saw made my head throb in exasperation. As when compared to my claw, the cultivator who I now assume to be the poison god, created claws waves that were larger than planets, like seriously larger than fucking planets where he himself looked no bigger than an atom compared to the massive space fissures he created. The claw marks wounded space itself, forcing it to break on contact where waves of pale green and sordid energy came down upon the snake. And what was mo vexing was how easily the serpent shrugged off the titanic assault with relative ease, causing the cultivator to sigh in hopelessness and turn tail escaping further. 
the images stopped and I was left with a sense of desolated dread. How the hell can I face against something like that? And that creature was creeping towards me as I speak. How long will it take to get here? Hours? Days? Years or centuries? No matter how long, it is of the utmost frustration to know that death is coming whether you want it or not. I focused my eyes on the stone because I needed to at least figure out how far we are. And just as I found myself in the vast expanse, I focused on my body, finding it on a random star in a random direction in the vast expanse. And almost instinctively, I turned to locate the serpent, who was still coming over, but, he was so far, so, so far away that it would be absurd to even believe this distance crossable in a hundred lifetimes. I had more chances of dying by a heart attack or outright getting killed by Zai Sun here than the serpent to kill me. The distance was absurdly far that I had a hard time understanding why did the poison god even fear this thing, he could just keep randomly teleporting around the universe. Still, it was frustrating knowing that this damn thing would always and forever be hot on my heels. I calmed myself and began inspecting the rest of this unfathomably large space, but at the same time making sure not to disturb any ancient beings, and then I found myself lost in the beauty of this world. For it was so grand, so large and so majestic that one would spend several lifetimes trying to describe it and never give it its due right. Space was grand and kept so many secrets and treasures and mysteries that it was extremely compelling to go and seek them and so I found myself lost in its amazing mysteries. Chapter 57, Against Overwhelming Odds As I swam in the embrace of the universe, I came to a slight understanding of what space was. Emptiness, yet fluffiness, the universe was empty, but at the same time, it literally had everything in it, a conflicting duality, unlike life and death, this was the existence and non-existence at the same time. For even if the majority of the universe was empty space, there literally was everything in it. Food for thoughts I believed, and I saw through the universe, discovering more of what lay in its embrace, I could see worlds being born, and others destroyed, space shifted, in the literal sense as it grew and shrank like the chest of a person, taking in a breath. The universe, though calm, silent, and forever grim and dark, had life in it life in its darkness, and this life was amazing to behold. Suddenly, my head started hurting and I was forced out of my meditative state. A loud booming voice echoed within the pagoda. You have not fared greatly in understanding law, but you have been given chance to improve in the future, take your newfound knowledge and use it when you encounter true application of law. The words of the laughing slaughterer were spoken to us as Zaisan sighed and looked at me. Sadly, I couldn't understand the mysteries of the world, but fret not, for you have a low cultivation base and it was not expected of you anyway, let's move to the upper floor, Zai Sun said. And as he spoke, the upper room opened up, where the two of us received a small square stone, similar to the stone in the room, it was a law stone, definitely smaller and weaker, but it had law in it, and I would study it later when I have the time. Zai Sun climbed up the stairs first, and just as I was about to follow him, I heard the laughing slaughterer's voice, unlike before when it was booming through the room, this time, it was sent directly into my head. Child, you searched through the universe, unguided by any thought, and in it, you saw the birth of new worlds and the destruction of others. Your cultivation level is so far below your understanding that once you attain greater heights, you'll understand how gifted you truly are for such insights you currently have. Keep your sights focused, and do know, that martial might is great at killing foes, but a complete comprehensive domain can be the death of gods if one was fully capable of controlling and understanding the laws that created their domain. Might is right, but what binds might to its beddings. The words the laughing slaughterers had spoken were like teachings a master would say to their disciple, Though they didn't have a lot of information in them, I wholly understood what he meant, not by his words, but the underlying meaning. The laughing slaughterers had given me advice, precious advice, and at the same time, he didn't outright say what I should do, 
lest he affects my path in the pursuit of the martial road. He showed me the way but didn't guide me through it, giving me the choice to do so on my own. Might is right, and that is the law of the cultivation worlds, only the strong are heard, but those with the ability to understand law are able to bind the world's laws to their own, and in a world where laws are bound, what can might do? It can also be bent according to the laws superseding the world. The laughing slaughterer's words were not many, but behind them, lay thousands upon thousands of years worth of wisdom, and I was amazed not by the wisdom behind the slaughterer's words, nor how did I even manage to understand so much from his words, but what amazed me the most, is how he used so few words, to convey so many meanings. A great mind dot in a dangerous one to boots. I turned and gave a nod to the empty air, it was a gesture that I just felt would be right, thanks to a man that didn't exist here right now, but well deserving of it. There were few that would give advice freely. Even if the laughing slaughterer was not here, he was due his thanks, as it was his right. I walked upstairs, to the fifth floor, only to find Zai son standing still, not moving a single muscle for an utter and complete shock. Cultivators, as this trial continues, you must know that there are always higher mountains and deeper seas, and here lays the example. The laughing slaughterer's words came as I saw what was in front of me and I went giddy with excitement, the complete opposite of Zison who looked like he was about to pass out from fright. And he was right to do so, as in front of us were a dozen terracotta-like puppets. They were almost exactly like X, but with some subtle differences. The material making them though I didn't know what it was it looked sturdier than the one X was made of. They had full armor to top it off, and they wielded weapons that radiated spiritual energy like the floodgates. Fight your way through, if you wish to continue ascending, otherwise leave with your tail behind your backs. The laughing slaughterer said as a door opened to the right of us. I wish to surrender the purest, Zai Sun said without hesitation and began walking toward the door. He looked back at my standing form and frowned, Shen Bao, these are all soul formation level puppets, I could barely handle one, but a dozen, I don't even dream of surviving for a half and since time. Don't do anything rash. Zai Sun said. Right, right, I said, and he was right, there was no way for me to win this battle, but damn if I was not tempted to dismantle these puppets and know the difference between X and these puppets if they were compared to soul formation level cultivators, which was higher than Zai Sun, then what gave them such strength? I needed to know and that greed of knowledge caused me to hesitate into leaving. Just as I turned away from the puppets to leave, the laughing slaughterer's voice sounded once again. Only one may leave. And almost immediately after his words were spoken, Zai Sun bolted out of the door with the speed of light, giving me not a single moment to react. The door closed behind Zai Sun and I was trapped amongst twelve unmoving puppets. I was fucked, and there was no way for me to survive this ordeal. But so far the puppets didn't move. Didn't attack and were waiting, I could even feel their gaze through their lifeless eyes. As they stared at me. The Poison God's book didn't alert me to any danger, however and I was left stuck here. I had more chances for hell to freeze over than to survive a single attack from any of these soldiers, not to mention how uselessly incompatible my skill set was against these things. Though X is strong, I don't fully know if he could fight his way through these things. So I was left with one thing to do, run. And I did, as I jumped back to the lower floor, only to have one of the soldiers jump after me. Desperate and hopeless my situation would seem, but I grinned from ear to ear, as this situation gave me a great chance that I never thought I'll be able to do. The soldier will definitely catch up to me in less than a breath's time, but I already called X out, and he shot out from the poison god's book like a bullet to intercept the puppet soldier behind me. I already gave X a mental command, use all the power you can and stop or kill the enemy if possible and thankfully only one soldier came after me. And the most surprising was, X was more than capable of contending against a soul formation puppet. Something I'll need to pay attention to later as I kept moving away towards the lower floors. 
I needed to get to the grade floor. Loud explosions of wood and metal against metal echoed behind me, I wasn't even entitled to see the battle between the puppets as they clashed enough times in a single second that I could only hear one constant boom of the sound of metals clashing against each other. Once I arrived at the barrier which hid the illusory treasures, I slapped my right hand against the barrier to which it shuddered. Then I pulled a brush from my side pouch and began drawing inscriptions on the barrier. My goal, simple, overwrite, overwhelm and overtax the barrier. It would have been foolish to attempt this with Zai Sun behind me, but now that he is gone all the treasures are mine. Yes, all the treasures, as what I said to Zai Sun before was nothing but a lie, a lie he would have immediately tore apart if he was not frustrated and exhausted from his attempts at breaking the barrier because even if the barrier could replicate the aura of weapons from another floor to this one, I would have been able to see such an inscription, but there were none and I lied at Zai Sun to prove intellectual superiority against his sight. I kept overriding inscriptions as fast as I could, but the barrier kept trying to defend itself, futile, as this was not an attacking restriction, but rather a defensive one and like lethal force. It could do nothing as I kept writing commands on top of it, small commands that would be futile and destroyed by the barrier in no time, but the sheer amount of the small commands I wrote was enough to keep the barrier focused on removing my inscription to keep its integrity. While I wrote the commands and the barrier kept removing them, I added something else. It was a simple random stroke at first. Then another, while I kept writing more inscriptions. The barrier didn't deem those strokes worthy of its attention as it kept its focus on the more annoying overtaxing inscriptions I kept adding. This was the same thing I did to Elder Yun when I played my first game of Go against him using my mind's eye, divide and conquer. And I was dividing the inscription's focus as I drew those random but subtle random brush strokes. But I was pressed for time, exhaustion was of no concern to me, as better be exhausted than dead. As I heard the sounds of the clash getting closer, no doubt X was being overwhelmed. Damn it, I don't want to lose X, he was the first puppet I ever made, he was mine. And I didn't want to lose him, but I had no choice in the matter. God damn it, I was distracted for a second and the barrier was about to retake control of our little game. But I focused harder, enough that I began seeing a red, as more blood vessels popped in my eyes from the sheer speed that my eyes were moving from place to place. A small pain, for greater gains, it kept me focused on an all-time high as my hand increased in speed, enough that if one were to look at my hands they'd see my hands blurring as they wrote more and more inscriptions piled on top of each other. And when I was about to strike the last brush, I heard the loud thud of metal against stone. Turning I saw a haggard, soldier puppet, with various wounds, and poisoned needles stabbing through its form, even a couple of X's fingers were embedded into its eyes, but the soldier was wholly fine and was standing with his sword drawn. Fear gripped my heart, and sadness, for this means that X had lost, and this puppet was now going to kill me before I finished what I was going to do. Chapter 58, Conscious Transfer only to have hope reignited as the soldier dropped on its face when X showed up behind him. His head was torn in half, and his right arm dangled uselessly against his side, where thousands of cuts littered his body, X still stood, while a soul formation puppet was laying on the ground. And this was all thanks to the fact that I had X working with five brains instead of one, as even though the gaping hole in his chest that destroyed his spiritual stone, or the destroyed right arm, X still had three other brains, one in his left shoulder and two more on his legs that acted as secondary brains and kept the puppet from failing his duty in answering my command. X's multi-brain functionality enabled him to fight tooth and nail to the bitter end, as for even if he lost his head, hands, or chest, there will always be a command center guiding him and he would still fight where the soul formation puppet only had a single inscription on his chest which X had destroyed by giving up one of his hands. X moved towards me, with difficult yet confirmed steps, he struggled to move due to all of the damage he had received, but he was a source of pride and joy to me, 
as he managed to defeat something that made an nascent soul cultivator scurry away in fright. X was mine. And I'll be damned not to reward him for his efforts. I struck the last brush against the barrier, and then a formation that wouldn't have been possible to create was now in place. All those strokes I made on the barriers had made a formation on top of this formation. A restriction that overwrites the former restriction and gave me the ability to take command of the barrier in front of me. X, bring the soldier rover, I called and my puppet heeded my command. Though painful to see, how awkward X moved, and how he couldn't even relay the damage he suffered. It pained me to see X suffering but without pain and it only confirmed my resolve to give him the best. X dragged the puppet soldier over and I waved my hand causing a hole in the barrier to open up. The moment the hole in the barrier appeared I was assaulted with powerful waves of spiritual chi that were trapped inside the barrier. X threw the puppet on the other side of the barrier and got inside while I followed suit and closed the barrier from within. I now have control of this barrier and everything that was behind it, all those treasures spirit stones, weapons, and artifacts were now mine. And best of all, they had a lot of materials that I could use to repair X and make him better, stronger, and faster. Just as I was admiring the treasure trove, the puppets from the upper floors came down, they had probably sensed the death of their comrades and came after me. They should have done that first, but I suppose they didn't think I'm worth their efforts, and thus. A there's the rub. I went on my knees and removed the armors that the puppet soldier wore. I needed to confirm something and almost immediately I sighed in thanks. The puppet didn't seem to have a self-destruction inscription or anything that could cause it to stand back up. I began by removing its parts and saw through the inscriptions making it, figuring out why this thing was a formation level puppet. The soldier puppet also had a single formation on its chest but it was so exhaustive and had so many inscriptions in it that I made my head hurt trying to figure it all out. But what pulled my attention was the fact that it also had five high-grade spirit stones operating it. Could it be that a puppet only needed more spirit stones for it to gain a higher cultivation grade? But if so, anyone could make soul formation level puppets. Oh no, it's the knowledge behind the setup of the inscriptions as even if one was able to procure the spirit stones, they'll need a lot of understanding of inscriptions to write a proper formation able to channel all the spirit stones without clashing against each other, something I came to understand only now, but at the same time had known before. This was simply because of my understanding of programming, though I'm not the best in the field, I needed code and computer knowledge in my field of work. Also the education quality back on earth was so far higher than inscriptions were nothing more than codes for me instead of what many of the books called language of the heaven, for me they were nothing more than mere commands to do a specific job, I didn't need to understand how they worked or who provided the pamphlet for them to work as they are, I only knew they worked and I used them to the best of my ability and accidentally created a soul formation level puppet. Now there was another factor on how to create formation level puppets besides how to organize the inscriptions not to clash with each other or the spiritual stones and how to organize their wavelengths, stuff like I said before I subconsciously understood thanks to my education, and this was the material. Powerful material was needed to operate powerful puppets, as showed by X, he had so much power but the material making him was not strong enough to wield all of that power. Not that X was weak, no, he could tear a nascent soul cultivator apart like he was tearing paper, but for him to show all of his might he'll need a stronger body, and it's already in front of me. And thus, I began dismantling the soldier puppet in front of his peers who looked at me with dead eyes. Once I dismantled the puppet fully and removed the spirit stones, I began by deleting the inscription it had, but before I could rewrite them, I was stuck in a dilemma. X. How can I transfer him here? I didn't want to lose X, nor make a stronger puppet and discard my first puppet, no, I wanted to wholly transfer X's being into this new body. But how can I do that? How can I harness the soul of a soulless puppet? I looked at X and then back at the dismantled puppet in front of me. Then it struck me, overwrite, 
overwhelm and overtake. X, come here, I commanded and X came to me, I opened his chest and wrote a new set of commands into them. Smiling with wicked glee I continued writing until my hands felt tired but kept going, adding more commands over all of X's body. Then when I stood up, I felt like I was going to pass out from mental exhaustion. I pulled a few leaves from the spiritual tea master Yun had given me and munched on them. I didn't have the tools nor did it look alright brewing tea in front of so many hostile puppets looking at me and I had to make with a small semblance of mental relief that the leaves gave me. But what happened next caused me great joy, as I have just inputted a hijack command on X. To which he used to great success, as he dove his still functioning arm on the puppet and the inscription on his hand flooded down the soldier puppet's arm. The inscriptions move like they had a purpose and I found it amazing how mystifying this was, as solid writings turned to live words. How can one explain this? I have no idea, and like always I do not fret over things I don't fully understand nor have the ability to currently understand. X finished with transferring his consciousness, or at least one of his consciousness, into the puppet. The one in his hand. The puppet's hand didn't move however as it needed the spiritual stone. And just as I was about to act, X shone bright, where the runes on his chest moved to his arm, the one that had all its inscriptions melted into the soldier puppet, and these new inscriptions were now commanding his hand instead of his chest. And his hand moved once again as it plucked one of the spirit stones on his body and placed it on the soldier puppet, then he continued, transferring his conscious onto the new puppet. This was amazing to see. This was intelligence, god damn it, did I make an artificial intelligence? The thought disappeared the moment it came to mind, no, this was probably a reaction to the self-preservation command I created into X, he made sure to survive and transferred his consciousness to a better host. Parasitic, but it suited my purpose. Soon after X had fully transferred itself into the new puppet soldier, I began by adjusting the new X editing a few runes and correcting ones then finished off by repairing some of the damage on the soldier puppet. Looking away from the soldier puppet on the ground, X's older puppet body was left on the ground, lifeless. And I didn't want to lose it, I placed it inside the poison god's book, and now I was left with a good feeling. I was nothing more than a first-tier foundation establishment cultivator. But I had a soul formation puppet to guard me. And this felt damn good. But when I remembered the gigantic planet heating serpent that was inevitably coming my way, my sense of security dulled. But this only ignited my ambition I'll become stronger, even if I had to rely on X to secure my safety right now, I'll become powerful in the future that I'll no longer need protection. I looked at the puppets outside the barrier and sighed because before I become stronger, I'll need to actually defeat these puppets and leave. The barrier was protecting me, but at the same time, imprisoning me inside it. Damn it. X is strong, and now he is stronger, but sending him out is the same as dooming him to his death, and I need a way out, and I only have my little brain to use and find myself an escape. Chapter 59, Soul Stairs. Thinking Things Through. I found myself in more of a bind than I thought could be possible. X's presence was comforting but with so many soul formation level puppets standing right outside the barrier, I felt like a mouse being watched by a pack of hungry cats. Not the best feeling in the world. Still, I gotta admit, there was a sense of security inside this barrier. And whereas I's son tried to force his way through this barrier with might, these puppets didn't even bother, why? because they knew they couldn't. I only managed to break the barrier because I cheated, I created several codes to force the defensive measures to guard against my assault, while working on another inscription behind the barrier's back. This caused the whole thing to become mine, even if I felt that this was only temporary because the barrier never stopped shining, as it sent commands all over its surface. And then and there I knew that this was not a good sign. For if the barrier was able to overwrite the commands, I wrote on it then it will no longer be mine to control, and if that happened, 
perhaps the barrier will allow the hungry cats to enter and I'll be no better than minced meat. I shook the thought out of my head, thinking about how grim my inn would be will not change the fact that I'm pressed for time. X is good and running, he is already flexing his metaphorical muscles, trying out his new body, though there is still a lot of damage on it, damage that I'll only be able to fully repair when I'm out of the stamped pagoda and back in my manor. But for now, I'll make do with what I have. Getting out of here is a priority, and now I have a good idea of how to do this. I grinned as the thought took root in my mind and didn't want to leave, and this idea was a damn good one. I stood up after having finally relieved some of my mental exhaustion. The next undertaking will definitely take a good measure out of my mental health, but it's the only thing I believe that will work. I pulled my brush and dust it in what was left of my drowsy inkberry ink. Then started splashing inscriptions on the barrier, adding more complex inscriptions atop simple ones, to do one single thing. I wasn't so arrogant to think I could make this formation into a killing formation and having it kill the puppets for me, that wouldn't work, not with my meager chi skills, but all I needed to do was add a slight modification to the barrier, something that will not clash against its basic command of protection. If I were to add an offensive trait to a defensive formation, I'll need a great deal of chi to supply the barrier, but if I were to slightly modify the terrain the barrier was protecting, then the barrier should theoretically not fight back. While it would have denied anyone else the ability to temper with it, I already held my claim over the barrier and giving it a subtle push to do what it was already doing protecting shouldn't contradict its reason of existence, which is to protect and preserve. And so, I finished the inscriptions and the barrier shook, as it began morphing, from a single sheet splitting the whole room in two, into a dome that didn't protect me anymore but encompassed the puppets. I just pulled a switcheroo on the puppets, now instead of me being protected by the barrier, they were trapped inside it and I was free to move about. I grinned as my action worked, and to the dumb puppets, they didn't even move, because they were definitely believing that this barrier was created by their master and they had no intention of destroying it, even if it meant that it will allow them to rip me to pieces. The dome around them would hold them off indefinitely, or until one of them wisen up and start going downtown on it. I skipped my way around the dome and toward the stairs, while the puppets struck me with their eyes, unable to chase after me. I continued going upwards until I reached the same floor where the puppets were. Splendid, you managed to survive. The laughing slaughter's voice sounded through the room. And another staircase came down. Another manual appeared in front of me, and I was taken aback when I read the title. Sanguine Blade, Second Tome. This was the second tome of the Sanguine Blade Arts. Good, this would mean that if I were to study this art I'll be able to have easier access to a higher tier of the manual. But would this contradict my poison cultivation? I'll have to think things through, for if I were to chase after two different paths, I'll be like the fox who chases two rabbits only to go home hungry. I climbed up the stairs and instead of finding another room, what I found was a set of stairs that led upwards to the skies. Yes, literal sky, there was no ceiling and no end to these stairs in sight, they just rose up indefinitely. As you tread the path of cultivation, do know that your soul is part of your power, for it can be a full to your power as it could also save you from certain death. You may use it to force your enemies to submit and you may even escape using it once your head is no longer attached to your body, and thus possess another body to reforge yours anew, the soul is a powerful weapon and these stairs will help you temper it. Climb until you can climb no more, and that's where you'll be able to challenge your limits and elevate your soul, trials and tribulations are the only things that a cultivator can use to become stronger. The laughing slaughterer's voice sounded through the room, and for the first time, it wasn't as oppressive. I took the first step on the staircase, waiting for a sudden pressure to come down against me, only to be surprised that there was no such thing. I continued with another step, and more, and even more, as I climbed the stairs with ease, there was no pressure until I reached the first 300 steps, then there was pressure only this was more like the pressure a helmet would cause upon one's head. 
negligible. I continued walking up, and up, where that slight pressure increased, it never was powerful enough to bring me to my knees, and that was true until I reached the 1000th step. There, my whole being felt like it was about to be ripped out of its place as I huffed, desperately gasping for breath. I grinned, this is how it's supposed to be, so show me your worst. Chapter 60 Training Montage a powerful downpour of heavenly energy crashed against me, it was like standing under a waterfall, the pressure was pushing me to my knees and I would have buckled down in an instant if I didn't anticipate such. As I thought, every milestone would have the pressure double up, but the thousandth step, the pressure increased exponentially, and I felt like I was about to drown. I took a deep breath, and grit my old teeth until I felt them about to crack. Then I took a powerful step forward. The stomp was mighty enough that I left a print on the staircase, this was new. And it had given me a slight understanding of something mystical, but I couldn't put my hands on it, this step that I took, though it was simple, it hid a secret, a secret that I was going to uncover once this goddamned pressure lessens a bit. But my prayers go unrewarded, as the pressure only increased the more I walked upwards. The step that crushed the staircase didn't happen again, and I didn't understand why, but no need to fret over things I can't figure out right now, I'll need to first make my way up. After a few more steps, I felt like my bones were about to break from the pressure, so I sat down in a lotus position, which was damn difficult, as even moving my body onto this pressure felt like my limbs were made of lead. Once I entered my meditation state, I found myself looking at my body, and all of its poison meridians, they were suffering, threatening to break. This wasn't good for me. The spiritual energy that is assaulting my body was indeed intended to temper my soul, but that would be good only if my body was attuned to the spiritual chi, as for me, I'm made of poison chi. I tried to channel the poison chi in my dungeon to reinforce my meridians but it was difficult to course through my spirit veins and reach the meridians, the pressure was powerful enough that it blocked my veins. My body began shuddering against the pressure. I need to go back, I can't move anymore. This was the only idea that was passing through my mind, I can't keep going, I must give up. But for some reason, this reasoning felt wrong. I instinctively felt that there was an opportunity here, that I could take, something huge that can allow me to reach greater heights, but why am I being prodded to give up, the thought is so forceful that I'm almost certain it's not mine. Someone or something is actually trying to temper with my thoughts, so I would give up. I looked within my shuddering meridians and then noticed something I failed to see the first time. The meridians weren't threatening to shatter. Otherwise. Under this pressure, they would have broken the first time, they are actually dot giddy? Anticipating something even, my whole body is actually shuddering at an incoming fortuitous encounter that I'm failing to even know, notice or see. Then it hit me like a truck, the energy, this is pure spiritual chi, not unlike world's chi, but more like this is a purified version of it, removed from heavenly law. This is not true spiritual chi but a fake one, though even if fake, it was the best thing I could hope for. National Heavenly Chi is opposed to my body, and it will not work in tune with it, but this inferior version, this boundless Chi that has no law inside it, would be perfect for my body if I were to add one single thing to it. Something that the spiritual Chi didn't come with. Poison. I took a breath and forced my meridians to shudder and release all their pent up force against the torrent of the incomplete chi assaulting me, and where the veins that linked the meridians were forced shut before, they now opened up, causing the poison chi in me to move through them with savage glee, even tearing some of the veins as they moved to cause me to spit a mouthful of blood from my mouth before I managed to gather my bearing, I need to be calm and can't have my body over exit itself to its demise. I willed my energy to move about in a slower manner, but strong enough to force its way against the incomplete chi pressuring me, then when they made a full circulation, I was ready, there and then I opened my mouth and shot a mouthful of my own poison chi against the fake chi. The two mixed together, and the chi that was incomplete found what was missing within my chi. 
though it wasn't as divine as heavenly law, there was still law in my own chi, and it engulfed it and transformed with it. Turning a great majority of this fake chi into true poison chi, and lo and behold as the pressure on my body switched from that of a dam pouring against my body to me being a black hole as I consumed all the incoming energy with lustful glee. Breakthrough came immediately, and I felt my body shudder and shake, foundation establishment, second realm, then the third, then the fourth, and it kept going until I reached foundation establishment lower peak, the seventh layer of the foundation establishment cultivation level. My body shuddered as it took in all of that energy and didn't find a way for it to release it, the pressure lessened intently, but I had so much energy within me that needed to be released. And what other way to release this energy but to use a spell? I found enlightenment in the poison god's own application of the poison tiger claw, one claw is all the poison god's book allowed me to learn, and I used the skill as the book instructed, one claw to rend the heavens, and I stood up then struck at the empty air in front of, where five cleaving marks of dense but thin rays of poison she shot out in the air in front of me, they moved with speed enough to contend with Zai Sun's bolting out from in front of the soul formation puppets. But I knew, this strength was only temporary. So I used the claw attack again, this time reining it in. This was the perfect place to train, as with every attack I did, the fake chi would merge with my poison chi and come towards me to fill me up with even more chi. Which I used to my advantage in trying these attacks and spells. And so, I began shooting out claw attacks, poison escape, and even a new skill that the poison god's book unlocked for me when I reached the seventh layer of foundation establishment. Twisted snake. An attack that bends perception giving the one opposing you the sense that your hands were snakes instead of arms, unable to understand where the attack would come from only to have them lying dead at your feet the moment you strike. An insidious attack that plays against one's own sight, for if one were to use their eyes to track the user's arms, they'll die before knowing how it happened. And best of all, my body, no longer had the thin skin of old people, but a slightly unhealthy skin tone and far fewer tumors and pustules than before, I could even feel my hair had fully grown back, though I believe it's still gray, it beats being half bald. And so I continued practicing in this unlimited chi space. An ascendant cultivator had so many means to create something like this, for many would find this place heaven, I believe for an ascendant cultivator this pagoda is nothing more than a discardable toy. For they can use Saint Chi which is far superior to regular chi, as for me, as long as I get to use this fake chi to my advantage and practice my skills with no regard to chi consumption, then I'm more than willing to spend a few months here until I perfect all of my skills. It's high time I start learning how to use the powers at my disposal, as relying always on X will only cause me to grow complacent. And so, my training montage started.